I Confess the Truth About American Communism by Benjamin Gitlow Introduction, by Max Eastman This book is a faithful and, resolutely candid account from the inside, and what is more important, from the top, of a vital phase of recent American history. The history is secret, and might well have remained so but for the extraordinary poise and courage of this man, Ben Gitlow, and his ultimate recovery of clear vision and unmixed devotion to his ideals. A thousand congressional investigations could not expose the facts exposed in this book. A thousand research experts, convinced of them, could not make them convincing. The work of the Communist Party in the United States has involved a series of fanatical crimes, not only against American law or Americanism, but against the party's own principles and ideals, against the working class. Nothing less than a confession by one of those guilty of leadership in these crimes of insane zealotry could adequately reveal them. In every case where the author describes an event or situation with which I had personal contact, and that means a good many both here and in Moscow, his statement of the facts, insofar as that can be separated from political or personal feelings toward them, is unassailable. In a number of cases, he lays bare the essentials more objectively than I could. His book is true history. Every judicious person from the inside to the remote fringes of the communist movement, whether he says so or not, will know that it is. Personally I failed to detect on any vital issue the dominance of any motive other than that of unmitigated truth-telling. Of course Ben Gitlow's judgments of men and their motives are his own, and they must be. Human motives are rarely single and I am not sure the author has always borne in mind that his opponents, like him, were moved in their factional maneuvers, and their dirty trickery in general, by superzealotry as well as by the mere thirst of power. To this I must add, however, that his depiction of persons in the movement who happen to have been more or less intimately known to me, is often startlingly perspicacious. I could endorse a surprisingly large number of his characterizations. They will be read by thoughtful people in touch with the movement, even when not with endorsement, nevertheless with a sharp sense of their honesty and acuteness. Thanks to his native gift, and guiding principle, of truthfulness, Gitlow has written an historical and political work of vital importance, and one which will probably never be replaced. No one studying American reflections of the Russian Revolution as such reflections of the French Revolution are still elaborately studied, will ever be able to ignore this book. Max Eastman. August 8, 1939 Prelude, a rebel is born in the spring of 1891 Two young Russian Jewish men rented for $10 a month the ground floor and basement of a two-story frame dwelling in Elizabethport, New Jersey a village near the southern shores of Newark Bay and on the eastern outskirts of Elizabeth. The thin fellow with the shocks of wavy black hair was my father, the other, short, stocky and blonde, my father's boyhood friend, Morris Ribbenden. Several days later, I was told it was a Saturday morning, a strange group of foreigners was the object of curiosity to the Americanized Scotch, Irish. English and German settlers as it came to occupy the premises. Rip Hendon and his young wife, who had recently arrived from Russia, together with my father, mother and older brother, Sam, two years old, made up the tired hungry group. A can of salmon was the only meal that day for the grown-ups. Sam was given a roll and butter which my mother had brought with her from New York. The rent and the rooms were divided equally between the two families. My parents occupied the one large room on the ground floor, Rip Hendon and his wife the two smaller rooms. The two basement rooms were shared together, although not in the fall and winter, when they were too damp and cold to be occupied. The place was infested with rats and had no improvements. There was an outhouse in the yard, water was drawn from a well, kerosene lamps furnished the light. My mother liked the place because it was in the country. The air was exhilarating, the bright rays of the sun danced through the windows, and two tall trees majestically stood guard in the front yard. Compared to the dirty tenements of Hester Street with their dark rooms and the noise, crowds, dirt and foul odors of the east side, 
the Elizabeth bought place was paradise indeed. But times were bad and work scarce. My parents found it difficult to pay their five dollars rent each month. My father worked only part time. The family income had to be replenished by my mother working at home. The shirt factory from which she obtained her work was far away. To reach the place my mother had to take a street car and then walk an interminably long road with a large clumsy heavy bundle of shirts. One miserable fall day dark with rain my mother lost her way. Besides the bundle of shirts, she was heavy with child. She arrived at the factory when it was dusk, drenched to the skin. The forelady saw her condition, when paying her off, she refused to give her any more work until the thing was over. My mother begged for the work, said she needed it badly, explained that her condition did not interfere with her doing it. But her pleading was of no avail. Mother returned home tired, despondent and despairing of the future. To make matters worse, the Rip Endens moved away, leaving my destitute parents with the full burden of the rent. Worrying, her mind constantly on the new life that was about to be born, mother helped my father to find tenants for the rooms left vacant by the Rip Endens, these went to an elderly woman and her daughter. Into this world of tyrannical petty worries I was born about an hour afternoon of Tuesday, December 22nd. 1891. No physician officiated at my delivery. I was pulled into the one room world of my family by a German midwife in her middle forties, who received six dollars in cash of the recently collected sublet money for her services. My father came home from the factory at two o'clock in the afternoon. He did the shopping and housework until late in the evening. When he went to bed, he soon fell fast asleep exhausted from the day's work and the excitement of the event. My mother fell asleep later. About midnight I awoke and kept crying incessantly. Weak as she was, scarcely twelve hours after delivery, instead of awakening my tired father, mother got up to look at me herself. My face was covered with soot. The kerosene lamp was ablaze. A terrible tragedy was impending. But my mother did not become panicky. She picked me up in her arms and awakened the elderly lady who shared the rooms with us. The latter awakened my father, then carried Sam, who had slept soundly through it all, out of the house. After my father had put the fire out and tidied up the room, my mother returned. Physically strong and firm in character, mother sent my father right back to bed, because he had to be up early in the morning to go to work, herself emptied the ashes from the cold stove made a new fire, put a large kettle of water on, bathed my brother and me and put us to bed, washed all the linen accumulated as a result of the confinement, hung the clothes up to dry, and only then retired for the night. The very next day, the day after the confinement, my mother was out of bed, attending to her domestic duties as if nothing had happened. In the one large room that was our home nothing remained to remind one that a day before a baby was born. Five weeks later, during a big snowstorm, the family moved back to New York, for my father, although not directly involved in a fight between some workers and the boss of the factory in which he was employed, as a class conscious worker, sided with his fellow employees and lost his job. At five weeks I was the son of a despairing unemployed tramping the sidewalks of New York in quest of work. As I look back in retrospect upon my boyhood days I find that lasting impressions have been made upon me by the social life in my parents' home, the constant coming and going of friends, the socialist activities that emanated from our house, the discussions and the stories that the immigrants told about their personal and political experiences in Tsarist Russia. Growing up largely in the socialist movement, stories about underground Russia fascinated me. I would listen intently to the adventures of the Russian revolutionary leaders, of their experiences with the police, the days and years spent in prisons and their exile to the wastes of Siberia. I would grow indignant hearing how the Tsarists treated the people. I thrilled at the stories of the underground movement, of the conspiring activities, how deeds of violence against the Tsarist oppressors were planned. I marveled when they explained how they transmitted messages and code by a system of telegraphic knocks upon the wall. 
I learned also how they crudely wrote out by hand the pamphlets and proclamations that were then distributed secretly by passing them in an endless chain from one person to another. The stories of personal experiences when raids were made by the secret police upon revolutionists' homes held me spellbound. I anticipated every incident that would be related. I also listened to discussions, very idealistic in their essence, in which the participants showed how socialism would transform the world, and to arguments over methods of how socialism was to be achieved. But don't for one moment imagine that my parents and their circle of radical immigrants lived with their past in Russia and the other countries from which they came. Far from it. They were eagerly interested in the world in which they lived. I was only a little tot when I heard the stories about the Molly Magyars, the Homestead Steel Workers Strike, the heroism of the anarchist martyrs. They took a keen interest in the economic development of the United States, discussing organization of the trusts and their significance from all angles, as well as eagerly following the political issues before the country. I was about four years old when the family moved to Cherry Street near the East River. On the north side of the street lived the Jewish immigrant families, on the south side, the Irish. A block below the tenement in which we lived were warehouses, factories and a large livery stable. The river was close by. The busy docks, the barges lying lazily tied up to the wharves, the puffing toilers of the river, the tugs, the ferries and other river craft of all description. The many children, the excitement. The noise and the congestion of the east side stirred my youthful imagination and left a lasting impression upon me. During the Spanish-American War we lived in Brooklyn. I was then about six, an ardent American patriot who hated the Spaniards for their mistreatment of Cuba. The radical circle that came to our house was interested and excited over the war with Spain. They were unanimous in their support of the United States. The Hearst Papers which they read and believed, influenced them tremendously. In New York City I learned more about the socialist movement. I attended mass meetings, listened to street corner orators, read socialist newspapers and argued socialism with the boys at school. The most impressive meeting I attended during that period was the one at which I first heard Mother Jones, the intrepid leader of the miners, and Ben Hanford, the socialist agitator. It took place in Bohemian Hall on 76th Street. I sat in the balcony. A noisy, enthusiastic crowd of men and women was present. A small band played the mass lays. The cornet shrieking defiance, it seemed to me, of the whole capitalist world. I was all eyes and ears, determined to see and hear everything. Until then Mother Jones had been a mythical figure to me. I had heard many stories about her heroism and devotion to the miners' cause. Now I was to see her in person. When the chairman introduced her I was nervous with anticipation. A tall, strong-featured elderly woman took the platform amid the outburst of applause, her voice was clear, powerful. It rang out in condemnation of the injustice meted out to the miners. When she finished, the band played and the very ceiling seemed to vibrate as the crowd rose to its feet and cheered. Ben Hanford followed her. He was tall, good-looking and impressed me very much. His voice, deep, gently resonant, was most appealing, as in simple language he delivered the socialist message. I was sure that his promise of a better world under socialism would come true. I left the meeting, convinced that in the end socialism would be victorious. My daily life really began after working hours. The most important single factor was Frederick C. Howe's forum at Cooper Union, which in those days exerted considerable influence upon the lives of the thinking youth of the city, especially those politically and socially minded. A motley crowd came to listen and learn. Many came to ask questions by which to justify their political philosophy. The socialists were most active in this respect. I attended these lectures often. I listened. I studied the crowds there. Attending the Cooper Union Forum was like attending a living university. It was vibrant with the life of the times. Nor did my evening end with the closing of the hall, for crowds gathered outside it, and groups of intensely serious people discussed philosophy, religion, 
politics, socialism, anarchism, astronomy, economics, there was no limit to the range of inquiry. The socialists, who were very numerous then, would cleverly turn every topic under discussion into one on socialism. At times a group would gather around some itinerant worker who would tell about the wonders of other parts of the country and of the world. There, exchanging experiences and views, were tramps, hobos, cranks, workers, students and professional people, all representing numerous nationalities. There I would be found, a tall lad for my age, listening and absorbing what was being said. I went from group to group. I found that men in rags could be profoundly philosophic and far from ignorant. I learned from the lips of men themselves how they lived, how they felt about life. When I reached home and went to bed, I would turn over in my mind the things that left an impression upon me. I would try to fathom the problems confronting mankind. In my mind would be the faces of those whom I had seen and heard, men unnamed, of unrecorded fame who had kindled in me a spark of affection and admiration for them, men who had given me a feeling for the world as it was and as it might be. It was at that time, in 1909, that I joined the Socialist Party and became active in the radical labor movement. Part 1, From Revolutionary Idealism to Power Politics Chapter I, From Socialism to Communism in March, 1917 when it seemed as if the German Kaiser and his allies were winning the war in Europe and America seemed secure in its peace after re-electing the president who had kept it out of war, Nicholas II, Emperor of all the Russias, abdicated the throne on which the Romanov dynasty had sat for over three centuries. This news struck the world like a thunderbolt. But it was a welcome surprise. It augured the clearing of the war-clouded sky. It betokened glad tidings to socialists throughout the world, who gathered all over the face of the earth to discuss the implications of this historic event to the sacred cause of socialism, the liberation of the working class. The small club rooms of the socialist branch in New York to which I belonged were crowded with happy men and women, whose smiling faces and expressions of ecstasy showed with what intense emotion they welcomed the news. To those among them who had played their parts in the 1905 revolution and, after its defeat, stumbled through the dark days of reaction that followed, it was an occasion of great rejoicing, for at last they were celebrating the defeat of the autocracy and the victory of the Russian people over the Tsar. One such old comrade turned to me and said, At last it has happened. The mighty Tsar is no more. Who could have foretold in 1905? when the Tsar seemed almighty and invincible, that he would be overthrown in so short a time. The great Russian people have proven that they are mightier than any despot. My people are free. It is hard to believe. To many of us the Russian Revolution was that break in the war for which we had been hoping and waiting. We saw in it the beginning of a worldwide revolutionary wave of resentment against the sordid capitalistic orgy of carnage popular resentment that would end the war by driving from power those who were responsible for it. Eventually the world would rise out of its shambles like the fabled phoenix, resplendent in the beauty and youthful vigor of socialism. Surely, no one could now regard that hope as utopian. Yesterday it seemed as if civilization was to be doomed to the boom of cannon and eternal destruction. Now the most backward people on earth were beginning to assert themselves. Russia showed the way. Others would follow. Peace and a new freedom seemed on the very threshold of this war-ridden world. The Russian Revolution revived our faith in socialism and in the ultimate success of our movement. That was why socialists everywhere followed its development with intense interest. When the Bolshevik uprising took place in November we in New York were perplexed, because we had never heard about Bolshevism before. But the Bolsheviks denunciation of the war, their demand for peace, and uncompromising declarations in favor of socialism struck in us a responsive chord. Then we understood. The Bolsheviks were the revolutionary socialists, the true votaries of orthodox Marxism. The Bolshevik revolution, many of us felt, was the socialist phase of the epoch-making events which the Russian masses were enacting. 
We were now witnessing in Russia a social upheaval of worldwide magnitude in which the overthrow of the Tsar's government was only an incident. The ending of the World War in 1918, followed by the revolutionary developments in Europe, seemed to indicate that the end of capitalism was at hand, as the red banners were being unfurled in one country after another. It was a sign that the Russian Revolution was spreading. Socialism was becoming a fighting revolutionary force. We accepted the Bolshevik Revolution as our revolution, the Bolshevik leaders as our leaders. We worshipped Lenin and Trotsky as their heroes of the revolution. Their influence upon us was tremendous. We did not stop to weigh and examine the program and philosophy of Bolshevism. Why should we? Bolshevism had shattered capitalism in Russia and was calling upon the revolutionary socialists to overthrow it in their own countries. Theirs was the militant call to action for which we had been waiting. The revolution was on the march. We could not lose time. We had to march with it. The socialist movement of the United States was caught in this whirlwind of revolutionary enthusiasm. The socialist party was at its mercy like a tiny boat caught in a storm at sea for the party which had hailed the Bolshevik revolution was in turn subjected to Bolshevik attacks, was given blow after blow from which it never recovered. The Bolsheviks split it. They called upon those of us who heeded their call to sever our ties with the opportunists and social patriots who stood pat in the way of the revolution. The Socialist Party, which I joined in 1909, when I was 18 years old became by 1919 the battleground of an internecine war between its right and left wings. Erstwhile comrades turned into ruthless enemies. The party whose guiding principle was democracy fell a prey to Lenin's philosophy, based upon the repudiation of democracy, and the socialist movement was split with ease. Inspired by Bolshevism, the left wing did not hesitate to use all means, fair or foul, to wreck the socialist party. When Lenin called for the extermination of the Yellow Socialists, we understood that the first prerequisite for the building of the Communist Party was that its foundation should rest upon the wreckage of the Socialist Party. In 1919, when I helped to wreck the Socialist Party, I had in back of me ten active years of devoted service to the movement. Joining the Socialist Party had seemed to me the proper and necessary thing to do. My father and mother were socialists. Our home in the Lower East Side of New York City was a gathering place for radical Russian immigrants. As a boy I was thrilled by their stories of adventure in the fight against Tsarism and fascinated by their descriptions of the utopian paradise socialism would establish. I believed that socialism would create a new society, free from exploitation, a republic of liberty and justice for all. The Harlem branch which I joined had its headquarters in a stuffy basement at 104th Street and Lexington Avenue. The branch had about 60 members, all foreign born. They looked at me with amazement when they heard that I was born in the United States, because I was the first American born member to join their branch. The Socialist Party at the time was a large and growing organization. Its 50,000 members were scattered all over the country. In the last presidential elections it had polled over 800,000 votes. Most of its members were foreign-born and belonged to the foreign language federations. The Native American elements were just beginning to join in larger numbers than heretofore. The organization was very democratic. Every action, every decision of the party was thoroughly discussed by the mass of its members suppression of opinion was unknown. Though the professionals and intellectuals exerted great influence over the party, its membership was nevertheless distinctly working class in composition. A few months later, as it was natural for a socialist to do, I joined the union of my trade, the Retail Clerks Union of New York, which was attempting to organize the department store workers. I soon became a member of its executive board, and at the first general election was elected its president. The union employed one paid organizer, all the elected officials serving without pay. The union was helped by a group of women who were active in the women's suffrage movement and in the Women's Trade Union League. Among them was the liberal Elizabeth Dutcher, who threw her whole soul into the work, Mrs. James P. Warbus, Mrs. O. H. P. Belmont, 
who gave us the use of the suffrage headquarters she maintained on 41st Street, Mrs. J. Sergeant Cram, and the vivacious Inez Milholland, who was very popular with the girl members of our union. My first fight in the Socialist Party was over the Negro question. One of the Negro members of the party, a cigar maker, had refused to go out on strike when his shop was called out by the Cigar Makers International Union. The Socialist Party of local New York condemned him for his action and suspended him from the party. He defended himself on the ground that the union discriminated against Negroes by refusing to accept them into the union. I fought against his suspension on the grounds that the action of the union in discriminating against Negroes was deserving of severe censure and that the Negro worker had registered such censure in the way he believed would be most effective. Some of the old party members attacked my viewpoint and threatened to expel me from the party for defending scabbing. I fought them tooth and nail and upbraided them for their failure to fight against all forms of race discrimination. The Socialist Party was never a party of one mind, never monolithic, as the Bolsheviks would want their party to be. It was rather the battleground for sharp differences of opinion, for contending viewpoints. The most important clashes were over the question of industrial unionism and the advocacy of violence. With the rise of the I. W. W. This controversy divided the party into virtually two warring camps. Hillquit represented one camp, Haywood, the other. Haywood favored industrial unionism, reinforced by the tactics of sabotage and violence, which Hillquit opposed. Haywood wanted to split and smash the American Federation of Labor, in order to build the I. W. W. as the one big union, which Hillquit opposed. At the 1912 convention Hillquit put through an amendment to the constitution calling for the expulsion of all those members of the party who advocated crime, sabotage and violence as means of working class action. The matter went to a referendum of the party membership. At first I favored Haywood's position, but as the discussion proceeded I broke with Haywood, because I opposed his contempt for political action and did not favor his proposal for smashing the American Federation of Labor. I voted in favor of Hillquit's amendment, even though I did not believe in his blanket condemnation of violence. I believed that there were occasions during trade union and political struggles when the use of violence was necessary. However, I was of the opinion that the public advocacy of violence as proposed by Haywood could only end in making the trade unions and the Socialist Party a prey to agents provocateurs and persecution by the government. Hillquit's amendment, known as Article 2, Section 6, 1. Its victory inflicted deep wounds on the party. Many thousands of the young and most brilliant members of the party voluntarily left its ranks. Many of Haywood's supporters accepted the defeat and remained in the party. These later formed the left-wing opposition, out of which the Communist Party was subsequently organized. The following year an economic crisis hit the country. It was a year of breadlines, unemployment and discontent. Hungry workers paraded the streets demanding food. The jobless invaded the churches for lodgings. Demands were made upon the government that something be done to relieve the plight of the unemployed. An unemployed movement sprang up, the spearhead of which were the members of the I. W. W. and the anarchists, with the Socialist Party playing a minor and very unimportant role. Yet I was drawn into it. My first meeting with the leaders of the movement took place at the home of Joseph O'Brien in Greenwich Village, New York City's Bohemia. O'Brien and his wife, Mary Heaton Vorse, were ardent supporters of the I. W. W. Most of us squatted on the floor during the deliberations. Here I met Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, the fiery tongued orator and organizer of the I. W. W. She sharply criticized the anarchists, and particularly Emma Goldman, for disregarding I. W. W. decisions and for pursuing an independent policy. Later Big Bill Haywood dropped in. He gave a glowing account of the heroic struggles of the I. W. W. and heartened his listeners by promising that, as soon as the unemployed movement in New York developed, an order would be issued for the footloose I. 
W. W. Members to converge on New York, to help in the fight of the jobless. In the dim light of the room, his massive hulk, his voice ringing with emotion and tenderness, and his one eye, from which flashed in turn both hate and love, Hayward appeared as a powerful dreamer of intrepid spirit who was ready to risk all in the attainment of his goal. After Haywood had concluded, we decided to hold a meeting on Rutgers Square Inch's defiance of police orders. I was to be the first speaker, because I was not a member of the I. W. W. was a native of New York and was president of a trade union. Before departing for Rutgers Square we were informed that Lincoln Steffens, heading a group of prominent liberals, would be present to back up our right to speak and when we arrived the Lincoln Steffens and his group were already on hand. As the chairman was about to introduce me, the I. W. W. Unemployed leader leapt upon the platform and proceeded to speak, disregarding the decision that had been made that I was to be the first speaker. He was the most surprised man in the world when the police did not interfere, spoiling his attempt to become a martyr. Later, when the unemployed movement became the target of bitter opposition, I saw him battered by policemen's clubs, during an unemployed demonstration on Union Square, until he fell unconscious in a pool of his own blood. The months preceding the World War were full of adventure for radicals. The strikes in Rockefeller's mines in Colorado aroused us to a pitch of feverish excitement. In protest against the burning of the miners' tent colony at Ludlow resulting in the death of men, women and children, we paraded together with Upton Sinclair, displaying mourning bands on our sleeves, in front of the Rockefeller offices at 26 Broadway. The socialists, anarchists, liberals and members of the I. W. W. jointly participated in a mighty protest movement against the outrage. Then followed the hearings in New York of the United States Committee on Industrial Relations, packed to the doors with radicals, who came to hear their own people testify and to enjoy the grueling cross examination to which the capitalists were subjected by Frank P. Walsh, the committee's chairman, and by the labor members on the committee. Then came the second half of 1914. The outbreak of the World War shook the American Socialist Party to its very foundations. We all believed that our brother parties in Europe would prevent the war. We were heartsick when we learned that the socialist parties of the warring countries flagrantly violated their pledges that workers would never shoot each other. Instead they were actually supporting the capitalist governments of their respective countries at war. The Socialist Party of the United States, however, maintained throughout an attitude opposed to the war, although many of its members took sides some supporting the Allies, others the Entente. I was steadfast in my opposition to the war as a capitalist shambles for imperialist profits. In this I was not unlike the majority of my party, whose prestige was enhanced during the war years, notwithstanding fluctuations in membership from 118,000 in 1912 to 93,500 in 1914 down to 79,000 in 1915 and up to 83,000 in 1916, when in the presidential elections of that year on an anti-war and peace platform, the party, for the first time without Debs as its candidate and fighting against Woodrow Wilson's popularity as the man who had kept the country out of war, polled over half a million votes. The war situation was the acid test of our socialism. The American Socialist Party passed through that test far more creditably than its fraternal parties in the major countries of Europe. When the United States government declared war in April, 1917, five months after Wilson had pledged the country to peace, the American people were profoundly shocked. The Socialist Party, in convention assembled, answered the declaration of war with its famous St. Louis resolution in opposition to the war. We thus demonstrated the utter unreliability of liberal democratic pacifism. We denounced those socialists who came out in support of the war as traitors to the party and to the proletariat. Socialist party members everywhere plunged into the anti-war campaign, notwithstanding that the party as such did not lead and direct it. 
Although we recruited comparatively few members, the periphery of our sympathizers extended considerably, for we became the anti-war party that had remained true to its pledge. Our influence was best expressed through numerous peace organizations which immediately grew to large proportions. The peace movement was spontaneous, clearly indicating that the people of the United States were opposed to American participation in the war and were determined to preserve democracy at home during its duration. I plunged into the anti war campaign. I joined the People's Council, a peace movement which attracted radicals and liberals of every shade of opinion. Almost every night I spoke against the war before tremendous crowds. It seemed that people everywhere were seeking the answer to the one question, what can be done to prevent the country's actual participation in the war? The anti-war groups were totally unprepared for the situation and could give no satisfactory answer. The government, on the other hand, pursued a very cautious policy. The peace groups were allowed to blow off steam with little interference. Government pressure was applied slowly. I believe, from my experience in the anti-war campaign, that decisive in the situation was the outstanding fact that the people, though anxious for peace, were not ready for any violent or revolutionary changes to attain it. The leaders of the anti-war movement, though they all loudly shouted against the war, were not ready to back up their defiance with action. One meeting in particular bears out this point. The government had decided upon conscription. The next day was registration day. The anarchists called a meeting in Hunts Point Palace in the Bronx. The hall was packed to the doors. The stairs leading to the hall were lined with government agents and police. The square outside was a mass of seething humanity upon which the police played powerful searchlights. Tense excitement prevailed. The noise from the crowd outside reached those lucky enough to get in. Alexander Berkman and Emma Goldman were the principal speakers. But neither speaker was able to arouse the crowd, which listened intently to every word they uttered, to the necessary pitch of enthusiasm. The crowd was distinctly disappointed. Why the disappointment? Because both Emma Goldman and Alexander Berkman had failed to give the audience an answer to the question which was uppermost in its mind. The people wanted to know what they were to do tomorrow, the day of registration for conscription. The speakers proposed no concrete action. They merely told their listeners to follow their own conscience. The war had become a grim reality. The Socialist Party entered the political campaign of 1917 expecting to capitalize heavily on the country's anti-war sentiment. I was nominated for the assembly in the 3rd Assembly District of the Bronx. My campaign was directed chiefly against the war. I was threatened with arrest many times. The campaign was successful. I was elected to the assembly by a good majority. For the first and only time in its career the Socialist Party elected ten assemblymen and five members of the Board of Aldermen, polling a record vote in New York City. We ten socialist assemblymen took our office very seriously. We were no mere politicians, we were crusaders, and the assembly was a bigger and better rostrum. We attended all the sessions, even when most of the other members were absent. For example, my democratic neighbor must have been sworn in when I was, on the first day but I never saw him until two or three days before the closing of the term. Our caucus leader was Abraham Shiplikov. We always met in the modest apartment house, where we established our headquarters and in which several of our colleagues lived. We worked out a legislative program of reforms, drew up the bills accordingly and introduced them for passage. But the work of the socialist delegation was of a negative character, its bills completely ignored. Our work was therefore mainly confined to voting against obnoxious bills and criticizing them. We were tolerated but not liked. Our way of thinking, our attitude on public matters, our ideas of what the concern of the government should be were out of harmony with the ideas and attitudes of the Republican and Democratic legislators, from whom it was most difficult to get any attention on matters of interest to the workers and the poor city dwellers generally. The greatest weakness of our legislative activity consisted in the fact that we sought to enact into law our whole socialist platform of reforms, 
instead of concentrating on one or two important political measures. Our second weakness consisted in the fact that we were completely ignorant of the needs of the rural population and were practically unconcerned with its lot, and at that time the farmers of New York State, through their various organizations, exerted considerable influence upon the legislature. When the legislature adjourned I began to take stock of the socialist movement, for the war shook to the very foundations my faith in the movement. I had become firmly convinced that the socialist parties of the warring countries were betraying the interests of the working class, in supporting the war. The Bolshevik Revolution further convinced me that the prevailing position of modern socialism, that socialism could be attained peacefully and through a gradual accumulation of reforms, was wrong. I looked upon the reformist socialists with contempt. I deduced from the war that brutal force and violence were the final arbitrators, and concluded that socialism would come as the result of revolution in which the masses would use force and violence in overthrowing their oppressors. My break with pre-war socialism followed. I became a revolutionary socialist and forthwith joined the ranks of the left wing. I pledged myself to work for the transformation of the socialist party into a revolutionary socialist organization. This was in the spring of 1918. A year later I was expelled from the party. After my expulsion, I was drafted by the left wing to carry on the work of its organization. The Bolshevik Revolution gave the left wing socialists the program they were looking for. The wrecking of the Socialist Party became its first step in winning the socialists for a program of revolution. The splitting of the socialist movement followed quickly. It was much easier to destroy than to build. I engaged in the crime of wrecking the socialist movement. My actions were motivated by the highest ideals and by the belief that I was thereby hastening the victory of socialism. It was not difficult to wreck the American Socialist Party, because its composition was mostly non-American, and the Bolshevik Revolution exerted a profound influence upon its foreign-born membership. In 1918, prior to the split, the American Socialist Party had over 70,000 members in its foreign language speaking federations. These federations dominated, because not only did they control the bulk of the party membership, but also because they had large cultural, economic and financial resources. But the foreign-born members were not all confined to the foreign language federations. Approximately half of the membership of the so-called American or English-speaking branches were likewise foreign-born. It is not an exaggeration to state that in 1918 the bulk of the membership of the American Socialist Party was made up of the foreign-born. About the year 1912, it was evident that the Socialist Party was beginning to take root in the United States. Had this process not been curtailed by the outbreak of the World War and especially by the split up after the Bolshevik Revolution, there is no doubt in my mind that the American Socialist Party would have become an important political party, its activities greatly influencing American life. The party certainly withstood the blows of the war quite well. Unfortunately, it could not help succumbing to the general demoralizing influences and reactionary trends set loose by the war. With its overwhelming foreign-born membership, it could not withstand the impact of the Bolshevik Revolution, for the triumph of Bolshevism electrified the foreign-born, and through them the debook of Bolshevism took hold of the party. Romantics among the native-born succumbed to it along with the comrades whose roots were abroad. For the overwhelming majority of the party, the romantic native-born as well as the others, Bolshevism meant the people's protest against the war and victory for revolutionary socialism. The party, without at once realizing it, was celebrating not only a decisive turning point in international socialism but in American socialism as well. The first news of the Tsar's overthrow was received with great rejoicing. It stimulated above all those elements in the party that comprised the Slavic and Jewish federations, because most of their members hailed from Tsarist Russia. These federations were, the Russian Federation, the Jewish Federation, the Ukrainian Federation, the Lithuanian Federation, the Estonian Federation, the Polish Federation, the Lettish Federation and such allied Slavic federations as the Bulgarian and the Yugoslav. The Slavic language federations began to grow very rapidly. 
those who had immigrated from Tsarist Russia began to look forward to the time when they would return to their native land, and as many as could left for Russia immediately. Among the latter were several staff members of the Novi Mir, Russian socialist paper published in New York, such as, Leon Trotsky, Nicholas Bukharin, Volodysky, who played stellar roles in the Bolshevik Revolution, and lesser luminaries, like Boris Reinstein, for many years active in the Socialist Labour Party, and Bill Shatoff of the I. W. W., as well as scores of other assorted radicals. Notwithstanding the presence of Russian Bolsheviks on our shores, the Socialist Party membership knew very little about Bolshevism prior to 1917, many of us hearing about it that year for the first time. For example, the Socialist Propaganda League, which later became extremely pro Bolshevik, ignored Lenin when he wrote them in 1915, and apparently threw his letter into the waste basket. Only after Lenin's death, when a thorough search was made of Lenin's personal papers, was a draft of the first part of the letter found. After the downfall of the moderate socialist Kerensky, a large section of the party became definitely pro-Bolshevik, all of us of that persuasion believing that Bolshevism was synonymous with the principles of revolutionary socialism and orthodox Marxism. A new defiant spirit rose which drew its inspiration directly from Bolshevik Russia. This new spirit clashed with the spirit that dominated the socialist movement before the war. It needed only a signal from Bolshevik Russia to arouse those imbued with the new spirit to war upon the old. The Russian Bolsheviks wasted no time in giving us the signal. They gave the order that the socialist traitors must be destroyed. We set up the hue and cry against all socialists who refused to accept Bolshevism, and the civil war in the American Socialist Party was on in earnest. Dot of all those who returned from Russia in the early days of the Bolshevik Revolution, John Reed made the greatest impression. Wherever he spoke he was greeted by wildly enthusiastic audiences. I was determined that the people of the Bronx should hear from John Reed the truth about Russia. The old-time socialists of the Bronx organization opposed my proposal for a John Reed meeting. They were afraid that the authorities might break up the meeting and arrest the speakers. But I succeeded in overcoming their opposition, and the meeting was decided upon. In agreeing to speak, John Reed wrote me as follows I shall be glad to accept. I hope that it will be a grand demonstration and that you do not spoil the opportunity by introducing on the platform men who are likely to moderate their protest, or attempt to apologize for the government of the United States in its intervention in Russia. The meeting took place in Hunts Point Palace on September 13, 1918. The place was packed to the doors. Thousands were turned away. That was the largest demonstration for Bolshevik Russia so far held in the United States. I spoke at that meeting before Reed. When I finished, he shook my hand and said he was very glad to make my acquaintance, because for the first time since he had returned to the United States had he heard a truly proletarian speech. That was how we met. I saw that he was nervous, very pleased with the large turnout and bubbling over with enthusiasm. I liked him at once because he was so typically American in his reckless abandon. Besides, his smile was captivating. When he arose to speak, the crowd greeted him wildly, standing, waving red bunting, applauding, cheering to the echo. Reed did not know what to do. He pleaded with them to stop, but they cheered more loudly and demonstratively than before. He turned to us on the platform for advice. But we could not help him. When he finally did get to speak, he spoke simply, with conviction and emotion. Although he was no orator, his earnestness and his fighting mood were truly impressive. At times he fairly leapt off the platform as he spoke. Now and again he dropped a few Russian words, which unfailingly drew loud applause and vociferous cheers from the crowd. His words seemed to carry a genuine message from the land of revolution and a challenge to the whole capitalist world. His descriptions of Red Russia and its people were vivid and indicated that the Russian people in their fight for freedom and a new world had made a deep impression upon him. What was most striking to me was the great impatience that was apparent in his talk. He spoke rapidly, as if in a very great hurry. 
It seemed that John Reed felt that the revolution was near in America and time must not be lost in preparing for it. John Reed's whole demeanor showed that he was certain of it and was eager to play his part in the momentous events that were to take place. After this meeting, John Reed was arrested and later indicted by the federal authorities. But Reed was not the only pilgrim who had seen the Red Star over the New Bethlehem. Many others followed, returning from the wondrous land of Bolshevism with words that set us all aflame. Bolshevism began to sweep the membership of the Socialist Party like a prairie fire. The sober leaders of the Socialist Party, grouped around Morris Hillquit, became very apprehensive of the new current, but they did not dare openly to obstruct its course. They sensed in it the flood that would engulf them. At the beginning they refrained from attacking Bolshevism, and the press which they controlled carried glowing accounts of events in Red Russia. But this calm before the storm did not last very long. The Bolshevik Revolution had given the left wing what it had lacked, a program around which to organize. The left wing was quick to take advantage of this, by claiming for itself the Bolshevik leadership of America. Its organization grew rapidly. New York City became the hotbed of American Bolshevism. The New York left wingers propagandized the country. The fight between the lefts and the rights in the Socialist Party soon took on national proportions. The Socialist Party was divided into warring camps. The lefts looked upon the rights as Mensheviks and counter-revolutionists. Peace between the two factions was out of the question. The Russian Federation of the Socialist Party became the idol of the left wing. We looked upon its membership as the true Bolshevik colonel in the party, little realizing that the Russian Federation members who allocated to themselves the glory of the Bolshevik Revolution had little or nothing to do with it. Many socialists believed that only the Russians understood Bolshevism and were fitted to speak on its behalf. Had they investigated the Russian Federation, they would have discovered that the majority of its large membership had joined after the success of the Bolshevik Revolution, that most of them were actually ignorant of what socialism or Bolshevism really stood for. The leaders of the Russian Federation did nothing to dispel these misconceptions. They wallowed in the esteem accorded them. Not only did they let the American socialists know that when it came to Bolshevism they knew all about it, but they went further and insisted that they alone should be recognized as the leaders of the left wing. The first important step taken in consolidating our organization in the Socialist Party was taken at the convention of the left wing section of the Socialist Party, local Greater New York, held February 16, 1919 in Oddfellows Hall on St. Mark's Place. The small hall was filled to capacity. Great enthusiasm reigned. All the outstanding figures of the left wing were present, including Rose Pastor Stokes, John Reed, Jim Larkin, as well as the leaders of the Russian, Lettish, Lithuanian and other Slavic federations. Louis C. Frayner, an expert in copying the ideas of the Bolshevik leaders and attaching his name to them, prepared the program for the convention under the title, Manifesto and Program of the Left Wing Section of the Socialist Party of Local Greater New York. It had nothing to do with American conditions. It might just as well have been written by the man in the moon. It urged upon the American people the organization of workmen's councils, as the instruments for the seizure of power and the basis for the proletarian dictatorship, which is to replace the overthrown government, workmen's control of industry to be exercised by industrial unions or Soviets, repudiation of all national debts, with provisions to safeguard small investors, expropriation of the banks, expropriation of the railways and the large, trust, organizations of capital, the socialization of foreign trade. What we proposed that the American people should do in 1918 was precisely what the Bolsheviks did after they seized power in Russia. The program was drawn up as if a revolution was around the corner in the United States and would be similar in all its aspects to the revolution in Russia. This manifesto and program proved that we had lost all sense of reality and that we either ignored American conditions as unimportant or were totally ignorant of them. To transform the Socialist Party into a Bolshevik Party, we proposed the elimination of the reform planks in its platform, the building of revolutionary industrial unions the repudiation of the second, the socialist, 
international and the election of delegates to an international conference to be held in Moscow, called by the Communist Party of Russia. Only lunatics or helpless romantics could even consider such a program. We, however, discussed it in all seriousness. We argued with passion over every clause, for we sincerely believed we were preparing a guide for the coming revolution in the United States. Very much seen and heard at the convention was Nicholas Awaich, son of Professor Isaac Awaich, famous economist and authority on immigration. He was the theoretical and ideological leader of the Russian Federation. Probably because his father had been friendly with Lenin in his youth, he actually believed that he was the outstanding exponent of Bolshevism in America. His egotism knew no bounds. When he spoke, his small reddish beard bristled with excitement and he was oblivious of everything else around him. He spoke with great speed, his words jumbled in an incoherent cataract. Behind his thick lenses his eyes flared with nervous tension. Short of stature and impressed with his own importance, he was a ludicrous looking individual dressed in black, pockets crammed full of papers and document, a bundle of newspapers and magazines always under his arm. When, finally, we bundled him off to Russia, to escape arrest, shipping him off as a coal stoker on a vessel Russia bound, he looked upon his departure from the United States as a temporary interlude. But the Communist International willed otherwise. He never returned. At the first left wing convention, there was plenty of talk. Everybody talked. If talk could make revolution, the left wing would have won in the United States. Yet, despite all the debates and wranglings, an organization was actually established and a city committee of 15 elected to carry on its work. This committee consisted of the following Nicholas Iyer each, Fanny Horowitz, J. Lovestone, James Larkin, Harry Hilzik, Edward I. Lindgren, Milton Goodman, John Reed, Joseph Brodsky, Dr. Julius Hammer, Jeanette D. Pearl, Carl Brodsky, Mrs. L. Ravitch, Bertram D. Wolf, and myself. An executive committee was also elected to carry out the daily activities of the organization, composed of the following Nicholas I. R. H., George Lehman, James Larkin, L. Tim Elfab, George C. Vaughan, Benjamin Corsa, Edward I. Lindgren, Maximilian Cohen and me. With the exception of Larkin, Lindgren, and myself, the rest of the members of the executive committee were entirely unknown in the Socialist Party and had never before acted in a leading capacity in the movement. The West Side branch of the Socialist Party, known as the Irish branch, situated at 43 West 29th Street, became our headquarters. A small room there was turned over to the left wing. Here we established also the business and editorial offices of our official paper, the New York Communist, publication of which was started in April, 1919. John Reed was its editor. These headquarters became the center of feverish left wing activity. Soon after the left wing organization was established, Ludwig C. A. K. Martins, who was appointed the official representative of the Soviet government in January, 1919, announced the opening of his bureau at 110 West 40th Street. Martins was a quiet, mild tempered man. He did not look like a Russian. Fair of complexion, with blonde hair and moustache, he looked more like a middle class German businessman than what went for the accepted description of a Bolshevik. He was indeed of German descent and an engineer by profession. He was a member of the Russian Federation and belonged to the faction that did not like our each. He was at a loss as to how to conduct the affairs of his bureau and ended by following two distinct courses. One course sought to placate American businessmen by attempting to convince them that it would be profitable for them to do business with Russia. The other course was to cooperate very closely with the left wing in carrying on Soviet government communist propaganda. I conferred with him often on left wing matters and received from him from time to time financial help for our organization and its press. Martins was not a strong man. He leaned very heavily on his advisers, namely, Santori Nuortva, a Finnish communist. His secretary, Dr. Hammer, whose generous financial assistance made the establishment of the embassy possible, 
and Gregory Weinstein, one of the editors of Novimia. Weinstein was an able writer, well versed in the movement, a good lecturer and speaker and in addition a fairly capable politician. The appointment of Martins and the opening of his embassy led to one of the sharpest controversies in the left wing. The leaders of the Russian Federation, who were very jealous of Martin's appointment, which was especially true of our each, who had personally written to Lenin asking for the appointment tried to gain control of Martin's embassy. They demanded that Martin's and his embassy submit to the supervision and control of a committee set up for that purpose by the Russian Federation. When Martin's refused, they sought to get the left wing officially to endorse their proposal. Nicholas Auer each became the leader of the fight against Martins. Martins' official supporters in the left wing were Dr. Hammer and Gregory Weinstein. The American elements in the left wing did not support Auer each. The one notable exception was Louis C. Freiner, who catered to the leaders of the Russian Federation. He wanted powerful support behind him in the left wing whenever it was necessary. Larkin, Reed and I fought the Russian Federation's attempt to boss Martins. However, there was more to the fight than just that. It was the first sign that some of the American elements in the left wing resented the domination of the Russian Federation leaders. The meetings on the Martins controversy were decidedly violent in character. Nick Hour each, spectacles perched on his thin pointed nose, red with rage, his eyes flashing scorn spoke heatedly in his thick Russian accent. You are Mensheviks, socialist traitors and counter-revolutionists, he shouted at all who dared to oppose him. His followers listened to him as if he were a me-god. They sat taut in their seats, eyeing their opponents with piercing glances of hate. In fighting our each, arguments were useless. Yet I argued for hours. John Reed did likewise till he almost collapsed from exhaustion and exasperation. The meetings never ended before three or four in the morning. When a vote went against the Russian Federation, our each would stand up, fuming with anger, call us counter-revolutionary bastards, after which he would proceed to walk out of the meeting in protest followed by all his supporters, who snarled and cursed at us. But when he discovered that his bolting did not have any effect, he would return at the head of his cohorts, declaring that he returned to do his Bolshevik duty by watching the proceedings in order to prevent us from committing more treachery against the movement. The declaration made, the Martins fight would start all over again. During one of these hectic nights I remember Nick Hour each's consternation when Harry Wynetsky interrupted him and called him an American cadet. Our each knew that in Russia the cadets represented a political party made up of the bourgeoisie, the party of constitutional democrats, outlawed by the Bolsheviks as white guards and counter-revolutionists. He fairly screamed, how dare you call me a cadet? Don't you know that a cadet is a counter-revolutionist? I am a Bolshevik, not a cadet. But, comrade our each, interjected Wynetsky with sweet reasonableness, I said you were an American cadet, not a Russian one. Our each was flabbergasted. What is it you call an American cadet? He demanded. Oh, replied Wynetsky, don't you know? Why, an American cadet is a pimp. In spite of all the dissensions within the left wing, the organization grew to such an extent that the right wing leaders of the Socialist Party became alarmed. They soon realized that if they did not take drastic steps at once, the left wing would take over the party. Hilquit gave the signal for action against the left wing in his famous declaration of clear the decks published in the New York Call on May 21, 1919, on the eve of the meeting of the New York State Executive Committee of the Socialist Party. The meeting took place in Albany. I was present as a member of the State Committee from the Bronx organization. The block of left wing state committee men, all of whom had been elected to the committee before the left wing organization was formed, was on hand. A bitter fight took place over Hillquit's proposals for the reorganization of the party and the expulsion of the left wingers. Hillquit, who had control of the state committee, forced his proposals through, though he did not have the support of the majority of the party membership. One of the left wing bloc, Harry Watton, 
rose and, pointing his finger at Hillquit, shouted, You are right-wing enemies of the revolution. Go ahead with your dirty work. Expel us from the party. We will soon meet you in bloody battles on the barricades. Following that meeting, all members of the left wing were expelled from the Socialist Party and summarily removed from all leading positions and committees. The fight between the lefts and the rights by this time had spread to the entire country. A referendum of the Socialist Party membership had just been completed on the election of a new National Executive Committee and a delegate to the International Socialist Congress. When the results were announced they showed that the left-wing slate had swept the elections and that Hillquit for the first time was beaten as a delegate to the International Congress by Kate Richards O'Hare, who had been endorsed by the left-wing. The left-wing endorsed her because she had been convicted and sent to prison for opposition to the war. She was, however, not a supporter of the left-wing. The old National Executive Committee took the unprecedented action of voiding the elections. They went even further. They suspended all the federations which supported the left wing and expelled the whole Michigan state organization. By this time the split in the Socialist Party was an accomplished fact and the breach between the two factions could no longer be bridged. The left wing immediately took steps to consolidate its forces on a national scale by calling a national conference to be held in New York City on June 21, 1919. But before the conference took place, other troubles were to beset the left wing and the radical labor movement. A reaction against all Reds set in. Returned soldiers were organized into groups whose function it was to attack radical headquarters and newspapers. The socialist call was viciously attacked by such a group. When a report reached the left-wing headquarters that a similar group was coming to attack it, preparations were immediately made to meet the attack. Comrades were hastily gathered together and armed with long iron pipes. Buckets of hot boiling water were kept in readiness. The stairway leading to the first floor was lined with armed men ready to fight to the last man for our headquarters. James Larkin was in charge of the defense forces. I eagerly awaited the attack, as did all those inside. But it never came. At the same time the Lusk Committee, appointed by the New York State Legislature to investigate seditious activities, became active in breaking into socialist and left-wing headquarters, destroying property and stealing cash and records. The left-wing definitely had its hands full. Some supporters were frightened away from the organization by the terror and persecution of those days, but their numbers were few. We managed to keep our forces intact. Our spirit was far from broken by these early attacks. In fact, it was spurred on to greater enthusiasm and sacrifice. The left wing conference was held the very day the Lusk Committee broke into our headquarters on West 29th Street between Broadway and 6th Avenue in New York. This forced the conference into semi-secrecy and made it necessary to move from one hall to another during the sessions, in order to avoid detection. About a hundred delegates were present, representing every important socialist center in the country. Among them was Charles E. Rothenberg, secretary of the Cleveland local of the Socialist Party. It was the first time we in New York had seen him. His fame as a left-wing leader had reached us long before he did. From Ohio also came Alfred Eugene Knt, State Secretary of the Socialist Party there, who later was to become the financial wizard in raising funds for communist purposes. From Kansas came Louis A. E. Catterfeld, a Kansas farmer, prominent in Socialist Party national office affairs, who later became the leader of the underground Communist Party. William Bross Lloyd, Chicago socialist millionaire, was present as was his private secretary, Isaac E. Ferguson, who became the first secretary of the National Left Wing Organization at the close of the conference. Also, James P. Cannon, a member of the I. W. W. and editor of a socialist paper in Kansas City, Missouri. New York sent a large delegation, which included Jim Larkin, John Reed, Rose Pastor Stokes, J. Lovestone, myself and many others. The Russian Federation and the group of Slavic language federations were all represented by delegates, among whom Nikau Ege and Alexander I. Stoklatsky were the most vociferous. 
present also was a delegation headed by Dennis Ebatt, representing the Michigan State Socialist Party, which had just been expelled from the National Party. That the ultimate aim of the left wing in the Socialist Party was to capture the Socialist Party and change it into a Communist Party cannot be denied. The left wing conference was called in order to organize the left wing forces on a national scale in preparation for the National Convention of the Socialist Party. But there were many in the left wing who, for one reason or another, were impatient and wanted to have the Communist Party organized forthwith. The question of the immediate formation of the Communist Party became the most hotly debated question before the left wing national conference rather than the question of what steps to take to organize the forces within the Socialist Party, for which the conference had been called. How did this come about? In New York, one of the prominent leaders of the New York left wing was Harry Watton, who conducted a Marxian study group. His chief lieutenant was Morris Zucker. At the city convention of the New York left wing on the eve of the opening of the national conference, Harry Watton and Morris Zucker argued for the passage of a motion calling upon the national left wing conference to organize immediately the Communist Party of the United States. He argued that the Socialist Party could not be reformed or captured by the left wing, that to work in that direction was a waste of time, the historical moment demanding the immediate formation of a Communist Party. He carried the city convention by storm. Why wait? The membership cried. Let us have the real thing, the Communist Party, right away. The question therefore could not be kept out of the National Left Wing Conference. Not only was Harry Watton present as a delegate supported by a delegation from the city convention, but, what was even more important, the Russian Federation and the group of Slavic federations also favored this step. Opposed to the immediate organization of the Communist Party was the overwhelming majority of the Americans of the left wing, though a few of the American leaders were beginning to compromise on the question because they wished to gain the support of the Russian and Slavic federations. Outstanding in this respect was Louis C. Freiner, whose whole demeanor gave to many the impression that he considered himself the Lenin of America. The others were J. Lovestone, Bertram D. Wolfe, Charles E. Rothenberg and Isaac E. Ferguson. Had the Federation leaders not been afraid of a break at the conference on this question, they would have forced the proposition through. John Reed, Jim Larkin, L. E. Catterfeld, were Jean Knkt, myself and a large enough number of out-of-town delegates fought against the proposal and insisted that only after the National Convention of the Socialist Party had refused to recognize the will of the majority of its members in favor of the left wing should the left wing split the Socialist Party and organize a Communist Party. The National Left Wing Conference did not dare, in the face of the stubborn opposition that developed, to vote in favor of the immediate formation of a Communist Party. When the proposition was defeated, Harry Watton called the delegates betrayers and bolted the conference. Then we passed a resolution calling for the mobilization of the membership to capture the Socialist Party Convention for the left wing. The leaders of the Russian Federation, their supporters in the left wing and the Michigan delegation had no intention of carrying out this resolution, and after the conference adjourned they at once began to organize the split in the Socialist Party by calling for the immediate organization of a Communist Party. The following nine were elected to the National Council, Louis C. Freiner, Boston, Charles E. Rothenberg, Cleveland, Isaac E. Ferguson, Chicago, John J. Ballam, Boston. James Larkin, New York, Eadmund McAlpine, New York, Benjamin Gitlow, New York, Maximilian Cohen, New York, and Bertram D. Wolf, New York. It should be noted that not a single leader of the language federations was included among those elected to the National Council. The federation delegates were in the majority and could easily have dominated the committee. Their omission was not accidental. Nor was it due to the fact that the Russian Federation leaders and the leaders of the other language federations had come to the conclusion that the native elements must take over the leadership of the movement. There was no danger of any such altruism or adherence to principle on their part. It should also be noted that in spite of the fact that the Michigan delegation was a large one and represented one of the largest state organizations, 
not a single representative from Michigan was included in the National Council. The explanation is that the Russian Federation and the group of Slavic federations around it made a deal with the Michigan delegation to go ahead immediately with the organization of a communist party. Though they voted for the decisions of the National Conference to carry on a fight in the Socialist Party, they had a tacit understanding among themselves to sabotage the National Council and the decisions of the conference. That was why they had declined to accept membership on the National Left Wing Council. Immediately after the conference, the National Council of the Left Wing established offices in the same building that housed the headquarters of the New York Left Wing. Isaac E. Ferguson became the secretary. The Revolutionary Age, published in Boston by the Lettish Club, was turned over to the National Council of the Left Wing. I was appointed business manager of the paper. The first issue published by the National Council in New York appeared on July 5, 1919. Then began the era of double dealing, lying, disregard of decisions, breaking of promises, and horse trading for personal gain and position, which has characterized the internal politics of the communist movement to the present day. It seemed as if the newly born Bolshevik leaders in the United States had very little to learn from the ward healers of Tammany Hall. That was the only American thing about them. No sooner was the conference over than evidence began piling up about the duplicity of the language federation leaders. They refused to support the National Council. They openly carried on a vicious campaign against it. They withdrew all financial support and withheld the membership dues to which the council was entitled. The Russian Federation went further. They ordered large bundles of the Revolutionary Age, which they destroyed and then refused to pay for. When the council issued a call for funds it was sabotaged. The leaders of the language federations backed up this campaign against the council by making deals with individual leaders of the national council as to their future positions and jobs in the communist party that they were going ahead to organize. In the early part of July, the Russian and Slavic federation leaders issued a call, together with the expelled Michigan State Socialist Party, for a convention to be held in Chicago on September 1, 1919 for the purpose of organizing the Communist Party. This call was signed by four members of the Michigan Organization and S. Kopnigil of the Lettish Federation, I. Stilson of the Lithuanian Federation and Alexander Stoklatsky, National Secretary of the Russian Federation. The Federation leaders who signed the call looked upon the Michigan Organization as a non-communist group because they laid too much stress on educational activities and attached little importance to the trade unions. Besides, there were too many Native Americans in the Michigan organization. They made the deal with them, however, in order to force certain left-wing leaders into line. When the deal with these left-wing leaders was finally consummated, it was with the understanding that the Michigan crowd was to be eliminated. The split of the Socialist Party was carried through by the Russian Federation with great rapidity. There was a reason for their haste. They hoped to organize a communist party in the United States which they would control and by that fact to become the directors of Soviet policy in the United States and, what is more important, secure control of Soviet appointments for themselves as representatives for the various Soviet agencies to be established in the United States. They actually believed that the Soviet government would appoint only those people who would be recommended by the Communist Party once it was organized and recognized by the Soviet government. On July 27, three weeks after the first issue of the Revolutionary Age appeared in New York, the Russian Federation leaders called a conference in New York, composed of representatives of the National Council and the Central Executive Committee of the Lettish, Lithuanian, Estonian, Ukrainian, Polish and Russian federations. The representatives of the National Left Wing Council were Ferguson and myself. It is necessary to keep in mind that the central committees of the above-mentioned federations formed a so-called Revolutionary Council which was dominated by the leaders of the Russian Federation. This council considered itself the only genuine Bolshevik and trustworthy revolutionary body in the United States. Needless to say, this council had met in caucus before Ferguson and I arrived. It had made all the decisions in advance and from these they had decided to yield not one iota. 
At that time the Russian leaders claimed that a good Bolshevik was one who would not compromise on the smallest point and would fight for that point to the bitter end. These federations represented over 90% of the left wing of the Socialist Party. And they were growing daily because the foreign born workers were joining them in droves. For example, it was a common practice for Alexander Stoklatsky, the national secretary of the Russian Federation, when addressing meetings of Russian workers, to hold up a membership card in the Russian Federation and declare that the card was the equivalent of a passport to Russia, that if any worker wanted to go back to his native country he could only do so by joining the Russian Federation and getting a membership card, the only passport Bolshevik Russia would honor. The members of the Russian Federation, who were anxious to go back to Russia, backed up their leaders, because they did not want to jeopardize their chances and incur the disfavor of their leaders who acted as if they were representative of the new Russian government. This council not only dominated the left wing, it dictated its policies, and sought to exercise complete control over its leaders. It steadfastly maintained that the American comrades could not be trusted because they did not understand Russian Bolshevism. Their reasoning was based on the premise that only those who were born in the territory that formerly comprised the Russian Empire had the attributes that went to make Bolsheviks. When Ferguson and I entered the room we found the other council members already seated solemnly around a long oblong table. Their demeanor was stern and serious. They were the Revolutionary Council and were acting their part. I tried to convince them that the only position to follow was the one adopted by the National Conference. I argued in vain. They sat glued to their seats, waiting with obvious boredom for me to finish. To them it seemed the height of impudence for a mere ignorant American to appeal to them against their dogmatic self-assured wisdom. When I finished speaking, they began to converse among themselves in Russian, not even bothering to give us a translation. Everyone who spoke new English and could speak it and on previous occasions they had done so. But now it was different. After they finished their Russian conversation, they informed us that they rejected the proposals of the National Council. They insisted that the National Council endorse their proposals for organizing a communist party right away. They demanded that we should not participate in the emergency convention called by the Socialist Party. We were then forthwith dismissed from the meeting like two schoolboys who had just received a spanking. Isaac Ferguson was very much distressed. He felt that the National Council should capitulate to the Russian Federation. I pleaded with him to the contrary. His reply to me was, after all, comrade, whenever it comes to a question of revolutionary tactics, I feel inclined to follow the Russian comrades. Have they not lived and been brought up in a country where the revolution has been successful? Today the same intellectual cowardice and lack of independence finds its counterpart in the subservience of present-day communist leaders to Stalin. John Reed was in Chicago at the time, attending the sessions of the newly elected National Executive Committee of the Socialist Party, which the right wing of the Socialist Party refused to recognize. When Reed returned I held a conference with him and Jim Larkin, at which we decided to fight tooth and nail against the Russian Federation and for the decisions of the National Left Wing Conference. On that very day the National Council decided to capitulate to the Russian Federation, Larkin and I being the only members to vote against capitulation. Reed publicly supported our position, though he was not a member of the National Council. Those who capitulated were Freiner, Ruthenberg, Ferguson, Ballam, Dr. Cohen and Wolf. We immediately took the fight to the New York membership. The King's County Socialist Party, the largest single section in the New York left wing, decided to participate in the Socialist Party convention, so did local Queens. We were outvoted by the Manhattan membership, though we carried a number of the branches. In the Bronx we lost the decision by one vote due to the tactics of J. Lovestone, who kept disturbing the meeting and interfering with the vote to such an extent that a number of members left the hall in disgust. John Reed, McAlpine and I resigned from the staff of the Revolutionary Age, because of our opposition to the policy of the National Left Wing Council. On August 15 we launched a paper called The Voice of Labor. John Reed was the editor and I the business manager. This paper made phenomenal headway. 
in a very short time it attracted a paid circulation of over 25,000 copies. About three days before the memorable September 1, 1919, Jim Larkin, John Reed and I discussed the question of going to the Socialist Party convention to represent the New York left wing. Money was needed. Among the three of us we had 50 cents. How to get more? We decided to call a meeting of our supporters immediately, hold elections for delegates to the convention and then and they try to raise the necessary funds. The next day the meeting was held. The three of us were elected delegates and the money was raised to send us to Chicago. I left with Reed for Chicago immediately. John Reed was as jubilant as a college boy going to a football game. It was my first trip to Chicago. I was to see a stretch of the country I had not yet seen. John Reed and I little guessed what the immediate future would hold in store for us. We discussed plans of what we would do. We did not expect to capture the Socialist Party. The split in our own ranks made that impossible. But we were agreed that as a result of our participating at the Socialist Party convention we would get the support of the radical element in the Socialist Party to build a genuine American Communist Party, for which we believed there was a great need. Both Reed and I in our discussions on the train had come to the conclusion that with the Russian Federation and the other language federations dominating the movement, no movement that was worthwhile could be founded. The American Communist Party, we decided, had to be an American party led by Americans, in the same way that the Bolshevik Party was a Russian party led by Russians. A little over a month before, the left wing had formulated a program at its national conference. All the left wing leaders who were soon to launch the communist movement were present and helped to formulate it. This program, as we have seen, gives an insight into the minds of the communists in 1919, and what they stood for. The national left wing program was an elaboration of the program of the New York left wing. It was, however, more specific on three important points, first, in its definite break with the official socialist movement and non-communist working class political organizations, as for example a Labour Party, second, indefinitely opposing the American Federation of Labour and calling for the splitting of that organization, third, by its disavowal of democracy. The program, in its entirety, was nothing more or less than a declaration of war against democratic government, the Socialist Party and the trade union movement. On the Labour Party and the Socialist Party it stated a Labour Party is not the instrument for the emancipation of the working class, its policy would in general be what is now the official policy of the Socialist Party, reforming capitalism on the basis of the bourgeois parliamentary stage. There can be no compromise either with liberalism or the dominant moderate socialism. From this language it is clear that the left wing was preparing for a war to the bitter end against all non-communist working class political organizations. On the American Federation of Labor the program went on to say our task is to encourage the militant mass movements in the A. F. of L to split the old unions, to break the power of unions which are corrupted by imperialism and betray the militant proletariat. The existing trade unions were considered instruments of American imperialism which must be split and destroyed. On democracy the program clearly declared in former democracy, the bourgeois parliamentary state is in fact an autocracy the dictatorship of capital over the proletariat. The proletarian revolution disrupts bourgeois democracy. Which must be destroyed. On my way to Chicago I certainly could not foresee that Bolshevism, seeking a monopoly of the labor movement by the destruction and annihilation of all non-communist working class organizations and advocacy of proletarian dictatorship. by the destruction of existing progressive forces of civilization and its opposition to democratic principles, was preparing the way for reaction in the form of fascism. I was convinced that Bolshevism was a system of revolutionary theory and practice which would enable the working class to overthrow capitalism and institute socialism. I was going to Chicago to build a Bolshevik party for the United States. I foresaw that many difficulties would have to be overcome, 
but entertained no doubts as to the ultimate success of the cause to which I had devoted my life. John Reed, I am sure, entertained very optimistic views as to the future success of the communist venture in the United States. I listened to him talk about his plans for the future, of his trip to Russia after the Chicago conventions. He sensed then that Moscow was destined to play a very important part in the development of the communist movement. That Moscow would set itself up as the undisputed boss of the movement he did not and could not at that time foresee. We arrived in Chicago in the morning and rented a room at the Atlantic Hotel. Here we stayed until the convention was over. Chicago was the journey's end for the left wing of the Socialist Party. It also marked the end of the period which owed its inspiration to the war and to the early phases of the Bolshevik Revolution. The movement attracted many of the best and most militant elements of the Socialist Party. These, however, were not attracted by a consideration of the needs of the country and of the American working class. Because of the apparent success of the Bolshevik Revolution, its championship of socialism, and its open declarations against war, they accepted its principles even though in so doing they abandoned positions they had steadfastly maintained as to the democratic foundations upon which socialism must rest. Attracted also were many youthful elements who became inspired with the romance of the Russian Revolution but who had little or no idea of what socialism or Bolshevism really was. The base of the movement was provided by the membership of the Russian Federation and the other Slavic federations, the majority of whom were motivated by nationalist emotion rather than socialist conviction. To these must be added a considerable group of adventurist, unprincipled job-seeking individuals, mostly confined to the leadership who expected the revolution to spread rapidly throughout the world and hoped thereby to bask in its glory. Besides, many of them realized that there were many advantages to be gained by breaking with the socialist movement and tying up with a new movement that would be connected with the ruling class of such a mighty country as Soviet Russia. Among all those I met at the time in the left-wing movement I cherish most my association with John Reed and Gimelakin. With John Reed I worked closely on the Revolutionary Age, the Voice of Labor and the New York Communist. We were independent rebellious spirits at that time. The Communist International and the Moscow leaders had not yet put us into party straitjackets. We mixed the seriousness of our work with adventure and play. An idea struck us to publish a fake socialist. It was done. An exact replica of the socialist was printed. The articles were written by John Reed and E. Admin McAlpine. The bundle was deposited at the Rand School Bookstore. When the right-wing socialists bought it and began to read the contents, they fumed and protested at their own editorial board, only to discover the hoax later by recognizing a slight difference in the type used. For that exploit we were charged with forgery by the right wing. We, however, enjoyed a good laugh at the seriousness with which they took the incident. Then there was the attempt to liberate Eugene V. Debs from Mountsville prison by force. Jim Larkin organized all the preliminaries. In on the scheme were Jim Larkin, members of the Irish Republican forces, who were to carry out the plan, John Reed, Louis C. Frayner and I. On the day the plan for Debs' liberation was to be carried out, and without Debs' knowledge, the authorities transferred him from Mountsville, West Virginia, prison to Atlanta, Georgia. John Reed and I also worked on a bold but fantastic plan to break the blockade of Soviet Russia with an American merchant ship loaded with food. John had succeeded in interesting a captain who was ready to run his ship, flying the American flag, through the blockade established by the British and French naval authorities. The United States had not joined the blockade. Martins agreed to defray the expenses of equipping the ship with a cargo of foodstuffs. He was afraid to take the responsibility of hiring the captain and the ship specifically for that purpose. We therefore tried to raise the money through private sources. We did not succeed, because those with money who professed to be friends of Soviet Russia either refused or were afraid to underwrite the expedition. Because of the nature of the proposed exploit the funds could not be raised publicly. The cause then was uppermost in our minds. Other things mattered not. John Reed often wondered about penniless. 
I received just enough money for the barest necessities. Regular wages were out of the question. But we worked all hours of the day and night. No time was taken off for careful planning, indeed, there was no time for serious thinking, let alone constructive planning. We were in a fight right now against the Socialist Party which was a preliminary to the revolutionary struggles which were to follow. We failed to give serious attention to the fact that on the eve of the Chicago conventions the country was going through a hysterical red scare. The Attorney General's office under the supervision of A. Mitchell Palmer was exploiting the red scare for all it was worth. The Seattle general strike and the Winnipeg general strike and the many outlaw strikes that broke out in defiance of government edicts and the express orders of the labor leaders increased the hysteria against the Reds. Attacks upon our meetings and headquarters by men dressed in the uniforms of the returned soldiers, aided by government agents and police, were common occurrences. Every device for stirring up anti Red sentiment was employed. Plots were unearthed, bombs discovered and some even exploded. The anti-red hysteria was fanned into a high pitch of frenzy by reactionary politicians who hoped thereby to gain political advancement, by all the open shop and anti-labor interests of the country, by a large section of the press and by labor spy agencies, who now saw a splendid chance to sell their stock in trade to the industrial interests. Certain wealthy individuals were also persuaded by these spy agencies that their persons and possessions were an immediate danger of a Bolshevik revolution. Lumped together as Reds were all factions of the Socialist Party, the I. W. W., the anarchists, liberals, and trade unionists. This atmosphere permeated the city of Chicago on the eve of the three conventions which marked the split of the Socialist Party and the organization of the Communist movement. If we who had participated at the three conventions had been awake to the situation confronting the labor movement, we would have come to Chicago with only one purpose in mind, to unite our forces in order that we might more effectively fight the wave of reaction which was sweeping the country but there was not one among us who gave the question of unity a thought. We drifted with the prevailing tide. To us the internal war in the Socialist Party was of the utmost importance. It alone mattered, for we believed that its outcome would to a very large extent determine the course of the social revolution in the United States. The Socialist Party convention took place at Machinists Hall, 113 South Ashland Boulevard, on the second floor of the main auditorium. The left-wing convention, which culminated in the organization of the Communist Labor Party, took place on the first floor of the same building, in the room which the left-wing delegates had hired for caucus purposes. The Russian Federation's Communist Party convention was held at Smolny, named after the headquarters of the Bolshevik government in Petrograd, the Chicago Smolny being the headquarters of the Russian Federation. Max Eastman characterized this convention as the Slavic American Communist Convention. As soon as our bags were deposited, Reed and I went to Machinists Hall to meet the other left wing delegates and to organize our forces for the Socialist Party Convention. We arrived at the hall bright and early. Comrades Catterfeld and Wajin Kunt had made all arrangements for registering the left wing delegates and for holding caucus meetings. The Socialist Party convention was to open that morning. The Arrangements Committee was meeting during the morning at the national headquarters of the Socialist Party. We had dispatched a number of comrades there to find out what were the plans of the right-wing old guard for the convention. We soon found out that delegates had to register at the national headquarters, where only those who were not contested would be allowed to sit in the convention as accredited delegates. Each delegate who was approved by the Arrangements Committee received a white card of admission. As soon as we found this out, we called together a hurried caucus of our delegates. Only a few were present. It was clear to us that by this arrangement the old guard was determined to exclude a sufficient number of our delegates to maintain a majority for itself. The Democratic Socialists, as they liked to call themselves, in an emergency which threatened their control of the party, quickly found ways to overthrow democratic procedure. We decided that they should not succeed in excluding the left-wing delegates. 
The strategy we worked out was that as many left-wing delegates as it was possible to summon together should immediately enter the convention hall and take their seats. These delegates were to be prepared, when the convention was called to order, to participate in all the preliminaries of organizing the convention, namely, in the election of a temporary chairman and the election of a credentials committee to determine who were the delegates entitled to vote. But the old guard had much more convention experience than we had. Their convention forces were manipulated by Julius Gerber, the secretary of the New York County Organization of the Socialist Party. A man with years of experience in party organization and conventions, Gerber was alive to all moves and left nothing to chance. No sooner had we entered the hall than Gerber came rushing in, ordering all to leave. I was in the rear of the hall when John Reed and Gerber engaged in a tussle. It did not last long. The arrangements committee had seen to it that police were on hand, and with their aid all of us were cleared out of the hall and the doors locked. Reed immediately drew up a protest regarding the use of the police, which the executive board of the Die and Toolmakers Lodge No. 113 signed and presented the next day to the Socialist Party Convention. This protest stated in part we call upon you to take steps to remove the police or make such arrangements as will satisfy us that you are not responsible for the presence of the police. We are not asking this to put hardships on you but for the best interests of the Socialist Party and the labor movement in general. The Socialist movement as well as the trade union movement looked upon the police with disfavor, for it was an unwritten law to exclude police from the internal affairs of the Socialist Party and the trade unions also. In resorting to the police, the old guard showed how desperate was its position. Without police assistance, they would have had to submit to the organization of the convention by the left wing, which would have been in a majority, or else bolt their own convention. How strong the left wing delegation was, is indicated by the vote for chairman of the convention. Seymour Stedman, a lawyer from Chicago, received 88 votes, and Joseph Coldwell of Rhode Island, a left wing delegate, received 37 votes these representing the number of left-wing delegates who had received white cards and were allowed to take their seats. At the left-wing caucuses there were present about 100 delegates from 23 states, most of them representing English-speaking sections of the Socialist Party and a good cross-section of the country. When the Socialist Party convention voted down a motion of its left-wing delegates that action on the contested delegates be taken up as the first order of business, the left-wing delegates bolted the convention. Though the emergency convention of the Socialist Party opened on Saturday morning, August 30th, the convention of the excluded left-wing delegates which founded the Communist Labour Party did not officially open until September 1st after the excluded California delegation had submitted a statement to the Socialist Convention which we drew up, and which ended as follows that unless the convention takes the above action, action on contested delegates, before transacting other business, the delegates from California, representing the overwhelming sentiment of their constituents, do join with the delegates refused seats and the comrades of the expelled and suspended federations and states in the immediate formation of a real revolutionary socialist party in the United States, the Communist Party of America, and we urge all comrades having the good of the working class of the United States and the world at heart to at once leave this reactionary convention and repair to the floor below to help us organize the proletariat of America for the final victory over capitalism. The few remaining left-wing delegates at the Socialist Party convention bolted after the reading of this alternate statement. Downstairs they were met by a cheering, excited crowd of the left-wing section of the Socialist Party. The convention was called to order. Delegates and visitors rose spontaneously. Our singing of the international fairly shook the building and ended with thunderous applause for revolutionary socialism and communism. John Reed and I made up a steering committee of two during our stay in Chicago. We worked out every detail of strategy together. In our tactics, we consulted during the lunch periods with Max Eastman, who was reporting the conventions for the Liberator. At these mealtime conferences there was often present, besides Eastman, Henry M. Tikuna, who owned and edited a socialist paper called The Melting Pot. 
We dined together at a Chinese restaurant on West Madison Street. Eastman usually gave us good advice, some of which we accepted. He was not so sure that the course we had mapped out would suit America. In the main he was in sympathy with what we were doing, but critical. Reed was all enthusiasm. He seemed to be driven by an impatience and a desire for action rather than calm deliberation. But he knew his shortcomings, the fact that he was new in the political movement, and he readily sought advice and accepted it. Our meetings at the Chinese restaurant were not confined to the politics of the convention. Reed liked to reminisce about his rich experiences and adventures. He never tired of telling about his experiences as a war correspondent in Germany and how he used to embarrass the representatives of the general staff and the foreign office. However, when Reed spoke about the I. W. W. His eyes would sparkle with delight, his words expressing a deep sympathy and love for the organization. The I. W. W. was part of the fiber that made up John Reed. He knew it and had been in it in its days of fighting activity and romance. The I. W. W. strikes thrilled him. The free speech fights, and the heroic struggles of the Willies in the ball pens, were reminiscent of the bold, pioneer spirit of the West, and John Reed was of the West. This movement of roving workers, traveling up and down the country in carefree abandon, militant and anarchistic in their defiance of authority and exploitation, struck a responsive chord in John Reed. Besides the I. W. W. was a movement of action and song, the songs that always stirred within his poetic breast. Max Eastman on these occasions was usually restrained, his humor subdued and philosophical. Tekner, when he was present, was the life of the party. Reed used to lean over the table, the better to hear this man of the Middle West, in appearance like Clarence Darrow, tell his ribald stories. He used to roar with glee at their simple, sturdy humor. The convention of the Russian Federation Communists opened up at the Smolny on September 1st. No sooner was Freyner elected chairman of the convention than the factional struggle broke loose. There were three factions represented the Russian Federation, which, together with the other Slavic federations, controlled the largest block of votes. The Michigan delegation, which disagreed with the Russian Federation on what a communist party should be, but united with it in splitting away from the Socialist Party, and the English-speaking delegation, which had violated the decisions of the National Left Wing Conference in order to go along with the Russian Federation in organizing the Communist Party. The convention was therefore conducted on the basis of negotiations among the caucuses representing these factions. The delegates tried to create the impression that they alone represented the true and genuine communist forces of the country. They soon denounced the other conventions in Chicago in typical communist style, classifying the emergency convention of the Socialist Party as right-wing, the Communist Labor Party convention as the expression of American centrism and their own as the real left, the true Bolshevik convention. In the unity negotiations with the Communist Labor Party, they gave ample expression of their self-glorification as the saints of communism. They claimed that they represented the only conscious communist elements. The proposal of the Communist Labor Party to unite the two conventions in order that only one communist party should emerge from Chicago they rejected by a vote of 75 to 31. The Rothenburg minority, by splitting the national left wing under pressure from the Russian Federation, was largely responsible for the chaos which prevailed in Chicago. The Russian Federation would never have issued the call for the organization of a communist party in defiance of the English speaking membership if the Rothenburg group had not gone along. For all their disdain for the Americans, they realized that without an English-speaking wing they could not organize a communist party in the United States. True, they united with the Michigan delegation to force a split in the left wing. But they neither trusted the Michigan comrades nor considered them communists. At the Chicago convention the Russian Federation began to tighten its hold on the Rothenburg faction. Against the obstinate wall of Russian Federation delegates, little could be done. 
Rothenburg therefore sought the admission of the Communist Labour Party convention delegates on the basis of equality. With them added, a better showing could be made against the Russian Federation majority. However, the question of unity was not looked upon as a question of principle but as a political question involving merely the jockeying for power at the convention. When defeated upon this question, the Rothenburg faction staged a sit down strike. All its members who held convention positions and membership on committees resigned. Ferguson, reporting the convention in the Communist, the official organ of the Communist Party, of September 27 characterized the act as follows. The minority strike on the job had its quick effect. But this effect did not bring about the unity of the communist forces. It had the effect of forcing the Russian Federation to come to an understanding with the Rothenburg faction. And in the deal that was made, unity with the Communist Labour Party was forgotten. That the Rothenburg faction never took unity of the communist forces seriously is further brought out in the first number of the official organ of the Communist Party edited by Freiner and Ferguson, both members of this faction at the convention, which declared editorially that there are communist elements in the Communist Labour Party is a fact, and particularly the comrades of the Pacific Coast. But it is equally a fact that these comrades have the opportunity of affiliating with the Communist Party. They are now being misled by the law Katafeld were gene concentrists and by the Reed Carney emotionalists. What was not reported, however, was the fact that the Russian Federation was prepared to admit John Reed the emotionalist to their convention, but under no circumstances was I to be admitted. I was to be driven completely out of the movement, because of my opposition to Russian domination. This final proposal was submitted to Reed personally by Rothenberg. He had hoped by informing Reed of this fact to cause a break between us and bring about the downfall of the Communist Labour Party convention. Reed immediately took up the matter with me, never for one moment leaving any doubt that he scorned the offer and detested its motives. I think that Ferguson, officially reporting the convention for the party in its official press, characterized it more properly than he intended, in saying for one thing the fact that the Federation delegates were largely Slavic emphasized the close union between the organization of the Communist Party here and the parent organization which came into being at Moscow in March of this year, the Communist International. It was the Russian expression of Marxism which predominated this convention, the Marxism of Lenin and the party traditions of the Bolsheviki. The Communist Party organized in Smolny Institute, Chicago, was dominated by foreign-born workers and owed its organization entirely to Russian Bolshevik inspiration. The Communist Party I helped to organize at the same time, though its delegates represented the American elements in the left wing of the Socialist Party, also owed its organization to the same inspiration. The difference between the Communist Party and the Communist Labour Party was evident in the desire of the Communist Labour Party to apply what it believed to be Bolshevism to American conditions. The Communist Party, on the other hand, was oblivious of America. Its heart was in Russia and its head full of Bolshevik abstractions. The closing days of the Communist Labour Party convention took place at one of the I. W. W. headquarters on Throop Street. Before every session Reed and I discussed questions of policy. Reed, more than I, understood that we would face a fight in Moscow on the question of recognition by the Communist International. He realized that he would have to gain recognition of the Communist Labour Party by overcoming the opposition of the Communist Party. Because of the fight for recognition that would have to be fought out in Moscow, we were very careful to hew close to what we believed to be Bolshevism. This brought about a clash between us and the American delegates from the Middle West and other states, who although opposing the policies of the right wing of the Socialist Party, were not yet fully prepared to accept what we presented to them as revolutionary socialism and Bolshevism. At the same time, we had to counteract the charge that we were a centrist organization. This brought us into conflict with a small group of Eastern delegates, who refused to accept the theories of Bolshevism in their entirety like Louis B. Baudin and Ludwig Law, who had maintained an independent position in the left-wing controversy. These elements were branded as centrists, because they preferred to take a position to the left of social democracy, 
yet hesitated in accepting the extreme positions of Bolshevism. The Russian Bolsheviks directed their fire at this time against the centrists, insisting that their influence had to be destroyed first, if the world revolution was to be successful. To be called a centrist was the most damning charge that could be hurled against a communist. Our task was therefore twofold. We had to induce the convention to adopt our Bolshevik program and in addition defeat the so-called centrists, notably Law and Bowdin. We succeeded by the sheer weight of argument and oratory in overcoming the opposition of the Western delegates to the program. But Bowdin was obstinate. He had the reputation of being one of the foremost Marxian scholars in the socialist movement. He argued that the program was un-Marxian that it was in total disagreement with the communist manifesto of Marx and Engels. He had delivered a terrific attack just before adjournment for lunch. John Reed was very much worried. As we went to the Chinese restaurant to eat, he turned to me and said, Ben, we must do something to kill the effect of Bowden's speech. He made a deep impression. I don't know what to say in answer to him. Don't worry, I said. I have the Communist Manifesto with me, and I have just the quotation you need to show up bowed in. We sat down at the table and I showed him the quotation. His eyes sparkled with glee. He could not wait for the time when he was going to spring his surprise. As soon as the convention reopened John Reed asked for the floor. He launched a sharp attack upon bowed in, and ended by flashing his copy of the Communist Manifesto and read from it to prove that Bowden did not know what he was talking about. Bowden shouted back, all excited, let me see that copy. Reed handed it to him. He read it, hesitated, and then exclaimed that it was a poor and false translation from the original German. 1. I followed up the attack. In reporting the incident, Max Eastman stated therefore, it was a practical, as well as theoretical, triumph for the majority when Ben Gitlow, walking up to the front of the hall like a great somber mountain unloosed the crackling thunder of his eloquence to the effect that Bowden had deliberately employed his knowledge of Marx to destroy and dilute the scientific integrity of this platform, and Bowden, crying it's a damn lie, got up and fled like a leaf out of the storm. When Bowden grabbed his portfolio under his arm, took up his cane and fled from the hall I was relieved and John Reed chuckled with glee. We had demonstrated how to deal effectively with centrists. But our troubles were not yet over. Ludwig Law was elected to the National Executive Committee. This came as a distinct surprise. John Reed became panicky. I also realized the gravity of our situation. The Slavic Federation's Communist Party would seize upon the election of law as convincing proof that the Communist Labour Party was a party of centrism. Something had to be done. I was a good parliamentarian. Comrade Wojciech Kunkt was chairman of the session. When he announced the complete results of the balloting, he asked if there were any objections or reasons why the vote should not stand. I directed Reed to object and state his reasons. Meanwhile, I rushed to the back of the platform, got hold of Wojciech Kunkt and Katterfeld, and explained to them why the election of law would be bad for us. A motion to reconsider the elections was carried. I spoke on the kind of an executive we needed and explained why law should not be elected. On the second balloting law was defeated and our Bolshevik skirts were clean. I did not run for the executive and neither did Reed. I knew that if I had accepted, the Communist Party would have charged that I split the Communist forces because I wanted to be elected to the National Executive Committee. I preferred not to give them that opportunity. Instead, I ran for the Labour Committee and received the highest vote. John Reed, as had been planned, ran for international delegate and was elected. When Reed and I came to Chicago together, we were determined not to capitulate to the Russian Federation. We were out to build an American Communist Party, a party that would make the revolution in the United States as the Bolsheviks had made it in Russia. I had put my whole being into the work of organizing such a party. Throughout the convention I labored with that one object in mind. I was very serious in my purpose and fostered no personal ambitions. The leadership which came to me I accepted, fully conscious of its responsibilities. 
I was 26 years old at the time. What spurred me on were not the cold abstractions of theories, nor political ambitions. Injustice, human suffering, the callous exploitation of workers, the brutality of our system and the useless extermination of human life were the basic motivating causes of my rupture with capitalism. I treasured human values above all other considerations. It was for safeguarding these human values that I had become first a socialist, then a communist. Reporting the Chicago conventions, Max Eastman wrote in part, the most powerful figure in the militant group, and the best speaker, I should say, in all three conventions, was Ben Gitlow. But Max Eastman evidently had not seen in Chicago a stranger who left a lasting impression on me, a certain minister, his garb old and threadbare who came to one of our caucus meetings and whose name I never learned. He was very much disturbed over what was going on. He accosted me, why, I don't know, and in all seriousness said, what is taking place here will not end well for the labor movement. It means strife, internal conflict, frightful suffering, eventually, war and devastation. The manner in which he said it struck home. Here was a socialist who was wrought up over what was happening to the socialist movement. He spoke in a low voice, with no venom. There was a note of sadness in his tone, as if some great personal tragedy was in store for him. Through all these years I have not forgotten his words. The sincerity with which he said them impressed me. The marks of poverty were clearly expressed on his haggard face. He looked at me and at all the world with a calm saddened stare. Perhaps I thought for a moment that he might be right. A comrade passed by and jeeringly asked me what the sky pilot had to say. I just shrugged my shoulders. Yet in more than one way, his words have come true. Before the Russian Revolution the left wing of the Socialist Party was pro I. W. W. In its sentiment. The left wing felt that the I. W. W put into practice the tactics of revolutionary socialism. It was therefore no wonder that the Chicago conventions were greatly influenced by the I. W. W. At the same time what was going on in Chicago also had an effect upon the I. W. W. When the Communist Labor Party convention was transferred to the I. W. W. Hall, the willies gathered at the rear of the hall and closely followed what went on. Many of them realized the new movement was going to play an important part in the growth of the I. W. W. A number of the I. W. W. Members said that the communist movement was dynamite for the I. W. W. That it would end in wrecking their movement. A number of them were obviously impressed and took the position that the communist movement was adding that understanding of government and politics that was lacking in the I. W. W. John Reed and I took the first opportunity we had, during a lull in the convention, to visit William D. Haywood at the general headquarters of the I. W. W. On West Madison Street. Haywood, in his shirt sleeves, was seated at his desk. He was very glad to see us. Reed he knew well, but he met me for the first time. He was now an old man in appearance, and when he looked with his one eye through his spectacles it was difficult to realize that here was a man whose whole life from boyhood on was a struggle against adversity on behalf of labor. He spoke in a low musical voice. The conventions that went on in Chicago interested him very little. The I. W. W was uppermost in his mind, and most important was the job of organizing a defense for the I. W. W. Boys in prison. Haywood had just been released from jail on bail pending an appeal on his case. He had been convicted in August, 1918, together with 99 other members of the I. W. W. Charged with interfering with the progress of the war. The war was over now but the conviction still stood. He went into detail, telling what he was doing to organize the defense forces and raise the necessary funds for legal and other purposes. I could see from the way he spoke that he was deeply affected by the fate of his fellow workers. 
Haywood impressed me very much by the simplicity of his character. His sensitive feelings revealed a big man with a big heart. There was, however, a little note of pessimism in his voice. He was somewhat discouraged at the losses the I. W. W. had sustained. He was a little troubled about his future, intimating that if he returned to prison he would end his days there. He asked us to help in the defense of the I. W. W. prisoners, because only through a display of working class solidarity could their release be obtained. When asked about his opinion of the Russian Revolution, he replied, Yes, it seems they have done a good job in Russia. We asked him to acquaint himself with what was going on in Chicago and with the communist movement. He said he had been busy working on the defense, but certainly would look into the matter at the first opportunity. I saw him again one evening at the I. W. W. headquarters in front of Jackson Park. Here a large frame house with a veranda had been converted into an I. W. W. hall. The place was full of willies, many of whom were dressed in overalls. They gathered in groups on the porch, arguing among themselves. In one corner Haywood was reclining on a rocker. Grouped around him were a score of wallies. He did not look at all like the robust fighting miner that he was when I first saw him in New York. With his spectacles and the bald spot bordered by fringes of light blonde hair here and there turning gray, he looked more like a genial retired locomotive engineer from the Middle West. Their willies looked up to him like a father. In fact, his demeanor towards them was like that of a grandfather to his loving grandchildren. I greeted him. It was the last time I greeted him in America. When next I saw him he was in exile in Moscow. The conventions finished, the following remained the result of their deliberations, the Socialist Party, which it had taken many years to build, was decimated, while the communist movement was started with three splits at its birth, namely, the Communist Party, dominated by the Russian Federation, the Communist Labour Party, consisting of the English-speaking representatives of the left wing of the Socialist Party, and the Michigan State Socialist Party, which soon became the Proletarian Party of America. Our communist message fell upon deaf ears, as far as the American people were concerned. But our failure to impress the American people did not prevent our penetration of the labor movement. The Chicago experience did not only represent a split in the Socialist Party, it represented much more than that, it registered the official date when we started the civil war in the labor movement. This war has become more general with the growth of the communist movement, wider and more violent in its scope. It has divided the working class, raised havoc among the liberals and sown dissension in all ranks. Before the Chicago conventions the left wing had approximately 60,000 members. Most of them were foreign born belonging to the foreign language speaking federations of the Socialist Party. About a tenth, roughly, 6,000 members, were either American born or belonged to the English speaking branches. Of these, many were psychologically unfit for a revolutionary movement that sought to constitute itself the government of the United States. After the Chicago conventions both communist parties were even more foreign born in their complexion than the left wing had been. The splits in Chicago scattered the 60,000 left-wingers. Only a fraction of this number joined the new communist parties. The return home from Chicago was that of armies with few laurels to show, tired and exhausted, straggling from the field of combat, their ranks greatly decimated. The Socialist Party, which boasted over a hundred thousand members before the split, was left with somewhat over 25,000. The Communist Labour Party and the Communist Party together had slightly less than that. But what stands out as a result of the Chicago experience is the Russian character of the movement. The determination of the Russian Federation to control the movement out of Russian nationalist considerations certainly characterized its early phases. When better contact was established with Soviet Russia and the Communist International, the Russian heritage was not cast off. The party did not become more American, but instead more Russian. The Russians still rule, 
although the dominance of the Russian Federation has been done away with and their leaders have been replaced by American leaders. For the Russians now rule from Moscow. Their decisions and orders must be obeyed. The American Communist Party is only a tool in their hands, its leaders their puppets, who must dance to every tune they play. John Reed and I had fought against the domination of the Russian Federation, little realizing that what we were fighting against was only a danger signal of what was yet in store for us. On our way back to New York I took the opportunity of the long train ride to relax from the strain and excitement of the Chicago days. I had some forebodings of the future. I told John Reed that we were not going to have an easy time of it, that the rank and file would not be pleased by the turn of events in Chicago. Many of them in Chicago had expressed themselves to me. They were dissatisfied. They blamed the personal ambitions of the leaders for the split in the movement. But Reed was not troubled by what I had to say. I ended by saying, the die has been cast. We will have to fight the thing through. Reed, however, was jubilant. He often remarked, Ben, we have a communist party and I think a good Bolshevik program for America. Moscow will have to sit up and take notice of us. He now spoke as the international delegate of the Communist Labour Party of the United States. He repeatedly kept harping on the fact that he must go to Moscow without delay to present the party's credentials to the Bolsheviks and to affiliate it with the Communist International. My mind was on what we must do to build the party in the United States, John reads on how to get recognition for it from Moscow. Chapter 2 the Red Raids of 1919 The Communist Labour Party first established its national headquarters in Cleveland, but soon afterwards moved to New York, where its headquarters were established at 108 East 12th Street, in a house rented for us by Dr. Julius Hammer, who not only paid the rent but later bought the house and turned it over to our party. Here we also established the headquarters of the Labour Committee, which I headed, the business and editorial offices of the Voice of Labor, which was the organ of the Labor Committee, edited by John Reed and managed by myself, and the New York City headquarters of the party. Before the office was actually established, John Reed, as had been decided, left for Moscow. The necessary money was raised by Max Eastman, the necessary sailors' papers secured through the efforts of Jim Larkin, for Reed was leaving for Europe as a stoker. One night, dressed in his work clothes, Reed hurriedly came in and said goodbye. It was his last farewell, for I was never to see him again. The Communist Labour Party had its hands full in getting started. All kinds of difficulties were in the way. The factional fight with the Communist Party not only took up a great deal of time but also drove many members away from us. The reaction in the country was becoming more pronounced. On October 16th, the secretary, organizers and editors were arrested and charged with violating the anti-syndicalist laws. This happened at an organization meeting in Cleveland. From all over the country we received reports of the hostility of the federal and local authorities. The press kept up an incessant barrage against us. Many of our meetings were either broken up or prohibited. Our activities, and especially the activities of our rival, the Communist Party, helped to add oil to the flames and gave the reaction every reason to proceed against us. We openly called for the violent overthrow of the United States government. We isolated ourselves by attacking the A. F. of L. as an agent of the capitalist government and calling upon the workers to build new unions that would not be afraid to use their economic power for revolutionary purposes. When strikes took place we called upon the workers to turn them into revolutionary channels, the Communist Party actually calling upon them, as it did in the strike of the Brooklyn streetcar men, to overthrow the government and establish Soviets. We existed in a state of semi-legality, always expecting to be attacked and arrested. On November 7 most of the meetings we organized for the celebration of the anniversary of the Bolshevik Revolution were prohibited by the police who saw to it that the halls we had hired remained darkened and closed. Most of us however did not realize how far both the local and national government was prepared to go. We knew that the Lusk Committee was busy investigating us, 
but we did not expect that the investigations would soon lead to arrests and indictments. We were therefore caught by surprise when the famous Lusk Committee raids came. On the night of November 8, I was addressing a meeting of the Lettish Club in Upper Manhattan in celebration of the Russian Revolution. In the middle of my speech about fifty police, detectives and operatives swooped down upon us in the name of the Lusk Committee. All the men present were lined up against the wall and searched for membership cards. I had some confidential papers in my possession which involved Ludwig Martens, the official Soviet representative to the United States. I slipped them out of my pocket and dropped them behind the radiator in front of which I was standing. When the examination was over about twenty-five of us were huddled into a patrol wagon and taken to police headquarters. But we were not a dejected crowd. We were in the best of spirits. We were, after all, revolutionists, ready to sacrifice all for the revolution, so that a mere arrest and a ride in a patrol wagon was a trifling incident. The police headquarters was alive with excitement. Policemen and detectives were running to and fro. We were taken to a large room, which to me looked like an auditorium capable of seating a thousand persons. Many comrades from all parts of the city were already there. Nobody knew what it was all about. New batches of comrades were being brought in continually. Soon after I arrived Jim Larkin was brought in. He was given a seat next to me. On the platform in front of the room was seated Archibald Stevenson, the counsel for the Lusk Committee and actually its head, and a number of men and women who acted as interrogators and interpreters. Most of those examined were released. When I appeared before them I had only time to tell them my name. I was immediately placed in the custody of two detectives who proceeded to take me to the rear of the hall. My insistence on knowing why I was being detained was left unanswered. The same thing happened to Jim Larkin. I knew that I was being held for something serious, how serious, I did not know. Out of the thousands brought to police headquarters, the Lusk Committee detained about thirty persons. About three o'clock Sunday morning we were locked up in the cells in the basement. I was tired and hungry. So were all of us. But that did not dampen our spirits. Jim Larkin and I were put in one cell, a narrow contraption of steel and cement about four feet wide and seven feet long. A cot made of lattice tie and strips was suspended with iron chains from the wall. The cot was very narrow. No mattress, sheet, blankets, pillows or bedding of any kind were supplied. At the head of the cot facing the cell door was a porcelain toilet bowl. Jim Larkin and I were to spend all of Sunday and a part of Monday together in that cell. We had large overcoats which we used for bedding. But when we lay down the thick iron lattice work penetrated through, making it impossible to sleep. Every bone in our bodies ached. Jim Larkin tried it, I tried it, time and time again. It was no use. Once when I got off the cot I laughed for all I was worth, for there was big Jim Larkin, of Dublin, Ireland, over six feet tall, seated on the toilet bowl, fast asleep. But we Reds were not a sad lot. We yelled through the bars to one another, called the authorities and our keepers all kinds of names and sang revolutionary songs all through the night. There was method in the treatment we received. We were arrested on Saturday night, so that no legal steps could be taken before Monday for our release. In the meantime Stevenson could create sentiment against us through the reports he gave the press of his citywide raids upon the Reds. Through these raids he sought so to dramatize the situation that public opinion would be against us and the judges before whom we would be arraigned should be properly impressed. In addition, spending as we did almost two days cooped up in a little cell, unable to wash, shave or even comb our hair, did not improve our appearance when we were brought into court. We emerged with dirty shirts, our clothes creased and disheveled looking like desperate criminals who could be guilty of any crime. Before arraignment and in violation of the law, we were fingerprinted and mugged, and those horrific photographs were later published in the official report of the Lusk Committee. After we had been kept waiting an eternity in the courtroom of Chief Magistrate McCodoo, our attorney, Walter Nils, 
informed us that the reason for the delay was Archibald Stevenson's inability to make up his mind as to the crime with which to charge Larkin and me. He finally decided to make it criminal anarchy, under the statute that was passed by the New York legislature against the anarchists during the hysteria following the assassination of President McKinley. When arraigned before the judge on this charge, we pleaded not guilty. Bail was immediately set at $25,000 each. A friend of mine, a socialist in the real estate business, offered free and clear real estate for much more than double the amount set, to secure bail. A hurried consultation took place between the prosecuting attorney and the magistrate's court, Archibald Stevenson and Judge McCodoo, and a ruling was handed down that the bail must be in cash or liberty bonds. The moment bail was set at the exorbitant figure of $25,000 I knew that I faced a serious charge. I looked upon the case as a challenge to the newly organized Communist Labor Party. As much as I desired freedom and as little as I enjoyed the prospect of many years in prison, I nevertheless realized that, from the party standpoint, the greatest publicity possible must be made out of the case, my own liberty and personal comfort being secondary. Cash bail not being on hand, Jim Larkin and I were handcuffed together. I bade farewell to my friends and parents, who were in the courtroom. Larkin and I laughed at Archibald Stevenson, who expected us to collapse when the bail was refused. Put in the custody of a couple of detectives of Jegan's bomb squad, we were escorted to the tombs. Larkin and I were lodged in one cell on the main floor. Well, Jim, I said, how do you like our new hotel? It has all the improvements. If the service is all right, I suppose it will be satisfactory, he replied in his haughty Irish manner. The cell was fairly large. An upper and a lower cot extended from the wall. Each of us was provided with a thin mattress, two cheap shoddy blankets and a pillow. A porcelain toilet bowl with no separate seat and a small wash basin with running water completed the equipment. The smell of disinfectant and bed bug exterminator pervaded the whole place. Above us stretched four tiers of cells. In all, it was a dirty, foul smelling place infested with vermin and bed bugs. Prisoners came and went, some out on bail, others to face trial, and some to sing sing. The vermin and the bed bugs stayed on, and with them the sickening aura of their alleged exterminators which by no means enhanced the palatability of the utterly abominable food. The mush and the hash were awful to look at, let alone eat. I never saw a prisoner touch the stuff. Many threw it down on the floor in demonstrative disgust. Most of the prisoners bought their own food from the commissary, a privately run concession which did a thriving business. The prices were controlled and therefore reasonable, though the food was not of the best quality. I must add that, on the whole, I found the keepers considerate. But during the few days Larkin and I stayed in the tombs our attorneys succeeded in having our bail reduced to $10,000 each, in either cash or liberty bonds. Dr. Julius Hammer supplied the liberty bonds, and one fine morning we breathed free air again. The period I was out on bail awaiting trial was marked by continual blows against the communist movement. The attacks of the United States Attorney General's office and the deportation activities of the United States Labor Department took on the character of a nationwide crusade against the Reds. Besides, all the leaders of the Communist Party and of the Communist Labor Party had been indicted on state charges either in New York, Ohio or Illinois. Most of them had been apprehended and were out on bail awaiting trial. To hold meetings of the executive committee, we had to move from place to place to cover up our trail, in order to avoid being raided. I remember particularly one meeting of the executive of the Communist Labor Party, held in the offices of the New Yorker Volkszeitung, the oldest German socialist paper in the United States, at 15 Spruce Street. Ludwig Law was the editor of the paper and present at the meeting. A worker on the staff rushed in with a long tape from the news ticker, shouting excitedly at Ludwig Law, Comrade Law, it's very important news. We must not miss it. We must feature it. He started reading from the ticker, 
Nationwide raids started this evening by Attorney General Palmer against the communists throughout the country. As he read, citing one city after another, Patterson, New York, Pittsburgh, Chicago, Boston, the national headquarters of the Communist Labor Party in New York, various city headquarters, clubs, newspapers, and the like, we realized for the first time the nationwide scope and thoroughness of the raids. It was uncanny to think that only a few minutes before I had left our national headquarters on 12th Street and that now it was already in the hands of federal authorities with all our records gone. We immediately decided to postpone the meeting of the executive committee, to take place later at an attorney's home in Brooklyn. Each one present was assigned to go out on a tour of inspection, to see what had taken place and to gather all available information. I went to the national headquarters on 12th Street. A large van stood in front of the place. Into it federal agents were loading papers, records, files, books and literature taken from our headquarters. Then I went from one place to another. All our local headquarters showed the physical effects of the raids. Besides, all were still under strict guard by federal agents. These raids, followed by deportation proceedings, were evidently conducted by the federal government for that express purpose, because all caught in a place who could not prove citizenship were turned over to the immigration authorities. Ellis Island in New York was jammed with thousands of our foreign-born members. Defense machinery had to be hurriedly set up, to handle the task of locating those arrested, securing a hearing for them and procuring their release on bail. Attorneys Charles Reeked. Isaac Schur and Walt Nels immediately came to our assistance in handling the legal matters involved. Money to pay for defense had to be raised, bail secured, public opinion aroused against the deportation activities and order created in the organization out of the chaos resulting from the raids. Money came pouring into the defense channels immediately, bail to a very large extent was raised by the frantic relatives of those being held. However, no sooner did we overcome the effects of one raid than another one started with equally devastating effects. These raids were very costly to the movement. They struck at its very heart and terrorized its foreign born membership. Thousands of members dropped out. The organization was very badly crippled. A simple necessity as vital to any organization as conducting correspondence with its members and local subdivisions became impossible for the time being. Organizers had to be sent out to re-establish contacts, and when they returned the reports were very disheartening, because most of the former contacts had been lost completely and the new ones established to replace them were only a fraction of the old. For all practical purposes the movement in the smaller towns and cities was almost completely wiped out. The Communist Labour Party and the Communist Party suffered alike in this respect. A few months after the Chicago conventions both parties together had only from 8 to 10,000 members. In fact, so badly was the movement disorganized that it was impossible to check up on its membership in order to determine its actual number. The movement went into a state of semi-illegality. The underground character of the movement consisted at the time in holding all meetings strictly secret and in breaking up our large branches into small units of from 10 to 15 members. When the movement shortly afterwards went completely underground, the units consisted of a maximum membership of 10. Meetings took place in private homes and were carefully guarded. All the members and officials of the party assumed fictitious names. We believed that in going underground we were giving evidence of the revolutionary character of our movement, for we reasoned that before the Russian Revolution the Bolshevik Party too was an underground party. We ascribed the attacks of the government to the capitalist fear of the revolution we communists would soon lead, a revolution, which like the Russian Revolution, would dislodge the present government and put the communists into power. Many with whom I spoke said in effect, it is now possible to know which communists can be depended upon when the revolution comes because all the cowards have now left the party. They were sure that in the underground party we would learn, as the Bolsheviks did, how to engage in conspiratorial and revolutionary activities. The few members we retain welcomed the change into an illegal party. 
The conspiratorial atmosphere surrounding the underground movement was so romantic as to be enticing. One joined a small group, the leader of which was appointed, not elected. Meetings were held in different places under a veil of secrecy, with always the possibility of a sudden raid. One lost his real name and adopted a party name. Sometimes we adopted more than one name. For example, I went under two names, Tom Payne and John Pierce. Many times the legal and the illegal, as we called the underground names, became confused. At an underground meeting we sometimes called a comrade by his right name, whereupon, he would protest most violently. Very often at public meetings, where the real name should have been used, the illegal one was used instead, much to the chagrin of those who knew the person under his real name. Needless to say, the members of the foreign language federations got a real thrill out of underground party life, as they hid in their secret meeting places and romanced about their fantastic plans. Divorced from the politics of the country, having little or nothing to do with the problems of the workers, they could plot and counterplot, in comparative safety. Through their benevolent and cultural organization they were able to re-establish a good part of their membership in the underground, so that while the English-speaking membership was greatly reduced, the numerical superiority of the foreign-speaking membership was very much higher than before. The result was that the underground communist movement was less American and more than ever dependent for its finances on the foreign language federations. Shortly, however, the influx of money from the Communist International of Moscow lessened this financial dependency. From the day I was released on bail to the time I was indicted by the grand jury, there was always excitement and trouble. The Lusk Committee and the federal government never ceased their attacks. Martins was hailed before the Lusk Committee and subjected to a grueling examination as to his credentials and finances. The Lusk Committee followed up the raids in New York City by raids in cities upstate. The indictment was handed down in November, 1919. I was again brought into court, pleaded not guilty and continued on bail until my trial took place in the extraordinary criminal trial term of the Supreme Court presided over by Justice Bart Urs Weeks. The district attorney decided that my case should come up first. Others indicted on the same charge were James Larkin, Charles E. Ruffenberg, Isaac E. Ferguson and Harry Wynitsky, secretary of the New York local of the Communist Party. We were indicted, except Wynitsky, for publishing the left-wing manifesto in the July 5, 1919 issue of the Revolutionary Age. We had neglected to build up a defense movement around the cases and now it became necessary to proceed with all haste. The securing of a good trial lawyer who knew how to defend the labor viewpoint became imperative. Our executive committee decided to secure services of Clarence Darrow, the famous Chicago lawyer who in 1907 had ably defended William D. Haywood and many other labor cases. Comrade Daniel Curley was immediately dispatched to Chicago to induce Darrow to take charge of the case. Curley succeeded in this mission, a retainer was telegraphed to Chicago and Darrow became my attorney. Curley was one of my closest companions in the movement. I first made his acquaintance at the left wing headquarters on 29th Street. He took care of the headquarters and did odd jobs. When I had charge of the Revolutionary Age, Curley helped to mail the paper. He had a ready wit and could tell stories rich in humor and imagination. He was of Irish Canadian stock, having been born in Canada at a trading post of the Hudson Bay Company of which his father was in charge. He was a mixture of Irish stubbornness and frontier individualism. Rebellious in spirit, he was subservient to no one and was usually at odds with everyone except me. If I wanted anything done I had just to ask him and it was forthwith attended to. He enjoyed arguments, was well informed and a good talker and in a dispute his tongue was sharp, his sarcasm cut to the bone. Once he debated Larkin on the question of trade unionism. Larkin, who towered over him in stature, spoke in a loud voice and was no respecter of personalities. It seemed as if Larkin would just crush him with his size, domineering manner and loud voice. But Curly just smiled. A devilish glint lit up his eyes as he took the platform. 
Curly began to unravel a story, full of superlative descriptions of how Jim Larkin, the Irish Labour leader, sipped tea on an English lawn with an English countess, and shall I put one or two lumps of sugar in your tea, Mr Larkin? asked the countess. And what do you think this Irish Labour leader just off the docks of Dublin replied? Two, if it please, your ladyship. He went through all the mannerisms. The audience roared with laughter. Jim Larkin listened in amazement, then lost his temper. He challenged Curly to a fight and called him all kinds of ugly names. Larkin completely forgot about the debate. Curly, however, did not. When the debate was over, I asked Curly, how about that story, was it true, what you said about the Countess and Jim? Oh, that, why, it never took place. I just made it up to get Jim Larkin's goat. In the days of the left wing a spirit of comradeship prevailed which one cannot find in the radical movement today. Our left wing headquarters were always open. All felt themselves on an equal plane. The most modest rank and file comrade did not hesitate to discuss questions with the leaders or to join with them in fun and jokes. One of Reed's pastimes on 29th Street was to call a certain comrade over for the purpose of discussing a question of Marxism with him, just because he liked to watch the solemn expression on his face when he discussed Marx. On these occasions Reed would purposely take the most ridiculous position on Marx in order to arouse the ire of the comrade over his ignorance. A crowd would soon gather and the argument, once started, would wax furious for hours. Every now and then Reed, with a very serious mien, would interrupt, but, comrade, Karl Marx never said that. Did you not read in volume 3 on page 600 that Marx said the direct opposite? That is impossible, the exasperated comrade would protest excitedly, I'll bring volume 3 with me next time to prove you are wrong and don't remember what you read. I was too busy to worry about my case. I did not see Darrow until the eve of the trial. He was not enthusiastic about the case. Oh, I know you are innocent, but they have the country steamed up. Everybody is against the Reds. He seemed not a little frightened when I told him I intended to stand by every communist principle and to defend my position regardless of the consequences. I was indicted on two counts for publishing in the Revolutionary Age and the Left Wing Manifesto and Programme, and for printing in the same paper an article by Nikolai Bukharin entitled, The Communist Programme. These, the indictment charged, advocated the overthrow of the United States government by force violence and illegal means. When Darrow realized that I was determined to defend the views of both the Manifesto and the Buckerin article he insisted that there was no use in my taking the stand. I agreed to his proposal, provided that he would allow me to address the jury on my own behalf in my own way. He agreed, saying, well, I suppose a revolutionist must have his say in court even if it kills him. The trial opened in an atmosphere of hysteria. The courtroom was filled with detectives. Everyone who came to witness the proceedings was carefully scrutinized. From the very start Judge Weeks showed his prejudice. The prosecutor, Assistant District Attorney Rourke, took advantage of every opportunity to create a hostile attitude. The selection of the jury was a long and tedious affair in which the judge bent over backwards to please the prosecution and was obdurate as far as the defense was concerned. We had very little to pick from, because the special jury panel selected from what was known as the Silk Stocking District, was made up of individuals, who, being ultra-conservative, obviously could be depended upon to bring in the verdict against the Reds, as desired by the prosecutor. During the trial, the prosecutor tried to bring in all kinds of extraneous matters for the purpose of blackening my character. But these attempts were so crude that even Judge Weeks could not allow them, and upheld Darrow's objections. One, for instance, was to try to introduce checks and money orders received by me as manager of the Revolutionary Age, in an effort to prove that I was pocketing the money and making plenty out of the revolutionary business. He knew very well that the Revolutionary Age had no bank account and that it was heavily in debt. Furthermore, 
He also knew that its editors and I as its manager seldom got paid and that, when we did, it was a mere pittance, usually about $10 every other week. I followed the trial closely. From the very start I was of the opinion that the verdict would be against me. However, I could not help but be angry at the judge. Weeks appeared to me everything but impartial. His interpretation of the law, his narrow definitions of what constituted legal means in effecting a change of government, left the jury no other recourse but to convict. Time and time again he stressed the fact that the only legal way of bringing about a change is through the ballot box and that all other methods were illegal. To demonstrate on behalf of political objectives through mass demonstrations or by means of the strike in his opinion constituted a criminal act. In summing up the case, the prosecutor made an appeal to the prejudices of the jury, to their 100% Americanism and coupled it with a personal attack upon me which pictured me as the worst blackguard in America. I did not mind his speech, because I expected it and realized that he did not believe the half of it. I knew that he expected to make political capital for himself out of the case and through it perhaps elevate himself to the office of District Attorney of New York. The speech of Darrow I discussed with him before he delivered it. I knew it was to be one of his flowery appeals to the jury, seeking, through arousing their sympathy and feelings for righteousness, to get them into a mood favorable for an acquittal. Upon my insistence his speech also included a defense of the right of revolution and an attack upon the hysteria which was sweeping the country. On the question of revolution he said for a man to be afraid of revolution in America, would be to be ashamed of his own mother. Nothing else. Revolution? There is not a drop of honest blood in a single man that does not look back to some revolution for which he would thank his God that those who revolted one dot later on he said, and emphatically, 2. It is utterly idle to talk about the abolition of the government by voters. It cannot be done. In attacking the red hysteria, he said, if Lincoln would have been here today, Mr. Palmer, the Attorney General of the United States, would send his night riders to invade his office and the privacy of his home and send him to jail. It was clear that evasion was not the tactic which I adopted. I was determined to fight out the issue squarely insisting upon my right to advocate the communist program for revolution in the United States. When I rose to address the jury, I was nervous. It was a new experience. I had addressed hundreds of meetings of all kinds. An audience never frightened me. But here in court it was different. I could feel that the room was surcharged with hostility. I felt that the jury would somehow be impatient and would not quite understand what I would say to them. I had not written my speech, but I had it well mapped out in my mind. I did not expect what followed. From my knowledge of other labor cases it had never happened before. The judge continuously interrupted me and objected to what I had to say. Whenever my attorney rose to my defense, he overruled him. It was obvious that the judge wanted to break up my talk disconnect my thoughts and finally spoil whatever effect a continuous well thought out speech would have upon the jury. I criticized capitalism, attacked the war, defended the Russian revolution and what I believed to be its system of democracy and industry. I ended my speech with this defiant note well, gentlemen of the jury, I think that when you read the manifesto of the left wing section of the socialist party, you will understand what the fundamental principles involved in the manifesto are. I want you to realize that I believe in those principles, that I will support them and that I am not going to evade the issue. My whole life has been dedicated to the movement of which I am a member. No jails will change my opinion in this respect. I ask no clemency. I realize that as an individual I have a perfect right to my opinions, that I would be false to myself if I tried to evade that which I supported. Regardless of what your verdict may be, I maintain that the principles of the left-wing manifesto and program on the whole are correct, that capitalism is in a state of collapse, that capitalism has brought untold misery and hardships to the working man, that thousands of men in this democratic republic are in jails today on account of their views, suffering tortures and abuse and nothing. Here the judge again interrupted, stating again the defendant must cease from making statements. 
there is no evidence before the court that anyone is in jail or suffering tortures and abuse. Proceed. I concluded all I ask of you gentlemen of the jury is to consider the language of the manifesto, to realize that the manifesto stands for a new order in society, a new form of government, that the communists believe in a new form of society and necessarily in a new form of government and will bend all their efforts in that direction. When the judge closed the case by giving his instructions to the jury it was with great effort that I could control myself. As he spoke I felt that I was like a fly caught in a spider's web. Every word was calculated to impress the jury adversely. When he finished I turned to Charles Richt, who was assisting Darrow, and said, it is all over now. The jury can do nothing else than bring in a verdict of guilty. The jury filed out. I felt relieved that the trial was over. The nervous strain of that day in court made my temples throb. I knew that in a very short time the course of my life would change. Darrow did not even wait to hear the verdict. He knew what to expect. The jury deliberated about three quarters of an hour and returned with the expected verdict of guilty. Weeks sentenced me to the maximum, five to ten years in Sing Sing at hard labor. When my attorney sought clemency, the judge interrupted Reeked and said, I am sure that what you are saying does not meet with the approval of your client and that if he were asked he would make no such plea for clemency. He was right, for I directed Reek not to proceed further. Then the judge thanked the jury in a speech in which he took notice of the fact that I had not accumulated private property by saying, a young man, 28 years of age, of intelligence, a striking example of the educational system of this country, able-bodied, of full intellect, confesses he owns no property. Employed at $41 a week the last time he was employed and never accumulated any property. Evidently Judge Weeks judged a man's worth only by the property he accumulated and held in scorn those who were propertyless. The sentence given, I was seized by two officers, taken immediately to the tombs and lodged in a cell on the main tier. The realization that I was no longer a free man struck home. Recent events went through my head in a kaleidoscopic world. I took very little notice of the many doors that were opened and shut behind me, the steps up and down, the short walk across the bridge of size from the criminal court building to the tombs. When I was locked up in my cell I was in a daze. I sat down on the cot. I was certain I would spend the entire ten years in prison for I knew that the hysteria against the Reds was in full force and I did not expect it to abate very soon. I kept thinking to myself, ten years in prison will be a long time, I am twenty-eight years old, when I come out, I shall be thirty-eight. Who knows what will happen during that period. I rose and paced up and down like a wild beast in a cage. The walls of my cell seemed to move about me in confusing circles. The strain of the day was taxing my mental and nervous system to its capacity. Again I heard the district attorney shout his abuse, again I heard the judge's harsh interruptions. Before me I saw his undersized figure, his prominent hook nose, he looked like a vulture ready to pounce upon me and destroy me. What a little fellow he was, and how great his hate of me. My temples throbbed fitfully. This will never do, I said to myself. I am not the only one who has ever gone to prison. Many have gone, some for a very much longer time and some never to see the outside again. If they were able to do so, why can't I? I have made my fight. What is there to be ashamed of? Nothing. Then came a period of calm. Although I felt keenly the separation from my many friends and the family I loved, I began to feel at home in my surroundings. The din of the tombs seemed somehow familiar. Let the future bring what it would, I was determined to face it. I breathed a sigh of relief, threw myself on the cot and soon was fast asleep. Undisturbed sleep is man's greatest boon and perhaps the only time when he is really at peace with himself. When I awoke next morning the past was history. My new life as a prisoner began. Chapter 3 America's first communist prisoner in Sing Sing tombs became my home, its prisoners my companions. Those who have never been imprisoned cannot realize how closely prison draws together individuals from different walks of life.
of different views, of entirely divergent psychological makeups. The least common denominator of all the members of a prison community, the one factor that draws them together, is, of course, their imprisonment, all are captives, all enemies of the law. I was surprised how many of the prisoners were glad to make my acquaintance. They expressed indignation over my verdict. What in the hell was the country coming to when men such as I were being sent to prison? The respect with which they treated me pleased me because of its genuineness. In their many and varied ways they all sensed that I was in prison because I was fighting injustice. As one short fellow who came to my cell put it, pal, I'm glad to make your acquaintance. It's pretty rotten with the law when they begin to put a fellow like you in the pen. But I am with you. I am against the law, too. During my stay in the tombs I met all kinds of men, pickpockets, murderers, robbers, burglars, forgers, bigamists. All kinds of criminals entered and left the tombs. Some were old, others, mere boys. Some, shrewd, mentally alert, others, undeveloped and below normal. One nervous fellow, a forger, was a cocaine addict. When he did not have the drug he was miserable. His despondency ended the moment he received his packet. Regardless of the strict rules against the use of drugs and their smuggling into the tombs, the drug addicts succeeded in obtaining their supply regularly. I was never able to find out how they obtained it. Dot for exercise we were permitted to walk around the cell block an hour at a time, three times a day. We kept up a dizzy pace, getting nowhere, like squirrels turning their wheels of their cages. Only once were we let out in the yard. How exhilarating was the air! The blue sky overhead had never before looked so strange and so beautiful. But the yard was so small. It was surrounded by buildings on three sides, and on the fourth by a high stone wall. I soon got tired of the dizzy pace in the endless circle. All I could see was the grey wall and the red brick of the buildings. Prison accustoms its inmates to limited spaces. If any ordinary person were told to walk up and down in a four by seven foot room for an hour or two at a time, he would soon rebel, and, if forced to do so, might even go crazy. Yet prisoners pace for hours up and down their narrow cells for relaxation. How do they do it? Go to the zoo and watch the animals in their cages. You'll get the idea. A monstrosity in the tombs was the visiting room, where relatives and friends were permitted to talk to the prisoners for 15 minutes. It was long and narrow, with two parallel rows of wire cages made of a thick, close iron mesh. Each cage was as wide as a narrow telephone booth. In one row of cages the prisoners sat, in the opposite row, about two feet apart, sat the visitors, comma, all yelling and screaming at the top of their voices to their own dear ones, because in no other way was it possible to carry on a conversation. The most horrible sight I ever witnessed in all my prison experiences was that of a young boy going stark mad. He was involved in some shooting affray. Picture to yourself a boy of about 18, shrieking in a high-pitched voice hysterical with terror, take him away. Don't shoot. Don't shoot. His lean frame stretches upwards, so that he appears much taller than he actually is. Every muscle of his body twitches in convulsive fear. His eyes, glassy and large, bulge out of his head as they stare in sheer fright. Froth comes from his mouth. His boyish face getting redder and redder, is contorted in agony and fear, his head moving from side to side in jerky spasms, as if to throw off an attack. His screams, ebbing into moans, are frightful to hear. When he is taken from his cell, two keepers must hold him with all their strength. He keeps wriggling in their grasp, frothing at the mouth, and his eyes stare, horror-stricken. With much effort the keepers force him down into a chair. He stretches himself upward, lets out an inhuman yell and shrieks, Oh, the pistol! Take it away! Don't shoot me! Don't shoot me! A sedative is administered, the shrieking and yelling dies down, the awful moaning continues. The ambulance from Bellevue comes. He is taken away. I stayed in the tombs longer than I was supposed to, 
because Sing Sing was quarantined, due to an influenza epidemic among its prisoners. The day I was informed that I would be transferred to the big house up the river, as Sing Sing was called, one of the prisoners came to my cell and said, Well, pal, I am glad to see you leave this dump. Sing Sing is a fine place, a country home on the Hudson. You'll get lots of fresh air, good food, a nice clean cell, everyone with running hot and cold water, a hospital bed to sleep on with a fine mattress, white sheet, pillowcases and warm blankets. I didn't expect all that, but I was sure that it would be a great relief to get away from the foul air and dirty surroundings of the tombs. I did not know but somehow felt that conditions in Sing Sing would be better. I had my sentence of 5 to 10 years to do and I felt that the sooner I began doing it the better. The next morning a number of prisoners were herded together by the keepers, handcuffed in pairs and marched to the prison yard. There we were placed in the custody of two deputy sheriffs, who put us into the sheriff's wagon which was already waiting for us. It was exceedingly cold that morning. New York was having a very severe winter. But I welcomed the cold air. I felt as if I had been liberated. The sky overhead was free, majestic, limitless. The prison gate opened for the sheriff's wagon with its human cargo. I enjoyed the ride. The city now looked strange to me, as though I had been away from it for many years. I was fascinated by all I saw. My fellow prisoners enjoyed themselves by cursing every policeman we passed on our way. The deputy sheriffs were very considerate with me. The stout fellow excused himself for putting the cuffs on me, as he called the handcuffs. We had to do it, he said. We were given the strictest orders to that effect. I did not mind. During the ride, my fellow prisoners asked, Say, bud, how much time you got? Five to ten, I answered, laughing. Oh, that's sleeping time you can do that sleeping on one side. When I found out what long stretches they were being sent up for, the shortest being ten years, I began to appreciate their humor. Many of them had sentences of life imprisonment. The only first timer besides myself was a young Irish American lad of about eighteen, who had received ten to twenty years for robbery. The others had been to prison before. Our destination was Grand Central Station where we were to board a train for our signing. At the station the crowds gaped at us, as if we were dangerous beasts. One mother pulled her child close to her and clasped it tightly in her arms for protection. I was amused at the way people looked at us. Once on the train, the deputy sheriffs held a secret conversation, then unlocked my handcuffs and let me sit as if I were a free man. On the way they spoke to me freely. They could not understand why I should be going to prison. They frankly declared that my case was a flagrant miscarriage of justice. I discussed local politics with them, mostly about Tammany Hall and the city administration. The stout deputy complained about the new Tammany Hall. Before, he said, everybody had a chance to get a job if he was regular. Now only the Catholic mix are getting the jobs. The deputy sheriffs treated the prisoners like human beings, giving us cigars and cigarettes and on the train providing us with coffee and sandwiches. They spoke to us in a friendly manner, as if we were all old friends. We looked like a sociable crowd enjoying a pleasure trip. The train ride was soon over. From our signing we walked slowly up the long hill to Sing Sing Prison. From the distance I saw the grey oblong structure that was to be my home. Every moment of that walk on that cold winter's day was precious. A beautiful scene unfolded. The bleak prison on top of the hill. The Hudson River, frozen from shore to shore, a silver ribbon, glistening under the melancholy colors of the departing sun. In the distance rose the palisades, like the massive walls of an ancient feudal castle. Beyond the prison, hills, with ghost-like trees, their bare branches like outstretched arms tapered by fingers thinned to the bone. Everywhere snow covered the ground. I felt no fear in approaching the place. I confess, it appealed to me. I began to wonder what was in store for me. Perfectly calm, 
I took a fatalistic attitude and was prepared for anything that was to follow. We entered their warden's office, a quiet, warm, business like office. We were registered. The convict clerks, as they put down our history, eyed us shrewdly and intimated that things would not be so bad, after all. Registration over, each one was given a card. We were taken to the big gate at the southwest corner of the prison adjacent to the old death house. The keeper in charge of us shouted to the guard on the wall who controlled the gate, eight on the count. The two deputy sheriffs were on hand to see that we were safely delivered. The massive door swung open. We passed through, eight state prisoners, eight felons. The door closed behind us. Many may wonder what are the feelings one experiences the first time he enters prison. I can only speak for myself. I felt as if I had just finished a period of my life, one that was already buried in the past. I regretted having lost my liberty, but I was not sad or dejected. I felt a little uncertain of the future and a little nervous, not because I was in prison but because I did not know what were to be my immediate new experiences and how I would adjust myself to them. The old timers seemed happy enough. They had been here before. They brought packages with them, knowing what a man needed here and what was allowed. The keeper mustered us up in a double line. Forward march, he shouted. He marched us up to the state shop. Here we were again registered in an office at the head of the stairs. We were told to undress completely. Each one was then given a coarse towel and a small chunk of brown soap. We were then ordered to go under the shower four at a time to take a bath. The four of us washed as best we could under the one shower, but before we were half finished we were ordered out. Another batch of four went under the shower. Our clothes were taken away. New underwear was thrown at us, with our prison numbers stamped on them. Each one was given a shirt socks, a pair of heavy crude shoes, a grey pair of pants and a grey jacket with metal buttons. All the clothing supplied to us was prison made, ill-fitting, of rough cheap material. It is said that clothes make the man. Truer still is the fact that prison garb makes the prisoner. I was amazed at the transformation. My fellow convicts no longer looked the same. They turned to me and said, your own mother wouldn't know you now. The convicts working in the state shop knew of me as soon as I came in. They gave me a warm welcome. I remember one of them turning to another and saying in Yiddish, News of Ose I hope and gemacht von der Mensch. Now see what they have made from a man, they told me not to worry, that things would be all right. I remember the sympathetic expressions on their faces, I have met it time and time again a feeling on their part that my crime consisted simply of trying to make the world better and that a grave injustice had been done by sending me to prison. When I look back upon my prison life, it was this feeling on the part of my fellow prisoners, the genuine concern over my welfare, their expressions of gratitude and sympathy, that I cherish above everything else. From the state shop we were marched into the mess hall. The inmates eyed the newcomers. Many a hello and broad smile greeted the old timers in the line who had been there before. But I was the center of attraction. I was pointed out continuously. We were seated at a table. All we got for supper was white prison bread, a cup of bitter black coffee without sugar, and a couple of spoonfuls of cornstarch jelly on a plate. Nothing to grow fat on and not very satisfying. Then we were marched out of the mess hall down through the yard to the bucket track which was situated in the rear of the yard facing the Hudson River. The cast iron buckets with their lids off, ugly, dirty, foul-smelling contraptions, stood in rows. We were each directed to take one off the rack. We took up our buckets and were marched back to the cell block. I was locked in a cell on the ground floor. It was in a prison building about a hundred years old, built of massive blocks of limestone and iron bars painted a dismal grey. The cell block, oblong in shape, towered in the centre of the building five tiers high. Through the narrow windows of the prison building the light fell in parallel shafts. We were placed in cells situated in the so-called receiving flat A section of the ground floor tier facing the darkest section of the prison, set aside for newcomers. 
Each of us was locked alone in a dark and dismal cell no more than seven feet long and about three feet wide. An iron cot, on which was thrown a thin mattress and a shoddy blanket, protruded from the wall. The floor of the cell was of stone. Rough limestone boulders with their jagged surfaces made up the walls. The ceiling was no more than seven feet from the floor. A small electric bulb supplied scanty light. A tin cup attached to the door of each cell was filled with water. The bucket, which I placed underneath my cot, was my lavatory for the night. Such bad living quarters I had not expected. It was my first unpleasant impression, and it came as a shock. Yet I did laugh when I recalled that in the tombs I had been told to expect a room with hot and cold running water and all the comforts of a hospital bed. The prospect of living several years in a place like this was not a pleasant one. My experience in prison, however, has been that always in one's darkest moments a ray of light just squeezes itself in. As soon as the keeper was gone the prisoner charged with looking after the receiving flats stopped in front of my door and said you're Gitlo aren't you? I replied, yes. He said, it's a damn shame you're here, but it's not as bad as it looks. These are only the receiving flats. Tomorrow morning you will get your regular cell. It won't be so bad. You can fix it up and make it comfortable. Besides, you won't spend much of your time in the cell anyway. And the five to ten years, you will do that in three to nine years. That's a small bit, it will be over before you roll on your other side. If you want any smokes or other things, just let me know. Gratefully, I thanked him. Later I heard the noise of marching men, the clatter of feet walking upstairs, the slamming of doors and boisterous voices. Then a bell rang out loudly, followed by the shouts on all tiers, close all doors. The keepers started to lock the cells. The count began. A few minutes later, the count completed, a bell rang, cell doors opened, and I heard the sound of hurrying feet. The cell block filled with voices and noise. Someone stopped in front of my door. I looked at the man, a prisoner whom outside I would have taken for a prosperous business or professional man. He introduced himself as doctor, I am very glad to make your acquaintance, he told me. I have read all about you in the papers. I want to help you and be of service to you. You will find that if you know how to conduct yourself, your stay here will be relatively comfortable and you will not get into trouble. Tomorrow you will be assigned to a cell. I have taken care that you get a cell on a tier that is kept clean by a negro friend of mine, Jim. He will provide your cell with a good mattress, blankets and things you need. Later you will know what to get from home to supplement what they give you here. You will be assigned to yard 2 for work. In yard 2 ask for Jimmy Hughes. I have arranged with him to take care of you. Cheered, I thanked him, too. I was not alone. Men I never knew or met always came forward to help me at a time I needed help. Later in Auburn prison and in Danimer estate prison it was the same. The cell was very cold. The limestone cells in Sing Sing are always damp and in the winter very cold. In the summer they are hot and the stones become so wet that the moisture drips from the walls. I was very tired. The first day had been a long one, full of excitement and mental agitation. I undressed and in my prison underwear stretched myself out on the cot, pulled the blanket over me and passed the night in blessed sound sleep. I awoke to the clatter of banging on my door. I got up and discovered it was morning. We were lined up, each one with a bucket in his hand, and marched to the bucket rack. We emptied our buckets. Unlike the regular prisoners, who left them in the racks, we took them back with us to our cells. When the whistle blew we were marched into the mess hall, where corned beef hash, consisting of mashed potatoes and shredded corned beef, was served with coffee and bread. After that we were taken to yard 2 and registered. Then came trips to the doctor for a superficial examination, to the school, to determine our mental development, to the principal keeper's office where we were given to understand that we were prisoners, that we had to obey the rules, 
that we had no rights and that whatever considerations we did receive were precious privileges. We were led to the Bertillon office, which had a small building of its own situated in the yard and separated from the administration building. Here we were photographed, front, left and right view. We were fingerprinted, each finger of each hand separately, then both hands, including the palms in full. Our footprints were also taken. We had to undress, and were examined all over for identification marks, all marks noted were registered on the card. A description followed, color and texture of hair, color of eyes, shape of ears, general description. Then the measurements began. The head was measured in width and length, the length of nose, arms, hands, legs, and feet. I was completely catalogued, deprived of the slightest possibility to elude identification. The visits to the chaplain's office, for every new prisoner goes through the chaplain's hands, was both interesting and instructive. Before I went there, I was warned to be on my guard, for the chaplain was very shrewd. In his polished and suave manner he might lead me into saying something that I would later regret. But I was rather intrigued by the idea of talking with him. The chaplain was Father Cashin, a Catholic. When I entered his office he asked me courteously to sit down. His face lit up in an inviting pleasant smile. He was well built, a light complexioned man with the straight chiseled features of the Irish. He looked at my card studied it a while and then said, I see that you are Jewish. Yes, I answered, I am Jewish. But not from a religious standpoint. As you undoubtedly know, I am an atheist. He smiled and continued, I see that you are different from the other men who come here. You probably have good reasons for believing as you do. But now you are in prison and subject to the rules of the prison. My advice to you is to stay out of trouble while here. Being an intelligent man, you, I am sure, will obey the rules and follow the advice I am about to give you. There are all kinds of men here, some good and some bad beyond redemption. Most of them are ignorant, mentally undeveloped, but some are intelligent and, in spite of their being here, not bad. However, remember you are in a prison. And the best rule to follow in a prison is to be yourself. Use your own judgment, confide nothing to your fellow prisoners. Don't trust the best of them. You have heard the remark that walls have ears. They have ears in Sing Sing. You may pass a remark and you will never know how it got about. I thanked him for his advice and told him that I came to prison to serve my sentence, that I had no intention of making trouble, that I intended to live up to the rules. He continued, telling me that he had charge of the library, that the library in Sing Sing was one of the best prison libraries in the country, that it contained a fine collection of books. He supposed that I would be interested in books and assured me that in the prison library I could find almost all the reading matter I would want. Then with a twinkle in his eyes he went on, but I suspect that you will like to receive certain books that we do not have in our library and that you will like to get papers as well. I want to inform you now that I have the authority over all printed matter that comes into the prison. I alone can decide what books and papers are to be allowed in and what not. But I will not judge you by the ordinary standards. I will allow you to get the books and papers you desire, provided you will promise now that you will read them yourself and will not pass them around to the other inmates in the prison. I gave him that promise. Did I keep it? Of course not. I am sure he never expected me to, but just put it that way in order to protect himself if anything happened. He inquired about the law under which I was sentenced. It was new to him. I explained. He smiled good naturedly, was very glad to make my acquaintance and hoped we would be friends. After we were completely examined and documented, we were enrolled in the Mutual Welfare League, the prisoners' self government organization in Sing Sing. Before the Mutual Welfare League was instituted by Warden Thomas Mott Osborne, an advocate of prison reform, the prison system, known as the old system, was based on harsh discipline. The regime which instituted the reforms, known as the new system, consisted of a less rigid and less brutal discipline, more freedom within the confines of the prison for the inmates, 
and the opportunity accorded them to supplement the discipline of the prison authorities with regulation of the men's conduct through their own organization, democratically chosen and administered. The office of the Sergeant of the Mutual Welfare League was situated next to the P.K.S. Principal Keeper's Office. Lined up in the Sergeant's office, we stood quietly at attention, while the Sergeant enrolled us in the League, gave each one a button, informed us of the rules of the prison, explained how important it was for us not to jeopardize the many privileges we now enjoyed in consequence of the League. The speech finished. We were marched back to Yard 2, full fledged prisoners of one of the most famous prisons in the world. Yard 2 was an old one story red brick structure that had been salvaged from a prison fire. Surrounding it were heaps of bricks. All the new prisoners were assigned to Yard 2 before they were assigned to their regular jobs or transferred to other prisons. Prisoners who had broken rules and were punished were also assigned to Yard 2 as were the sick and the infirm and the gangs who worked outside the prison walls. Yard 2 was the most colorful and interesting place in the whole prison. It took on the appearance of a pioneer camp on some western frontier. I shall always remember one of its keepers, an Irishman, six feet six, well built, in his early fifties, extremely gruff in manner. He always shouted out his orders in a voice charged with his dire retribution for disobedience, yet, notwithstanding the menace of his manner and his towering height, he was really a very gentle and kindly soul. He liked his charges and his charges liked him. The angrier he got, the more they kidded him. He towered above the whole motley lot of us and epitomized Yard 2. The yard was divided into corners, coops and sections each the claim of a particular group of prisoners. All around the walls were lockers of different sizes and shapes, made of old boxes and boards. Clothes lines were stretched across the yard on which the prisoners had hung their wash to dry, socks, underwear, shirts. Before the center of the rear wall was a large blow furnace, the remains of the blacksmith shop that had been yard two before the fire. This furnace was a very interesting and important institution. It was the communal cooking range. Around this range 15 or 20 prisoners at a time would gather to cook their meals. Soup, macaroni, chops, hash, bacon and eggs, flapjacks, a dozen pots of coffee, all would be cooking at the same time. And the cooks were all experts. They would toss their flapjacks high in the air to turn them over and catch them just right on the pan. Around this community stove the busy cooks of all shapes and sizes argued, yelled, played pranks and had one hell of a broiling time. Yard 2 was always full of men. Everywhere the groups could be seen arguing or washing or otherwise occupied. Jimmy Hughes had the largest place in Yard 2. I threw in my lot with Jimmy Hughes. He was a jovial negro of excellent features who was greatly respected by the prisoners and the attendants as the leader of the negro group, which, as I soon learned, he most certainly was. In Sing Sing, if you had the wherewithal and the proper connections, there was no need to eat in the mess hall, where, except on special holidays, the food was far from good. Only a few dozen prisoners took their breakfast there about 50% their noonday meal and a mere handful gathered in the mess hall for the supper the state served them in the evening. Jimmy Hughes was one of those who never ate in the mess hall. An excellent cook, he was famous for his buys. He would come into the mess hall to collect a bucket full of the prunes served for supper that the men would not touch, and cook them into prune buys. These he disposed of at a quarter each, selling as many as he baked. I took my meals with Jimmy. His assistant was a short jet black negro, an expert at gambling in all its forms. As a youngster he had been picked up by a gambling man in the south. They went the rounds of gambling houses, race tracks, resorts, saloons and cafes. He would laugh, telling me how they would rope in the suckers and how crooked every gambling game was. He was a quiet, unassuming little fellow who would chuckle to himself every once in a while. Besides helping Hughes at whatever Hughes put him to do, he would wash the dishes and clean up the corner. The Hughes domain three times a day. Through Hughes, I made very important contacts. 
I soon discovered that the most reliable underground chain in Sing Sing was the one operated by the Negroes, consisting of Negro convicts working at strategic places, including the warden's office. Through this channel I could secure desired messages or articles from the outside or send communications to the communist organizations which the censor would not otherwise permit or which I did not want the censor to see. It was done quickly, confidentially and faultlessly. Every time I used the services of the chain I paid a quarter. It was well worth it. Through my contact with this chain I knew what was going on in the prison, learned about orders received by the warden affecting the prison as soon as they were received. When drafts of Sing Sing prisoners to other prisons were contemplated, I learned in advance the names of those on the draft. I want to pay tribute to this Negro chain. It could be trusted implicitly. A job turned over to it was never discovered. Letters given to the chain to mail never reached the hands of the authorities. It maintained the highest moral code in this respect. I used the chain frequently. I never once had occasion to doubt in the slightest degree that my trust in them would be violated. Jimmy Hughes was also a help to me in many other ways. We were on terms of warmest friendship. This helped me materially with the whole Negro population of Sing Sing. As long as I was Jimmy Hughes' friend I was so. K. I could be trusted, and what was worth still more, they respected me. I was warned by the prison authorities that a strict rule in prison was the one against having money in one's possession, infraction of this rule being severely punished because one had no need for cash in prison. Money could be deposited to my account. With it I could buy almost any necessity either at the store of the Mutual Welfare League or from the stores in or signing. The rules provided that one could spend no more than $6 a week at the League store. But this rule was never followed. One could spend as much as desired. I soon discovered that cash in one's pocket was a very valuable asset. I obtained my first cash by buying a carton of cigarettes at the league store on money deposited to my account with the prison authorities and selling it for cash. Rules or no rules, I soon found out how to get money into the prison. I smuggled it in myself through the visiting room. I had it sent in through the Negro chain by having a letter mailed to me with money. I soon discovered that obeying all the rules got you nowhere. All rules were generally being broken. Indeed, very often those who most strictly adhered to all the rules found themselves in trouble. In all my prison experiences I always did the things I thought it was possible for me to get away with, whether it meant breaking the rules or not. I was never brought up before the prison authorities for infraction of the rules. As far as they were concerned, my conduct was unimpeachable. I found the inmates courteous, friendly, and helpful. The keepers were not intimate with me, but in the main treated me humanely and courteously. Had I been a bank robber, or labor union racketeer, I would have been given many privileges and favors. But I was a new type of prisoner. Though classified as an ordinary felon, they knew that I was not the type of criminal they were accustomed to take care of. They knew that I was sentenced for my political views. They expected me to be honest and incorruptible, and therefore kept their distance. But I very quickly adjusted myself to prison life. In the prison shop I made contact with tailors, who, for a small consideration in cash, made me a pair of prison trousers and a prison jacket to measure. We were allowed to wear grey shirts which we could buy at the store or have sent in from outside. Sweaters could be worn in place of the prison jacket, provided they were in grey. The only garment that marked one off as an inmate was the grey trousers. These trousers, tailored, well pressed, clean, made one look far from the prison picture of a convict dressed in stripes. My prison number in Sing Sing was 70,900, my cell, 243. I came to Sing Sing after Major Laws had been appointed warden. Many of the prisoners were afraid that under laws the reforms that had been instituted by wardens Brophy, Osborne and Kirchway would be abrogated and the hated old system installed once more. But they were mistaken in their fears. The regime at Sing Sing was a very liberal one. It had its shortcomings, 
there were of course abuses but, in the main, it was very considerate of the welfare and comfort of the men. What were its main faults? The food was very poor and inadequate. It is true that most men could supplement their prison fare by getting food at the store or by having food sent to them by their relatives and friends. If they could procure food, they were permitted to do their own cooking. With cash, food staples could be bought from the prisoners who worked in the storehouse. Food supplies which the storehouse received for the inmates were peddled by the prisoners working there and, I suspect, with the knowledge and collusion of the keeper in charge. Sugar, milk, fine cuts of meat, canned stuffs, found their way under coats and sold for a quarter or fifty cents or more, depending upon what one wanted. The finest cakes and the warden's delicious spread was sold by the inmates who worked in the bake shop. The negro cook who took care of the keeper's meals, and prepared the meals for the death house, would deliver, for a cash consideration or its equivalent, a cooked meal from soup to dessert. The prison laundry washed prison underwear for one free each week. But if special service was wanted, it was possible to obtain it from the convicts who worked in the wash house. The laundry came back washed spotlessly, everything pressed as neatly as by the finest laundries outside. The prison regulations provided that you get a shave twice a week at the prison barber shop. The inmates were then not allowed to have razors of any kind in their possession. A haircut was given once a month. Without any difficulty one could, for a stipulated amount, arrange with a barber for haircuts and shaves as often as wanted. We could select a good barber and get as good service as we could get outside, if not better. One barber shop, run strictly as a private enterprise by a convict, was patronized by both prisoners and keepers. So crowded was this shop that customers always had to wait in line for their turn. One's cell could be kept spotlessly clean by paying the prisoner in charge of one's tier a stipulated amount every month for keeping it so. Even the bucket was cleaned and taken care of for one by the convict in charge of the bucket rack, if paid for. The bucket would even be taken from the cell and put back for the night. Of course the prisoners who had no money, or could not devise some way of making money, were badly off and greatly envied their more fortunate associates. The prisoners in Sing Sing were always afraid of being drafted to other prisons. Drafts took place every few months, sometimes, if secrecy was desired, at midnight or two in the morning. The reason for the drafts is obvious. The overwhelming majority of men sent to Sing Sing from New York State come from the city of New York. New York is the world's greatest breeding spot for criminals. The world's richest city is the world's most criminal numerically. Sing Sing, being the nearest state prison to New York City, necessarily becomes the receiving station for the metropolis army of criminals. Sing Sing is not large enough to accommodate all of them. It, therefore, becomes necessary from time to time to send batches of them to the other prisons, notably, Clinton Prison at Danimara in the Adirondack Mountains, to open the oldest prison in New York State, and to Comstock. But the prisoners resent being transferred, for Sing Sing is the most liberal prison in the state, and, being near to New York City, is more accessible to relatives and friends. Sing Sing, because it is a famous institution and is visited by thousands of sightseers, is very careful of its reputation. This results in a cautious application of the meeting out of punishment for infraction of rules. In Sing Sing a convict has more free time, more fresh air, more diversions and entertainments to help him spend his time than in other prisons in the state. The regime is humane, and the contact with the outside world fairly well maintained, both from the prisoner's standpoint are very important and desirable. Hence the drafting of prisoners is responsible for many abuses. Those who have political connections and those who have money can find ways and means of either staying at Sing Sing or being transferred back to Sing Sing in a few months time. Abuses were also rife in the assignment of prisoners to the different jobs in the prison industries. Maintenance, or administration. Jobs varied in quality from good to definitely bad, 
yet often the value of a job depended on how hard it was for an inmate to get it. The men were not always assigned to jobs on the basis of their fitness for the work. It was common gossip among prisoners that political pull and paying the price demanded for the job had a lot to do with one's assignment to a desirable post. From my observations the conclusions of the prisoners appeared to be correct, because rich men and those with political pull always did get the good jobs, the poor and those without pull getting the jobs that were undesirable. I was kept in yard two for a long time, working about an hour or two a day at the odd jobs to which I was assigned such as, washing windows and manicuring bricks. The Metropolitan Press carried a story that I was assigned to heavy work on a frozen coal and rock pile. But there was no rock pile in Sing Sing. Manicuring bricks consisted in picking out a few bricks from the mass of bricks left by the ruins of the fire, putting them into a wheelbarrow, and carting them to another part of the yard, where they were piled up. When the newspapers reported I was sweating on the rock pile, I was either visiting the various prison departments for registration and examination or else was sitting around in yard 2 listening to the stories or woes of my fellow convicts. After sitting around in yard 2 for many months, I was finally given a job in the knitting shop. The inmates consider this shop the worst one to work in. The shop was run by Kennedy, a disciplinarian of the old system. The men feared and hated him. He was always finding fault with someone. One of the keepers in charge of the men in this shop was unfit to guard dogs, let alone men. He looked more criminal than the men he was in charge of, and there were some really ugly fellows among the hundred men there. My first job was assisting the packer. When the cutter, who supplied the work to the operators on the machine, finished his term and was released from prison I got his job. From then on my troubles began. At first Kennedy wanted to be satisfied that I knew my work, which he soon found out I could do very well. But when he saw me standing around doing nothing, because whatever had to be done was finished quickly, he started complaining that I was not doing enough work. I decided to teach Mr. Kennedy a lesson. I gave him a lay down, as the clothing workers would call it. Whenever he passed through the shop I was busy working. He did not know I was working in my own way, turning out as far as I was able a perfect job, the kind of a job that necessarily took a great deal of time. I took my time placing the patterns on the lay, and figured and refigured in order to save materials. I succeeded in shortening the lays two to three yards from the lengths specified by Mr. Kennedy. He came to investigate and found everything in order. He was satisfied. In working with the electric cutting machine, I cut as if I were cutting men's suits made out of the most expensive wool and worsteds. It was very tiring to take my time cutting cheap flannel nightgowns for inmates of state insane asylums, pajamas, aprons, house dresses, etc., for the various state institutions. I hewed close to the line, made all curves perfect, and above all, deliberately took my time about it. Work of such quality was never before turned out in Sing Sing. But I gained my point. The work was not coming out fast enough for the operators on the machines, who had to sew the cut parts up into the various garments. Mr. Kennedy fumed. But he could not complain that I was not working, because whenever he looked toward the cutting table he found me busy at work. Finally, he asked me what was the matter. I told him there was nothing wrong that I was working as well as I knew how, that I could not work otherwise. If he did not like the way I worked, he could put me at other work or make a change, since he had the power to do what he desired. He fumed and blustered and sent me out of the office. As the cutter of the knit shop I also took care of the stock room, which was stacked with all kinds of piece goods. The cutter before me used to dispose of a few yards of piece goods from time to time in return for pocket money, cigarettes and favors. The inmates bought the materials to sew up into sheets and pillowcases, well-fitting underwear, handkerchiefs, and the like, which they used themselves, sold, or exchanged for other articles. When I was placed in charge of the cutting table my fellow prisoners came around, leaned over the table looked knowingly and confidentially into my eyes,
passed a few hints about the stock room and waited to see if I would bite. I knew very well what they wanted. I laughed and said, see here, I am not selling anything. There is no use your trying to induce me to. I am no screw either. I am not here to watch over you or any of the prison property. Keep this in mind as far as I am concerned. I see nothing and hear nothing. Whenever you see the stock room door open, remember that. The rest is up to you, you can do as you please. Like old hands at a familiar game they understood me well. Whenever the stock room door was left open, they found the opportune time to sneak around my back, enter the stock room and make away with a bolt or two of goods. The market for sheets and pillowcases in particular became well supplied, and all demands on the part of prisoners for the same was immediately met, for a consideration of course. In the spring Jim Larkin arrived, and later on Harry Wynetsky. When Harry Wynetsky arrived in Sing Sing he immediately became the talk of the prison. You must know Harry Wynetsky to appreciate the humor of it all. On his arrival in Sing Sing, Harry weighed exactly 325 pounds. There were no prison clothes on hand to fit him. But they had to give him grey pants. So the story went round that three men in the state shop who were assigned to make the pants in a hurry did not know whether they were making a pair of pants or a tent. Some said they actually got lost in the cloth and were missing on the count. Wynetsky got his pants, but he did not get a belt with them. When he emerged in the yard he carried a bundle in one arm and held his pants up with the other. Every once in a while he let go, and down slid his pants. Some baby elephant, the prisoners said to me. They'll have to blast the cell block to get him in. One day Jim Larkin came to me for advice on how to mail a letter out without having it censored by the prison authorities. I informed him about the Negro chain. But when I asked him for the letter, he refused to give it to me. Evidently he was suspicious, either he did not trust me or the chain. Later when he informed me what he had done I became furious. As much as I argued with him that he had made a mistake, he refused to admit it. His Irish obstinacy showing up to perfection. Larkin had been foolish enough to turn over his kite, as such letters are called, to the one keeper in the knit shop who was most despised and least trusted by the prisoners. A few days later the keeper informed him upon returning the letter that he had opened it, read it and that its contents were of such a nature that he was afraid to mail it. We found out later that the letter was not opened by the keeper to whom it was entrusted, but by the proper prison authorities. Returning the letter to Jim was a bit of strategy, the authorities wanted to find it on his person. Soon thereafter Jim was called out to the visiting room to meet someone who came to see him. He took the letter with him. It is strictly prohibited to pass out letters through visitors. Jim knew the rules, but he was ready to take a chance. What he didn't know was that the keeper in the visiting room had been instructed to keep an eye on him. The moment Larkin attempted to hand the letter to his visitor, he was caught. The letter was taken away from him. Jim was subjected to a thorough search, in the course of which cash was also found in his possession, and then locked up for violation of the rules. But Jim Larkin was not punished as other prisoners in similar circumstances would have been. He was not thrown into the cooler, nor did he lose good behavior time. It was, however, very apparent that the prison authorities were aroused over Jim Larkin's letter. It was very clear that their attitude toward us changed. I sensed it and so did Harry Wynitsky. Jim Larkin became exceedingly angry. He insisted that the prison authorities had committed a great injustice towards him, freely giving vent to his indignation. A few weeks later, about three in the morning, I was awakened out of a deep sleep by the knocking of keys on my cell door. I jumped up. Hurry up and pack, commanded the keeper in a gruff voice. You are on the draft. I generally knew when drafts were taking place, because I was usually informed in advance who was on the draft. But not this time, for this one was what the prisoners called a sneaky draft. It was kept secret by the warden from the prisoners and the keepers, you knew about it only when it broke upon you. I got dressed in a rush and packed up as quickly as possible. 
In about twenty minutes the keeper came around again, opened the door and commanded, follow me. I did. I was taken down to the washroom, a large room with a cement floor, where the prisoners take their showers. The room soon filled up with prisoners, about sixty in all. The principal keeper was on hand looking us over. His assistant was also there. About a dozen keepers stood guard. A few of the convicts from the mess hall were also on hand to help get the draft off. We put our prison numbers on the bags which contained our belongings before they were taken from us. Jim Larkin and Harry and I grouped together. But not for long. The handcuffs and shackles made their appearance. We were manacled, two prisoners together, hand and foot. We had to walk in step, or else we could not walk at all. After being shackled, we were marched into the mess hall, where we got some hash, bread and coffee. In the dark we were marched out of the prison to a little station built next to the prison, especially for such an occasion. The special car was waiting for us. We were marched in, a grim, haggard looking lot of desperados, desperados who had to be shackled, hand and foot dot before getting into the car the men were in an ugly mood. They muttered curses. Some were worried over what had happened. Some were, silent, but sullen and angry. I took in the whole scene. Again a new experience. I had scarcely become used to Sing Sing, when I was being shipped to Clinton Prison in Danimara, a place noted for its repeaters, hardened criminals who had long terms to do. Among us was a Spanish fellow who later was to be my friend and co-worker at Clinton Prison. He was sentenced by a judge in New York City to 52 and a half years at hard labor. When he arrived in Sing Sing his long sentence was the talk of the prisoners. So it became the joke of the place. It was as follows. Do you know why the judge slapped another one half year on the sentence of 52 years? No, I don't, you answered. Well, came the retort, that was for war tax. On another prisoner, a thin Italian fellow, the guards kept an eagle eye. He had been in the death house, from which he was released because he squealed on some of his companions. They had paid with their lives, but he escaped the chair. The executed men had friends in Sing Sing. Drafting him became necessary for his personal safety. The other prisoners looked at him with contempt. Some remarked, I wouldn't like to be in that job in his shoes. He'll get the knife in Clinton as sure as you are born. Another one in the lot was a young red haired Irish fellow with bumps on his head, a reddened face, pocked and scarred. His had been a life spent in institutions and prisons. To him, prison was just another home. He was as hard as a brick and utterly fearless. His coarse ignorance was offset by a happy and jovial disposition. You could get along very nicely with him provided you were careful not to offend him. We got along very well. How are you, Bolsheviki? He would greet me. Put it here, old timer, he would say, shaking my hand. Once on the train the mood of the prisoners changed. They made themselves comfortable as best they could under the circumstances. I was shackled to Jim Larkin, who took the ordeal as good-naturedly as I. Harry Wynetsky happened to be an odd one so his hands were shackled together. He was lucky, because on the train his handcuffs were removed by the keeper, who made him the official water boy of the shackled crew. He had to answer every call for water, by filling the one tin cup which was provided for that purpose with water and giving it to the one who asked for it. When the train started to leave the small platform of Sing Sing, the prisoners let out a yell, mingled with curses and catcalls. An incessant chatter arose from the human cargo. The keepers in charge of the car were treated to all kinds of verbal jabs and sarcasm. In a few moments we were at Ossining, where we were attached to a regulator train. When the whistle blew and the locomotive bell rang the prisoners shouted and cursed again. The grey mist of early morning lifted, the Hudson ribboned her silvery way, and we were off to Clinton prison. The windows were kept closed to prevent an escape, and every possible precaution was taken by the guards to see that no one could get away. Shoes came off, cigarettes were lit. The smoke, mixed with the odor of sweaty feet, 
made the air stifling. Prisoners told stories of how cons, convicts, on Clinton drafts made their breaks for freedom, some of the breaks happening during my short stay at Sing Sing, so that I knew their stories were true. Whenever one had to go to the toilet, he had to take his shackled partner with him. It was really comical to see how it was done. Nature had to have its way, regardless of the circumstances. When we left Albany, where I had been a member of the legislature, the sun was shining brightly. There was a beautiful day outside, which to me seemed separated from the train. The car was the world of the prison, outside, a different world. It looked strange and fantastic. I wondered if it could be the same world I lived in a few months ago. I enjoyed the unfolding scenery of the ride, but my fellow prisoners enjoyed themselves most by using all the power in their lungs every time a farmer came into view. A number of them would cry in unison, How goes it, Hoosier? You hold him, see, while I wing him. I understood their attitude, for in their hate first came the police, then the screws of the prison and third the farmers and residents of the rural communities. I believe this hatred was due to the fact that the so-called Hoosiers despised them just as much and welcomed every opportunity if they lived near a prison to join in the hunt for an escaped convict. For the $50 reward offered by the state the farmers were relentless in pursuit of an escaped convict. Long before noon the bags, containing two ham and two cheese sandwiches, which were given each of us in Sing Sing were opened and the sandwiches devoured. That and water was all we were to get until the journey was finished, a matter of about fifteen hours. As the train rolled on north through the beautiful country, the prisoners caught snatches of sleep. Many started complaining about their feet, because as their ankles began to swell from the shackles the pain became almost unbearable. Others talked about their exploits, how they were arrested, of their sweethearts, mothers and friends. On roll the train. We were passing through valleys and hills. The brightness of the day was lost in a sunset of riotous colors. When we reached Plattsburgh it was already dark. Our car was switched to another track. A small locomotive, puffing in eagerness to be away, was coupled to the car, the whistle of the engine tooted, the bell rang, and before we realized it, we stopped at the small station that is the heart of Danamara. We were glad the weary journey was over, glad, too, of the expectation that soon the shackles and the iron cuffs would be off our hands and feet. At the station the whole town was on hand to greet us. The Clinton prison keepers were there, too. All I could see in the darkness was a small town, above which mountains loomed. It seemed a cold and uninviting place. The keepers were an ugly looking lot. They stood by holding their long tapering sticks with a heavy metal stub on the end. The sticks were new to me, for in Sing Sing the keepers did not carry them. Their attitude to us was harsh, their manner curt. I got the impression that now I was in for some real prison life, because the whole atmosphere was one of heartless discipline and cruelty. We were counted and recounted as we disembarked from the train. When we were lined up in a row on the station platform we were counted and recounted again. They were taking no chances with the new lot of city desperados that had arrived, they were going to make positively sure that the number of convicts in the cargo was as specified in the papers. The crowd in the station looked sneeringly at us, and I could detect in their eyes a spiteful gleam which seemed to say, Now, you wise fellows from the city, we will show you what a real prison is like. I hated them for it. When the principal keeper was sure the count was right, he gave the order to march. We did march between two rows of keepers, silently and sullenly, up the one dusty street that was the town, dragging our swollen feet and shackles along, many a curse being grit between the teeth in silence. The gate of the prison loomed before us in the darkness. An order was given. It swung open. I was a little chilled by the cold mountain air. As we marched through the gate we were counted again. The gate swung back on its hinges. We were now in the prison of the doomed. Still they were taking no chances and counted us once more. Next we were marched into a large room, where we were commanded to line up in a row. The way in which the principal keeper shouted his commands, 
the manner in which the keepers responded gave you the impression that you were in the drill room of a military academy. Here we were not only counted, but also had to answer a roll call, after which it appeared that they were satisfied that we were all delivered. The order was then given to the keepers to remove handcuffs and shackles, after which we were ordered to undress naked. The room was flooded with light from the large glaring electric bulbs. The screws watched every move we made as we undressed. Soon there stood in their naked innocence over sixty men of different shapes and sizes. I again noticed as I had in Sing Sing that many of the men had their skins pricked by the needles of hypodermic syringes, which they used in injecting themselves with narcotics. The examination began as soon as we were undressed. First every bit of clothing was carefully searched, every pocket turned inside out, the lining felt, the seams fingered in order to discover if anything was concealed. But the search did not end there, for the keepers looked into our eyes, up our noses, into our ears, under our armpits, combed our hair with their fingers, looked at our hands and at each finger, looked at our feet, between our toes made us spread our legs apart to discover if anything was concealed between them, and ended the search by making us bend over, after which they spread our buttocks apart and looked to make sure we had not concealed anything there. Yet thorough as this search was, I knew of prisoners who had succeeded in smuggling and opened other contraband, which goes to show that nothing in this world is foolproof. When the search was over we were ordered to dress after which we were immediately taken to our cells. The cells were a trifle wider and larger than those in Sing Sing, and unlike those in Sing Sing were very dry. The cell block also looked cleaner and better kept. Here, as in Sing Sing, a narrow cot was extended from the wall. I threw myself on the thin mattress stuffed with straw, covered myself with the shoddy blanket and went to sleep. I was too tired to stay awake for I had been up since three in the morning. I could wait until tomorrow to find out what was in store for me. At Clinton Prison I went through practically all the formalities that I had been through at Sing Sing. I remember the visit to the doctor. He was a jovial middle-aged man, whom the prisoners rather liked and called Benny the Dope. The rumor prevalent among the convicts was that he was a drug addict. How true it was I do not know. One day he was found dead in his office. Again the wise ones among the inmates were sure it was the result of an overdose of morphine. He greeted me with a smile and asked me to strip to the waist. He gave me a thump on the chest. Well, you are all right, my boy. That was all there was to his examination. Clinton was unlike Sing Sing, for in Clinton you knew you were in a tough place. The keepers were strict. You got very little free time. After your day's work you received an hour for recreation in the yard, after which you were marched back to your cells. The guards all carried sticks. Those on the walls walked up and down, their rifles in their hands, ready to shoot at a moment's notice. No prisoner's organization, like the Mutual Welfare League of Sing Sing, was allowed. On Saturday afternoons during the summer months, you spent the afternoon in the yard, where you could watch the prison team play baseball with outside teams. On Sunday you either attended the religious services or stayed in your cell all day long. In the fall and winter months, the prisoners were confined to their cells after working hours. Entertainments were given on rare occasions. Cooking was prohibited in practically all shops. If you wanted to cook up a pot of coffee you did it at the risk of being caught and sent to the cooler, solitary. A prisoner was allowed to spend no more than six dollars every two weeks in the village store, where the prices were extremely high. You were allowed only two packages a year from home. Everyone had to go to the mess hall three times a day for breakfast, lunch, and supper. You could only send out a limited number of letters a month only one visit a month by relatives or friends approved by the prison authorities was allowed to you. One had to watch one step, because every infraction of a rule was severely punished. You not only lost time but also spent a number of days in the cooler on bread and water. I was assigned to the prison tailor shop. Here the prison clothes were made, and suits for the inmates of the prison for the criminal insane, 
which was adjacent to Clinton Prison. Two keepers were assigned to this shop besides the one who took charge of production. One of the keepers was a French Canadian, called Frenchy by the inmates. The other was a middle aged rotund Irishman, rather congenial in his ways, an Irish Republican patriot who took pleasure in letting me read speeches made by Robert Emmett and other Irish patriots, which he clipped from the Irish Republican press. At first he tried to make an operator out of me. But I was too tall, my legs too long for the sewing machine. I was therefore transferred and put to work at the basting table. The head of production was an old German. I despised him from the first day I met him. He was round shouldered, walked with his head outstretched, and, being near sighted, always kept squinting at you through his thick spectacles. Working with me at one table was the Spaniard who had received fifty two and a half years. He made an excellent companion. He was somewhat anarchistically inclined. I learned much about him. He had a mother in Spain. His brother was well off in Cuba in the custom tailoring business. He was an excellent tailor, having learned the profession from his brother. He always insisted that he was not a criminal, even though he related to me many of his exploits in entering apartments at night for the purpose of stealing. As might be expected, he bitterly hated the judge. It seems that he was robbing a wealthy Texas oil man, who was stopping with his wife at one of the fashionable hotels in New York City. He and his partner had succeeded in getting their pockets full of jewels while the couple were asleep. But his partner was not satisfied. He remembered that the lady wore a brooch studded with large diamonds when they first saw the couple in the dining room. His partner was certain the brooch was worth a fabulous sum. We must go back for the brooch, his partner insisted. No, replied the Spaniard, it's hard luck. Come, let's go. But his partner was obstinate. He would not go. Come on. Let's go get the brooch. So I went, like a big fool, with him. The woman, she woke up. When she saw us, she screamed ow 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 so loud. I took a pillow and threw it over her head. But the husband, he woke up. He think I attack his wife. That's the worst thing, when a man is with his women he must act brave. So he gets up and fights me and my partner. And all the time the woman yells like hell. But if I was a criminal, I would take a knife and zip right to the heart. Then there would be no noise. What'd I do? I peek up a shoe and bang over his head and knock him out. The wife she must have fainted. My partner began to run. But it was too late. The whole hotel was awake. We were trapped like rats. I run to the window, the police were there. Now I am a criminal, they say, and that I wanted to kill, that I was not satisfied to rob the big rich gentleman, that I wanted to rape his wife, too. So the judge sent me away for fifty two and a half years. And my partner whose fault it all was, he comes to prison and gets religious. You know, I work in the state shop. I work on a keeper's uniform. I decide to make one for myself. My partner find out. And now am I'm in Clinton prison. I used to listen to him moan a Spanish folk song, in a monotone, or marvel as he would go into ecstasy over a photograph that some Cuban ballerina had sent him after he wrote her for it. Then he would tell me about his family, his mother, his sister, his motherless daughter, and how he loved them all. He would end up by sighing, rolling his eyes in a tragic way, as if he knew he would never again see them and would never again be free. I wrote many letters for him, asking the prison superintendent to transfer him back to Sing Sing, though I knew it was useless. He never finished his fifty two and a half years. He died in Clinton prison. Mui amigo, he would call me, as he handed me a cup of coffee. I supplied the coffee and sugar. Fifty two and a half years, in spite of his twisted logic, in spite of the fact that he was a thief, had a genuine love and sympathy for humanity. Life was not without its humor and excitement in the tailor shop. A motley crew worked here, and some of them were very ugly criminals. One of my great dilemmas was the question of getting shaved. In Clinton each shop had a barber or two, according to its size.
the tailor shop, a large shop, having two. The barber chairs were crude, wooden, prison-made affairs. Coming up with me on the draft was a young German fellow who said that, though he was a machinist, he would tell the keepers he was an expert barber, in order to get a barber's job, which was considered one of the good jobs in Clinton. Sure enough, he succeeded, for he was assigned as second barber to the tailor shop. But he was not the barber I was assigned to. I was assigned to the old barber, a Puerto Rican. I went to the Puerto Rican for my first shave. I gave him one look. When I saw the expression in his eyes I decided it was not safe to shave with him. So I asked the German if he would shave me. He consented. It was an ordeal. He held me tightly by the nose, so that I could not breathe. He pulled my ear. He put his dirty hand in my mouth. He delighted in shaving against the grain. Slips of the razor and cuts there were plenty. But I preferred innocent butchery at the hands of the German barber to the murderous gleam in the eyes of the Puerto Rican. Nor was I mistaken in my fears. One day a young fellow sat down in his chair for a shave. The Puerto Rican put the towel around his neck and then proceeded to cut the poor victim with his razor. The fellow got up with a scream. When the other inmates saw what happened they went after the Puerto Rican. A riot started. The Puerto Rican grabbed the great big cutting shears and edged himself into a corner. He glared at the attackers like a wild beast. He looked stark mad. The riot call was sounded. In a few minutes the keepers came running in excitedly, with pointed rifles, many of them very much frightened. Our keeper, Frenchy, in his excitement, swinging his stick in the air, mounted a table and stepped into a pail of water. This broke the tension and caused everyone to laugh. The Puerto Rican was overcome by the keepers, as were all the other prisoners found with missiles in their hands. The Puerto Rican was sent to the prison for the criminal insane. The others were sent to the cooler. Dot working as a presser at the table next to me was a young Jewish lad of about twenty. He was always in a sullen mood. I thought he was crazy. Very often he would stop his work turn to a group of prisoners who were talking or laughing and interject, stop talking about me. Don't think I don't know. And stop laughing at me, too. Now cut it out, if you want to know what is good for you. One day when no one was suspecting anything he picked up a heavy wooden block which is used in pressing the shoulders of coats, and with terrific force let it down upon the head of an unsuspecting fellow prisoner. His face became distorted, his eyes were red. The prisoner struck fell unconscious to the floor with a large gash in his head from which blood flowed freely. The Jewish lad was subdued, taken away and sent to the prison for the insane. Dot in my company was a tall upstate Yankee. He was six feet six inches and had the mental capacity of a child. He believed all the wild stories we told him about New York. We finally got him to believe that in New York City the gangsters were so numerous that they pointed their guns at you, from out of the windows of the large buildings, in order to take pot shots at you. Our tall Hoosier, as we called him, had an enormous appetite. He was always hungry. He ate what everyone left over. Fish cakes, meatballs and especially bread pudding found in Hoosier a ready customer. He would gather it all together as it was passed to him and at night when alone in his cell would devour it all. No one except Hoosier in our company ate bread pudding. It was a concoction made from the week's leftover bread boiled in water and soaked in a cheap gooey vanilla sauce, with a few raisins thrown in for seasoning. One day a few of the prisoners went to the doctor, complained about belly aches and received the usual dose of compound cathartic pills. At supper time, in the mess hall, as they passed their bread pudding to Hoosier they dropped in the sea. Sea. Pills. The next morning in the shop Hoosier in a sweat remarked oh gosh, I don't know what happened to me last night. I kept sitting on my bucket all night till the darn thing overflowed. From then on he was known as bread pudding sea. In Denimero I made the acquaintance of one of the two Finnish political prisoners, members of the Finnish I. W. W. Who were convicted of criminal anarchy for editing a Finnish syndicalist paper. He was Gus alone, 
a carpenter by trade, a very shrewd and courageous man. He was not a communist, but an anarcho syndicalist. At that time he believed in direct action and was ready to practice it. He was sure that a well trained group of workers who were evolutionists were the equal if not better than an overwhelming number of police or soldiers. He had been active in the I. W. W. and had travelled all over the country working in lumber camps, on construction jobs, everywhere organising workers into the one big union. Jim Larkin, Gus Alone, Harry Wynitsky, and I formed a quartet. The keepers treated us with respect, but also with caution. Clinton Prison is situated in one of nature's wonder spots. The Adirondack Mountains rise about it in colourful splendour. From my cell I could see Lake Champlain, majestically at rest in a valley of green and gold. In the fall every leaf was tinted in autumn colours, every bright hue mellowed with a dash of golden brown upon which the sun cast shafts of light, while the tall trees cast their dark shadows to create a phantasmagoria of colours. Yet there was also the village with the ugly cottages of the screws, the prison with its forgotten lost men, the madhouse close by with its maniacs and those who dwelt in the strange lands of their imagination, beyond the wall the hospital for the tubercular criminals who coughed and spat up blood, nearby the cemetery where men rested forever in their plain, wooden, black, painted coffins. Often I watched the scene and pondered how it was possible that amid such beauty so much misery and ugliness could exist. With winter came the cold and snow. The prisoners prepared for both by making mittens and mufflers, and sewing earmuffs onto caps. The mercury often fell below zero. The wind drove the snow into high drifts of five, six or more feet in height. In the morning during blizzards we walked shivering with our buckets through a path lined by snow banks which rose high above our heads. The Siberia of America the men called the place, and it really looked it. During the winter months we were locked up for the night, after supper, which was served at four. The men amused themselves or passed the time as best they could. Some sang, only to arouse the anger and ribald remarks of others. Others carried on conversations with fellow prisoners on other tiers and in other cells. The studious and serious-minded prisoners read books and magazines. Many artistically and industriously inclined worked at their particular hobbies. Many would pace up and down in their narrow little cells for hours. The lights went out at nine o'clock. The cell block soon became quiet. One heard the heavy breathing, snores, an occasional moan the steps of the keeper, marching up and down the cell block. Very often I would lie awake. Events, experiences would go through my mind. The dreams of freedom, the joy of being once more with family and friends were sweet. As the dreams assumed reality in my imagination I fell asleep. In the morning I would jump off my cot just in time to get my tin can filled with hot water. I dressed and washed hurriedly the doors unlocked. I picked up my bucket at the given command, marched with my company to the bucket shack and emptied it. I was part of a continuous line of men, each carrying a bucket, alongside of me was another line. The two lines spread apart as they entered the shack. A heavy stream of water was continuously pouring down into a large metal bowl. Each line emptied its buckets into the soup bowl, as the prisoners called it then washed them under the pouring stream. One's hands and face always got splashed. We then deposited our buckets on the rack and proceeded by companies straight into the mess hall. What was on the hands or faces of the men did not matter. We marched to the long benches and narrow long tables which stretched across the room. Each company when it reached its table stood at attention until the keeper gave two taps with his stick the order to sit down and eat the uninviting breakfast. The cereal I never ate, because on a number of occasions I had found long worms in it. The rest of the prisoners ate it, and if they found a worm, just picked it out, threw it away and went on eating. A tap by the keeper with his stick signaled that breakfast was over and that the company had to rise. Another tap, the order to march out into the yard where the men were lined up for a few minutes before being marched into the shops. Danimara was run on the old system. Nevertheless, 
in spite of the strict discipline, it was possible for one to adjust himself and get along quite well. I found it a little more difficult to get the things I wanted, the things that only currency could buy. But I soon found out how to get cash, what could be used in lieu of money. Cigarettes, Bull Durham and Duke's mixture were as good as United States currency. In fact, they could be readily exchanged for money. For cash one could obtain special steaks and potatoes cooked by the inmates who worked in the powerhouse. For cigarettes or tobacco one could get better food, from the inmates who worked in the mess hall, delivered just before we were locked up in our cell. Prisoners who had accumulated cash through gambling, or selling goods, would gladly give you cash if you could arrange to deposit an equal amount to their account at the office. This could only be done if you knew how to send instructions out by mail through non-prison sources. Here as in Sing Sing a quarter would do it. A chain worked in Clinton as in Sing Sing. Who made up the chain I never was able to discover. All I did was to give my dear man a quarter and the letter, the rest was taken care of. But in Clinton it could be done only on special occasions and you were notified when you could take advantage of it. Clinton was considered a punishment prison, a place where the most desperate criminals with the worst reputations, those who were repeaters and had to serve long terms, were sent. Ten years was considered an ordinary sentence. When I told them that I had a sentence of five to ten they laughed and said pal, that's nothing at all. I met many lifers and men with twenty, twenty-five, thirty, forty, sixty, and one with ninety-year sentences. Prisoners who could not be controlled in the other prisons were sent here. The worst drug addicts among the state prison inmates were found in Clinton. A large number of the fairies, homosexuals, and their partners sooner or later were transferred here. Clinton was a veritable hell of contradictions, where human character in its worst and in its best was brought out in sharp relief. Here too was comedy, but above all grim tragedy. In Sing Sing it did not take me long to discover that sexual satisfaction was obtained by a very large percentage of the prison population through contact with one of their own sex. The aggressive men were known as wolves, the others as kids, pansies, fairies and sweethearts. It was not unusual for me to hear someone remark, there goes the big wolf with his two kids. The wolves took care of the objects of their love. They showered them with favors, gave them shirts, blankets, food, money, and above all protected them in every possible way. One youngster in Auburn prison put up a terrific battle to ward off the wolves. He had to fight with great risk to his physical well-being in order finally to succeed. He was about 19, slim and good looking. As soon as he arrived the wolves started to introduce themselves. They showered him with gifts. At first he thought he was fortunate, but when they started to caress him like a woman and to demand what they consider their due, he refused, whereupon, they attempted to terrorize him and beat him into submission as procurers do. But he was strong and courageous. He fought back desperately. It became the talk of the whole prison. Many youngsters succumb, because state prison is not their first experience with institutional life. They have grown up in either religious or state reformatories from which they graduated into the penitentiaries, finally completing their development in a state prison. Besides, the prison authorities seem undisturbed over these practices among the inmates. Interesting too was the attitude of many of the inmates. They look upon abnormal sex relationships as perfectly normal and proper. I spoke about it to prisoners who were above the average in intelligence and who had a good sense of what was right and wrong. Often I found to my amazement that not only did they consider it perfectly proper but that they also indulged whenever they had the opportunity to do so. I once was struck by the attitude of the inmates over a situation that developed in Yard 2 involving two blonde fellows just admitted. As soon as they appeared in yard two the wolves and other inmates became agitated about them. From what I could see they looked absolutely normal. The other prisoners knew differently. I watched to see what would happen. When they walked in the yard, they were followed. A flirtation with them was started that was as genuine in appearance as between a couple of girls and some shy nervous boys. 
but the newcomers would have nothing to do with the white inmates. They attached themselves to a group of Negroes for whom they did washing, cooking, errands and the most menial work thrown upon them. The Negroes knew their power over them, for they ordered them around like servants, scolded them and abused them at every opportunity. The inmates called them nigger lovers. The white inmates were not angry with them because they were perverts, not at all, but only because they did not yield their pervert favors to the white men. It is sometimes very difficult to understand the moral code of some prisoners. Once I overheard the following remark by such a prisoner, when he saw a woman smoking a cigarette in a group visiting the prison, if my girl smoked a cigarette in public, I'd bat her in the eye. Clinton prison was full of degenerates. They flaunted their homosexualist practices. The names they affected included Princess, Cleopatra, Nellie, Lizzie, as well as those of famous movie actresses. Their mannerisms were feminine, so was the inflection of their voices. They had high heels attached to their shoes, powdered their faces and rouged their lips and cheeks. They remade their shirts to give them a blouse effect and embroidered hearts around the kerchief pockets. During the summer months, the fairies took blankets with them to the yard and spread them on the grass. Here, reclining with their husbands, as they called their companions, they engaged in amenities of repartee and exchanged darts of vulgar wit. They were extremely jealous of one another, when angry called each other, hussy, cat, lady bum and similar names. Perhaps the most popular fairy was the princess, a man of about forty-five, married and the father of several children. There was not a single manistrate about him. His walk, his speech, the way he tossed his head, the motions of his hands, his behavior in the company of men were always feminine, never masculine. Next in popularity was a short ugly colored man of about thirty, who was very slim. He was almost jet black. His hair kinky and curly, bright laughing eyes topped a broad nose that almost covered his thin black face. His lips were of medium thickness and edged an enormous mouth which displayed two rows of large snow white teeth. Why this colored man was called a man, I don't know. Not only was he feminine in all his actions and characteristics but in him they were exaggerated. I never saw a person in prison more jolly than he. Always laughing, ever disporting a coquettish smile. The way he rolled his eyes, broke into a laugh, or affected an air of modesty was similar to that of a girl flushed with excitement. During a flirtation. When angry, he was a feminine shrew on fire. In spite of his ugliness in spite of the revulsion he aroused in me, he was nevertheless a favorite among the inmates, especially the white ones. How was it possible for convicts in a prison like Danimara, where the regime was so strict, where freedom of motion was limited, to engage in practices of sex perversion? It is impossible to keep a perfect watch on prisoners unless a guard is attached to each prisoner. The number of guards actually employed, can only do a superficial job in watching what takes place. Furthermore, the degenerates in Clinton were assigned to jobs where it was possible for many of them to ply their trade quite freely, and I suspect not without the knowledge of the prison authorities, who surely are not so blind that they do not know about this common practice. At Clinton prison, as also in Sing Sing and Auburn prisons, much of the trouble that develops between inmates has its roots in the jealousies arising out of these abnormal sex relationships. I have seen convicts cut each other up seriously because of this jealousy. I remember such an incident in Clinton prison, when a tall French Canadian took a fairy away from one of the convicts I described previously as the red-headed Irish youth with bumps on his head. Just as the men in the yard were given the order to line up with their companies, the red-headed Irish lad threw the Frenchman flat on his back, squatted across the Frenchman's chest, grabbed hold of his head by the hair and brandishing a long knife prepared to cut his head off. The Frenchman gave out a yell like a wild hyena. Frenchy, our keeper, was close at hand. With calm deliberate courage he raised his stick quickly and with all his might brought it down on the attacker's head. The blow was terrific, the Irishman collapsed over his victim. But I could not understand the reaction of the prisoners. 
a little spark of encouragement and a riot of major proportions would have started. The prisoners became madly indignant at the keeper. What right did he have to use his stick? They cursed him. An ugly murmur rose from their ranks. They saw nothing wrong in the act if one of their number attempted to murder a fellow prisoner. But that a keeper should use his stick in order to save the life of a fellow prisoner, they considered an outrageous act of brutality. The class lines in prison between the screws and the prisoners were very sharp. Evidently the animosities created by the long confinement of the men and the harsh treatment they received were responsible for their code which held that every act of a keeper against the person of a convict, regardless of its motives, was an attack upon the whole convict fraternity. In no other way can I explain it. Hoosier, a lad of about nineteen, was committed to Clinton prison for perpetrating the terrible crime of stealing a cow, killing it, skinning it and selling the hide for a few dollars. He seemed to enjoy coming to Clinton prison, where the worst bad men from the big city were confined. The minute he arrived he was spotted by the wolves, here was a young country lad from the farm. He was assigned to the mess hall. He seemed to be having one fine time. The wolves showered him with presents. I remember hearing him say one day, Well, you city fellas can't fool me. I read all about ye. My father on the farm used to get the Sunday paper from New York every week. I'm wised up. Soon he sported a wrist watch, new shirts, a nice new sweater. He was making friends among the old timers who were initiating him into the ways of prison. And they certainly did. He became very popular with the wolves. When in the yard he was trailed by a score of them. He walked around with a happy air of satisfaction and self-assurance. He was now in big company. Perhaps he thought the Sunday paper from New York that came once a week to his father's farm no longer could teach him anything, for he knew it all. He was thrilled with his prison experiences. He was not only at home in the society of the prison big shots, but he was actually one of them. In Auburn there was an undersized Jewish lad of about eighteen. He reminded one of a slinking pup that has had its spirit broken by too many beatings. He doubted every kind word, and feared to look one straight in the eye. I never saw him smile. This Jewish lad was the kid of Big Bill Jew, an arrogant negro who had spent most of his life in penal institutions. He was well built, about five foot ten in height, with a cruel and angular chiseled face. His smile was sarcastic, his demeanor haughty, giving one the impression that he was extremely selfish. He was forty-five or over, strong and well preserved, despite his years of incarceration. He was known as a cocky, a dope fiend. When he was released after serving almost ten years in prison, he got off at Albany, spent his money on dope, drugged himself to capacity, and attempted to commit a robbery. He was caught that same night, convicted and sent back to prison. In the bathhouse he used to admire his physical prowess as he looked over his naked beauty, and would delight in telling all the inmates how he was going to enjoy his first night of freedom with his dark gal. The Jewish lad was his kid. But he was more than that. He was his slave. He jumped at Bill Jew's beck and call. One day the lad was caught by Bill Jew with a white inmate. I saw the Jewish lad after he had been scolded, cursed and beaten for his unfaithfulness. His eyes were bloodshot, the tears had not yet dried. The story was told to me by one of the old timers, a Jewish safe cracker, who was looked up to by the Jewish inmates. He narrated how Bill Jew cursed and scolded, yelling at the lad, You're my kid. I take care of you, and as long as I am in this prison you're better stick to me. Then he slapped him all over the face, while the lad cried for mercy and promised never to be unfaithful again. My narrator spoke in contempt of the lad, not because of what he was but because a Jewish lad had to associate with a Negro, a Schwarzer. After that the lad continued faithful to Bill Jew, and like a frightened puppy continued to take the abuse and the scorn that was heaped upon him by the Jewish inmates. In Clinton you felt that you were in a primitive wilderness. The prisoners liked to talk about the jungles surrounding the prison, 
the impossibility of breaking through them and making good an escape. They looked upon Clinton as America's forsaken spot, the hellhole of America. Nevertheless, there were many who attempted the dash for liberty. My German friend was one of them. Radically inclined, he said that if he ever got a chance he would take it, make for the city and beat it back to Germany. The revolution in Germany was in the making and he was sure he could play his part in it. He got his chance. They gave him a job on the farm outside of the prison taking care of the hogs. He came to me smiling, told me of his good fortune. His smooth oval German face lit up. He would wait for his opportunity. One day in the yard he came to me, nervous but very happy in his agitation, tomorrow I go. Goodbye. I wished him luck even though I thought his attempt was foolish. The next day he was missing. Two days later they brought him back. I happened to catch a glimpse of him. He was in rags. He had not been able to traverse the jungles. He looked like a man who had returned from a different world. Later, after he had served his punishment in the cooler, I saw him in the yard. His failure was a bad blow. He was a different man. His spirit was broken. The most daring exploit, based on sheer courage and split seconds, was the break of an Irish American lad and a pole. The Irish American lad I knew well. He came from the lower west side of New York City. He was one of the 10th Avenue mob. In spite of the fact that he was in his early 20s, he was already old in prison years, having spent most of his youth in penal institutions. He was fair of complexion, of medium height, with light brown hair and a broad forehead. They called him Angel Face. He was the kind of boy any mother, from appearances only, would have been proud of. He was a product of New York's streets poor family environment and sheer poverty. It seemed to me that he was simply puzzled by all the complexities of life. You are an anarchist, he would say to me, I don't know what it means, but if it's what I think it is, then I'm all for it. You are against the present laws. You believe things are not what they should be. I felt that all along. Maybe you know how to fight it. I've been fighting it all along and here I am in this dump for life. But if ever I get a chance, I'll learn. And his eyes laughed, as his baby face lit up into a smile that petered out in a puzzled expression of perplexity and he waved his hand in parting. So long, Bolsheviki, he said, using the common term for us politicals. I liked him, though he was known as a killer, the kind who, when cornered, fights like a lion and kills without hesitation. Adversity and the struggles of childhood had hardened him, but beneath this veneer was a youth with a heart that could feel deeply and genuinely, with sympathy for the underdog, a sense of justice, and a willingness to fight for what he thought was right. Contemplating him, I came to the conclusion that fundamentally he was a sound young man in rebellion against the social abnormalities of his environment that had crippled his youth by denying him the freedom and opportunities for normal self-expression that were his natural right. He was determined to break his way to that freedom through any obstacle, be it a social barrier or a prison wall. But he knew of only one way to break through, by main force. Patience subtleties, organization were beyond his intelligence and foreign to his temper. That limitation was at once both his misfortune and the source of his truly admirable courage. What appealed to me most in him was his innate defiance of life as it is. In that, surely he was a revolutionist in temper and truly my comrade. Angel Face and the Pole did odd jobs around the prison under the supervision of a keeper. Every morning, after mess, the two of them, accompanied by their keeper, would go to a room on a level with the yard and facing it. Here they would wait for their keeper to put on his overalls, and then they would follow him to their assigned chores. At the precise time that the keeper was wont to put on his overalls, a small band of prisoners who worked outside would march across the yard to a small door that was opened for them. On the wall above were six prison guards, pacing up and down, trigger finger on the trigger of their rifles ready to shoot at a moment's notice. 
my Irish friend and the Pole had planned to time their escape for the brief lapse required by their keeper to put on his overalls and while the band of prisoners marched through the open door. Hoping in that interval to dash for the open door and lose themselves in the woods. The opportune morning came. The keeper was putting on his overalls, the company was marching through the open door. They made a dash for freedom across the yard, using the few breathless seconds between life and death. It was so audacious, so unexpected that the keepers on the wall were dumbfounded for a few moments. These few moments were all the two lads needed. The firing of the rifles came too late. The two prisoners had made their getaway. Then came the blowing of the siren. The manhunt began. All of us prisoners were locked in our cells. The keepers of both shifts were mobilized. Farmers came rushing into the prison and were enrolled as deputies. From my cell window I saw the automobiles leave with their details of armed men. I watched one automobile and could scarcely believe my eyes. Riding in the front seat with a rifle across his knees was a convict. He worked in the front office. The son of an upstate judge, he had been convicted of murder. The prisoners despised him. He was feared by the keepers. He walked around the prison as if he ran the place. From the expression on his face I could see that he despised the inmates and did not consider himself one of them. Here was this convicted murderer with rifle in hand engaged in the mad excitement of a manhunt, eyes strained, muscles taut, ready for the catch. The prisoners shouted invectives at him, but he was too far away to hear. I listened, and the sentiments of the inmates, regardless of the language in which they were couched, were my sentiments. Day after day went by. The manhunt continued. If they could only make the jungles. The good wishes of every prisoner went out to the fugitives as their hunt went on. On the fifth day a farmer and his two burly sons brought back the ghost that was once angel face. But there were also the glad tidings of the Pole's successful escape. Town after town sent reports that he had passed through. From one farmer he stole clothes, from another a horse, which was later abandoned, and so on until the authorities lost trace of him altogether. Later, when the Irish lad was released from the punishment cells, we learned what had happened. The Pole and he had agreed that as soon as they gained freedom they should separate. The Pole evidently knew forests and the open country, had a sense of direction and could make his way. One does not pick up that sort of knowledge on the sidewalks of New York, surely not on 10th Avenue. One learns how to dodge trucks and automobiles, how sometimes to escape from the clutches of a policeman, but of the ways of nature Angel Face was totally ignorant. Our Irish lad was completely lost. In the daytime he hid in the jungles, at night he ventured out, but all the time he kept running in circles, instead of making headway. He was always returning to the prison. On the fifth day, tired and exhausted, he decided to hit the open road. He proceeded but a short distance, when the farmer and his sons came upon him and covered him with their rifles. The game was up. I had my troubles in Clinton prison and so did the other politicals, Harry Wynitsky, Jim Larkin and Gus alone. First we had trouble with our visitors. Instead of allowing us to talk with them like human beings, we were segregated in wire cages with a keeper inside each cage censoring all a prisoner wished to say. We rebelled against this and forced the prison authorities to give our visitors the same courteous treatment accorded to all others. One day Agnes Smedley came to Clinton on the pretext that she was interested in prison problems. She was shown the prison, and on her tour of inspection came across Jim Larkin who knew all about her visit. He greeted her with a smile which did not go unnoticed by the prison authorities, who became suspicious, investigated her, took her aside later and ordered her to leave. Then followed a series of articles in the Socialist Daily, the New York Call, about the dungeon at Danimara and the terrible treatment being accorded to the politicals, especially Jim Larkin. It was a grim story, part true and part good imagination. It infuriated the prison authorities and particularly state superintendent of prisons Rattigan. 
he looked upon all Reds as dangerous criminals. He really hated us and held us personally responsible for what had appeared in the call. Tratagon appointed a commission, which included himself, the warden, the chief doctor of the prison for the criminally insane, and an outside psychiatrist, and which was to pass on our sanity. Jim Larkin was the first one subjected to an examination. They were rather rough with him, but he was rougher in his retort, which he delivered in trenchant Irish brogue. He was followed by Harry Wynitsky, who was cross-examined at length, then came Gus alone, and I was last. I answered the questions they asked me calmly and deliberately. They seemed chiefly concerned with the treatment accorded to our visitors. I told them that it was discriminatory, that we resented this discrimination and would seek through all means at our command to fight it until it was ended. I told them that while we did not expect any favored treatment or special considerations, under no circumstances would we tolerate obvious injustice. They dismissed me immediately. But I had seen enough to be alarmed. We politicals had a conference in the yard that afternoon. It was obvious from the very nature of this commission and the manner in which Jim Larkin and Harry Wynitsky had been interrogated that Rattigan was determined to make short shrift of us by declaring us insane, in order to commit us to the prison for the criminally insane as punishment for our public protest. Word had to be sent outside immediately through some trustworthy underground channel. There was but one that could be trusted implicitly, the rabbi. He was a genuine orthodox Jewish rabbi, who lived in Plattsburgh. Since he has joined his maker and is beyond the reach of mundane laws, this sinful world may know that the name of this modern good Samaritan was Rabbi Judelson. For his sake, I hope there is a heaven, for he surely deserves to be in it. Short of stature, with a pointed reddish brown beard and a merry twinkle in his eye, Rabbi Judelson was as wholesome and hearty a man as anyone would care to meet. He was the best friend all the prisoners had, Jewish or Gentile. He understood the men, sympathized with their lot and was always ready to do them a favor, even if it involved infringement of prison rules. He looked upon the prisoners as his children, and they in turn loved him as a father. He was proud of his orthodox Judaism and fought tooth and nail for the religious rights of the Jewish inmates. But he was not narrow and not vindictive. He respected the opinions of others. No prisoner will forget his long black coat, which was far more than a mere garment. It was a sanctuary. Whatever went into its pockets was holy, inviolate, and into its pockets the prisoners would put letters and little slips of paper that bore requests for favors. You had to put them stealthily into his pockets, as if he were not noticing it, and he appeared always unmindful of the fact. When he left the prison and reached his home, he would dig his hands into his pockets, to discover to his assumed surprise the notes and the letters. He would mail the letters and read the notes. Whatever was requested of him, providing it was in his power, he would do. If asked to do so. He would even go to the trouble of calling on friends and relatives of the prisoners for one purpose or another, and on his next visit to prison he would nod to the inmates, to let them know he had received their notes or letters and that he had attended to all their requests. So, Harry Wynetsky wrote a letter and dropped it into the rabbi's long black coat. The letter was mailed. Our friends in New York got busy. Lawyers and visitors came. Instead of going to the bug house, as the prisoners called the place, a few months later, due to the pressure exerted by our many friends, Jim Larkin, Harry Wynetsky and I were on our way back to Sing Sing, and Gus alone was transferred to Comstock. Back in Sing Sing life was more pleasant. There we found Dr. Julius Hammer, serving a sentence for an illegal abortion, having been betrayed to the authorities by political enemies, presumably. Dr. Hammer had financed Martin's Soviet Bureau, had joined the Communist Labour Party and had generously helped to finance its activities. In addition to Hammer there were also Isaac E. Ferguson and Charles E. Rothenberg, who had both been sent to Sing Sing for five to ten years. These three had arrived in Sing Sing while we were in Danamara. But soon after our return a fourth communist newcomer came, a Russian comrade named Paul Manko. 
the last communist prisoner to arrive in Sing Sing during our stay there. Manko, an ordinary rank and file member of one of the Russian branches, was arrested for distributing leaflets, indicted and convicted as a dangerous red leader and sent to Sing Sing. He was obviously a psychopath and probably a paranoic. He had delusions that there was a cosmic plot afoot to poison him, and hence refused all food and drink. The keepers treated him gently and with consideration. We politicals delegated Dr. Hammer, who as a physician understood his mental condition better than any of us and who moreover spoke Russian, to persuade Manko that no one was plotting against him. But that proved the most unfortunate choice we could have made, for Manko detested Hammer as the alleged seducer of his wife. That was apparently another of his phobias. Instead of listening to Hammer, he threatened to settle scores with him in Russia, as one Bolshevik to another. Moreover, the very next time his wife came to visit him, he created a scene, scolded her in voluble Russian at the top of his voice, and the poor woman left dumbfounded and in tears. We were quite sure that she was perfectly innocent of her husband's charges and that Manko, having improvised the seduction charge against Hammer to protect himself from the doctor's intervention, played the irate cuckold to the bitter end with the consistency of a maniac. Harry Wynitsky and I were quixotic enough to try our persuasive powers on him next. Naturally, we couldn't get to first base with him. He spurned our invitation that he eat with us and our offer to taste every morsel of food before he should swallow it. Instead, he would fill his pockets with hard-boiled eggs, onions, breadcrumbs and other bits of food, at which I presume he would nibble when unseen, for somehow he did manage to keep alive and able to work, notwithstanding his refusal to eat with the rest of us. He behaved in the strangest way, going through breathtaking contortions when let out of his cell in the morning and assigned to his daily job. At times, jovial and in good humor. He would approach one of us and with a knowing look and a mischievous smile would say, You can't fool me, I know what's happening. There's a revolution and the Red Army is coming. Soon they will be here and we will all be free. Once while Jim Larkin was looking through a book about Mexico, Paul Manco, proudly pointing to a picture of a Mexican wearing a wide sombrero hat, a belt of bullets around his waist, his rifle leaning against the wall, nonchalantly smoking a cigarette, exclaimed, that, Comrade Larkin, is me. See, that's me smoking a cigarette. I am a general in the Red Army. Knowing, as we did, that he was mentally sick, we could not object when he was assigned to the lunatic asylum for observation. We took steps to see that he was accorded the best of treatment. During his stay at the hospital, Manko, as he passed the linen room, heard someone call for linen. He rushed to the window. Did you hear that? They called for Lenin and Trotsky. He was very much excited when he spoke. Do you know that means Lenin and Trotsky are coming for me? You can't fool me, I know all about it. And he went away excited and overjoyed. Of the many insanity cases I observed in prison, I shall mention only one more. It had to do with that twin of the political passion, religion. Red was an actor who could sing well dance well and compose popular music. He started getting religion in prison. Every Sunday he attended the services. He went to Bible class as well. His daily job was to sew undergarments in the knit goods shop. There a pipe supplied live steam. The prisoners would put buckets underneath the steam pipe to obtain hot water for washing their clothes, or boiling water for their coffee pots. One day Red held forth that he was not afraid of anything, nothing could harm him. Because he had the spirit in him, and to prove it, he said, Can you put your hand in a pail of live steam? No. But I can, and nothing will happen to me, because I have the spirit in me. However, he was stopped from demonstrating. Several days later he took out his penis in the shop and declared, It is evil. It does no one any good. I will get rid of the evil. He grabbed a large shears for the purpose of cutting it off. He was stopped, and this time taken to the hospital. When a prisoner is found to be insane, he is put on a special draft, but before he leaves the prison he is dressed as a civilian, in a black suit, white shirt, 
a tie and a derby hat. One day we discovered Red dressed like that. As he was leaving Sing Sing, he waved goodbye to all of us and threw cigarettes at those of the inmates who saw him off. He seemed quite happy. But Sing Sing had its boisterous madman as well. I recall the case of a man who went raving mad awaiting his execution. The real inhumanity of the act is psychological rather than physical, the endless waiting which fear and imagination fill with unendurable horrors. The tenseness of that waiting is contagious. It affects the entire prison. It is the doomed man's last strong link with his fellow men. It stirs all, from principal keeper to the least of the prisoners, to a hysterical pitch of excitement, no matter how subdued it may outwardly appear. The P. K. is invariably in an ugly mood on such a day, for he has reason to expect a revolting scene, and he steels himself against it with hate and snarling. All the keepers in the P. K.S. office are ill tempered, annoyed by the last minute visitors and the reporters, who are invariably on hand and invariably in the way. The entire prison is tense, the impending execution on the lips of every inmate. I remember the executioner a puny fellow with sandy grey hair, mincing his way across the yard in short quick steps, bound for the powerhouse to see if everything was in order, and I remember that the prisoners never failed to curse him, filling the yard with their indignant imprecations. Before the new death house was opened, we inmates, locked in our cells, would know the exact moment of electrocution, for when the current was on in the electric chair the lights throughout the prison dimmed. An intense hush would fall over the prison. But in a few moments it would be broken by mutterings of indignation and these would rapidly accumulate into a subdued roar, as if of distant waves breaking against the cliffs. Such is the atmosphere through which the condemned man is dragged to his doom, to be burned or fried, as the prisoners call it, terms that describe the effect of electrocution without the slightest exaggeration, for at the end the corpse is actually charred. A keeper in yard two who had attended any number of executions told me that in all his experience only one man faced his doom bravely, a dentist convicted of poisoning his mother-in-law, and all others had to be dragged to the chair in a state of utter collapse, petrified with terror or raving mad. I can still hear the shrieks of one such madman. Since he had been sane when first locked in the death house, the keepers were sure that he was feigning insanity on his day of doom but they were mistaken. He could not be subdued, not even with a hose turned on him full force. He continued to shriek like a wild beast through all the insane commotion. Whatever nightmare he was suffering through in his last moments was communicated to us in our locked cells. That day the entire prison was stark with horror. but there was also romance in Sing Sing. On the grim stage of the visitor's room Charlie Ruthenberg played the Romeo and Ray Ragozin was his Juliet. Ray was an active comrade from New York City, but far from good looking, nor was she in the prime of maidenhood. But love being proverbially blind, such things did not matter. Oblivious to all around him, Ruthenberg would woo her in the visitor's room with all the ardor of an impetuous lover. It was a touching sight, even if most of the prisoners disapproved of such demonstrativeness in public. And after the visit ended, our Romeo would stand for hours on end, waving to Juliet, whose balcony now was the hill above the prison walls, from which she waved back. Judged by the ardor of these furtive prison meetings, their love should have endured for an eternity and surely for the duration of their natural life. But there was some inexplicable joker in this affair, for upon release from prison our Romeo turned Lothario and Dre Rigozin was quickly forgotten in the charms of another Juliet. Ruthenberg's romanticism was merely amusing as long as it was confined to love. But unfortunately it invaded the domain of politics as well, and then it became rather annoying. Yet it was not untypical of the early period of communism in the United States, for the tenor of the time was to behave a la Ruthenberg. I remember the day a much excited Ferguson came to me with a tale of Ruthenberg's fantastic plan to escape from Sing Sing. Although I was on the verge of exploding as he unfolded its details, I listened carefully, without interrupting him even once. The plan was as simple as it was foolhardy. 
a group of Lettish comrades was to explore the terrain around the prison, after which several of the Letts, heavily armed, were to call on Ruthenburg in the visitor's room. At the end of the visit Ruthenburg was to leave the prison, surrounded by his visitors, who were to fight their way out, firing their revolvers as they fled, to the high-powered automobile waiting for them outside the prison gate. From there they were to drive to the hideaway, prepared for the emergency. He was later to steal away to Russia. Ruthenburg firmly believed that in a few years the revolutionary situation in the United States would develop to such an extent that he could return to America, where he was sure he would be acclaimed and become the leader of the American Revolution. It was fantastic. But Ruthenburg was all excited about it. He had already succeeded in getting the Letts to survey the grounds around the prison. He even pointed them out to me one day. Ferguson was more than alarmed, and correctly so. He felt that the plan was a wild romantic dream which would cause great harm to the movement. The others and I agreed with him. We all intervened to stop the scheme. The objections we raised against the plans finally resulted in their being abandoned. Ruthenburg was denied the opportunity of playing the hero and incidentally of making a fool of himself. Had Ruthenburg succeeded he would have played right into the hands of the reactionary forces, who would have seized upon the affair in order to crush all militant and progressive tendencies in the labor movement, because obviously the plan could not succeed without violence and bloodshed. The liberal forces, who were supporting us wholeheartedly in our fight for freedom, would have been alienated. The damage to the communist movement would have been very costly. Why then did a man of Ruthenburg's caliber entertain such a proposition? Because, I believe, Ruthenburg was motivated mainly by a strong personal ambition to be the head of the American Revolution. His actions were based not on what the American conditions demanded, nor on whether they were in harmony with the psychology of the American people, but solely on the romantic aspects of the revolutionary movement in Russia. He was behaving as if America were Tsarist Russia an adolescent attitude unpardonable in a responsible political leader. In a few months I was drafted again. This time to Auburn, the oldest prison in New York State. My companion in misery was Ferguson. It was his first experience with the draft. He certainly did not relish it, although he stayed but a few weeks in Auburn, returning to Sing Sing and soon thereafter to Liberty on bail. Yet the regime at Auburn was liberal compared to Danamara. There were, however, no redeeming features about the place. Sing Sing was on the Hudson and had a large yard. Danamara was surrounded by the natural beauty of the Adirondacks. Its yard was smaller than the one in Sing Sing, but it was nevertheless sample for ball games and other sports. It was bordered on one side by the prison proper and on the other three sides by tall stone walls, yet when you looked beyond the walls the mountains were in view in all their glory. But the yard in Auburn was the smallest of the three. It was oblong in shape, very narrow and completely enclosed by prison buildings. Whichever way you turned or looked, you saw stone walls and brick upon brick. Adjacent to the prison ran a dirty little canal. When the prisoners crowded into the yard there was hardly space for elbow room. In the summer a ball field was improvised that reminded one of a small sand lot in a crowded tenement section of the lower east side of New York City. In the winter time you froze, in the summer it was abominably hot. Unlike the regime freedom of Sing Sing, we were not allowed to use the shop or administration buildings during the free periods. Whether we liked it or not. We had to be in the yard. Because of its canal, Auburn Prison was infested with rats. I never saw so many rodents in all my life. They were so bold that they came out of their holes in broad daylight. If you left some food in a locker or securely hid it in a machine, the next day it was gone, the rats had gotten to it. The inmates set traps for them, but they soon got wise to the traps and avoided them. I worked in the tailor shop. The rats there were more than a nuisance. One of the inmates, a Swedish-American mechanic, decided to catch the rats en masse. He built a very large rat trap out of steel wire mesh that could accommodate at least a hundred of them. But he decided to educate the rats first. Every night he filled the trap with bread and delicious food morsels, 
making sure that the trap was left open. In the morning all the food was gone. The rats marched in, ate what was left for them, and departed. This was done for a week. Then the trap was set. The next day it was full of rats, large ones and small ones, about twenty-five in number. After mess, the custom in Auburn was to have the different companies line up in front of their shops for a smoke. With the permission of the keeper, the trap was brought out into the yard. Beauty, a little black female fox terrier, known for her rat-catching exploits, was on the scene, barking in great excitement. The trap was opened in the middle of the yard. The rats went scampering for freedom in all directions. But their freedom was short-lived. With lightning speed, Beauty seized each scampering rat, one at a time, by the back of the neck, threw it into the air, and went after the next one. When each rat fell, it was dead. Not one rat escaped Beauty. It was a marvelous demonstration. The inmates applauded, and aided the dog by preventing any of the rats from escaping back into the buildings. The Warden of Auburn had a military title and record. The principal keeper had also been a junior officer during the World War. The military spirit therefore prevailed in this prison. The most important thing in Auburn was marching. The keepers took time to drill their companies. You had to march in step and in line, old and young, tall and short, crooked and straight, it made no difference. It seemed as if the prison authorities were of the opinion that if the inmates would only straighten out and march correctly, in good military style, they could be cured of their criminal ways. It was march three times a day to and from the mess hall and to the cell block. If you were out of step, if you did not keep in line with your partner, if you were too far back of the man in front, you were scolded and often punished. Also, everyone was marked, for perfect behavior, a white disc about the size of a silver dollar sewed onto the right sleeve of the coat, if punished once, a blue disc, if punished more than once, a red disc. Through perfect behavior over a given period of time you could graduate from the red to the blue and eventually to the white disc. Auburn prison had its own police station and jail. Prisoners who misbehaved, or were caught breaking prison rules, were arrested and locked up in the station house, where they were interrogated by the P.K., who either freed them with a reprimand, or punished them by taking away a few days' time allowed them for good behavior, very often, in addition, they were thrown into jail, that is, into the cooler. The coolers were dark, without bedding, and those confined to them were fed on bread and water. I have known recalcitrant prisoners who were kept in the cooler for weeks, and who were released only after the doctor reported the danger of a fatal collapse. Pavio, one of the I. W. W. Finnish leaders convicted for criminal anarchy, was kept in one of these dungeons for sixteen days. This frail blonde fellow persisted in refusing to admit a wrong which he did not commit. When he came out he was a skeleton, but happy because of the fight he had put up. A powerful despot in Auburn was the prison doctor. One look at the medico was enough to frighten you. He was a tall austere man, between fifty and fifty-five who was obsessed with the idea that crime was a mental disease and that all criminals were in some manner, shape, or form insane, purely in a pathological sense. Other factors, such as environment, economic conditions, youthful associations, and the like, never entered into his reasoning. If a man was in prison, he was evidently crazy. The doctor's job was to find out the degree of insanity and whether it was of the dangerous kind or not. He took his job seriously. Every prisoner who came to Auburn was subjected to a thorough physical examination. After that came the mental tests, varied and numerous in form, to determine the mental status of the inmates and to discover mental deficiencies. The mental examination was concluded with one by the medica himself, who sought to find out the most intimate details of a prisoner's personal life. I decided that after I had gone through the physical examination I would not submit further to the doctor's pet whims. I refused to answer the questions of the examiners. I finally reached the doctor himself. He was very polite when I entered his office. 
but his demeanor changed when I just as politely informed him that I would not answer his questions. I informed him that as far as I knew there was no law on the statute books that gave him the authority to ask the kind of questions he wanted me to answer. He became indignant. His tone of voice changed. He threatened to arrest me, to throw me into the cooler until I would answer. I replied very calmly that I knew that he had the power to do what he threatened. However, I made it quite plain to him that I would not answer his questions. If anyone looked crazy in that office, it was the medico. He stood up, his face red with anger, his nervous fingers fumbling the papers on his desk. He hesitated in his attempt to say something, stopped, kept quiet for a few moments, and then dismissed me forthwith with the remark that I would find out soon whether or not I could continue to disobey his orders. I was not a little worried when I left. I soon forgot the incident because I heard no more either from the medic or from the prison authorities. A few weeks later we learned that a bug house draft was in preparation. It spread fear throughout the prison. Many of the inmates who were deficient mentally, or who had been at odds with their keepers for some infraction of prison discipline, began to worry about the draft. No one likes to be considered a lunatic. One day at the movies one of the inmates who worked in the doctor's office came to me and offered the information that the doctor had included my name on the Naponark bug house draft. I decided to lose no time in taking up a fight against the doctor. Right after the movies I asked an old timer, a safe cracker, whether or not it was possible to get a letter out of Auburn through some underground channel. I told him what I wanted the favor for. He told me to write the letter and to give it to him in the morning. I gave him the letter in the morning. I also decided to let those inmates whom I trusted know of my fight with the doctor, in order, if I was drafted, that the prison should know why. My letter reached New York the following day. The Workers' Defense Committee got busy immediately. One of the lawyers, Isaac Schur, came to Auburn. He interviewed the warden. He interviewed the doctor. The warden said I was a model prisoner. The doctor, of course, claimed the whole idea was preposterous, because I was rated far above the average in intelligence. Chaw called me out, told me of his interviews and informed me that he would also take the matter up by long distance phone with the state prison department. The draft to Naponark came soon after, early in the morning, while the prison slept. I heard the unlocking of doors, the commands of the keepers, the curses of the inmates. I was wide awake. Only in the morning did we find out who the unfortunates were. On April 22, 1922, I finally received the telegram which informed me that a certificate of reasonable doubt had been granted in my case. It meant that I would be allowed out on bail pending my appeal to the New York Court of Appeals. I immediately made preparations for the happy event. I was overjoyed when my keeper instructed me to prepare to leave, for I was going home. I had been almost three years in prison. I took the first suit they gave me, a black hill fitting one, prison made, of poor material and workmanship. A cap, taken in preference to a derby hat, a white shirt, a celluloid collar, and a black bow tie completed the outfit. I must have looked very ludicrous, because when I met my lawyer, Joseph Brodsky, in the warden's office, he burst out laughing. I did not mind it a bit. I was going out, that was all that mattered. With Brodsky was a detective of the bomb squad, one I knew well from the 1919 raids. Brodsky explained that I was going to be taken to New York, where I would be freed on bail, pending my appeal before the New York Court of Appeals, and that Rothenberg and Ferguson were already out on bail. He further informed me that Justice Cardozo had signed the writ which made my release on bail possible. Brodsky insisted that I get a new collar and tie as soon as we reached outside. Out of prison I felt as though I was walking on thin air. I took deep breaths. I looked at the people as strange beings and was surprised that they looked so well. We went into a haberdashery shop, where I selected a tie and bought a collar. When asked what size collar, I said 17, 
the size I wore when I first entered Sing Sing. But when I put it on, Brodsky had another laugh on me, because it was ludicrously too big. I had not realized how much I had shrunk, and I was not troubled by it. Dot since the train for New York was not due to leave for several hours. The bomb squad detective hinted that if I would like it, in as much as I had been in prison and away from girls so long, he knew just the place to go. But I declined his kind offer, and so he left me in the custody of my lawyer on the pretext that he had to visit a relative. I had lunch with Brodsky, but was too excited over my liberation to remember what we talked about. Later, at the station, the detective met us. Brodsky had tickets for the three of us in one compartment. As we made ourselves comfortable, the detective showed me his handcuffs, remarking, Say, Benny, I was ordered to put the cuffs on you. I won't, though, but you better don't try to escape, because I am a good shot. I never miss. He then proceeded to take off his belt and holster with the revolver and bullets. These he placed on the seat next to me. If I had wanted to escape, I could have taken the gun, put the cuffs on his hands, and escaped very easily, his braggadocio notwithstanding. The detective then proposed a game of poker. I refused, but Brodsky played with him, making sure that the detective should win, in order to keep him in good mood. I slept in the upper berth, Brodsky on the side, and the detective in the lower berth. I was eager to get home and to see comrades and friends. Innumerable incidents and ideas concerning the movement and my future activities flashed through my mind. Stretched out on the upper berth, I listened to the pleasant music of the swift moving train over the rails. I was moving away from the monotonous life of prison, onward to the city where a warm welcome would await me, happy faces greet me, and a life of activity begin. In the morning I was in New York. When we arrived, it was too early to go straight to court, so I went to police headquarters first, where I was fingerprinted and photographed again. This took a little time. But around 10 o'clock I appeared in court, secured my release and for the time being was a free man again. I went straight home. My folks lived on Greenwich Avenue in two rooms that were formerly the mailing headquarters of the underground communist movement. On the way I passed the places that were familiar to me, Patchen Place, where John Reed had lived, the alley where Jim Larkin had had his quarters, and the office of Dr. Maximilian Cohen, one of the first secretaries of the New York District of the Communist Party. Many comrades came to visit me at Greenwich Avenue. I saw the party leaders at the National Office of the Workers' Party, located at 799 Broadway, corner of 11th Street, Rothenburg and Lovestone were not pleased to see me then. Lovestone, with Rothenburg's complicity, had already taken advantage of the fact that Rothenburg and Ferguson had been liberated a few days earlier than I, to arrange a banquet for them the night before I arrived in New York. Already they were scheming and playing for position in the movement. I also discovered that steps had already been taken to make Rothenburg the general secretary of the party. I visited a number of party institutions and auxiliary organizations. The friends of Soviet Russia occupied an entire building on the corner of 13th Street and 7th Avenue. The movement had grown considerably, its ramifications were many but everywhere I went I heard about the struggle going on in the party. I was told of caucuses, that the movement was split, one group having refused to join the United Communist Forces. I heard about William Z. Foster and the Trade Union Educational League which he headed. It was all new to me. I had not been informed on all these developments. One thing I did realize, and that was that the virus of factionalism that had been responsible for the violent internecine struggles when the communist movement was started in 1919 had not been eradicated. Personal animosities were prevalent in all quarters, the comrades hating each other bitterly. I decided to listen, investigate, and learn what it was all about before I made up my mind on the party situation. Soon after, a mass meeting was held in Central Opera House welcoming all the politicals released from prison. The hall was jammed with joyous men and women who went wild with enthusiasm in welcoming us. 
when I got up to speak I received a tremendous ovation. I thanked the workers of New York for their splendid support. I took the opportunity to reaffirm my communist ideals, defying the ruling class of the United States to crush the revolutionary working class movement by imprisonment of its followers. I concluded by predicting the victory of the American proletarian revolution which would turn the sham democracy of the United States into a Soviet government of proletarian dictatorship. The years I had spent in prison did not change my political convictions. I returned to freedom a firm believer in communism. Chapter 4, American Communism Comes Up For Air The Communist Party Was Teeming With Life the most important activity in 1922 was raising money through the friends of Soviet Russia for the victims of the Russian famine. All the important party members seemed to be working for that organization, which collected thousands of dollars every day. But this work did not appeal to me. I preferred political activity. I had hoped to tour the country when I came out of prison and spread the gospel of communism. But I soon discovered that the party was much more interested in petty politics than in the larger issue of bringing its message to the American people. It was stewing in its own juices of bitter factional controversy. Following the raids, the communist factions had made several attempts to unite into one organization, but failed each time. Moscow, too, had intervened and had ordered the communists in America to unite. But no sooner was unity achieved than the movement again split over the question of publicly and legally carrying on communist activities. The Underground Communist Party had organized a number of legal political organizations with which to camouflage its activities. The most important of these, the Workers' Party of America, succeeded in drawing into its ranks a number of revolutionary socialist organizations that had refused to go along with the left wing when the socialist party was split in 1919 and had steadfastly refused to join the underground communist movement, although these organizations subscribed in full to the communist program of the Third International. The underground communist party was affiliated with the Third or Communist International, but the Workers' Party was not. Among the members in the movement, the underground Communist Party was known as the number one organization, while the Workers' Party was the number two organization. A large section of the underground Communist Party split away from the underground movement, feeling that the Workers' Party was given too much autonomy and that its program was no more than a remote approach to the Communist program. Regarding the Workers' Party as a dilution of communist principles and a step leading toward the liquidation of the communist movement, this group, which called itself the United Toilers and was nicknamed by Lovestone the United Toilets, published in its official paper, The Workers' Challenge, edited by Harry M. Wicks, the most violent and vituperative polemics in America. I should say that 99% of the United Toilers membership came from the foreign language federations. They were chiefly Russians, Lets, Ukrainians and Lithuanians, with a handful of Jewish and a sprinkling of English-speaking members. It soon became very clear to me that the deciding factor in the situation was number one, the underground Communist Party, where the internal struggle was over the question of its relations with the Workers' Party or in the broader sense, its attitude toward legal public activity. On this issue number one was divided into three main caucuses. The largest of these was the so-called Goose Caucus. Its leaders were Elie Katterfeld, Secretary of the Communist Party, Abraham Jeg Era, outstanding leader of the influential Russian Federation, Alfred Wajin Knkt, Israel Amter, and Edward Lindgren. The name Goose Caucus originated in the course of a stormy debate, when William Dunn, exasperated by Jeg Era's unceasing and persistent stuttering, interjected, Jeg Era, you make me sick, you cackle like a goose, and Amta, springing to the defense of his fellow factionalist, retorted, but the geese saved Rome and we shall yet save the party, while Lovestone, counterattacking with ridicule, shouted back, all right, then. From now on you're the Goose Caucus. The name stuck. The Goose Caucus looked with suspicion and contempt on those members of number two who were not at the same time members of number one, 
fought against the immediate liquidation of the underground movement, hoping in time, as soon as the changed situation in the country warranted it, to transform number one into a legal party openly espousing the communist cause. The chief opponents of the geese were the liquidators, a name borrowed from the situation in the Russian social democracy after the revolution of 1905, who allied themselves with the non members of number one and number two, using them as political leverage for wresting control of number one from the geese. The liquidators were led by J. Lovestone. Charles E. Rothenberg, James P. Cannon, William Z. Foster and Earl Browder. Between these two chief contending forces were the conciliators, who hoped to gain control by pleading unity and by holding the balance of power between the two extreme factions. While the liquidators sought to have the Workers' Party supersede the Communist Party in effect, the conciliators recognized it as merely the legal front of number one. But it is really a waste of time to discuss principles in reference to this controversy, for principles played a subsidiary role, they were merely verbose rationalizations to cover up the main consideration, to gain control of the party apparatus. I joined neither of the two extreme caucuses nor the conciliators nor any of the minor ones nor the united toilers. All of them tried to capitalize on my prestige as a political martyr and courted my support. But it was clear to me from the first meeting of the Central Executive Committee I attended, I was co-opted into it immediately after my release from prison, that personal and factional considerations were of greater moment to all of them than the welfare of the party as a whole. Perhaps I am stating the matter too harshly, it might be kinder to say that each faction identified the best interests of the party with its own faction. But it would not be altogether truthful. The fact remains. However unkind it may seem, that factional fanaticism, personal vanity and ambition to rule the roost ranked far above loyalty to the communist cause. It was this fact that appalled me when I came out of prison, it was a fungus that had grown from the early factionalism in which the party was conceived into a parasite that was beginning to choke the communism out of the communist party. The trouble with me was that at the time I understood it only emotionally, not cerebrally, as I see it now I had a feeling about it and merely recoiled from it. Had I understood it better, I might have devised a plan for fighting it, although I can see now that any plan for fighting it was foredoomed to failure. Politically my sympathies were with the Goose Caucus, with reaction still rampant, it would have been suicidal to abandon the underground party, which in turn needed the Workers' Party as a front through which to conduct its various open and legal activities. On that issue a I happened to be in agreement with the famous 21-point program of the Communist International for all its affiliates. Knowing that my views coincided with theirs to that extent, at least, although they differed in other respects, the geese adopted me as one of their own, included my name on their New York delegation to the National Convention and supported my candidacy vigorously. So. Although I told them frankly that I disapproved of their factionalism as much as of the factionalism of the others, I was adopted by them and became to all intents and purposes a member of the Goose Caucus. All of this took place while Catterfeld of the Geese, Lovestone of the Liquidators and John Ballam of the United Toilers were in Moscow, arguing the merits of their respective factions before the Supreme Pontiffs of the Communist International. From the first, Moscow was the final arbiter on the issues and policies in the American Communist Party, as it was on all its affiliates throughout the world. Whatever its decision in this case, it was couched in such equivocal terms that, far from terminating the factional controversy, it merely added fuel to the fire. At any rate, what Lovestone lost in Moscow he regained soon after his return to the United States. All three came back on the eve of the National Convention. The air was thick with recriminations and feuds, with charges and countercharges, nor could the three communist international nuncios, sent to enforce the decision of the Holy See, do anything about it. The leader of the three Comintern representatives was a professor of mathematics by the name of Wailki, pronounced Valetsky, a rather aristocratic Polish intellectual, who, notwithstanding his origin, looked like the American cartoonist's idea of a Russian Bolshevik, hooked nose, disheveled mop of hair on his head, 
an unkempt and unruly beard, looking rather ludicrous in the ill-fitting white linen suit that accentuated the angularity of his frame. But you could not help liking and respecting him, once you saw his eyes, sparkling with intelligence, wisdom, wit, and sheer human charm. The second of the three Cominton nuncios looked like a Hungarian version of the proverbial traveling salesman. Short and stocky, with a large head and a disproportionately larger nose that proudly bore a pair of gold rimmed spectacles perched importantly on its bridge, he dressed like a dude, combed his hair sleek and neat, was always clean shaven, smoked gold tipped cigarettes, listened attentively to everything that was being said in his presence and said absolutely nothing. But this man was a genuine Bolshevik, albeit a Hungarian one. A commander of the Hungarian Red Army in 1919, he had fled to Russia after the overthrow of the Hungarian Soviet Republic and along with Bielakun became an important functionary of the Comintern. In Hungary his name had been Joseph Bogany, he came to America as John Pepper. The third rep as we irreverently referred to all three of Moscow's representatives, was none other than Boris Reinstein, a druggist from Buffalo, who until 1917 had been a leading member of the already then steadily dying Socialist Labour Party, which since the death of Daniel de Leon in 1910 has been no more than a ghost of its erstwhile stillborn self. Reinstein was returning like a conquering hero to his hometown. He had been practically nothing even in leftist political circles in the United States, now he was returning five years later as spokesman of the victorious Bolsheviks. He was about sixty at the time, excitable, enthusiastic, and behaved toward us like an indulgent father toward his recalcitrant children. We saw at once that he was not important, that only Wilkie's views were decisive, but all of us underestimated the importance of John Pepper. E. Catterfeld was put in charge of arranging the National Convention, which was to settle all controversial issues under the supervision of the Cummington reps. Rose Barron, Secretary of the Workers' Defense Committee, came to me, very much alarmed, just before the convention was due to open. She told me that one of the detectives of the New York police had confided to one of our comrades in the tombs that our convention would be raided. He intimated that the authorities were very well informed concerning the secret place where the convention was to be held. William F. Dunn, of Butte, Montana, also spoke to me about the coming convention, asking me, as one who had some influence with Catterfeld, to try to induce him to hold the convention elsewhere. When I saw Catterfeld and spoke to him, I discovered how useless it was to attempt changing his mind. Obstinate, he was very sure that the arrangements he had made were foolproof and that the authorities would never find out about them. He was obsessed with the idea that the opposition led by Lovestone and Rothenberg had resorted to circulating these alarming rumors because it wanted to break up or postpone the convention, in order to gain time to manipulate its minority into a majority. I assured him that he was entirely mistaken about that. I argued that it would be folly to hold a secret convention in a place where underground conventions had been held before. When I learned, moreover, that the convention was to be held in a state that had criminal syndicalist laws, I launched an attack against him, declaring that, if that was so, he had no right to jeopardize the party and gamble with the freedom of his comrades. But all my efforts were in vain. Catterfeld was determined to go ahead with his plans. The convention was held in the latter part of August, 1922. There were regular delegates, fraternal delegates, Central Executive Committee delegates, the representatives of the Communist International, and several lesser categories of others. We were divided into groups of two, three, and five. Each group had a captain who was given the route he was to travel to the convention and instructed when he was to leave. Every route was broken up and circuitous. The trips were so arranged and timed that no two groups were to cross each other en route to the convention or find themselves riding on the same train. Strict orders were given that under no circumstances were any groups to leave for the convention through any of Chicago's railroad terminals because information had been received that the Chicago railroad stations would be honeycombed with detectives on the watch for communist delegates, 
whom they were to follow wherever they went. I left for the convention with Harry Wynitsky. We travelled in a roundabout way, making about half a dozen changes on the way. To our surprise, at one of the junctions where our train crossed a line directly out of Chicago, Harry Wynetsky spotted Rothenberg and John Pepper. When he informed me about it, I said he was crazy, that it could not be possible. But Wynetsky was right. Rothenberg and Pepper deposited themselves in the parlor car, where Rothenberg opened up his portable typewriter, sprawled communist documents and papers all around him and started to type, in flagrant violation of traveling instructions. I considered his actions irresponsible, if not criminal, but I dared not reprove him there and then for fear of violating my own traveling instructions by communicating with him there. We were to leave the train at Bridgman, Michigan. The convention place was about a mile away from the station. A small town, Bridgman consisted of a few ramshackle houses irregularly grouped around the railroad station. Everyone who got off there was immediately spotted. The villagers must have realized at once that there were strange doings going on, by the bands of strangers continuously filtering through the town toward the lake lodge and camp that was to house the convention. The minute I landed I knew it was impossible to prevent detection. The place was picturesquely situated in the wooded section of Lake Michigan. A large rambling building with a very wide and long veranda constituted the main house. A few delegates slept in the main house, but the great majority of them lodged in the cabins in the woods. The proprietor of the place, a German woman of about fifty-five, prepared our meals which she and several girl waitresses served to us on the porch. The convention itself was held in the very thick of the woods, with night sessions by torchlight. That enhanced the romanticism of the event for the delegates, but it did not in the least deter their punch on for vociferousness. The guards, who were stationed all around the charmed circle in the woods, more to deepen the conspirative atmosphere than to secure real conspiracy, as events subsequently proved, complained that the voices of the delegates carried too far and everything they said could be heard distinctly several hundred yards away. But these complaints went unheeded. In addition, we had scouts stationed in the village, supposedly to detect signs of danger, but really, as events subsequently proved, to betray the presence of rank and suspicious strangers in the Michigan woods. Nor did the convention get down to business at once. A lot of time, fully three days, were spent on preliminaries, held in a large shack in the woods. There, alternating, met the outgoing Central Executive Committee, the caucuses of the various factions, and conferences as to how the presidium of the convention was to be constituted. After the convention started, that shack was used for the Central Executive Committee meetings, the sessions of the convention presidium and the various convention committees. In the meantime, the delegates were having a wonderful time. They turned our convention spot in the thick of the Michigan woods into a kind of improvised country club. There were avid poker games, swimming parties in the lake, and endless bull sessions, thoroughly ray blazon in spirit, the most shriveled stories drawing the lustiest guffaws. A sprinkling of femininity among the delegates added to the enjoyment of life. Not ever the most exalted one among us, the eminent chief of plenipotentiary of the Cummington, Professor Whalekey, to whom we irreverently referred to as the Rep, disdained to join in the general merriment. Indeed, he proved to be the champion raconteur of risque stories. That was all right with us, and we liked him for a good sport. But in a couple of days he gave up entertaining us collectively and began to concentrate on Rose Pastor Stokes who feigned to be shocked as she thrilled at the attentions paid to her by the chief Cummington plenipotentiary. Even that was all right with us, we could even forgive this desertion of the collective for individualized self-seeking as a perfectly human aberration, but we began to lose patience with him when he took to billing and cooing with Rose so close to our bungalow and kept such late hours that we could not fall asleep. Among those who shared this bungalow with me was the impetuous Harry Wynitsky, a man of action and no respecter of exalted rank. When our hints and protests failed to restrain the professor's romantic eloquence,
we of the bungalow took to yelling imprecations, vowing to murder the lovers if they did not desist from disturbing our sleep. Finally, when every non-violent effort failed, Harry Wynetsky picked up a shoe in the dark and hurled it through the fragrant night. In less than a minute we had positive proof that Harry had hit the bull's eye, for the IRA trap was in our bungalow, shoe in hand, matching it, determined to find out whose foot it fitted. Of all things, it turned out to be my shoe. There were two definite caucuses at the convention. The largest one was the caucus of the geese, which I attended. The other, the caucus of the liquidators, led by Lovestone and Rothenberg. The geese had a clear majority. Lovestone then organized a so-called neutral group, which claimed that it did not belong to either caucus. In charge of this caucus Lovestone placed his crony, Bertram D. Wolfe, who came as a delegate from California. Wolfe had been Lovestone's associate when the national left wing was first organized. He had followed Lovestone into the Communist Party, organized jointly with the Russian Federation in 1919. As soon as the raids took place he shirked all party activities, disappeared from his post and failed to show up at committee meetings, though his wife continued to insist that his party salary should be paid. After many months news began to trickle in that Wolf had left the country and had made his residence in Mexico. The rank and file comrades did not relish what seemed to them cowardice in a leader, and openly expressed their disapproval of what looked like flight to Mexico. Through Wolf Lovestone schemed to cause disaffection in the Geese Caucus by using him as a neutral spearhead against the Geese majority. It was evident from the beginning that the Communist International Delegation favored the liquidators. But Whaleke respected a majority. However, Rothenburg and Lovestone were indefatigable. They were prepared to drag the convention out for weeks on end, until they succeeded in dividing and breaking up the majority. What actually divided the convention was not a fundamental political difference. The geese were not opposed to a legal organization. All they maintained was that the time was not yet ripe for the party to come out in the open. The liquidators were of the opinion that the time was ripe, that the legal expression of the Communist Party, that is, the Workers' Party, had superseded the underground organization and should therefore replace it. This attitude was now adopted by the leaders of the liquidators' caucus, because they had meantime made secret deals with some of the leaders of the Workers' Party and knew that if the Workers' Party should supersede the underground Communist Party, they would be in control of the entire Communist movement. Only a very small section of the Geese Caucus, represented by Edward Lindgren and Deli Catterfeld, was definitely committed in principle to an underground Communist Party, but not the majority of the Geese whose views on this question were in line with the decision of the Communist International, which called for the unification of all groups and acceptance of the Workers' Party as the legal expression of the Communist movement. Before the convention really got underway it was faced with a split brought on by the attitude of the handful of diehards in the Geese Caucus, who rejected all collaboration with the liquidators. I bitterly fought this tendency in the Geese Caucus and finally defeated it. I maintain that the unity of our forces, in spite of the differences on the tactical questions under dispute was of the greatest necessity if our movement was to succeed. Before I made my fight in the Geese Caucus the Communist International delegates became panicky and refused to go on with the convention. After the Geese Caucus vote was taken and my position upheld, the convention proceeded. By manipulation of the neutral elements on the issue of being against all caucuses, Wolf succeeded on the minor question of a point of order in dividing the convention by a vote of 23 to 22. However, the important questions before the convention never came to a vote. Had it reached that point, the Lovestone Rothenburg leadership would have been decisively repudiated, even though it enlisted the support of two promising newcomers in the party. William Z. Foster and Earl Browder. The highlight of the convention took place on the second night, when Foster arrived from Chicago to address us on the Trade Union Educational League and Communist Trade Union work. The stage was set to make Foster's speech as impressive as possible, in order to win over some delegates from the Geese Caucus. In the darkness of the woods, lit by the glare of torches, 
he started a report, full of personal anecdotes of his experiences in the trade unions. The gist of it was that if the communists knew how to behave in the unions, they could quickly gain control of them, put through the proposition of amalgamating the craft unions into industrial unions, and thus alter the very course of the American labor movement. It was clear to me that Foster saw himself as the head of this new American trade union movement. Many delegates resented Foster's presence at the convention. Some felt that he came for the express purpose of diverting attention from the main issue before the convention, others, that Foster's presence was jeopardizing the new trade union activities of the party, which he was conducting as our undercover man, not openly as a communist. Nearly all delegates, moreover, expressed the fear that Foster's coming to the convention exposed all of us to imminent danger, because he was being constantly shadowed by agents of the Department of Justice and other operatives, who suspected his hand in the recent railroad strike and the general activities of our party and the Trade Union Educational League. This apprehension was not altogether baseless. The very next day things began to happen. In the morning a stranger who seemed very suspicious stopped in front of the main house to look the place over. Another grave situation was caused by Bimba's indiscretions. Anthony Bimba was a fraternal delegate of the Lithuanian Federation, which prior to the convention had maintained relations with the United Toilers. Bimba was discovered mailing convention reports to the press of the United Toilers. Among the convention rules was a strict prohibition on the mailing of any letters, much less convention reports, and certainly not to the United Toilers. Bimbo was apprehended by the comrades detailed to look after the safety of the convention. His person and quarters were searched, and copies of his reports were obtained, as well as letters ready for mailing. A special meeting of the convention was held on the Bimbo matter which ended in taking away his convention rights and placing him on probation as far as his future membership in the party was concerned. A strict watch of Bimba was also arranged. Lovestone and Rothenberg tried to make capital of the Bimba incident by charging that the Goose Caucus was to blame and that it maintained relations with the United Toilers through Bimba. The charge, however, had no truth in it and was knowingly made for factional reasons. Foster's indiscreet presence, followed by the appearance of the mysterious stranger in the Bimba event, created an alarming situation. We called in the guards from the village. They reported seeing strangers in town who looked suspicious. William F. Dunn, former editor of the Butte Daily Bulletin, whose appearance was the opposite of what a communist was expected to look like was dispatched to the village to investigate. When he returned the Presidium was called into session to hear his report. He said that detectives were in town looking the situation over, that one of the detectives was the famous Spolensky of Chicago, who had been active in the raids against the Reds in 1919. The Communist International representatives became duly impressed and asked for an expression of opinion. Catterfeld became indignant. He charged that the whole thing was a plot by the liquidators to break up the convention because they did not have a majority. I disagreed with him. I said steps should be taken in an orderly way to end the convention and disband. The Communist International representatives agreed with me. They decided that in view of the fact that the geese were in the majority, they should elect a majority on the new Central Executive Committee and that then the convention should adjourn. All records should be destroyed and the delegates ordered to disband in an orderly fashion in small groups of five, leaving at regular intervals. The order for the disbanding of the groups was as follows, the first to leave were to be the communist international representatives, next were to follow those who recently came out of prison and whose cases were not yet completed, next were to follow the non-citizens, the last to follow were a group of Americans who were to leave the next morning after all traces of the convention had been destroyed. Strangely enough, among the records at this underground convention was a registration of all present, made on mimeographed forms upon the insistence of the Communist International representative. On these forms we had put our party name, our party and labor movement history, including the number of times we had been arrested and confined to prison. Here was a complete record of who's who in the Communist Party, 
of great value to the authorities. After all the details were worked out, the convention was again called to order. I made a report on the situation as chairman of the convention. The decisions made by the Presidium were approved. This was all done in the woods under the cover of darkness. Now the comrades spoke in muffled tones. The gathering in the darkness of the great trees, the atmosphere permeated with the danger of an impending attack, the chirping of the crickets, and the buzzing of the insects gave the scene a mysterious, fantastic and conspiratorial air. The election of the new Central Executive Committee proceeded without a hitch, the slates of the two caucuses were elected, the geese getting the majority, the liquidators the minority on the committee. By the time the convention adjourned all the comrades had already been assigned to their groups and to the special tasks they had to do. Each captain of a group was given sufficient cash to take the group to its final destination. Special messengers were sent out to nearby St. Joseph, to hire the automobiles which were to take the delegates out of Bridgman to Chicago and other cities. These automobiles arrived like clockwork at the specified time. The first group to leave. The representatives of the Communist International, crowded into the first automobile and pulled the collars of their jackets over their faces, so that the chauffeur should not get a good look at them. The second group, which was to follow next, consisted of Wynitsky, Ruthenberg, Ballam and me. Before departing I could see in the darkness that all their comrades were in a state of intense excitement and nervousness. Those who had already packed their belongings were standing in huddles awaiting their time to depart. But when our automobile arrived, Rothenberg refused to come along. He violated the very orders he himself had helped to formulate. When Harry and I insisted that he carry out the instructions of the convention and leave with us, he passed a slurring remark to the effect that he was not a coward and would remain to face the danger. I clearly saw that his determination to stay was grandstand play, he wanted martyrdom, in order to win the applause of the communist rank and file. Later, when he faced prison as a result of his foolhardiness, he was not so willing a victim, and indeed was greatly disturbed over the prospect of imprisonment. Under Rothenburg's inspiration, those who still remained procrastinated in violation of convention decisions which were that they leave the first thing in the morning. They breakfasted, then took a dip in the lake, and wasted hours in just hanging around. Apparently Rothenberg did not want to lose the opportunity of being arrested, he waited until the federal and state authorities arrived. Although the convention had voted to have the records destroyed, due to Rothenberg's interference they were buried in the woods, not only in full sight of all who remained among whom was one Francis A. Morrow, a member of the Communist Party of Camden, New Jersey, who acted as undercover agent of the Department of Justice, but also in full view of children related to the proprietor of the place. The authorities came, as was expected. They not only arrested Rothenburg and all the other comrades who were leisurely awaiting their arrival, but also went directly to the place where the barrel of records had been buried and dug out the treasure they were after. They had no difficulty in finding the burial place, for it was apparent that they had been tipped off in advance about its whereabouts. In addition to the registration of the convention delegates, possession of which gave the Department of Justice a complete history of the important communists in the United States. That barrel contained some of the most confidential and important party documents. Those arrested were herded into an army truck and taken to St. Joseph, Michigan, where they were thrown into jail and later charged with violation of the Michigan State Criminal Syndicalist Law, a law similar to the Criminal Anarchy Statute of the State of New York, for the alleged violation of which I had been convicted and sent to prison. In place of Ruthenberg, the committee put in Arkashikno Epstein, one of the editors of the Frigiite, who was so frightened that for a long time he could not talk. When he finally did talk, he spoke in such a low whisper that it was difficult to make out what he was saying. We left Bridgman about 10 o'clock at night and arrived in Chicago the next morning. All the party headquarters had been closed by the authorities. The railroad stations were full of detectives who were watching out for Eds. I had to see Bob Miner, according to instructions, 
to get the money for the trip to New York. I was able to contact him the next day. He rushed in and out of the hallways of Chicago and in and out of the lobbies of the hotels in the loop, as if an army of detectives were trailing his footsteps. When he finally gave me the money to cover both Wynitsky's and my fare to New York, he whispered instructions into my ear that I should watch out for detectives and should under no circumstances take a train out of one of the Chicago railroad stations. Comrade Miner was in a panic. Upon my return to New York City, I faced prison again, for the New York State Court of Appeals had returned an unfavorable verdict. But the Central Executive Committee, under the inspiration of John Pepper, the Communist International representative who remained in the United States after the Bridgman Convention, had other plans for me. These had been jointly and carefully well thought out by Pepper, Ruthenburg, and Lovestone, who, for factional reasons, wanted to get me out of the way. They knew I was popular with the rank and file and was the only member on the new Central Executive Committee who gave standing to its Goose Caucus majority. John Pepper, representing himself brazenly as one of my best friends, advised me in all seriousness to jump my bail and flee to Soviet Russia. He put it, rather ingeniously, in somewhat this fashion, Comrade Gitlow, I am sure you realize that the Bridgman Convention proves beyond the shadow of a doubt that the reaction in the United States will continue for a very long time. I have made inquiries and have learned that after you have served your term in New York State, you will have to face trial in Michigan as a second offender, and, if convicted, you will face a prison term of ten years. He argued that it was foolish to place any trust at all in the law and the courts, something European revolutionists never do. But I was not impressed. He continued, but, Comrade Gitlow, fifteen years in prison is a lifetime. It means actually spending the best part of one's life in prison. It is not necessary to make such a sacrifice, for today it is possible for a revolutionist to spend his life in worthwhile constructive socialist work in Soviet Russia. The you can gain tremendous experience so that later, when the revolutionary situation in the United States develops, you can return, just as Lenin did when he returned to Russia from Switzerland, to take command of the revolutionary situation. I listened to him very attentively, but gave him no definite answer. I told him I needed time to think his proposals over. Others also saw me on the same matter, comrades who could not be suspected of any ulterior purposes, notably, Abraham Jagera, one of the leaders of the Goose Caucus, and Johnny Ballam, who left the United Toilers to work among its membership for putting across the Cominton decision on the American Party question. Ballam was considered a good friend of mine. John Pepper, however, was the most insistent. Whenever he saw me he spoke about it, carefully unraveling to me how it was possible to get the necessary passports, how easily the authorities could be eluded and circumvented. I gave the matter serious consideration. I was young, unmarried, and the adventure of the proposition appealed to me. What then decided me against the proposal? First, I had given my word to the Civil Liberties Union to go through with the appeal. I could not go back on my word. Second, I did not trust in the good faith of those who made the proposal. Third, I did not have such a pessimistic view regarding the extent of the reaction in the United States, even though I, unlike Pepper, Rothenberg, and Lovestone before the Bridgman Convention, was of the opinion that the Communist Party could not come out in the open immediately. Fourth, I realized that taking such a step would make me a fugitive from justice and a permanent exile from my own country. Fifth, in Russia, even if it was a socialist country, I would be a foreigner, with the result that I would be of very little use there, in addition to being cut off from all effectiveness in the United States. Making the decision did not come easily. Facing, as I did, the possibility of many years of prison in New York and in Michigan was not a pleasant future to look forward to. I was an American. I had already some experiences with the police and prison methods of my country. I knew that what was possible in backward Russia of the Tsarist days, with its crude methods, lack of transportation, and communication facilities, and the attitude of its population, 
was not possible in the United States. It meant that if I ran away to the Soviet Union, an early return for me, because of my prominence in the movement, was entirely out of question. When I informed the Central Executive Committee about my decision to fight it out in the United States, even if it meant serving many years in prison, they looked dismayed, but finally agreed with Pepper, when he soothingly said, after all, this is a personal matter which we must leave to the individual comrade himself to decide. After the Bridgman Convention the new Central Executive Committee of the party met in New York City. A flat was hired in Upper Manhattan to serve as its headquarters. But we did not meet there often, moving our meetings mostly from one private dwelling to another. Factionalism did not end. Those who were defeated at the Bridgman Convention were determined to break up the new majority on the Central Executive Committee and to take over the leadership of the party themselves. In this effort they united with the group Foster and Browder had formed in Chicago and with those forces in the Workers' Party who were against the Underground Party, even though they now knew that in consequence of the raids on the Bridgman Convention they could not advocate before the Communist Party rank and file the discontinuance of the Underground. The Foster group, though many contended that it made the alliance with Lovestone and Rothenberg, in order itself to gain control of the party, attempted through the Bridgman case to discredit the current leadership of the Communist Party. At the time of the Bridgman Convention, Foster was advertised to the labor movement as a progressive trade unionist who was opposed to dual unions and who sought so to reform the A.F. of L. within its framework that it would become a militant trade union organization. Prior to the Bridgman Convention and for some time after Foster emphatically denied that he was a member of the Communist Party, although throughout that period, while he was working most closely with Fitzpatrick of the Chicago Federation of Labor and with many progressives in the trade union movement, he was attending the sessions of the Central Executive Committee as a highly placed communist. His activities through the Trade Union Educational League were supervised by our Central Executive Committee which made all the decisions, sometimes upon Foster's recommendations, at other times against them, and whatever decisions we made Foster had to carry out. The money for the Trade Union Educational League organization came largely from two sources, the Profinton, the Red International of Trade Unions, in Moscow and from the Communist Party in the United States. The Trade Union Education League could not have existed one month on the money it raised from its supporters in the United States. The decision for profit and support was made by the E. C. C. I. The Executive Committee of the Communist International. In no other way could Foster have obtained that support. Foster was not arrested at Bridgman, he left right after he made his report and still continued to insist that he was not a member of the Communist Party, which position he maintained at the time he was tried in the courts. Placed in charge of organizing the Bridgman defense, Foster sought to create the impression that the majority of the underground Communist Party represented at Bridgman was dominated by spies, that spies determined the policies of the party. His factionalism had carried him so far into this crass plot that the matter was brought indignantly into the Central Executive Committee by John Pepper, who demanded an immediate change of the whole defense policy mapped out by Foster, including decisions that would make Foster unable to carry out such a line when he himself came up for trial. Foster pleaded before the Central Executive Committee that it would be a good defense tactic to pursue such a line because it would lead to the acquittal of the defendants. Foster's stand in 1922 was symptomatic of the downward trend of communist ethics. In the first communist trials, in 1919, we communists took a principled stand. Placed on trial, I realized the responsibility I shouldered. I was the first communist in the United States to be prosecuted for the advocacy of communism. I realized that the standing of the movement before the radical workers depended upon making a straightforward principled fight, regardless of the consequences. In the early trials of 1919 all the leaders brought to trial made fearless principled defenses of their communist beliefs. The one exception was J. Lovestone, who, faced with prison, 
came to an understanding regarding his freedom from prosecution in New York and Chicago by appearing as a witness for the state against Harry Wynitsky. But even Love's tone did not elevate his defection into a general policy. The Bridgman cases marked a change in this respect, as far as the Foster policy was concerned. In organizing the party's defense of the case, Foster, Ruthenberg, Browder and Dunn mapped out a plan based upon an avoidance of the issues of principle involved and pleading that the Communist Party was the plaything of Department of Justice spies. It was only through a bitter struggle in the Central Executive Committee of the Communist Party that this entire plan was scotched. Soon after the Bridgman Convention I was returned to Sing Sing Prison. I tried this time to follow the party situation closely, but was kept inadequately informed by the Central Executive Committee. By the middle of October, 1922, I had concluded that the reactionary trend in the United States was giving way to a more liberal spirit. President Harding had, as early as Christmas, 1921, pardoned Eugene V. Debs. The action of Attorney General Doherty, in issuing a sweeping injunction against the strike of the railroad shopmen, aroused the resentment of organized labor and a large section of the public. So violent was the reaction against Doherty that, after the settlement of the railroad strike, impeachment proceedings were started against him. The month of September witnessed the ending of the major strikes in the country and the conclusion of very favorable union agreements in certain industries. Around this time the wage-cutting campaign had come to a close and a definite beginning of wage increases set in. The attitude towards Soviet Russia was also undergoing a slight change. Better contact with Russia was being established, and the federal government had sounded out the Russian government, through its ambassador in Berlin, on the sending of an American technical commission to their country. The raid upon the Bridgman Convention, instead of whipping up red hysteria, had the opposite effect. On the one hand, it put us in a ridiculous position, while, on the other hand, public opinion turned definitely against the raiders. The trade unions rallied to our defense, as did the liberal forces of the country. At the end of September, Alfred E. Smith received the nomination for governor on the Democratic ticket, on a platform pledging social legislation, progressive labor laws the abolition of the Lusk Committee and the repeal of the reactionary anti-sedition Lusk clause. Even the Republican Governor Miller, who had a reputation for conservatism, showed how the wind was blowing when he refused to extradite Edward Lindgren to stand trial in Michigan for participating at the Underground Convention. Around the middle of October, Harding began to commute the sentences of many I. W. W prisoners in the federal prisons as well as of other political prisoners. These and many other factors convinced me that the time had come for the communists to emerge from the cellar, to give up their underground party, and to come out publicly as a political party. I informed my parents when they visited me in Sing Sing that the communist party must come out as an open, legal, political party, and gave them my reasons. Being party members, they were shocked by what I had to say. They warned me that the membership would never agree to such a change. I told them that the change must be made and that the party must not lose its opportunity to do so. I instructed them that upon their return to New York, they should immediately inform the Central Executive Committee and the members of the party of my views. In parting, I said tell the comrades that, with an open party, we can carry on our communist propaganda more effectively because we will be able to do so publicly. We will also be able to penetrate the trade unions, engage in political campaigns, increase our membership and gain hundreds of thousands of supporters. For the first time we will become an American political factor of importance. Should we be driven underground again, we will then have an army of communists spread all over the country a force that will have to be reckoned with and respected. This time I stayed only three months in Sing Sing, for my lawyers succeeded in obtaining my release on bail pending my appeal to the United States Supreme Court. I left Sing Sing in high spirits. I was going to help legalize the Communist Party. Free again, I learned that during the interim of three months many important developments had taken place. 
Katterfeld, the national secretary of the Communist Party, had left for Russia after the Bridgman Convention and had not yet returned with Moscow's decisions. Israel Amter, who was one of the big three of the Goose Caucus in favor of maintaining the underground party, had been won over by Pepper to the idea of an open party. Pepper also succeeded in sending him to Moscow as the official representative of the party to the Communist International, in order that he might counteract Katterfeld. Pepper was now the political leader of the party. He sought to re-establish Lovestone's leadership, which was thoroughly discredited, by having the Central Executive Committee assign Lovestone to the task of writing a book on the American government as a strike breaker. Our national headquarters was situated in a small three-room flat in the Washington Heights section of New York City. A few chairs, a couple of typewriters, a number of small tables and some filing cabinets constituted its equipment. When not occupied by the political committee, it was used by Sadie Van Veen, Amter's wife, as her living quarters. Here the work of the political committee was performed. The acting national secretary during Katterfeld's absence was Abraham Jagera, formerly a member of the Russian Federation. He was very short, not over four feet six inches tall, very nearsighted, and afflicted with stuttering. Jagera was a weakling, with no roots whatsoever in the labor movement. He owed his high position in the communist movement to the factional situation in the party and to the fact that he was a Russian. He realized that, in order to maintain his position as a leader, he had to lean upon someone really capable of leadership. Heretofore that someone had been Katterfeld. In addition to Jagera, the meetings of the Central Executive Committee were now attended by Clarissa, or Chris, Ware, who was in charge of the research department of the Workers' Party, always with a briefcase full of newspaper clippings which she brought to our uptown hideout from the headquarters of the Workers' Party at 799 Broadway, Ruthenberg, Lovestone, Pepper, Minor, and myself. Occasionally Foster and Dunn were also present. Chris Ware was an ambitious person, who once remarked that if a woman desired to make a career for herself in the communist movement she had to attach herself to one of the communist leaders. She was true to her word. It did not take her long to attach herself to Rothenberg, who was then National Secretary of the Workers' Party. Whether by chance or design, even her office was right next to Rothenberg's private office. Indeed, in order to enter Rothenburg's office one had to go through the research department. It was in the research department, however, that J. Lovestone had his desk placed right up against the partition of Rothenburg's office, thus, if he desired, he could make sure of keeping well informed regarding everything that went on in the National Secretary's Sanctum Sanctorum. But after Rothenburg fell in love with Chris Ware, he not only abandoned Ray Ragozin, but he also moved J. Lovestone and his desk out of the research department. Lovestone was very much peeved over this removal act. The outer office supported his peeve by openly resenting the fact that during office hours, when Rothenburg wanted to be left in all privacy with Mrs. Ware, he would lock the entrance of the research department and keep it locked for hours. The amorous proclivities of Chris Ware really threatened to create a political crisis of major importance for her favors became the accolade of leadership. Before long, that indefatigable politician, John Pepper, made an attempt to win her affections when she brought some research material to him while he was alone at the underground headquarters uptown. She described the incident to Rothenberg, who flared up in anger against Pepper. Chris Ware, quick to recognize that Pepper's ambition for leadership was a challenge to Rothenberg as the leader of American communism, took every opportunity to intensify Rothenburg's anger and to create a wide separation between the two. Lovestone sought to bring peace between Pepper and Rothenburg at the expense of Chris Ware and not without a thought, I suspect, of having his desk moved back close to the partition. At this point a physiological reaction settled the political crisis. It was a tragic end, for the last of Chris Ware's abortions proved fatal for her. Rothenburg wept at the funeral, 
peace with Pepper was established and Lovestone had his desk moved back to the strategic spot in the research department. The first question that the comrades of the political committee took up with me was the question of my attitude to the proposed question of the merger of the underground, illegal Communist Party with the Workers' Party of America, its legal auxiliary organization. Some of the comrades were fearful that I would be opposed to the merger because, before I returned to prison, I had opposed such a step. They were skeptical of the message I had sent from prison by my parents that conditions now warranted the parties coming out in the open. When I discussed the matter with Pepper, he at first tried to show me that the Communist International favored the step and would soon order the Communist Party to undertake it. However, when he realized how I stood on the matter, he informed me that he had already assured the others that they would find me not only committed to the step but also ready to carry it out energetically. This occurred at the end of 1922. Assured of my support, the political committee was called together and immediately adopted measures to carry out the merger as speedily as possible. To facilitate matters, we received in the nick of time a cable from Moscow, signed by Amta assuring us that the Cummington favored the step. When Catterfeld, who had gone to Moscow as the leader of the majority, returned, he brought with him the rebukes of the Cummington and its repudiation of his policy. He also returned to a party in which his followers on the Central Executive Committee had deserted him. It marked the end of his leadership. Catterfeld was a sincere, honest American radical, a Kansas farmer who had given years of his life to the socialist movement. He was very serious in his demeanor and intensely fanatical. Once he got an idea into his head, he tenaciously held on to it. To him underground communism was a principle. Its abandonment he looked upon as treachery to the movement. In a brief period of time he was so completely eliminated from the movement that when, in 1928, he started a non-political, scientific magazine called Evolution, he was, upon a motion of Lovestones, instructed that he must be prepared to turn over all the connections and resources of his magazine to the party, which simultaneously was instructed not to endorse the magazine. Whatever opposition prevailed in the underground communist party was soon overcome either by individual conferences or by meetings of the rank and file, held in out-of-the-way places under conditions of great secrecy at which Pepper usually delivered a long-winded speech, stressed the orders of the Communist International, ridiculed the opposition, and ended in a manner that left his poor rank in file listeners bewildered with the wealth of arguments presented. During the discussion he would shout down a rank and file he did not agree with by crying Schluss, shut up, with all the authority of the Communist International, even though the poor fellow had only five minutes in which to answer the tirades of Pepper which generally lasted two or three hours. In summing up the discussion, Pepper would single out one of the innocent rank and filers who, in his honest simplicity, had left himself open to demagogic attack, and berate him most unmercifully, making him out to be the worst of scoundrels and an ignoramus to boot. He gloried in attacking the weak. His vituperative ability was embellished with abuse and insults. Once, before entering the verbal fray, he remarked gleefully to a friend, if you want to see how pig is stuck as you never saw one before, watch me. During this period many conferences were held with those leaders of the Workers' Party who were not also members of the Underground Party or its Central Executive Committee. These conferences dealt mainly with the division of the offices of the merged party. When all the deals were finally consummated and a vote for them assured, a joint meeting of the Central Executive Committee of the Underground Party and of the Workers' Party took place. Thus, in the early part of 1923, the Underground Communist Party, the vaunted number one, disappeared. During the discussion period we had promised the members of the Underground that a skeleton of the Underground Party made up of the most trusted Communists would be maintained for the conduct of illegal conspirative work and to serve as the framework for an Underground Party in case reaction in the country once more appeared. The promise was made, but was never intended to be kept. The Underground was liquidated thoroughly and completely. The merging of the number one the Underground Communist Party, with number two, the Workers' Party, under the name of the Workers' Party, 
made that party the official Communist Party of the United States, secretly affiliated with the Communist International and recognized by it as one of its official sections. The new party accepted the discipline of the Communist International. Even the Workers' Council Group, headed by Trachtenberg, Ingdahl, and Olgin, who had originally refused to join the Communist Party because they objected to the discipline it exercised over its membership, accepted as members and leaders of the Workers' Party, that kind of discipline and the even more rigid and exacting discipline of the Communist International as devoutly as did the members and leaders of the former underground Communist Party. It was the first time since 1919 that the Communist Party dared openly to espouse its cause. We had attempted before in a veiled and camouflaged form to propagate our ideas. In 1921 we organized the Workers' League for that purpose. The League ran candidates for office in New York City. I was its candidate for mayor when I was in Sing Sing and was ruled off the ballot by the Board of Elections. We made a little headway in some of the unions, notably the needle trade unions and the small independent unions. We effectively used our legal defense organization, known as the Workers' Defense League, cleverly to carry on communist propaganda and agitation which could not be done under other circumstances. The most intensive and widespread dissemination of propaganda in favor of Soviet Russia and communism was carried on through the Friends of Soviet Russia, which we organized for the ostensible purpose of collecting funds for the famine stricken in Russia. Through this organization we collected hundreds of thousands of dollars, out of which we, to a very large extent, directly and indirectly financed the party. A large percentage of the funds which we turned over to the Central Bureau in Paris was credited to our party instead of being spent for famine relief. The payroll of the Friends of Soviet Russia was swamped with party bureaucrats who received their salaries out of the monies donated for relief being thus enabled to carry on party work. Often when funds were desperately needed, the secretary of the Friends of Soviet Russia was called in by the political committee and directed to turn over money to the party, the necessary bookkeeping notations being made to cover the matter up. This was easy to do, because practically everyone working on the large staff of the Friends of Soviet Russia was either a party member or one who carried out party instructions. In becoming a legal party, we had to turn our attention away from abstract theories of communism to the problems of the country. This was not an easy task, because our party, even with the merger, was predominantly made up of foreign born and Americanized members. From 80 to 90 percent of the membership belonged to the Foreign Speaking Language Federation of the new party. The Jewish Federation had about 1,200 members and published a daily paper, Freiheit, the German Federation had several hundred members, and published the daily Volkszeitung. The Russian Federation had about 1,200 members and its own daily paper, Novi Mir. The Ukrainian Federation had about 1,000 members and also a daily paper, the Finnish Federation had about 3,000 members, published two daily papers and controlled a large and wealthy section of the Finnish cooperative movement. The Lithuanian Federation had about 1,500 members and published a daily paper, the Lettish Federation had a few hundred members, the Estonian Federation about 100 members, the Italian Federation about 500 members the South Slavic Federation about 800 members, the Hungarian Federation about 500 and a daily paper, the Polish Federation, several hundred, the Swedish Federation, several hundred, the Greek Federation, several hundred, the Armenian Federation about 150 members, there were a couple of hundred organized Bulgarians, and finally, some Romanians. In all, Nearly 12,000 members belonged to the foreign language branches. Only about 1,000 to 1,200 members were in the English-speaking branches, and in these branches the overwhelming majority were foreign-born, many of whom were not even citizens and spoke English badly and with difficulty. It was out of this material that the Workers' Party had to be built into a party for the winning of power in the United States. Moreover, a large number of the members were non-workers. Many were professionals, intellectuals, and small businessmen, if to their number had been added the paid party officials, 
such as secretaries, organizers, teachers, journalists and professional propagandists, the percentage of non-workers would have been very high. The party had very little influence in the trade unions, of the majority of its members who were workers, many did not belong to the unions. Pepper did more than anyone else to turn our attention to American problems. He followed closely all the political developments in the country, discussed them at length in the political committee, and privately with the party leaders. I had many such conversations with him, conversations in which he prodded me on my views, what my perspectives were concerning the future development of the country concerning the unions and particularly concerning democratic, republican and labor politics. But, like all foreign communists, he did not understand the United States. He expected the Teapot Dome scandal to result in the overthrow of the Republican administration before the next presidential elections, and the emergence of a Labour Party that would immediately become a serious contender for power. He expected the agricultural crisis which followed the war to bring about a farmer's revolt of great proportions that would result in a farmer's revolution, the farmers taking up arms against the government. He believed that the foreign-born could be welded into a unit of opposition to the capitalist parties because of the anti-foreign-born legislation that was being considered by Congress in 1923 and 1924. The merger did not give the country a united communist party free from factionalism. The Workers' Party now contained the leaders of both the Communist and the Workers' Party. They were now on an equal footing, because they all were recognized by Moscow. A struggle for power in the party soon developed. This factionalism was aggravated by the party's turn to a consideration of American problems. Foster, who had started his career as a Bryan Democrat, and who then became successively a socialist, an anarchist, an I. W. W., a revolutionary syndicalist and an A. F. of L. Organizer supporting Sam Gompers and the World War, ended by becoming a communist in 1921 and the secret leader of the party's trade union activity. Foster was imbued with the idea that he could capture the A. F. of L. and take the place of Gompers as its president. He saw little beyond the trade unions. In 1921 he was firmly convinced that the Communist Party could serve his ambition and help him capture the A. F. of L. He did not understand or appreciate politics. He viewed the most insignificant fight in the trade unions of infinitely more importance than the questions of politics over which the country and the press were agitated. It was only natural that the non-political groups in the party, such as the foreign language federations least active in politics, and those communists interested in purely in a trade union matters, should gravitate towards his leadership. In addition, he attracted those leaders of the Workers' Party who desired to challenge the former leaders of the underground movement grouped around Rothenburg. Foster took advantage of all this. He organized his faction secretly, made alliances with the leaders of the former Workers' Party, took the various federation leaders into his confidence and enlisted the support of the trade unionists. This marked the beginning of another factional war in the United Legal Party that raged for six years and kept the cables between New York and Moscow hot with messages transmitted both ways. The factionalism which developed broke out with particular fury in the Jewish section and in the staff of its daily newspaper, Freeheit. Drastic steps had to be taken in an effort to root out the opposition to the political committee. Upon Pepper's suggestion and much against my desires, the political committee decided that I should be sent in as its commissar to take over the affairs of the paper. Moise J. Olgin, the editor of the paper, became furious. He paraded as the guardian of Bolshevism among the Jewish masses, though he had joined the communist movement only after he was sure of the success of the Bolshevik revolution. A native of Russia and active in the Russian socialist movement, he nevertheless in 1917 wrote a history of the Russian revolutionary movement, called The Soul of the Russian Revolution, which mentioned neither Lenin nor Trotsky. Then he made a roundabout face and paid particularly obsequious journalistic observances to Trotsky as the guiding genius of Bolshevism since 1905. Alexander Bittelman who was the secretary of the Jewish Federation, opposed both Olgin and the political committee. 
of medium height, Bittleman was very thin, had drooping shoulders, and squinting eyes. His political manipulations make weird party history. He fought together with Olgin against the underground party and at the same time fought Olgin for control of the Freeheite. At the time of the merger of the number one and the number two he became Foster's close political advisor and a leader in Foster's secret caucus. Foster then, with Bittleman's consent and upon Bittleman's advice, made an alliance with Olgin for the purpose of capturing the party. Bittleman, however, continued, though pledged to support him, to undermine Olgin secretly and to make his position as editor of Freeheite unbearable. Obviously, my job to clean up the mess was not an easy one, with the staff against me, the Jewish membership hostile, and the financial affairs of the paper in disastrous condition. I had to watch every line the writers wrote, give attention to the raising of money to keep the paper alive, and convince the membership that the paper was not being destroyed through the changes made by the Central Executive Committee of the party. When Foster captured the party at the end of 1923, he sent Jim Cannon to see me. Cannon hailed originally from Kansas City. He was a member of the I. W. W. and of the Socialist Party before 1919. In the I. W. W. He had gained a reputation for his languid laziness and his aptness in singing and reciting Hobo and I. W. W. Ditties. I first met him in 1919, when he came from Kansas City as a delegate to the National Left Wing Conference. At that time he edited a small weekly socialist paper of I. W. W. and Left Wing Leanings. He made only a superficial impression upon me if any, I remembered him merely as a colorless individual of medium height and complexion, who spoke with a nasal twang and in sentimental monotone. He was not then very talkative, perhaps because he was not yet sure where the left-wing movement would lead. He failed to show up at the Chicago conventions, but made sure to have one of his emissaries present, to report back to him in Kansas City, so that he could make up his mind. It was clear to me that he did not want to commit himself on the spot, and stayed away so that he could have an opportunity to weigh the events carefully. He joined the Communist Labour Party, soon rose to prominent leadership, and in 1923 united with Foster to oust Ruffenburg from a leadership. His mission in New York could not have been a pleasant one, because he came to bribe me, not to convince me. When he spoke, I thought I was listening to a miniature boss Murphy of Tammany Hall. He hemmed and hawed for a few moments before coming to the point, made some personal remarks, and finally said, You know, Comrade Gitlow, you are fitted for the big things in the party. I, more than anyone else, am interested in seeing that you get ahead and get the position which is your due. Now if you will be reasonable and will comply with my request that you resign, rest assured that I will not let you down. I replied, but Comrade Cannon, since when must a communist be concerned about jobs? It has always been my impression that a communist must above all be motivated by principles. You are not discussing principles with me but jobs. I am sorry, but under the circumstances I cannot comply with your request. That ended the parley. Cannon turning red took his leave. But soon after that conversation with Cannon I was removed by the Foster Bittleman majority. This was my first experience with the practice of trying to obtain political support by bribing with an offer of jobs. In years to come this practice became common in the party from top to bottom. I was not sorry to leave and not sorry that I had been assigned to that post, for in the Freeheite office I met the girl who, though not a communist or member of the party, was destined to become my wife. For a communist leader to marry a non-communist was considered by most of my associates an unpardonable breach of Bolshevik conduct. I must confess that in this instance my love for the girl outweighed all the stock communist objections. I had not become the sort of communist who regards such intimate personal matters as trivial and as a submission to bourgeois sentimentality. Had I been unable to stand up against communist prejudices, in this respect, I would have had to give up a union, which through all the years of party strife has been a source of great happiness and has enabled me to overcome the pressure and strain of nerve-wracking events.
to have power and to be alone, is the one tragedy which the power intent politician understands, and the communist politician who hides his feelings behind the ramparts of so-called objectivity that the needs of the movement cannot tolerate one's personal feelings, knows this better than all the rest. Chapter 5 how a Brian Democrat captured the Communist Party The nature of American communism is incomprehensible without some insight into the nature of its Russian prototype. However vague and inconclusive the relationship between the two in the beginning, by 1923 the leaders of Russian communism became increasingly involved in the affairs of the American Communist Party. By that time Moscow became quite definitely the mecca of all American communists and the source of all communist wisdom. It is not difficult to understand the reason for this adulation. Nothing succeeds like success. The Bolsheviks alone of all the socialist sects, groups and parties anywhere in the world, ever since the days of the Great French Revolution, not only seized the state for a short while but held it for years not only vanquished the enemies that encircled them on 19 different fronts but won the respectful fear of the great capitalist powers opposing them, signing a commercial treaty with Great Britain in 1921 and entering the concert of great powers in 1922 through the diplomatic coup of an alliance with Germany at Trepala while the authors of Versailles were plotting to emasculate Bolshevik Russia at Genoa. The Bolsheviks had come to stay. If even the great powers were forced to reckon with them, Surely they were good enough for labor leaders in need of allies. The earliest American votaries of Bolshevism followed in the footsteps of Lenin, because they believed that the Second International and its affiliated socialist parties of Europe had betrayed the working class of the world by supporting their respective capitalist governments in the World War, whereas, the handful of socialists grouped around the Bolshevik nucleus constituted the only force in the world that remained loyal to Marxist internationalism. They believed, moreover, that the Bolshevik revolution marked the immediate opening of a new era of proletarian revolutions that would culminate in the overthrow of capitalism throughout the world and that the leaders of the Second International and of the organized labor movement throughout the world being counter-revolutionists because of their careerist self-interest and their political timidity, were hampering the development of this worldwide liberation movement and were determined to defeat the revolutionary endeavors of the most class-conscious workers. Leaders of the Second International and of the organized labor movement were therefore looked upon as an insidious and pernicious agency of the capitalist exploiters inside the working class an agency that must be rooted out before the workers of the world could be organized for their foreordained victory over the capitalist social order that enslaves them. Therefore, in 1919 the Third International was founded under communist auspices in Moscow, to destroy the Second International and the existing trade union movement, organize the workers of the world instead into communist parties politically and through the subsidiary agency of the Red International of Trade Unions, the Profinton, into revolutionary trade unions. And then proceed to the conquest of the earth for socialism through the intervening dictatorship of the proletariat country by country. Such in bold outline was the socialist dream as revived and revivified by the victory of the Bolsheviks in Russia, the dream that drew us dissidents of the socialist left toward the communist international. It was no accident that the founding congress of that new international was dominated by the Russian leaders. Lenin opened it and was its presiding officer. All the important reports were made by the Russians, Trotsky, Commissar of War and Commander-in-Chief of the Red Army, Zinovov, President of the Petrograd Commune, who was elected the first President of the Comintern after its founding, Bukharin, regarded as the chief theoretician of communism after Lenin, Chicherin, Commissar of Foreign Affairs, and others. From the very beginning in March, 1919, the delegates of the non-Russian parties found themselves in the embarrassing situation of poor relations dependent on the Russians both for money and wisdom. We who followed them believed with them that the world revolution was just around the corner and that within a few years, under their superior guidance, we would make the whole world red, provided we did what we were told by them in our own country. We actually believed that they understood the play of social forces in our country better than we, 
although most of them had never set foot in it. Indeed, through wishful thinking and because of our deference to their wisdom, and subconsciously, perhaps, because we carried the favor and support of these supermen of revolution, we entered into a kind of conspiracy of deception and self-deception, by reporting to them on the political situation in our country in terms most pleasing to the Russian leaders and most in consonance with their theories and expectations of imminent world revolution. Psychologically, thus, the Third International was doomed to defeat from the start, because it began its career as an organization of revolutionists subservient to their political patrons, and hence rapidly developed into an international of toadies and careerists. This tendency, inherent in the Cominton because of the monstrous political predominance of the Russians in the international organization, had moreover very deep roots in the very character of the Russian Bolshevik party, which was fashioned by Lenin himself temperamentally an absolutist, in the course of its hard and dangerous struggle against Tsarist absolutism. From its inception in 1903 until it seized power in 1917, the Bolshevik organization was, with the exception of a negligible interval of several weeks during the early part of the Kierensky honeymoon in the spring of 1917, a closely knit conspirative organization ruled from above. Its vaunted principle of democratic centralism became upon application under conditions of conspiracy no more than slightly democratic and no less than overwhelmingly sheer centralism. The Bolshevik Old Guard, schooled to obey the orders of the Bolshevik Central Committee in all its struggles, were there against the Tsarist government, the Russian capitalists or their comrades of the Menshevik faction, were psychologically incapable of undoing this conditioning over a period of years had they sincerely desired to do so after coming into supreme power. But being after all human, could they be expected to reverse the proportions of democracy and centralism in their vaunted doctrine at the very moment when they came to constitute the personification of that centralism? The flesh pots of power are far too succulent for such self-abnegation, especially when the easiest thing to do is to justify the retention of that centralism in the hands of the revolutionary veterans by the hue and cry of imminent danger to the triumphant revolution on all sides and even inside the fledgling proletarian state. Beginning in coalition with the left social revolutionaries in 1917, the Bolsheviks became the one and only party in power, the state party, in July, 1918 increasingly identical with the state, the discipline of its ranks increasingly centralized under the sway of its central committee, the latter increasingly restricted by the political bureau, where increasingly the voice of its leading member, Lenin, became the voice of God. The Russians, who grew up in the struggle against Tsarist absolutism, should have known even better than many of us who hailed from the Western Hemisphere that subservience is an inseparable complement of absolutism and that you can sooner make a revolutionist out of a Tory than out of a toady. Yet, with all the blindness typical of all men in power, the omniscient Lenin and the brilliant Trotsky, not to mention such lesser luminaries as Zinovov, Bukharin, Radk, Kamenev, Stalin and the rest of them, proceeded to perpetrate the classic error of all rulers by canonizing this fundamental error into a principle. The Cominton became organizationally a carbon copy of the Russian Bolshevik party, and every national communist party became a carbon copy of the carbon copy. The very cornerstone of the Cominton program, composed by Lenin and concurred in by all his satellites from Trotsky down, proclaimed that every communist party must perforce be organized on a military basis and subject to military discipline, that, having thus, the only way possible, Mind you exclamation mark overthrown the capitalist government, the communist party must set up a dictatorship of the proletariat, in which the only party permitted to function would be the communist party, to whose will the entire country was to be subjected. True, there were important asides on how to mobilize the support of non-proletarian groups, such as, the peasants or farmers, for example, but they were merely of a maneuvering nature not part of the communist essence ideologically. The Russian leaders were so certain that they were absolutely right in propagating this sort of pseudo-revolutionary absolutism that they would brook no deviation from this organizational principle among the affiliates of the Cominton, 
insisting on the Bolshevization of all the non-Russian communist parties. The bed of procrusts on which all the communist parties were laid were the famous 21 points of the Comintern program. It was a case of take it or leave it. We American communists took it, hook, line and sinker. We have, therefore, no one to blame but ourselves, nothing but our own moon calf foolishness in the field of politics, if we got it in the neck as a group and were doomed to political ineffectualness in our own country. What is unpardonable? however, is to canonize your foolishness into a policy and to pursue it wherever it may lead, as long as you stay pretty close to the top, even if the course of events enjoins practices in direct contradiction to the ideals and principles with which you had originally set out. Yet, given the anti-democratic organizational principles of Bolshevism, this course of development was inevitable from the start, although I did not see it then and see it all too clearly only now. I confess that, although I was one of the few who along with John Reed fought against the domination of the peanut politicians from the Russian Federation, when I returned from prison in 1922 and was faced with the accomplished fact of the far more dangerous domination by the Russian Communist Party of Moscow, far from complaining about it, I concurred with the rest of my American comrades. Only the Russian Party was given the unprecedented right a right no other member party of the Comintern enjoyed, to review Comintern decisions and alter them at will. This organizational poison was implanted in the Comintern by its originators and founding fathers, Lenin and Trotsky. Moreover, while the Russian party, not only instructed its delegates but even such of its members as were officers of the Comintern, no other communist party was accorded the privilege of instructing its emissaries to Moscow who found out only from the Russian bosses what was what. The internationalism of the Comintern was thus never more than a reflection of Russian desires and Russian policy. As for the national policy of each communist party, that was merely a reflection in the distorting mirror of the Comintern of whatever happened to be at the moment the policy of the Russian communist party. This dependence on the Russian communist party, and more specifically, on the ruling clique and the dominating person within it from time to time, became the condition sine qua non for every non-Russian member of the Comintern. Matters concerning the German, French, English, American or any other Communist Party were first thrashed out inside the Russian Communist Party by its political bureau, and the decisions reached by a half a dozen Russian leaders were handed down to the Communist Party in question through the channels of the Comintern. Hence, the policy of every communist party became dependent in large measure on the exigencies of the foreign policy of the Russian Soviet Republic, which was the prime concern of the Russian political bureau surely since Brest-Litovsk and more definitely and increasingly so since Ray Palo, until today it is exclusively so. Official communism has thus rapidly crystallized into no more than merely the international instrumentality of the Russian Soviet government. That was not apparent when communism was still in the state of turbulent solution that was being shaken constantly by political winds, now, however, with its stabilization and crystallization under Stalin's personal dictatorship, it is clear that this characteristic of communism was inherent from the start. This essential characteristic of communism, I mean, of course, Leninist communism in practice, not in theory, must be clearly borne in mind, if you are to understand what took place in the American Communist Party from the moment of its emergence as an open political party out of the fusion of number one and number two early in 1923. We all accepted, without any reservations, the right of the Russian Bolshevik leaders to boss our party. At the same time, we the leaders of the American Communist Party fought each other there. Since basic policies were decided upon not by us but by our bosses in Moscow, Ours was a struggle for power rather than for principles. In that respect, we were of course no different from Tammany Hall Shysters or from any other politicians, for we all became the victims of that strongest of all the social passions, the political passion. Yet the fashion among us communist politicians, and we believed it to be far more than merely a fashion of thought, we believed it to be an incontrovertible truth, was to proceed on the premise, more readily assumed than practiced, that in the communist movement the individual factor was of negligible, 
if any, importance. The individual, we contended when arguing the matter with our aloof sympathizers of the liberal left, merely reflected social conditions. In the face of daily experiences with individual communist leaders of opposing factions who ruthlessly connived to wrest power from us or to keep us from wresting power from them, we insisted to our liberal friends that pure objectivity was the determining factor in all communist politics. Therein, indeed, was the crux of the difference between lowly bourgeois politics and the politics of the proletariat's revolutionary priesthood, meaning ourselves, of course. We did, not lie with malice aforethought, we lied subconsciously, to ourselves as well as to others, nevertheless, we lied. The truth is, that in the struggle for power inside the Communist Party, the personal ambitions of individuals, their selfish interests, their animal instincts of self-preservation, always come to the forefront and all but completely overshadowed the political issues and the principles, which indeed serve mostly as the rationalization for the struggle. In that the Communist Party must be very much like any other political party, bourgeois or proletarian. What makes it worse than any bourgeois party, however, in that respect, is the injection of pseudo-revolutionary amorality, the effect of that is to cast into limbo the last vestiges of human decency as mere bourgeois prejudices. It is this which flavors communist politics with horrible bitterness, for the strife among the comrades proceeds with all rules suspended and any weapon at all in use, all the way from deceit, chicanery, double dealing, patronage and bribery, to character assassination and outright assassination, if possible. Anything goes. It is this which makes every party debate between the leaders a small scale but highly intense civil war. Indeed, the ethics of civil war against the bourgeoisie and its white guard defenders are merely applied to the strife among the leaders inside the party. When the Communist Party became illegal, it was a foregone conclusion that its leader would be Rothenberg. And he did become its leader. But now the party was different from what it had been in 1919. The most important change was in its trade union policy. In 1919 we were opposed to the American Federation of Labor and were strongly in sympathy with the industrial workers of the world, attacking, however, the anti-political stand of the I. W. W. We were for revolutionary unionism that openly espoused the overthrow of capitalism. The ordinary strikes for more wages and better conditions interested us only in so far as we could develop them into mass movements for the overthrow of the hated bourgeoisie. Whenever a strike broke out, communists came upon the scene with leaflets urging the workers to overthrow the government and set up Soviets. But when the revolution in America did not come as quickly as we had expected, and our appeal to the trade unionists to form Soviets fell upon deaf ears, we changed our attitude and began to use other tactics and appeals. With these altered means, we soon gained some trade union following, notably, among the foreign-born workers, in such unions as the needle trades, the food workers, some independent unions of metal workers, laborers, and others. The first industrial organizer of the Communist Party who made some headway among these union forces was Joseph Zach. He sought to give the party a trade union following, by building up a new and independent trade union movement. He achieved some success in this direction by bringing the independent unions of New York and vicinity together into a central organization which was called the United Labor Council. Then, for reasons that had nothing to do with our communist problems in America, Lenin put an end to this dual union policy when he issued his famous pamphlet, Left Wing Communism, in which he called upon all communists to go into the existing unions and that abhor from within for the purpose of capturing them. The publication of Lenin's pamphlet turned the trade union policy of our party upside down. In scouting around for someone to organize the boring from within activities of the communists in the trade unions, Foster was discovered. That was in 1921. William Z. Foster was unattached at the time. He had been unsuccessful in leading the steel strike and had lost considerable standing in the A. F. of L. unions. Besides suffering defeat in the steel strike, 
Foster and his associates also lost their influence among the packing house workers, who had been organized by Foster during the war through the intervention of the A. F. of L. and the Federal Mediation Commission, because the government then favored trade union organization as a war policy. Foster's Syndicalist League of North America, which was replaced by the International Trade Union Educational League in 1915. The principles upon which they were founded were repudiated by Foster on the witness stand during the steel strike in 1919, even though he had been instrumental in organizing both organizations and was their outstanding leader. After the debacle of the steel strike in November, 1920, Foster organized anew the Trade Union Educational League, with headquarters in Chicago. But this organization had no following in the trade unions, no funds with which to operate, and was destined to die soon, a failure. Subsequently, the National Committee to the First National Conference of the Trade Union Educational League in Chicago, August 26 and 27, 1922, reported, for over a year this body lingered along more dead than alive. It was a peculiar organization, it did not charge dues or per capita tax. The first real money it saw came when the representative of the Profinton, or Red Trade Union International, acting in collaboration with the underground Communist Party, contacted Foster, persuaded him to attend the first Congress of the Profinton and gave him the money needed to finance the trip of the Trade Union Educational League delegation to that Congress, to be held in Moscow. This emissary for the party and the Profinton, was Carly Johnson, a Lettish comrade from Roxbury, Massachusetts, and at one time a member of the Lettish Communist Club of Boston, who became a member of the Executive Bureau of the Profinton, under the name of Scott. The very same Scott, entrusted with the work of gathering an American trade union delegation to attend the first Congress of the Profinton, upon the specific instructions of the Communist Party, induced William D. Hayward to head an I. W. W. delegation to Moscow and at the same time skip bail, a decision which had tragic and disastrous consequences for Hayward. The delegation of the Trade Union Educational League that went to Moscow with Foster in 1921 included Earl Browder and Ella Reeves Bloor. No one in that delegation had official connections or standing with American trade unions. They represented what for all practical purposes was just a paper organization centered around Foster. The communists paid all their expenses for the trip. In Moscow, Foster joined the Communist Party and together with the Russian leaders worked out the plans for the capture of the American Federation of Labor. President Sidney Hillman of the Amalgamated Clothing Workers was in Moscow at this time. Conferences were arranged between Foster, Hillman and the Russian leaders, at which it was urged that Hillman back Foster's activities in building up a progressive trade union movement in the United States, for the purpose of dislodging Gompers and taking control of the A. F. of L. unions. Foster's Trade Union Educational League was accepted by the Russians as the organization through which the communists should bore within the American unions. Foster returned to the United States, supplied with funds by Moscow and with the instructions to work under the direction of the American Communist Party's Central Committee. Part of the plan included a strict order that under no circumstances should Foster's official membership in the communist movement be disclosed and that great care should be taken in so conducting the campaign that Foster should be considered merely as a progressive trade unionist who was not connected with the party and was entirely free from its domination. Here let me point out a Moscow paradox. The Bolshevik leaders at the first Congress of the Red International of Labor Unions repudiated the policy of dual unionism to the consternation of the syndicalists and the I. W. W. delegation from America. They called upon the communists and all other revolutionary elements to organize cells within the existing trade unions, to bore from within. They completely rejected the idea of building new independent revolutionary unions. But in the international field the Bolshevik leaders adopted a policy that was directly the opposite. They built on the basis of the Russian trade unions an international trade union organization known as the Profinton, a Russian abbreviation for the Red Trade Union International. 
This international organization was a dual organization to the International Federation of Trade Unions at Amsterdam. The communists outside of Russia were given the impossible task of, on the one hand, recognizing the unions that adhered to the Amsterdam International, and, on the other hand, fighting to destroy the international organization of these same unions. Foster returned to the United States in the autumn of 1921. Backed up by Russian funds and with the full support of the Communist Party, he became active in the campaign to organize the Trade Union Educational League. He became secretary treasurer of the League and the editor of its journal, The Labour Herald. Earl Browder was Foster's man Friday with the title, managing editor of The Labour Herald. Though Foster denied he was a communist, he and Browder met continually with the executive council of the then underground Communist Party of the United States, the good old number one. Not a move was made by Foster without the approval of the Communist Party. The only thing the Communist Party did not check Foster on were his expenditures of the special fund given him by Moscow to build the Trade Union Educational League. Foster steadfastly maintained that he was not a member of the Communist Party, hoping to camouflage the Trade Union Educational League as a non communist organization. As late as June, 1923, the party kept up the fiction that Foster, who was then already a member of the Central Executive Committee of the party as well as of its most powerful ruling committee, the Political Committee, was not a communist, not a member of the Communist Party. In the June, 1923, issue of the Labour Herald, Rothenburg wrote these methods and the fact that Foster was not a member of the Communist Party, while I admittedly was a member of the Central Executive Committee of the party, explains the difference in the results of the second trial as compared to the first. Dot about a decade and a half later, while writing his autobiography, Foster apparently forgot the period when he masqueraded as a non-communist, for in his book, From Brian to Stalin, on page 163, he states so, when I returned to the United States, in the middle of 1921, I joined the Communist Party and took my proper place in the ranks of the Revolutionary Communist International. Even this statement does not give the actual fact that Foster joined the Communist movement and threw himself under its discipline during his first sojourn in Moscow, in 1921. The first national conference of the Trade Union Educational League, held in August, 1922, in Chicago, proved how thoroughly communist it was. The editorial committee consisted of Knudsen, Carney, Wirtis, Buck and Foster, all communists. The report on the building trades was by Jack Johnston, a communist. The report on the metal trades by Knudsen, a communist. The report on the printing trades by H. M. Wicks, a communist. The report on the needle trades by Rose Wirtis, a communist. The report on the boot and shoe industry, by Harry Cantor, a communist. William F. Dunn, communist, was chosen to lead the metal mining campaign. O. H. Wangerin, secretary of the railroad amalgamation campaign, was a communist. Representing the Profinton, that is, the Profinton's commissar at the conference, was Carly Johnson, alias Scott. The program of the Trade Union Educational League combined nearly everything that the radicals and the progressives had been advocating for years. Its main features included the transformation of the craft unions into industrial unions by amalgamating all the craft unions of a single industry into one industrial union, a militant strike policy in place of the policy of class collaboration the traditional policy of the American Federation of Labor of peaceful negotiations between unions and employers to some working compromise in their mutual interest, and independent working class political action through the unions, although at its inception the Trade Union Educational League did not come out openly for a Labor Party, at the same time opposing Sam Gomper's policy of supporting the Friends of Labor on the Republican and Democratic tickets. In addition, however, there were other points in the program which had nothing to do with the immediate task of reforming the American trade unions, as, for example, recognition of Soviet Russia, affiliation with the Profinton, wholehearted support of the Russian Bolshevik Revolution, 
and abolition of the capitalist system. How Russian interests determined all questions that came up before the Trade Union Educational League was demonstrated to me at the convention of the Amalgamated Clothing Workers held in Chicago in May, 1922. I have already mentioned the conferences of Hillman in Moscow, as a result of which it was understood that Hillman would support Foster's activities in the American trade unions. At the same time the Russians agreed to Hillman's proposal to organize the Russian-American Industrial Corporation for the building up of the clothing industry in Russia. The Communist Party of the United States could not be outdone in its praises of Sidney Hillman, the president of the Amalgamated. Olgin, the editor of our paper, Freeheit, delivered one of the most flowery eulogies of Hillman possible, at the convention which he had been invited to address. At this convention there was a very strong block of progressive and left-wing delegates. The underground Communist Party sent two representatives to the convention whose duty it was to advise the Communist left-wing bloc as to policy. William Z. Foster and Robert Minor were these representatives. Their work consisted chiefly in preventing any opposition from openly breaking out against the Hillman machine. The first important issue came over the status of a left-wing leader, Albert Goldman, who was also a member of the party, whose effectiveness the Chicago administration of the Amalgamated undermined by accusing him of being a spy and expelling him from the organization. Hillman supported the Chicago machine against the Chicago left-wing, which insisted upon justice for Goldman by a repudiation of the frame-up against him. Foster and Minor prevented the left wing from making a fight on this issue. The other issue was even more important. It had to do with a trade union policy. Hillman's main proposal for the Chicago Convention was that it approve his policy of standards of production. Hillman proposed that the union, in close cooperation with the bosses, work out standards of production which should guide the workers in the shops. These standards, wherever they were adopted and applied, its opponents charged, instituted vicious speed-up schedules for the workers. They created impossible conditions in the trade and paved the way for the corruption of the trade union officials by the bosses, whenever they met to work out standards. Large numbers of workers opposed these standards of production most bitterly. The progressives and left-wingers voiced this opposition of the rank and file. At the caucuses of the left wing the delegates were determined not to yield on this question. Minor and Foster argued with them. Bob Minor in particular tried to rationalize, to prove that their fears were unfounded, that it was really a progressive measure. When the workers ridiculed his arguments and informed him that his ignorance of the trade was monumental, He switched to other persuasive methods, highly political in their content, arguing that Hillman was rendering a great service to Soviet Russia and the workers' cause by championing the Soviet Union, and besides, that one who had pledged himself in Moscow to further the cause of the left wing could be trusted. The Communist Party members were finally whipped into line to support Hillman's proposal under compulsion of party discipline. Foster in his one speech to the caucus supported Minor, but after that he stayed in the background and let Bob Minor do all the cajoling. I was present at the convention, though not in an official capacity. I had just come out of prison pending an appeal of my case and was sent by the party to get a donation from the convention for the National Defense Committee. I became alarmed at the anger of the left-wingers. I called Foster aside warned him that a grave mistake was being made, that Minor should be called into conference and the whole position on this question changed. He refused to accede to this request. I spoke to Minor in the same vein, but he would not entertain the idea for one moment. With the aid of the party members in the left-wing caucus, Hillman's proposal for standards of production was endorsed. Minor jumped up in jubilation over the victory. The workers sat silent when the vote was in. They left in the early hours of the morning, convinced that they had acted wrongly, their dejected faces clearly showing how badly they felt. Right after the caucus meeting Bob Minor took me aside and tried to convince me what a wonderful man and leader Hillman was. Then he spoke to me about Moscow, about Hillman's agreement to support the building up of a left-wing movement. 
We must be objective, he said. The interests of Russia must always be our first consideration. I did not realize then, when Bob Miner stated it, that that phrase, the interests of Russia must always be our first consideration, was to determine all communistic activities. The organization of the new trade union education league proceeded apace. First, all the plans and strategy were worked out by the Central Committee of the Communist Party. Then all the district organizations of the party throughout the country were informed of these decisions and plans. The district committees proceeded to inform the membership of the decisions. After that, in the industries and union affected by the decisions, fraction meetings were called. The fractions consisted of the party members employed in the industries or belonging to the unions involved. The fractions were informed about the decisions and minutely instructed how to carry them out. If the decisions were considered of great importance, involving a union in which the party was strong, then Foster or some other leading representative of the Central Committee reported on the decision to the fraction meeting. Only after the party membership was thoroughly whipped into line and drilled on how to put the decisions across, was the matter brought up in the section of the Trade Union Education League covered by the decisions. There the party membership voted as a block and a party decision was always railroaded through. In fact, it did not take the non-party members of the Trade Union Educational League long to discover that it was useless to take a position on any question that had already been acted upon by the party. They generally waited to see how the party caucus voted and either refrained from voting or voted accordingly. The first National Committee of the League was an appointed body, approved by the Central Committee of the Communist Party. A majority of its members were communists. Its secretary treasurer, Foster, was a party member and a member of the Communist Party Central Executive Committee. The editor of its paper was Earl Browder, a Communist Party member. Its two national organizers were Joseph Manley, Foster's son-in-law, and Jack Johnston, both party members. When sections of the Trade Union Educational League were formed, such as the Needle Trades Section, the Miners Section, the Metal Trades Sections, the main officer of the section, the secretary, was always a party member, as was the majority of the executive committee. The Communist Party was taking no chances. But notwithstanding all its Machiavellian plotting to pass for non-communist, the Trade Union Educational League succeeded in organizing only the Communist Party members and their closest sympathizers. It, therefore, became necessary during early stages of the T. U. E. L.S. activities to organize progressive trade union committees to carry on fights within the unions, as for example, in the Miners' Union, the Progressive Miners' Committee, in the railroad industry, the Railroad Workers' Amalgamation Committee. These progressive committees were organized in the following way. First the plan for their organization was submitted to the Central Committee of the Communist Party for approval. Second, conferences were arranged between communist leaders and the dissatisfied elements in the unions for the formation of a leading committee to function as an executive of the progressive movement. For wind addressing, a leading non-communist progressive was generally decided upon for president and a communist put in as secretary, because the secretary carried on the correspondence, had charge of the records and finances, thereby controlling the organization. In the executive committee, the communists were usually a majority by virtue of the fact that they either took a majority outright by agreement, or, if that was impossible, they achieved their purpose by including a number of so-called non-party members who were really communists disguising themselves as non-party workers. But the most important source of communist control and influence was the money the party supplied for carrying on the work. As for the rank and file control of the progressive movement, it was manipulated, as follows. First the communist fraction acted as a caucus in the T. U. E. L where it lined up the closest sympathizers, then, the T. U. E. L. Group acted as a block in the progressive movement. The communist party left nothing to chance. 
It worked like a well-oiled machine from the Central Executive Committee down to the most remote party member. When the Trade Union Educational League was first organized, Foster had a rather naive conception of the American Federation of Labor. I spoke to him on many occasions concerning the unions and listened to him at many party meetings during the early days of the Trade Union Educational League in 1922-23. Foster actually believed that if the Communist Party members in the trade unions became active they could in a short time have themselves elected as presidents, secretaries, and executive board members of the thousands of local trade unions throughout the country. Then through the control of the local unions they could easily gather sufficient strength to capture the international unions and finally the A. F. of L. itself. He greatly underestimated the strength of the trade union hierarchy, the strength of its machine control, and its influence over the mass of the workers. Another factor that Foster almost completely left out of his ambitious scheme to become the president of the A. F. Of L was the government's friendly relations with the American Federation of Labor, and the strength of the Republican and Democratic parties in the trade unions. Later on in the intense internal struggle in the A. F. Of L, which followed the organization of the Trade Union Educational League, Foster had an opportunity to learn that his road to supremacy over the A. F. Of L was not as easy as he visualized that in the A. F. of L. the communists faced a powerful adversary. At this time the communist international reversed itself on another of its policies and raised the slogan of the United Front. Moscow called upon the communists to unite with the socialists and trade unionists of their respective countries against the encroachments of capitalism, for better conditions, and in support of Soviet Russia. The Bolsheviks hoped that by the United Front maneuver they could gain the leadership over the millions of socialists and organized workers who had steadfastly refused to follow communist leadership. In the United States we tried to put the United Front slogan concretely into action by preparing a Labour Party thesis, which we sent to Moscow for approval. When we were assured that the Communist International would have no objections, we launched a campaign to organize a Labour Party that would include the Communists. Foster's Trade Union Educational League, which at first was very cautious on the question of the Labour Party, now vigorously espoused its cause. Foster, very enthusiastic over the prospects of a Labour Party, he expressed high hopes at every meeting of the political committee that the organization of a Labour Party would help him capture the A. F. of L, because Gompers, being opposed to a Labour Party, would eventually be ousted by the Labour Party forces. Browder, who was Foster's orderly, made hurried trips from Chicago to New York to report to the political committee how Foster was working hand and glove with Fitzpatrick. President of the Chicago Federation of Labor, and Knuckles, its secretary, for the establishment of a Labor Party. He also reported that hundreds of trade unions were openly declaring themselves in favor of a Labor Party. Foster would report at length on his conferences with Fitzpatrick and Knuckles, giving the impression that both A. F. of L. Officials were mere putty in his hands. The party threw all its resources into the campaign to organize a Labour Party. This endeavor culminated in the July 3rd convention held in the city of Chicago in the year 1923. Money received from the Cummington helped organize this convention. Important delegates were financed directly by our party. Trade unionists, farmer Labour Party leaders of the Northwest, important liberals, Cooperative leaders were interviewed by our agents and every effort made to interest them in the convention and to have them attend. No money was spared. The party was geared for full speed in this convention. Instructions were sent out to mobilize and sent several thousand delegates to Chicago. Every organization in which the party had some influence, regardless of how small it was or unimportant, was utilized in the sending of delegates. Many unborn represented organizations that existed only on paper. Many came representing organizations that never even considered the question of a Labour Party, let alone electing delegates to this convention. Communists, men and women, formed groups, 
and hiked to Chicago from all parts of the country, and when they arrived, presented credentials and became duly accredited delegates. All the expenses for the convention, every penny of it, were paid for by the party. The communists who appeared representing innocent organizations denied that they were communists, but they were all duly registered for a communist caucus of the convention, which caucus included fully 90% of the delegates present. The steering committee for the communist caucus consisted of Rothenberg, Pepper, and Foster. Difficulty soon arose at the convention over the question of the immediate organization of the Labour Party. President Fitzpatrick and Secretary Knuckles of the Chicago Federation of Labor were for waiting. They wanted to see what the Farmer Labor Party of Minnesota would do, what the Railroad Brotherhoods and the unions represented by the Conference for Progressive Labor Action would do in the immediate future, before taking the step. In this they were supported by some of the genuine state Labor Party forces present. However, the steering committee wanted to organize a Labor Party right away. It had the delegates present and they would do whatever the steering committee ordered them to do. They came for no other purpose. The steering committee also knew that if a Labour Party emerged from Chicago the communists would control it. When the communist steamroller flattened out Fitzpatrick and Knuckles, they and their few supporters bolted the convention. Amid fanfare and wild enthusiasm a motion to organize a Labour Party was carried and the Federated Farmer Labour Party came into existence. It was just another new premature communist baby. The executive committee elected was dominated by the communists, its secretary being Joseph Manley, Foster's son-in-law, who had the unpleasant job of being the new party's wet nurse. But the break with Fitzpatrick was very costly to Foster. Foster had clung to Fitzpatrick like a leech. He was with Fitzpatrick in the campaign to organize the steel workers, and also in the packing house campaign. Fitzpatrick gave Foster the platform of the Chicago Federation of Labor and on more than one occasion came to the support of Foster and the Trade Union Educational League. Fitzpatrick was Foster's most important ally in the A. F. of L. He played an important part in Foster's plans for the capture of the A. F. of L. Foster had on more than one occasion remarked that Fitzpatrick would make an ideal president for the American Federation of Labor. Moreover, the astute Sam Gompers followed up the break of Foster and Fitzpatrick by unloading the full power of the American Federation of Labor against Foster, the Trade Union Educational League, and the Communists. The few positions which Foster had gained in the trade unions were soon lost. The prospects of capturing the A. F. of L. no longer looked bright and easy. Besides, Fitzpatrick himself followed up this break with an attack upon Foster and the Communists. When he spoke before the party's political committee on the break with Fitzpatrick, Foster almost wept. The break made Foster realize that his efforts to capture the A. F. of L. were at an end. The most important wedge he had in the A. F. of L., the Chicago Federation of Labor, with its tremendous membership and powerful unions, was now lost. He looked upon the situation as a tragedy, and, though he shared the responsibility for it, he secretly held Rothenburg and Pepper solely responsible for this blow. He had to make up with his followers in the T. U. E. L. For his loss of face in the trade unions. The only way to do it was to blame Rothenburg and Pepper for the July 3rd debacle, and to organize to depose them from leadership. For his lost ambition to capture the A. F. of L., he developed a new ambition to capture the Communist Party and become America's number one communist leader. How crassly opportunistic Foster's new position was is borne out by his actions on the steering committee in support of the tactics that forced the Fitzpatrick break, in his support of the actions at the meetings of the political committee of the Workers' Party, and his writings on the matter. Writing of the July 3rd Convention in the August, 1923, issue of the Labour Herald, Foster declared the advent of the Federated Farmer Labor Party marks an epoch in American labor history. And further on, 
The Federated Farmer Labour Party is a militant organization. The Federated Farmer Labour Party will break the chains with which the Gompers bureaucracy keeps the workers of this country bound to the political chariots of their industrial masters. In this article, there is no criticism of Fitzpatrick. Foster still had hopes then that he could maintain the Fitzpatrick alliance. At every meeting, he raised the Fitzpatrick question. And it was not until the end of December, almost six months after the break, that Foster finally agreed to answer Fitzpatrick's attack. He submitted his reply to Fitzpatrick to the Central Executive Committee of the Workers' Party, which went carefully over every sentence and, even after the decision was made, Foster was not so sure about its advisability. The result of the decision was Foster's open letter to John Fitzpatrick, which was printed in the January, 1924, Labour Herald, and in which, admitting the Foster Fitzpatrick combination against Gompers, he asserts that the loss of the steel strike of 1919 killed the plan to revolutionize the A. F. of L. Included is an analysis of the personal weakness of Fitzpatrick's leadership, his swing to the right, his capitulation to Gompers, and the conclusion that in betraying the Labour Party movement he had thrown the Labour movement back twenty years. How completely the line connecting Foster to Fitzpatrick was severed is made clear in the concluding tirade of the letter which states, your retreat from your former progressive position has not only injured the Labour movement as a whole, but it has completely wrecked your individual prestige and made you impossible as a progressive leader. Your weakness at the July the 3rd to the 5th convention, coupled with your re-adoption of the Gompers non-partisan method, had killed you as the national champion of the Labour Party idea. You are due before long for a rude awakening on this matter. I wonder how long the reactionaries will let you retain even your formal leadership of the Federation now that you have lost the real leadership of it. Foster organized carefully and secretly to capture the party. He raised no political or principal differences with the Central Committee of the party. What he did was to turn the Trade Union Educational League into a conspirative, factional organization for the capture of the party leadership. Instead of doing trade union work, the organizers of the T. U. E. L. toured the country as the secret emissaries of Foster and everywhere gathered together party members for their plan. But Foster could not capture the party with only the T. U. E. L. He, therefore, secretly made a number of important deals, one with Ludwig Lohr and Juliet Points, who jointly had a considerable following in New York City. Ludwig Lohr was the editor of the oldest socialist daily paper in the United States, the New Yorker Volkszeitung, through which paper he wielded great influence and dominated the German-speaking members of the party. Juliet Stewart Points was an American college-bred woman a forceful speaker, very ambitious, and one who aspired to national leadership. She was popular among the rank and file members and could be counted upon to muster a considerable number of votes in New York. The alliance with Bittleman and Dolgin of the Jewish Federation gave Foster additional strength in New York and the majority of the Jewish Federation membership throughout the country. Most important, however, was his alliance with the powerful and clannish Finnish Federation which had a large membership, was rich in cooperatives, printing plants, three daily newspapers, clubhouses, and other enterprises. The Finnish Federation could be depended upon for considerable financial support in the campaign to capture the party, and what was more important, the solid vote of its membership, because the Finnish members were never active in the general work of the party and voted the way the leaders of the Federation told them to. In addition, Foster rallied to his banner some important party leaders. Foremost was Jim Cannon, who joined forces with Foster. With Rothenburg removed from the leadership of the party, Cannon was probably of the belief that he could assume the party's political leadership, because of Foster's lack of experience in party politics. Another figure was William F. Dunn, the wild bull from Montana, as he was known, who was promised the editorship of the Daily Worker. Dunn having been editor of the famous Labour paper. 
The Butte Daily Bulletin. Foster conducted the campaign to capture the party so secretively that Rothenberg refused to believe the reports he received that Foster was conspiring to oust him. It was only on the very eve of the party's national convention, with the election of delegates already proceeding in the districts, that he allowed Lovestone, Ballam, and Pepper to organize against Foster's moves. But he was not convinced for he came to the New York District Convention, from which the largest number of delegates to the National Convention was to be elected, and delivered a report about the unanimity of the Central Executive Committee on all the important issues before the party, and squelched all rumors that there was a schism between him and Foster. But no sooner was his speech delivered than it was clear that the Foster Caucus and alliances were working smoothly. I was present as a delegate to the New York District Convention and led the fight against the Foster forces. I had very little time to organize, because only a few days before the convention Lifshitz, the little corporal, as he was called, organizer of the New York District, reported to me that there was trouble ahead. Points, Law, and Jack Jampolsky, the organizer of the New York District T. U. E. L conducted the fight for Foster. A bitter fight over the election of delegates ensued. When it was over, I was elected as a delegate with a very large vote, but I did not take a majority of the delegates with me to the national convention. Foster had a little more than half of them. But we did manage to retain our majority on the New York District Committee. Rothenburg went back to Chicago, not at all worried over the result, but once in Chicago, he became alarmed when he received the reports on elections all over the country. He gave Lovestone and Pepper a free hand to see what they could do to remedy the situation. It was clear that Foster had a majority of the delegates, and since the National Convention was the supreme authority of the party, he could do with the party whatever he desired. The only way to destroy Foster's majority was to cause a split in Foster's delegation. This Pepper and Lovestone attempted to do by trying to break Law away from Foster. I arrived in Chicago with Law. At the station were Lovestone and Pepper. They immediately accosted Law and invited him into a conference. But Law hated Pepper. Besides, he was not a man who could be made to change his position easily. The conference with Law proved futile. At the convention the routine matters prepared by the Central Executive Committee were adopted. The Foster Group maintained its majority throughout the sessions, and when the elections of a new Central Executive Committee took place the Foster forces captured it. At the first meeting of the newly elected Central Executive Committee Foster was a little afraid fully to exert the power of his majority. He hesitated about removing Rothenburg as the General Secretary of the party, which he desired, since he feared that such a move would not be welcomed by the membership, and what is more important by the real boss of the party, the Communist International. So, Foster had himself designated as the chairman of the party and Rothenburg was retained as general secretary, but with his wings clipped, because he was subject to the decisions of subcommittees on which the Foster group made sure to have a safe majority. But the Foster majority did request the Communist International to remove Pepper from work in the United States. This convention brought into life the smoldering fires of factional controversy which were to keep the Communist movement in a state of civil war up to the year 1929. I remember after the convention was over, and the sessions of the newly elected Central Executive Committee had been concluded, that a small group of the minority met in a restaurant where over our cups of coffee we discussed the recent events and the future. Present were Lovestone, Rothenberg, Ballam, and Pepper. Pepper declared, Comrades, we must have patience in politics. To gain a majority is one thing, to maintain it is another. We must take a lesson from Foster and organize our own forces, but secretly and carefully. That night was born our caucus through which we waged the factional fight, not only in America but in Moscow as well. From that night on, Moscow became involved in practically every important step of the American communist movement. In fact, so scandalous did the situation become that the following joke became popular among party members why is the communist party of the United States like the Brooklyn Bridge?
because it is suspended on cables. Every week, cables to Moscow were hot with messages sent to the Bolshevik Holy Land, or Mecca, as we called it, protesting or setting forth the position of our group. The Foster Group did likewise, and in addition supplemented them by official cables from the party. Some were sent in code and many were not, even though they carried some of the party's most confidential matters. These cables were supplemented by letters and long reports. We in return would receive cables officially from Moscow addressed to the party and unofficially from our caucus representatives in Moscow. Many of these cables were often five, six, and more pages in length. Thousands of dollars were spent in this manner. No special representative of the Communist International was present at the 1923 convention, because from all indications the party was united, no serious differences of opinion prevailed among its leaders. Pepper had become a regular member of the American Party. All the Communist International did was to send a letter to the party which declared the excellent work that has been done by the communists in the left wing of the labor movement in the United States demonstrates that if all the comrades were members of the trade unions the work would increase manifold. The propaganda that the Workers' Party has conducted during the past year has been most effective. The vast sentiment for communism that the Workers' Party has aroused must be organized. The Central Executive Committee acted right in inaugurating a campaign for membership. The Workers' Party has applied communist tactics correctly. The organization of the Federated Farmer Labor Party was an achievement of primary importance. Foster, who had given up as helpless his ambition to become the head of the American Federation of Labor, had succeeded in his endeavor to become the communist leader of America. He had traveled a long road from the time he was a Bryan Democrat. Chapter 6, A Case of Political Infanticide to a Cardinal Rules of Communist Politics are, 1, in every important fight for power in the party, raise only one important political issue or one set of issues as an excuse for the struggle, 2, draw up a documentary record of your opponent's crimes and deviations from the general line of accepted communist policy, if true evidence is lacking, stretch the truth. Foster knew these rules. He was fully aware of the fact that it was not enough to capture the party. He had to hold on to it. He had to establish a political platform for his leadership and a record of the crimes of his opponents, the Rothenburg group which he had deposed from power. A post-mortem on the campaign to organize the Federal Farmer Labor Party supplied the political issue. But Rothenburg also knew the rules of the game. That issue therefore became the factional football that was booted around in the Communist Party of the United States and at the Holy See in Moscow. We all played the game, and the way we booted the ball depended on which man we backed for leadership, Foster or Rothenburg. Having captured the party, Foster tried to consolidate his position by using the power which his majority on the Central Executive Committee gave him and that meant dictatorial powers. The C. E. C. appoints all heads of the district organizations, it has a minority on a district committee, it can either send its representative there with power to nullify all decisions and enforce whatever orders the C. E. C. issues on executive or policy matters, or the C. E. C can add members to the district committee until it has a majority favorable to itself, even though, according to the party constitution, the district committee is elected by a district convention. The district committee and all its officers are required to carry out all the decisions of the central executive committee, whether they like them or not. Although elected by the membership of their district, they are in the position of army officers of inferior rank. However, Foster hesitated to use his newly won dictatorial power, but not because he was a Bryan Democrat. Moscow had even greater power over him, and he was so afraid of Moscow that he moved very cautiously. Many of those who had been with him in the Steel Strike and the Packing House Union strangely enough were also members of the Communist Party, he placed them all, his son-in-law, Joseph Manley, Earl Browder, Charles Crumbain, Hamas Mark. Otto Wangerin, Jack Johnston, in strategic positions. 
it seemed that the cadre he had built up in the days when he confined himself strictly to the trade union field, and upon which he evidently depended in his alliance with the Fitzpatrick forces, was now to make up his lieutenants in the party. In a district as large as New York, where we Rothenburgians had the majority of the district committee, Foster was particularly afraid to use his power. He moved gingerly. New York was the largest district in the party, its membership more alive than any other to inner party developments. On the district committee were Ludwig Law, Juliet Stewart Points, George Ashkenusi, myself, and other prominent members of the party. Foster had removed the district organizer, little Corporal Benjamin Lifshitz, a short impulsive little fellow, and had put in his place Charles Crumbane, from Chicago, a blustering trade unionist who had got his training in the Chicago Federation of Labor as one of Foster's henchmen. Foster refrained from changing the composition of the district committee. Through this appointment Crumbane automatically became a member of the district committee with a vote. All Foster needed now was a switch of one more vote from the opposition to his side, to give him a majority on the New York District Committee. Politics works in strange ways. This time it moved along on the Albany night boat, carrying delegates from New York City to Albany, to attend a so-called State Federated Farmer Labor Party convention, organized and financed by the Communist Party. The Albany boat carried a load of delegates from New York, among whom were all the members of the district committee. The night was beautiful, the moon's silvery sheen enraptured the romantic hearts of the comrades. A Lithuanian woman member of the district committee who was a supporter of the Rothenburg group fell under the sway of that romantic night and became enamored of Charlie Crumbane. After a fateful night with him on the entrancing Albany night boat, she was connected to Fosterism. Crumbane won a sweetheart and a majority on the New York District Committee, but in doing so he broke the heart of a veteran Foster follower on the District Committee, she, however, although slighted by Crumbane, nevertheless remained loyal to her politics and continued to support Crumbane and the Foster group. Foster was shrewd enough to realize that he had been merely lucky in winning a bare and uncertain majority on the New York District Committee. He had to ground his leadership more substantially. He had to develop political policies which would be in harmony with Bolshevik policy and which would meet with Moscow's approval. One had but to watch Foster at Central Executive Committee meetings to see how cautiously and hesitatingly he developed his political ideas. He was not sure of himself as a political leader, did not feel on firm ground in the domain of internal party politics. His inferiority complex in this respect was so apparent that we of the opposition took full advantage of it, making his life on the Central Executive Committee just as miserable as we could. We were the bright boys who knew how to sling the communist lingo, he was the shamefaced dullard. To overcome this deficiency, he brought to his aid, Alexander Bittleman. That was a master stroke. True, Bittleman was a Talmudist in every respect, completely divorced from all contact with the labor movement and with American life. But he read Russian followed the Russian communist press minutely and tried to copy in detail everything the Bolsheviks advocated, in order to apply it to the United States. His sensitive nose was always pointed in Moscow's direction, the better to catch the odor of the political breezes that blew from there. Bittleman became Foster's political brain trust. He bent over the papers, snooped through the books, collected statistics, worked out the policies, which were then presented by Foster. It was teamwork, with Foster in the limelight and Bittleman in the background. When Foster lost the majority in 1925 and Bittleman was excluded from the Central Executive Committee, Foster acted like a lost man. Finally, in sheer desperation, he came into a meeting of the political committee with a special motion on personal privilege, requesting that Bittleman be allowed to attend the committee meetings. The obvious purpose of this motion was to make it possible for Foster to go into a huddle with Bittleman on all important matters that came up before the committee. The most important political policy which Foster inherited when he took over the party was the Labour Party policy. Let us recover the facts. The policy had been devised by Moscow for the Communists of Great Britain, 
who were urged to campaign for admission into the British Labour Party. It was John Pepper who had first adapted this policy to the United States. Before it was actively put forward, however, it was submitted to Moscow for approval. When the Labour Party policy was put into practice the Communist Party was insignificant politically. Our total active membership was 6,862, of whom over two-thirds were not in the trade unions and the rest an insignificant minority there. We could make a lot of noise through our press and at meetings, but we were to all intents and purposes completely isolated from the mainstream of organized labor. Through the Labour Party we hoped to attract the workers and penetrate the trade unions. Moscow also was interested in an American Labour Party for purely Russian reasons, for Moscow desired a political party with millions of voters supporting it that would be friendly to the Soviet Union and would fight for its recognition by the United States government. Hence, with the money supplied by Moscow, Emissaries of the Central Executive Committee of the Communist Party were sent all over the country to interview trade union leaders, farmer Labour Party politicians, progressives of the La Follette movement, farmer organization leaders and influential people of the cooperatives. These emissaries carried in their pockets complete and detailed instructions from the party. When they returned, they reported to the political committee on their missions describing in detail the persons visited, their weak points, how they could be influenced with offers of jobs and otherwise dot in order to overcome the opposition of the A. F. of L. To the Labour Party, we attempted to bore within the Conference for Progressive Political Action, dominated by the powerful unions of the Railroad Brotherhoods, the Machinists Union of the American Federation of Labour, and Sidney Hillman's Independent Union the Amalgamated Clothing Workers of America. We made no headway with the Conference for Progressive Political Action, for our party was excluded from its Cleveland Conference. We thereupon took steps to call a conference of our own for the purpose of organizing a farmer labor party, which would include the communists and which the communists would control. The Farmer Labour Party which in 1920 had run a presidential candidate was induced to support the campaign for such a convention and to issue a call for it, inviting all the political and economic groups favoring the organization of a Farmer Labour Party. The date of the convention was set for July, 1923. The report of the Central Executive Committee of the Communist Party to the 1923 convention indicates how completely we dominated the campaign for the July 3rd convention. It states from the beginning of the campaign for the July 3rd convention there was close cooperation between the Farmer Labour Party and the Central Executive Committee. The Executive Secretary, Rothenberg, of the party held a number of conferences with the secretary of the Farmer Labour Party at which the plans for the campaign were formulated. Our party did not only give its support as an organization but it assisted in financing the work of printing and sending out the call for the convention. We were all very enthusiastic over the campaign. Foster was more than enthusiastic. He was jubilant. He very often expressed himself in the political committee that the American Labour Party, once it was organized, would bring about the disintegration of the Gompers machine and would pave the way for the supporters of the Labour Party taking over the A. F. of L. But the July 3rd convention did not run smoothly. The communists packed it with their delegates, burdened it with their oratory and stampeded it with their applause. However, the delegates who really represented farmer labor party organizations and trade unions withstanding objected to the platform which was drafted by the communist party and presented by Joseph Manley. Then Rothenberg took the floor and declared the platform we recommend, even though charged with being red, Bolshevik, ultra radical, is hard for us, the communists, to swallow. And he made this statement even though he himself actually wrote the program. As for Foster, in speaking for the platform, he chided the opposition with being too conservative and out of tune with the radical sentiment in the United States, which in his opinion in the year 1923 was more radical than the sentiment among the Russian masses on the eve of the Bolshevik Revolution. The real fight of the convention came on the report of the organization committee which included a majority of communists or communist sympathizers and which contained the following well-known leaders of our party, Rothenberg, Foster, Hathaway, 
law, J. Lovestone, Manley, in all about 23 Communist Party leaders were on this committee out of a total of 61 members. In addition, we had a sufficient number of rank and file party members and communist sympathizers, who could be depended upon to follow the party line, among the 61, to give us a distinct majority. This committee forced through its resolution to organize immediately a National Labour Party, to be known as the Federated Farmer Labour Party, and rejected the proposal of Fitzpatrick, made prior to the convention, that the convention of July 3rd should declare itself merely a conference and create a committee to be known as the Organization Committee, in which the Communist or Workers' Party and all other national organizations should be represented while the local unions and central labor bodies should be affiliated with the existing Farmer Labor Party. The proposal to organize the Federated Farmer Labor Party was carried by a vote of 500 to 40. But in carrying the proposal, the Communists, as has been said before, split the convention and forced out the non-Communist forces representing the genuine Farmer Labor Party movement of the country, as well as the trade unions. We were jubilant about capturing a convention of over 500 delegates, with most of whom we ourselves had packed this convention, with the result that we captured ourselves. Having organized a farmer labor party in name, we did not know what to do with it. For weeks after July 3rd, its office was virtually in the office of the Communist Party. Joseph Manley was appointed its secretary. His wages and the expenses of his office were all paid for by the Communist Party. Wherever we attempted to organize local or state branches of the new party it became only another cloak or mask for the local or state communist organization. The Federated Farmer Labor Party became a joke among the communist membership. We soon realized that the split was very costly, that we had an illegitimate baby on our hands. Something had to be done to gain a foothold in the Farmer Labour Party movement of the country. This became an urgent need in February, 1924, when the Conference for Progressive Political Action issued a call for a conference to be held on the 4th of July, 1924, for the purpose of taking action on the nominating of a presidential candidate. Besides, there was a lot of talk that Senator Robert M. La Follette would run against the two old parties. The sentiment in Farmer Labor Party circles was very strong for La Follette. Encouraging the American movement for an independent party of workers and farmers was the recent victory of the British Labor Party, which at about this time took over the reins of government in Great Britain, with J. Ramsay MacDonald as Prime Minister. We were in a panic over these developments especially as the movement to induce La Follette to run against the Democratic and Republican parties was gaining momentum. We feared that all our efforts in building up a Labour Party which would include the Communists and be dominated by them would come to naught. The situation created a serious crisis inside the Communist Party. In spite of all the money and energy we had spent, we were facing complete isolation from the movement, because the Conference for Progressive Political Action dominated by the powerful railroad brotherhoods, was the real driving force behind the La Follette for President movement. It was very evident to us that we would be excluded from the convention called by that organization for the purpose of nominating La Follette. Something drastic had to be done to save our political necks in the Farmer Labour Party movement. A full meeting of the Central Executive Committee of the party was held in the middle of February. 1924, at which this situation was discussed. At this meeting it was decided that steps should be taken by our Federated Farmer Labor Party, in conjunction with some of the Farmer Labor Party leaders of Minnesota, to call a national convention for the formation of a new National Labor Party, the convention to be held on May 30th, in order that, whatever organization was set up by then should be able to make demands and dicker with the July 4th meeting of the Conference for Progressive Political Action. The Central Executive Committee of the Communist Party desired to use the Farmer Labor Rights of Minnesota as a smokescreen for the new organization, which we would set up on May 30th. We laid down the following policies for the May 30th convention colon 1. We must end our isolation from the Farmer Labor Party elements under our influence by consolidating our influence over these groups in a definite organizational form. 2. 
we must hold a May 30th convention irrespective of the action of the Farmer Labor Party of Minnesota provided we can hold the support of the other state organizations.3. We must launch an immediate campaign against the July 4th convention in order to create doubt and suspicion in the minds of the workers as to its forthcoming action.4. On May 30th we must form a new organization, adopt a platform and elect a national committee and empower the national committee to take action on the question of candidates for president and vice president.5. The national committee, of the Labour Party, shall go to the Cleveland July 4th conference to negotiate. If the National Committee is seated at the July 4th conference we shall endorse whatever candidates the July 4th conference shall nominate. This policy meant an endorsement of La Follette. 6. If the National Committee is refused admittance by the Cleveland Convention and Cleveland nominates candidates for President and Vice President, the National Committee shall immediately hold a public meeting and endorse the candidates of the Cleveland Convention. Continued endorsement of La Follette even if excluded from the Cleveland Convention. 7. If the Cleveland Convention does not form a third party, the National Committee shall immediately place in nomination candidates of the May 30th Convention as the Farmer Labor candidates. Foster was completely in favor of the May 30th Convention and at the sea. E. C. Meeting he declared May 30th now becomes the real mass labor party and we close our eyes to the July 4th conference. Ludwig Law, who opposed the endorsement of La Follette, nevertheless favored the May 30th strategy and stated we must have organizations behind the May 30th convention. Minnesota must be flooded with our people and activity. The farmers in Minnesota must be organized. Steps were taken immediately to negotiate with the Farmer Labor Party leaders of the state of Minnesota, especially with William Mahoney, who edited the Minnesota Union Advocate, the political expression of the Farmer Labor Party Federation, which wielded a tremendous influence in the Minnesota Farmer Labor Party. We also took steps to flood the state with our organizers and to colonize the important centers with our members. We had considerable strength in the Minnesota movement through the Finnish Cooperative, which had its headquarters at Superior, Wisconsin. They were included in our plans for capturing the Minnesota Farmer Labor Party movement. Our endorsement of La Follette helped us tremendously in this respect, because the Farmer Laborites of Minnesota were all for La Follette, but did not like the dominance of the Brotherhoods over the Conference for Progressive Political Action. They felt that they were the genuine protagonists of the Farmer Labor Party idea and that the Brotherhoods were not. Since we were in common agreement with them on La Follette, it was very easy to ensnare Mahoney and the other leaders. They did not realize all the time, from the very first negotiations, that they were just tools in our hands. Most of the negotiations were carried on through Clarence Hathaway. At the time he was a member of the Machinists Union of St. Paul and represented his local at the Farmer Labor Federation. The Farmer Labor people did not know that Hathaway was a member of the Communist Party and acting under its discipline. As a disciplined communist, Hathaway did everything to maintain the fiction that he was not a communist. We came to an agreement with the Farmer Labor Party representatives in Minnesota to call the convention for the formation of a National Labor Party on June the 17th instead of May 30th. Following this agreement, the party launched a campaign to discredit the July 4th Cleveland Convention, and to win over the party members to the policy of supporting La Follette. The party members did not like the policy. They were inclined to favor the principled position of law that under no circumstances should he be supported. I had great difficulty in convincing the comrades, many of them agreeing not out of conviction, but out of a sense of discipline and loyalty to the party. Law and Olgin wrote a thesis, which was published on April 12, attacking our policy. Foss has two main aides on the political committee, Bittleman and Cannon, wrote a reply to the thesis defending our policy, notwithstanding the fact that Law and Olgin were important pillars of the Foster majority in the party. The situation for Foster was very complicated. He had to discredit the Ruffenburg group and particularly Pepper on the Labour Party policy, while at the same time accepting their most important premises on this question. In addition, he had to carry on the fight in such a way as not to antagonize Law and his followers 
for the loss of law's followers would mean to lose the majority. Suddenly, while the negotiations with the farmer laborites of Minnesota were going on, a call was issued for a plenary session of the Executive Committee of the Communist International. John Pepper, the initiator and one of the most active spirits in our Labour Party strategy, was recalled to Moscow, so that the Labour Party issue was immediately transferred to the Holy See, and we had to await the verdict of Moscow before knowing how best to proceed in the matter. It was Foster who, using his influence with Lozovsky, the head of the Profinton, had succeeded in having Pepper recalled, as we Rothenbergins learned later. As soon as Foster had assurances that Moscow would recall Pepper, he called a meeting of his caucus in New York City. It was attended by the entire Law Point Solgan caucus. It decided to demand of Moscow that Pepper be permanently withdrawn from the American party. According to the reports of Rothenburg's spy at this meeting, Foster ranted against Pepper and welcomed the support of the Law Point Solgan group even though the latter violently disagreed with the policy of supporting La Follette, should the senator be nominated by the July 4 convention. On this major question of policy, Foster and his group, including Bittleman, Cannon, and Browder, were in complete agreement with Pepper. When the Rothenburg spy returned with a complete report of that fateful caucus, Pepper became exceedingly nervous. He did not desire to go back to Moscow. During his brief stay he had developed a great slugging for the United States. He realized moreover that his political head was at stake. He immediately started to work on his defense. He knew that his greatest fight would be against Foster. He did not want to make this fight alone, because he was wise enough to know that if he appeared alone against Foster, it would be tantamount to committing political suicide. In addition, he realized that he would have to bear the brunt of the responsibility in defending the policies and mistakes of the party on the Labour Party question. He therefore appealed to all the leaders of the Rothenburg group to join him in his fight against Foster and in defense of the Labour Party policies and tactics. We did not hesitate to do so, not only because of loyalty to a member of our group, but also because we realized that if Pepper was completely discredited by the Communist International, it would be a big blow to our group in regaining the leadership of the party. We decided not only to back Pepper to the fullest extent, but at the same time to have Pepper develop the fight in Moscow against the Foster leadership. Therefore, in the letters which we sent to Zinovov, chairman of the Communist International, we stressed the importance of our own role as leaders of the party, an estimation of Foster and why he could not be trusted with the party leadership a defense of the Labour Party policy, at the same time showing how Foster was non-politically minded and hampered the Labour Party campaign, an attack upon Foster's unprincipledness and factionalism, and finally a laudation of Pepper's services to the American Party and a request that his services on behalf of the American Party be continued. Before Pepper left for Moscow I had a talk with him. He was rather pessimistic as to the prospects of his returning immediately. Nevertheless, he said your letter to Zinovov is an excellent one and every word of it's true. Foster will have to reckon with me when I am in Moscow. I will be the unofficial representative of the Rothenburg group and will guard its interests every moment of the day. In a political fight one must have patience, for victories are not won in a day. After Pepper left for Moscow, Foster followed him. He was very bitter against Pepper. At a central executive committee meeting he was heard to boast. If there is one thing I will accomplish in Moscow, it will be to keep him there. By that time Foster had already developed a critical attitude towards some aspects of the Labour Party policy. He was not sure of his attitude, his position being the result of developments in the party. His supporters who followed the Law Point Solgin group were very critical of the Federated Farmer Labour Party and the endorsement of La Follette. In addition, the powerful group in the New York Needle Trades, headed by Charles Zimmerman, head of Local 22 of the Dressmakers, Ben Gold of the Furriers, and Rose Wirtis, head of the Needle Trades in the Trade Union Educational League, favored the law position. Foster had to yield to the pressure of these forces on the Labour Party question in order to maintain his majority. 
He therefore denied responsibility for the formation of the Federated Farmer Labour Party, in the formation of which he had played as much of a leading part as John Pepper. Besides, placing the whole responsibility for the Federated Farmer Labour Party debacle upon the shoulders of the Ruthenburg Group was excellent factional strategy. Foster went to Moscow in April as the leader of the majority of the Communist Party. He had been its leader since January 1, 1924. As the leader of the majority, he did everything possible to hamper the work of the Federated Farmer Labour Party and to prevent its growth, only in order to discredit the Ruthenburg leadership of the party. But had Foster then understood the situation clearly? he would have known that nothing which the Communist Party would do could instill life and growth into the Federated Farmer Labour Party. In Moscow the Communist International accepted the political line of law in reference to the non-endorsement of La Follette and categorically rejected the policy of supporting him. But accepting law's policy on La Follette meant a serious repudiation of both the Foster and Ruthenburg groups, which together constituted the overwhelming majority of the party. Pepper who was a very shrewd and unscrupulous political adversary, saw this situation immediately and made the most use of it, by launching a most violent attack upon law for his heresies and unorthodox communist viewpoints. Whether one agreed with law or not, it must be stated that he dared to maintain an independent and critical viewpoint even when it was at variance with the Moscow position. These heresies, these critical viewpoints, Pepper magnified out of all proportion to their importance. At the same time, Pepper's attack fitted in with the desires of certain Bolshevik leaders, whose fight for the elimination of Leon Trotsky, following the death of Lenin on January 21, 1924, was beginning to take form. Law had always been an admirer of Trotsky, and in the editorial columns of the Volkszeitung. Whenever the occasion presented itself, he came out in praise of Trotsky. In addition, it was no secret in the American party that Law had no use for Zinoviev, whose leadership of the Comintern on more than one occasion he had criticized in a veiled form. Therefore, Law became the scapegoat. The Russian leaders attacked him unmercifully. Rod called him an anti-communist, a social democrat, a German patriot who entered the communist movement because he opposed the United States entering the war on the side of the enemies of Germany. Anyone knowing Law and his long record in the Socialist Party, knew that all these charges and especially this last charge of Radx was absolutely false and was made out of whole cloth, only to destroy the political effectiveness of Law in the labor movement. Zinoviev, chairman of the Comintern and member of the powerful political committee of the Russian Communist Party, drew up the verdict from what I have read, law proves he is in no case a communist. I really do not know whether he belongs in the Central Executive Committee. In the resolution we have said that very politely. Perhaps we will be compelled to tell it to him less politely. The fact that law, too, was against the support of La Follette is of no moment. We know the manners of social democrats who hide behind some barricades, who say they are against the work among the farmers because they are orthodox Marxists. The Zinoviev came an F. Stalin machine in the Comintern was not sure where Foster would stand on the Trotsky issue, because of his alliance with law. In the decision of the Executive Committee of the Comintern, published in the Daily Worker of May 18, 1924, it was stated that there could be no doubt of the loyalty of the Rothenburg Group to the Comintern. In reporting for the American Commission in the Presidium of the Comintern, Rod put it this way the groups of comrades Ruthenburg and Pepper appear to be the more radical. As far as Comrade Foster is concerned, I believe that we may have very serious difficulties with this comrade. That was a blow to Foster, who cut a very pitiable figure in Moscow in 1924. He did not defend his position on the Labour Party question. He merely blamed Pepper for the split with Fitzpatrick and for the formation of the Federated Farmer Labour Party. But he did not defend Law, though Law was one of his most important supporters. Nor did he carry out his promise to Law and Olgin that he would present their views on the Labour Party for the consideration of Moscow. When he felt how the political winds blew, he kept the famous Law-Olgin thesis on the Labour Party in his pocket. 
he talked in the most general terms about the aristocracy of labor and other trade union matters. On the La Follette matter he begged if we have made a mistake in our policy, then it must be clearly understood why we have made this mistake. And I will be perfectly satisfied with the explanation that will be given. This subservient attitude toward the Moscow leaders, this cringing before them, this readiness to accept their viewpoint, whatever it might be, even before it was presented, made the erstwhile Brian Democrat a perfect communist. In the final decision adopted by the Executive Committee of the Communist International, it was decided to work for the establishment of a political united front with the workers and exploited farmers by raising the slogan of the Farmer Labor Party. Trotsky's proposal that the farmers be dropped was rejected. The trade union policy of the American Party was now to be in line with the Prefinton. An ideological campaign was to be started against the two and a half international two tendency of Law and his followers. The party was to be Bolshevized and organized on a shop nucleus basis, that is, the units of the party were to be organized in shops where communist members worked. The Foster and Rothenburg groups were ordered to unite on the basis of equality. On the question of the June 17 St. Paul Convention for a Labour Party, a supplementary secret decision was rendered, for party consumption only, not for publication. In it the Moscow leaders put thumbs down on the endorsement of La Follette under any circumstances. A supplementary decision also contained the point on the removal of Pepper from the American party, the one foster demand which Moscow granted. We of the Rothenburg group had been kept informed almost daily by cable and knew of the Moscow decisions even before they reached the party. Upon his return to New York Foster immediately called caucuses of his group, this time without law and the law rights. He was extremely worried about the decisions and tried to interpret them as a victory for his group and leadership. But the law group was not satisfied. He could not square himself with them. He met with law and points in an effort to try to convince them that what had taken place in Moscow was only temporary and that it would be straightened out in the future, provided law and his followers would meet the decision halfway. But the law group was not convinced. Feeling that they had been shamefully double-crossed by one whom they had helped to put into the position of leadership of the party, they decided to maintain an independent position as a group free from entanglements with either Rothenberg or Foster. Juliet Stewart points became exceedingly bitter towards the Foster group. She freely expressed her contempt for Foster, Bittleman, and Cannon, the Foster Big Three. The rift of the law group expressed itself immediately in the largest district of the party, New York. The Rothenberg group gained the majority of the district committee, because Law and Points, who were both members of the district committee, voted independently. There was real consternation among the Foster followers. The Rothenburg group decided to take full advantage of the C.I. decision by putting teeth into that clause of the decision that ordered the party to start a campaign against Law and his followers. Foster, for his own protection, wanted to pussyfoot this part of the decision, but the Rothenburg group made life very miserable for him on this issue. In Max Bidict we had in our group not only a member of the Central Executive Committee but a German expert, so to speak. To him we assigned the task of founding law. He put the writings of law under his communist microscope. Every little deviation of the Volkszeitung from accepted communist orthodoxy was built up into a major departure from communist principles. Demands were made upon law to correct his viewpoint and to turn the Volkszeitung which he edited for a publishing society the majority of whose members were not communists, over to the party. While concentrating the attack upon law personally, our group tried at the same time, and later with some success, to win points and the leaders of the needle trades over to the position of the communist international and against law. We practiced the good old maxim, divide and rule dot as to the end of factionalism and the unification of the two groups, as proposed by the Communist International, that did not take place because the Communist International made no specific provisions for such unity. The result of the decision was to create an atmosphere of such intense feelings of animosity between the groups that factionalism flared up within the party on a scale never before experienced.
the Caucasus became disciplined military organizations. Party interests, always subordinate to Caucasus interests, were so far forgotten that Caucasus members looked upon the leaders and members of rival Caucasus as enemies. Each Caucasus maintained a spy system to ferret out the machinations of the rival Caucasus, because the Caucasus were in theory outlawed by the party and their activities necessarily had to be conducted with the utmost secrecy. Most costly to the party was the Comintern decision on La Follette, for it affected adversely our political prestige as leaders and as a party. We learned of this Comintern decision in the latter part of May. Only a few weeks were left before the June 17th convention. All the important non-communists had already been induced to participate, with the understanding that the convention would endorse the nomination of Senator Robert M. La Follette for President of the United States. Now these very same people had to be either convinced, or forced, to reject the La Follette endorsement. Moreover, this could not be done before the June 17th convention for that would mean its collapse before it even convened and exposure of our red hand in it throughout. Thus, it was impossible to negotiate the La Follette issue before the convention took place. The break with La Follette had to be made on June 17th and only then. This was not an easy thing to do. Naturally, we kept the Moscow decision on La Follette a dead secret and prepared to dominate the St. Paul Convention of June 17th. 1924 in precisely the same fashion in which we had dominated the July 3rd convention the previous year. By every known conveyance, including a special train from Chicago to St. Paul, the Communist Party delegates converged on St. Paul. Besides, as many communists as possible who were not delegates were also directed to be on hand. Every communist leader, every district head of the party was on hand at St. Paul. Our party caucus, attended by over 600 party members, was like an important national conference of communists. Here for the first time the communist international decision on La Follette was taken up with this select group of members and plans worked out for killing any proposal in favor of La Follette that might be raised at the convention. In addition, the caucus was organized as a functioning body during the life of the convention. The members were informed of the decisions of the Central Executive Committee and ordered under the strictest discipline to carry out explicitly the decisions of the Steering Committee on all questions coming up at the convention proper. The Steering Committee consisted of Foster, Bittleman and Ruthenberg. The Communist members who were delegates to the convention were divided into small groups, each one headed by a captain, who was to be in direct touch with the Steering Committee. These groups were even assigned the places they were to take in the convention hall. The communists who were not delegates were assigned through Clarence Hathaway to positions on the staffs taking charge of convention arrangements and technical matters. Others were organized into a group of runners, whose duty it was to carry messages between the steering committee and the captains of the delegate groups. Certain groups of delegates were assigned to sit in with the wavering elements, in order to influence them to vote as the party desired. Others were assigned to oversee such elements as the party knew were not to be dominated by it, in order to spy upon them and report their conversations and attitudes to the steering committee. The members of the political committee of the party were directed to sit close to the steering committee, in order that if a decision had to be made by that body it could be made forthwith and to be at the disposal of the steering committee when they wanted to fire their big guns at the opposition. Hathaway, who was secretary of the committee on arrangements and in full charge of organizing the convention, played a most clever Jekyll and Hyde role. Before the non-communist forces he paraded as a trade unionist and farmer Labrite from Minnesota, giving no indication of his communist entanglements. Before the party caucus steering committee and political committee he was a communist party member whose double role helped the party in its machinations against the non-communist elements. Hathaway reported every matter given to him in confidence by the non-communist elements and, like a good soldier, carried out the orders given him by his communist chieftains. William Mahoney editor of the Minnesota Union Advocate, a genuine farmer Labor Party leader from Minnesota, was caught in our Machiavellian plans and plots. He fell into the snares of the communists and could not extricate himself. 
he evidently suspected dirty work, for on May 24 he wrote an editorial on the Communists and the Farmer Labour Party, which expressed some of his apprehensions. Mahoney declared the Communists, so called, closely organized and highly disciplined as a political party, have become a serious problem within the farmer labor movement. The relationship between the two will have to be definitely settled at an early day, as the organized activity of the communists has become a source of fear and irritation to a great many earnest supporters of this new movement. The presence of an organized revolutionary group within the party and constantly striving to control and direct it, is causing many to question the wisdom of tolerating such activity. But the thing that causes most irritation and distrust is the existence of a small group carrying on their intrigues and plots to control. It savors too much of the dictatorship of an insidious minority. But Mahoney had to go along. He did not know that at almost the very moment he was making an agreement with the Communists for the calling of the June 17th convention to nominate La Follette for president, steps were being taken in Moscow to repudiate that agreement and to make a complete somersault on the Communist policy toward La Follette. On the eve of the St. Paul Convention, Senator La Follette wrote an open letter in which he unequivocally repudiated the June 17th convention and in the sharpest terms made it known that, Inasmuch as it did not speak for the progressive farmers and workers, he would not accept its nomination or support. He further left no doubts that he would fully cooperate and accept the endorsement of the July 4 convention called by the Conference for Progressive Political Action. Old fighting Bob Lafollette was no fool, at least. He was a lucky guesser. Mahoney probably knew that without his support the St. Paul Convention would have never been called. He played a very active part in putting the idea across in Minnesota. He resented the La Follette attack, especially since he was one of La Follette's most ardent supporters. The communists had led him to believe that they could bring to St. Paul a mighty delegation representing millions of farmers and workers. Mahoney believed he could turn St. Paul into an impressive demonstration for La Follette. Imagine his consternation when he found out that the communists were going to knife La Follette. He soon discovered also what a stranglehold the communists had on the convention. About 90% of the 600 delegates at St. Paul were either communists or under communist tutelage. Outside of a few local unions and the Farmer Labor Federation of Minnesota, the convention was practically nothing else than a conclave of the communist forces in the labor movement. The millions of farmers and trade union workers, whose pressure was so glibly promised by us, were conspicuous by their absence. When the La Follette question was raised the communist steamroller went into action. I opened the fight on La Follette by launching a tirade against him. The communist faction under orders applauded vociferously every attack and at the end of my speech staged an anti-La Follette demonstration that left the insignificant La Follette minority at the convention almost speechless. But this minority double-crossed and trapped into the convention as they were, continued to insist upon an endorsement of La Follette, even though their idol had already repudiated them. The steering committee called a hurried meeting of the political committee members present and decided upon a compromise proposal, which was then presented to the convention by Foster, who declared the only basis upon which the Workers' Party will accept La Follette as a candidate is, if he agrees to run as the farmer labor candidate to accept the party's program, a program which was drawn up by the Workers' Party and contained almost all the communist demands, and its control over his electoral campaign and campaign funds. Since the National Farmer Labour Party organized at St. Paul, was a vest pocket creation of the communists and completely controlled by them, Foster's proposal was tantamount to asking La Follette to place himself under the dictation of the Communist Party not only as far as the platform was concerned but also in the conduct of the campaign and the control of campaign funds. I have never been able to understand why Mahoney believed he could go with such a proposal to Cleveland on July 4 and obtain the approval of La Follette. The fact remains that Mahoney did not split with the communists at St. Paul. He went along to the very end participating in the nomination of candidates for president and vice president who were hand-picked by the Communist Party before the convention convened. 
Duncan MacDonald of Illinois, an ex-official of the Illinois District United Mine Workers of America, was unanimously nominated for president, and William Book, a farmer of Cedar Woolley, Washington, was nominated for vice president. We staged a demonstration when the candidates were nominated in true Republican and Democratic Party fashion in a vain attempt to prove that the loud noises represented something more substantial than wind. St. Paul in most respects was a replica of the Chicago July 3rd convention of the previous year, with two minor exceptions, one, Foster this time controlled the steering committee and engineered the convention instead of Ruthenberg, two, Mahoney, unlike Fitzpatrick, did not split. Later when Mahoney, after he was denied admission to the July 4th convention, came out in support of La Follette, we lost no time in attacking him as a traitor to the Farmer Labor Party movement. There was no bottom to our cynicism. The Cleveland July 4th convention turned out to be a triumph for La Follette. He was nominated to run for president on his own personal program and given the right to choose his running mate. All the organizations participating at the convention representing the unions, farmers' organizations, cooperatives, progressives, farmer labor forces, and the Socialist Party united behind La Follette. It was also becoming clear that the American Federation of Labor would soon officially back the La Follette movement. Our campaign to wreck the Cleveland Convention failed completely. All of which placed us in a great dilemma. We leaders of the party knew that we were completely isolated from the popular opposition movement of farmers and workers, which the La Follette for President movement represented. We had hoped to capture the mighty farmer labor movement and had ended again by capturing ourselves. The plans for the campaign of McDonald and Book had already been made. Book had already started his speech making tour of the country, when the members of the Central Executive Committee were called to Chicago for an emergency meeting to be followed by a conference of important party functionaries the next day. I hurried from New York to Chicago, wondering what the emergency could be. When I arrived in Chicago I immediately went into conference with Ruthenberg. He spoke about the political situation, explained that the party was completely isolated from the forces that should get behind the new National Farmer Labor Party, that we would look ridiculous if we ran McDonald and Book, because they would receive an insignificant vote, which would discredit the Farmer Labor Party movement for a long time to come. In order to save the face of the communist movement and the issue of the class Farmer Labor Party, it had become necessary to abandon the campaign of the Farmer Labor Party and run an independent communist campaign under the banner of the Workers' Party. But how can we do such a thing? I inquired. We cannot take responsibility for wrecking the Farmer Labor Party right after we organized it with so much fanfare. Oh, that has been taken care of already, Rothenburg informed me. We have canvassed the National Committee of the Farmer Labor Party, and the majority of them, the majority were communists, voted in favor of discontinuing the campaign and endorsing the campaign of the Workers' Party. We in Chicago have also decided that our ticket should consist of Foster for President and you for Vice President. But I don't see how we can abandon the Labor Party policy, especially knowing that the Communist International favors this policy that has been taken care of, too. We have cabled the Communist International of our desires and they have replied approving them. At the meeting of the Central Executive Committee Foster, Bittleman, Cannon and Browder took the lead in proclaiming the new policy. Foster was very excited. He had a wire in his hand from MacDonald, the presidential candidate of the National Farmer Labor Party, withdrawing from the campaign, but he had no word from Book who was already touring the country. Foster spoke of the million votes Debs received in the last election. He was sure that the Communist Party would rally the Socialist vote, because the Socialist Party was backing La Follette. In addition, he felt we would poll many votes from the progressive forces in the trade unions and farmers' organizations. It was clear from the way he spoke that he expected that the Communist Party would poll anywhere from 500,000 to a million votes. I found out later that he had actually informed Moscow that he expected the party, running in its own name and on a communist platform, to make such a showing. After admiring, I finally spoke in favor of the proposal, 
because the steps already taken by the comrades in Chicago had left no other alternative. I stressed the necessity of making the Farmer Labor Party question one of the major issues in the campaign, but expressed doubts of the ability of the party to get anywhere near the number of votes Foster expected. The party conference that followed the meeting of the Central Executive Committee was turned into a nominating convention. Foster was nominated for President and I for Vice President, with organized demonstrations staged and whipped into enthusiastic frenzy. While this was going on, Book was notified by Wire to discontinue his campaign, because the National Committee of the Farmer Labor Party had voted not to run in the elections and had endorsed the nominees of the Workers' Party. Foster and Gitlow. Moscow supplied the party with $50,000 to get the party ticket on the ballot in as many states as possible and for the carrying out of the campaign proper. Joseph Manley, former secretary of the Federated Farmer Labor Party, was chosen as campaign manager, the position he held for the National Farmer Labor Party. We succeeded in getting on the ballot in 14 states. The party members accepted the change in policy. They welcomed the idea of campaigning for a straight communist ticket. But the party organization and membership did not know how to campaign. The communist movement lacked such political experience, because our members had been primed in the belief that only by a violent revolution could the communist program be put into effect. Voting in general was looked upon as a necessary evil. The campaign was primarily directed against La Follette. J. Lovestone wrote a special campaign booklet called The La Follette Illusion. The research worker employed to gather the material could find nothing of real importance against La Follette's record. But a case against La Follette had to be manufactured, which was accordingly done by innuendos and drawing conclusions from facts that were in no way germane to the charges made. When the campaign was over and the votes counted, the Communist Party polled exactly 33,361 votes out of a total of almost 30 million. La Follette received 5 million votes. I had expected at least 100,000 votes, a figure indeed of no real significance. Foster, however, hailed the result as a victory, coupled it with a charge that the two old parties had engaged in wholesale frauds in the robbing of Communist votes and cabled Moscow that the party had actually received a half million votes. It was a fitting concluding chapter to the communist campaign for a Labour Party and revealed the political weakness of the communist movement. In the Liberator of July, 1924, Rothenberg had written the St. Paul Convention has laid the groundwork for the permanent organization of a farmer Labour Party on a mass scale. In the candidates nominated and the platform adopted there is the basis for a nationwide struggle against the capitalist order in this country. In the Liberator of August, 1924, Foster wrote for the Workers' Party to have continued behind the skeleton National Farmer Labour Party would have been to accept all the disadvantages of the United Front with none of its advantages. A militant campaign by the Workers' Party for revolutionary ends is the only effective reply to the sea. P. P. A. Socialist Party Surrender to the La Follette Petit Bourgeois Movement. The finale by Browder, in the August, 1924, issue of the Labour Herald, declared the issues are clear. William Z. Foster, the candidate of the Workers' Party, running on the platform of the dictatorship of the working class against the dictatorship of the capitalist class, is the only representative of the struggle against capitalism. The betrayal of the official misleaders of labor has been complete. Only the struggle for communism remains in this election for the workers and farmers. The lightning rapidity with which the Workers' Party went through the Labour Party campaign is indicated by a recapitulation of the dates. July 3, 1923, the Federated Farmer Labour Party is organized in Chicago. July 17, 1924, the Federated Farmer Labor Party goes out of business and the National Farmer Labor Party is organized at St. Paul. July 10, 1924, at a conference in Chicago, Foster is nominated for President and Gitlow for Vice President, just 22 days after the National Farmer Labor Party is organized and candidates McDonald and Book nominated. On the same day Foster, Chairman of the Communist Party, 
had telegrams in his possession signed by Alex Howard, C. A. Hathaway, Alfred Knutson and Joseph Manley, the Communist contingent of the National Committee of the National Farmer Labour Party, withdrawing the candidacies of Macdonald and Book and calling for support of the Workers' Party ticket. Alice Daly, of South Dakota, the one non-communist on the committee, refused to sign and William Mahoney had resigned in order to support La Follette. The hold which the communists exerted on the farmer labor party movement they organized ended in the strangulation of their own child just 22 days after its birth. Chapter 7, Comrades Aldward Comrade really stood for a fine human relationship between forward-looking persons of exceptional civic courage bound by the common bond of defying all constituted authority in their common endeavor to build a better world for all mankind. But that word sounds hollow today, and in its hollowness mockery resounds. There was a time, even within the span of my own life, when this comradeship of the political left imposed certain definite restraints on the ardor of partisanship, no radical, no matter how fanatically he championed his particular political sect, would have dared at one time to deny a fellow radical of opposing views the right to state them publicly without molestation. The radical zealot might go to his opponent's meeting and boo, he might castigate him mercilessly in a meeting of rebuttal or in his own newspaper, but at one time he would never have dared to organize a police raid on his opponent's meeting, no matter how great the provocation. Yet that is precisely what we communists came down to early in 1925 acting as a kind of colonial police force for the government of the Soviet Union on the territory of the United States. And the victim of our aid in defense of the Soviet Union was a socialist leader who prior to 1917 had been not only a comrade but a fellow member of the Bolshevik leaders in the same political party, the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party. I cite this instance, because it illustrates one stage in the process of moral degeneration that has broken the spirit of the radical labor movement and renders it so utterly helpless today in the face of fascist reaction. In its connotation, as used among leftists, comrade has always been a democratic word, an anti authoritarian word. But with the advent of the Bolsheviks to power in Russia, and particularly as Bolshevik totalitarianism was first consummated in Russia and then spread through the communist movement of the entire world, leftists everywhere began to receive more severe blows from comrades of the Bolshevik persuasion than they had ever received from the capitalist police. When Rafael Abramovich came to the United States on a lecture tour early in 1925, the capitalistic government of the United States was not in the least concerned by what that Russian socialist might have to say, if he were to return this year, it would still be unconcerned. But Nazi Germany and fascist Italy and communist Russia would be greatly concerned about the presence of a Rafael Abramovich in their country, bound on a lecture tour, if indeed they would give him an entrance visa. We American communists lacked the power over visas to visiting foreigners in 1925, an influence the Communist Party of the United States is said to have acquired by 1939 through the intercession of its sympathizers in contact with employees of the federal government, and therefore had recourse to plain ordinary police methods as our most direct way for keeping him from making his criticism of the Soviet Union public in the United States. Abramovich was a member of the Second International, with which in 1922 the Third International had negotiated a common united front against world reaction, Abramovich remained a member of the same Second International, with the French and Spanish members of which the Communists entered into united fronts in 1936. Throughout the intervening years Abramovich has not changed his allegiance to socialism nor his critical attitude toward the Bolshevik regime in Russia. Yet in 1925 we refused to let Abramovich speak in public in the United States, where we ourselves had been subjected to red raids only a few years before and were ourselves on sufferance in most parts of the country, although at best Abramovich could address only a handful of foreign-born who attended Yiddish and Russian meetings. 87% of our communists were members of foreign language federations, and of the 1750 in the English-speaking branches, 
the majority were foreign-born who spoke their English with a decided foreign accent. They had but one homeland in common, these strangers in America, the Soviet Union, and they were fanatically devoted to the defense of the Soviet Union. They would brook no criticism of their proletarian homeland. Here in America the vast majority of our party, fully 90%, regarded themselves as colonists of communism among the unconverted heathen, who before long would be either converted or conquered. Anyone familiar with the history of any imperial power knows that a colonist is an infinitely more zealous patriot than his fellow citizen in the home country, it is the A. B. C. of human psychology that nostalgia for the homeland enhances its attractiveness and love of it all this being intensified by the necessity to live and work in a hostile environment. Even apart from its subservience to the foreign policy of the Soviet government, the communist movement was psychologically a movement of political colonists determined to place the world, or as much of it as possible, country by country, under the sway of their government in Moscow. Psychologically we were as imperialistic as the British as in the Indian civil service, for example. The Englishman in Lahore is a far sterner patriot than the Englishman in London or Liverpool, and a far more zealous imperialist, too. Let us not deceive ourselves. Fanatical zeal alone cannot account for the police methods we employed. Heretofore, fanatical zeal among radicals had not led to police methods. If we communists resorted to them, it was not only because we were zealots, but rather because, in addition to being zealots, we subconsciously identified ourselves with the ruling caste in our homeland, in the Soviet Union. We were psychologically a new species of radicals, not democratic anti-authoritarians along with the other comrades of the political left, but, on the contrary, anti-democratic authoritarians, as much so as our superiors of the communist hierarchy in Moscow, who ruled over one-sixth of the earth. Moreover, we were no longer radicals in the true sense of the word, because we were no longer seekers after the root of social injustice, no longer seekers of the truth that would make men free. We were volunteer members of the militarized colonial civil service, pledged to carry out the decisions of our supreme rulers resident at Moscow anywhere in the world but particularly in the land we were colonizing for communism, the United States. How then could we be comrades to anyone outside of our communist ranks? Why allow any of them to air their views, when these views were bound to be wrong and inimical to our doctrines as revealed by the infallible Russian leaders of the Comintern? We alone knew how to win the world from the capitalists, we alone proved that we knew how to do it through the Bolshevik Revolution. The Socialists the deviators from the Marxist doctrine in its only true and effective interpretation, or anyone else who was not a Leninist as certified by the Comintern, were only insidious traitors in the ranks of the labor movement, conscious or unconscious agents of the capitalist class in its ranks. To the rank and file of the communist movement, communism was not just a political philosophy, it was a faith that was destined to convert the world into a socialist paradise and solve all of man's pressing problems. Bolshevik Russia was our country from which we drew inspiration every moment of our conscious lives. Only good could come from Russia. Criticism of Russia aroused our anger, for we regarded all criticism as lies, fabricated by counter revolutionists and capitalist imperialists. Soviet Russia was our fatherland its red army our army, its red flag our flag. Patriots of Soviet Russia, we would not hesitate to commit any act of violence or treason against the country in which we lived, if ordered to do so by the party, or if we believed that act would help Soviet Russia. To us the heads of the Soviet government, the leaders of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, the Russian leaders of the Communist International were super geniuses, imbued with such political sagacity and knowledge of world affairs that they could make no mistakes and whose decisions were always right and motivated by the highest communist ideals. We believed that the communist international knew what was best for us and that to disobey its decisions was tantamount to treason. We who were the leaders did everything to build up this attitude. We did not have to do it hypocritically, because in the main we believed as did the rank and file. 
we prided ourselves on the fact that we were not only leaders of an international communist movement but that we also had ties with the Soviet government. Above all, we enjoyed the idea that we were part of a state machine that ruled a mighty empire of millions of people. In fact, we became the most ardent agents of the Soviet government and were prepared to render any service it might require of us. Moreover, whenever the Russian leaders made moves that seemed contrary to communist principles, as, for example, cooperating with fascist Italy, we explained it as an example of clever communist maneuvering by which the Russians would outsmart their enemies, discredit them and gain the upper hand. This was the highly disciplined group Rafael Abramovich had to contend with when he came to the United States for his lecture tour. I was in New York City at the time. Upon orders of the Central Executive Committee in Chicago, the New York District was instructed to call a very important and secret meeting of party functionaries to hear a report by Alexander Bittleman. Though I was a member of both the Central Executive Committee and of the New York District Committee, I was not informed of the nature of Comrade Bittleman's mission. The meeting was held at the headquarters of the New York District Committee. About 400 party leaders and functionaries were crowded into the room. Bittleman reported that an emissary of the Second International, Rafael Abramovich, a counter-revolutionary scoundrel, was coming to the United States to poison the minds of the workers with anti-Soviet lies, in order to mobilize sentiment against the Soviet Union. He said it was part of a plot hatched by the Yellow Socialists in league with the White Guardists and counter-revolutionists to create an anti-Soviet Russian front in the United States. In his report he tried to give the impression that the matters he was going to take up at the meeting were in the nature of confidential instructions from Moscow on how to defeat Abramovich's anti-Soviet campaign. He exclaimed we must give Abramovich the answer of the American working class. We will show him that, in no place in the United States. Will the workers permit him to speak? Bittleman then outlined the policy that every meeting arranged for Abramovich must be broken up. I objected to this policy and spoke against it then and there. I proposed that the party and the friends of Soviet Russia hold counter meetings, at which Abramovich was to be exposed and his charges against Soviet Russia answered. I said the policy proposed is very dangerous, because our party is a minority party bitterly opposed by the ruling class. If we deny freedom of speech to others by breaking up meetings because we don't like what will be said there, then we give the opposition to the Communist Party the same right to break up our meetings. Although my objection was only on the grounds of expediency and self-interest, even my appeal to such motives received no response. The party functionaries present were either cowed by Bittleman and afraid of the charge of being called cowards or else welcomed the idea of some real fighting against a yellow socialist. At any rate, the overwhelming majority were in favor of Bittleman's militant policy. That opened the way for Bittleman, who again took the floor and denounced me. He called me to account for not supporting the proposals of the Central Executive Committee, of which I was a member, and considered my position not only an act of hostility against the Central Executive Committee but a crucially serious breach of communist discipline. He attacked me for giving aid and comfort to the counter-revolutionists and to the enemies of the Soviet Union. Obviously enjoying his own Jesuitic casuistry, he shouted we will not be breaking up meetings. The working class will break up the meetings. We will do here what the working class in the Soviet Union would do, only not as much because we haven't the power in the United States as yet. Does this statement sound familiar? A decade and a half later Dr. Joseph Goebbels was to use similar demagogy in asserting that the German masses had perpetrated the pogroms of German Jews in November, 1938, expressing their pent-up indignation. In those days I did not even dream that such a parallel could ever be drawn. After the meeting, the district committee worked out detailed plans for carrying out Bittleman's proposals. They included the appointment of a committee to be in charge of each meeting to be broken up. After that a number of recognized communist leaders were assigned to the task of rushing the platform as soon as the meeting was opened, in order to bombard Abramovich with insulting questions and charges all insinuating that he was a counter-revolutionary scoundrel. 
the committee in charge was instructed to mobilize a sufficient number of communists, who were to be stationed in all parts of the hall, to start disturbances by incessantly coughing, shouting, catcalls and the hurling of invectives. Another group was assigned to start fights with people in the audience in all parts of the hall. Women were assigned to shriek and throw hysterics. And to climax it all, a group of strong-arm communists were held in readiness, to go into the fray and start pummeling and blackjacking when signaled to do so by the committee. A conference was held immediately with all the communist leaders in the trade unions and their strong-arm squads mobilized for the holy war against the politically weak and physically puny Abramovich, who dared to disagree with the policies of the Bolsheviks. The communist forces went into action immediately and broke up one meeting after another. There was jubilation in the communist press, but the real jubilation was at the communist headquarters when the brave red fighters returned, their scars of battle visible. Flushed with victory, the comrades shouted and laughed, evidently overjoyed, as strong arm men described how they flattened out the socialists by terrific punches to their jaws or eyes or by blows on the ear with a pipe or by breaking a chair over their heads. But the victories did not last long. The pamphlet which the party issued, Abramovich, the guardian of democracy, did not convince those who came to listen to Abramovich. The socialists and trade unionists who supported him immediately organized to resist the communists. After the first flurry of success, it was difficult for communists to gain admission at Abramovich meetings. When a fight started they soon found out that, when prepared to fight, the other side could give more than just blow for blow. Bloody communist heads coming into party headquarters soon told the story. Besides, the reaction among the people who came to hear what Abramovich had to say was very bad. A storm of protest arose and a revulsion set in among the party members. Soon many comrades openly opposed the tactics, so that, when Abramovich spoke in Boston. The Boston District Committee failed to carry out the Central Executive Committee program but instead arranged a counter-meeting. For this the Central Executive Committee severely censured them. Thus, we were forced to abandon our anti-Abramovich campaign very quickly. However, this was never done officially. The Central Executive Committee held that this activity was an achievement for when it reported to the Fourth National Convention of the party, it stated Abramovich's mission to the United States was completely defeated, and his meetings, instead of mobilizing workers against Soviet Russia, were turned into monster demonstrations in favor of Soviet Russia. The success of this campaign would have been even more complete but for resistance within the party, such as in Boston where there was a refusal to demonstrate at Abramovich's meeting and the substitution instead of a rival meeting. The question of the role that the party should play at meetings in which the Soviet Union was attacked came up again in March, 1925, at the meeting of the District Committee of New York, when Charles Crumb Bain, the district organizer, reported that a meeting was to be held in town hall by the International Committee for the Defense of Political Prisoners, an organization started by Roger Baldwin, of which Elizabeth Gurley Flynn was secretary. This committee appealed on behalf of political prisoners in all countries, including Soviet Russia. We, of course, denied that Russia had political prisoners. Crumbane proposed that if the committee in charge of the meeting refused to withdraw reference to Soviet Russia, that we attack the meeting. I denounced Crumbane for his position, but he would not listen to me. I felt so keenly on the matter that I drew up a lengthy statement, incorporating the reasons for my position. I knew very well that if I did not do this, the Foster Group would send out factional documents from its caucus headquarters, putting statements in my mouth that I did not make and upon those statements interpreting my position as cowardly submission to the liberals and enemies of Soviet Russia. My statement in part said the policy of disrupting meetings of the International Committee for Political Prisoners is not calculated to produce the results we wish to attain. It is more particularly entirely unsuited for the present political situation in the United States especially in view of the campaign of repression likely to be instituted by the capitalist and fascist organizations in the near future. Such a policy only helps to form a united front against the party, 
ranging from the Liberals to Coolidge, without sufficient compensating results for the party. Nevertheless, the meeting, held in Town Hall, March 10, 1925, was broken up by our party, when B. Charney Vladik attempted to speak on political prisoners in Soviet Russia. We would not let liberals and radicals plead in defense of political prisoners in Soviet Russia, instead, we set out to mobilize their money, influence, and sympathy for our own purposes at home. In June, 1925, the International Labor Defense was organized. Before that time the Communist Party carried on its defense work through special committees and local defense organizations. The Labor Defense Council, with headquarters in Chicago, was organized to defend Foster, Rothenberg and the others arrested at the Underground Convention held at Bridgman, Michigan, in 1922. The organization of the International Labor Defense, popularly known as the I. L. D came as the result of a Moscow decision that an American section of the M. O. P. R. Russian initials for the International Class War Prisoners Aid Society, be organized at once. The MORP was run by the Comintern. It was the international defense organization of the communist movement, with headquarters, of course, at Moscow. To see that the decision should be properly carried out. A representative of the MORP was sent to the United States and the necessary cash supplied to call a convention and launch the organization. The launching of such an organization was a political plum for any ambitious leader. James P. Cannon, Foster's chief lieutenant, saw in this new organization an opportunity to utilize it for his personal prestige and for furthering the interests of his factional group. It seemed to me that if ever a man was unsuited to head an organization like the International Labor Defense, it was Cannon. He spoke most enthusiastically of the prospects of the new enterprise. In Chicago he explained to me how the I. L. D. could be built into a powerful mass organization. Here is what the party has been looking for, an organization with an appeal that can enlist hundreds of thousands. I agreed with him. Of course, but I had my own idea as to what was probably in back of his mind. Cannon was smarting under the popularity accorded to Foster. Though in Foster's caucus, he envied him. To him Foster was a simple trade unionist, lacking in political ability. He felt that he was the man of the greatest political ability in the party, superior not only to Foster but to all of us. If political maneuvering for place is a sign of political ability, then, I admit, Cannon ranked high. Cannon had organized a caucus of his own within the Foster Caucus. He disclosed his true ambitions only to his most trusted caucus comrades and lieutenants. The I. L. D. would give him contact with the masses and with party members all over the country. He could utilize the organization to build up his reputation as a leader of the masses. He would use the I. L. D organization to build up his personal machine and to strengthen that machine by the new members that would be brought into the party by virtue of the I. L. D. S. activities. Furthermore, through the I. L. D. many of Cannon's followers in the Foster Caucus could be given births with pay in the new organization in the same manner in which Foster took care of his followers through the Trade Union Educational League. Of great importance was the added fact that the I. L. D. would publish a magazine. This magazine could become the expression of Cannon and his followers through the able editorship of Max Schachtman, who, together with William F. Dunn, formed the big inner three of the Cannon Caucus within the Foster Caucus. It was a case of wheels within wheels, and Cannon had hopes through the I. L. D to become himself the main driving wheel. All the details for the convention to organize the I. L. D. were worked out by the Central Executive Committee of the party. All the officers were selected in advance, and the composition of the National Committee and the Executive Committee of the new organization to be formed was decided by the party. Even the agenda, resolutions, reports and who were to make the speeches and the kind of speeches were worked out in advance. Yet this was advertised as a non-party undertaking. 
The National Conference in Chicago was a poorly attended affair. The trade unions were conspicuous by their absence. Those who had been political prisoners were seated as delegates. Out of the conference emerged a strictly communist organization. Of course, the fact that it was affiliated with the Soviet MORP was not then made public. An executive committee of 11 members was elected, seven of whom were members of the Workers' Party, among whom were James P. Cannon, Rothenberg and I, all of us leading members of the Central Executive Committee of the Workers' Party. The chairman and vice chairman were genuine liberals roped in as a front, but the secretary was James P. Cannon. It is important to note that in every so called non party organization or committee organized by the communists, the secretary is always a communist. Whosoever controls the secretary controls the organization, for when communists organize, the secretary does not merely take care of correspondence, he is the actual full time paid executive of the organization in charge of all its activities. He is there to guard the interests of the party in every manner shape and form, morally, politically, and financially. The I. L. D. did prove a juicy political plum, if not factionally for Cannon, at least for the Communist Party as a whole. It attained such respectability that its present chairman is the Republican Congressman Vito Marcantonio, although it continues to be strictly a communist organization ruled more than ever with an iron hand from Moscow. Cannon lost it as he lost all his astutely won prerogatives in the party, when he attached himself to the wrong Russian leader and ever after has been forced to say B, and pretty much of the rest of the alphabet, to his original A, by continuing to champion the cause of that leader to the bitter end and to this very day. For a politician of Cannon's admitted, not to mention his self-admitted, astuteness, his original bet on the Russian leader in question was an act of monstrous stupidity. On the surface it may appear as if Cannon had acted out of noble, if quixotic, motives. But that is far too unlike the Cannon I knew in the party, for me to believe. The measure of the man, and Foster, too, for that matter, and all the Fosterite caucus leaders, as well, may be judged from his typical reaction to the decision of the United States Supreme Court, which on June 8, 1925, just when he was founding the International Labor Defense Organization, upheld my conviction on criminal syndicalism charges by a vote of 7 to 2, Justices Holmes and Brandeis dissenting. Had Cannon been the political leader he claims to be, he would never have allowed factionalism to overshadow its significance for the party, the American labor movement and the cause of civil liberties in this country. Everyone alive to political developments, not only legal experts, recognized at once the importance of this decision as a dangerous precedent for limiting the scope of freedom of speech and civil liberties generally throughout the United States. While my comrade who was head of the I. L. D., together with his caucus chieftain, the erstwhile standard bearer of the party, could not think beyond the possibility of having a factional opponent removed, even if that removal was to a capitalist prison in punishment for service to the party and both rejoiced at the thought, the American Civil Liberties Union, at that time completely free of any vestige of communist control and attacked by our party because its head, Roger Baldwin, had the temerity to champion the cause of political prisoners in Russia, immediately appealed to Governor Alfred E. Smith of New York to pardon me. Since Governor Smith replied that he could not keep his promise to do so at that particular time, because legally the case was not subject to his review until the verdict of the United States Supreme Court had been executed by having me returned to prison, I prepared for immediate imprisonment. It so happened, due to the proverbial delays of justice, so called, that I did not have to return to Sing Sing until November 11th, thus continuing to plague Foster, Cannon, Bittleman, Browder, Crumbain et al. for another five months much to their comradely discomfiture. I do not mention this matter because it involved me personally. As a matter of fact, at the time I, too, was so involved in factional squabbles, a fight I was leading in one of the needle trade unions, and a complexity of trade union and party problems, 
that I was too swamped to give the matter of my personal fate or the significance of this decision any thought at all. I left that up to the appropriate department of the party, administered, as it happened to be, by my comrade then in charge of founding the I. L. D. But I must not be too hard on a man like Cannon. I am not surprised that his political vision did not extend beyond his caucus. What amazes me now, as I look over the correspondence and party documents of that time, is the indifference to the case on the part of all the party leaders. Irrespective of faction. At the session of the Central Executive Committee of June 11th, only three days after this important decision that set a precedent for outlawing at will even reformist, let alone a revolutionary, party, was rendered, the matter was not even discussed. The first person in the Communist Party to be officially concerned about it, according to the record now before me, was a minor official of the New York District Organization by the name of Julius Kodkin, who on June 22 introduced a resolution pledging the New York District to work for my liberation from prison and calling upon the District Committee to forward this resolution to the Central Executive Committee. Chronologically, again according to the record I have, Charles E. Ruffenburg was the second person in the party to show some initiative in the case. While it is not surprising that Kodkin did not appreciate the implications of the decision, I am surprised that Ruffenburg did not, for Ruffenburg wrote me in a letter dated July 28th I suggested the other day that the New York Party organization range a big mass meeting on Thursday, protesting against the sentence, but did not get action. I will make a definite motion to that effect tomorrow, so that we can stir up something. But Ruthenburg's efforts were in vain. The Fosterites on the Central Executive Committee spiked his attempts, as did Crumbain in New York. As for Ruthenburg, his interest on my behalf was as factional as was the Fosterite effort against me, for in that same letter he expressed the hope for my freedom so that you will not have to be out of the present fight for a single day, meaning the party factional fight. No more. And we fancied ourselves political leaders and liberators of the working class. This spirit of factionalism was so incorrigible that often it overflowed into the sacred soil of Moscow decisions. The consequences had a touch of the ironic at times, as I look back on it now although then I took the antics of the opposition in too dead earnest to see the humor of the situation. A case in point concerns the Cummington decision to Bolshevize the American party. The exalted and then apparently omnipotent Zinovov himself was in favor of it, so, indeed, were all the Muscovite super geniuses. Yet nothing more ridiculous could have been thought up for Bolshevization meant the reorganization on a shop nucleus basis of our little party, numbering all told thirteen and a half thousand members, of whom less than half, and these scattered throughout the length and breadth of the United States, could by any stretch of the imagination be regarded as shop or factory workers. To be precise, out of the thirteen thousand five hundred and fifty-six registered party members, 2,000 were party functionaries who registered as workers of a trade of one sort or another, at which they were not working, of course, 4,500 were employed at miscellaneous non-factory jobs, including the liberal professions, business, housewives and students, 1,500 registered as building trades workers, which meant that they constantly shifted from job to job, if and when they worked, thus, leaving about 5,500 party members for Bolshevization. In February, 1925, I was assigned the Sisyphean task of Bolshevizing the New York district over the sabotage and opposition of its district organizer, Charles Crumbain. The only reason why I fought for this stupid and thankless job was because the Fosterites wanted to drive me out of New York, in order to separate me from the New York membership among whom I wielded considerable influence. But the incontrovertible fact that I had not been assigned to definite party work forced the hands of the Fosterites to agree to my assignment to the important post of shop nuclei organizer for the New York district, the largest and the most important in the United States. Bolshevization meant a death blow to branches and federations. 
it meant that the basic organizations of the party would now be in the shops, all members working in the same shop constituting the new unit of the party. By securing the Bolshevization task, our faction had the opportunity to build its support among the membership anew and from the ground up. It was a good move of gerrymandering ourselves into an ironclad majority. Members found to be working in the same shop were organized into a shop nucleus designated by a number, that is, shop nucleus number one, or number two, or number three. I organized a nucleus in every shop of the district that had three or more members. By May I had organized only 25 shop nuclei totaling 126 party members, in establishments employing a total of only 16,022 workers. I had organized 10 nuclei in the men's and women's garment industry, 6 in shoe factories, 4 in metal and machine shops, 1 in a restaurant and 3 others I forget where. My most important shop nuclei were in the Singer Sewing Machine Company plant at Elizabeth, N. J., employing 7,500 workers, the Evening Journal plant printing the Hearst Papers, employing 2,000 workers, the Miller Shoe Company's plant, employing 2,000 workers, and in the Board of Transportation of the City of New York, employing 1,500 workers. Since the combined membership of all the nuclei was only 126, they had an average membership of 5. The largest nucleus, that in the Singer plant, had a membership of 24. In the industrial metropolis of the world, this was a ludicrously pitiable record, but I am satisfied it was the best that could then be done. However, Moscow was not satisfied with the slow progress the party was making in its Bolshevization and on June 20, 1925, sent a letter to the Central Executive Committee of the party, with detailed instructions on how the party was to proceed with its Bolshevization. The only intelligible portion in that letter of the Communist International stated during the visit of the representatives of your party to Moscow we held with them a consultation on the immediate tasks of the Workers' Party in the sphere of organization and the methods of carrying out the decision of the plenum as expressed in the theses of comrades in of a von Bolshevization dealing with the duties of the Workers' Party. The rest was gibberish. Nevertheless, Bolshevization became a factional football. The Foster Group was afraid of it, because the powerful Finnish Federation opposed it. If Foster pressed reorganization, he faced the animosity of the Finnish Federation leaders. Besides, organized in the Finnish Federation branches, the Finnish leaders could deliver the Finnish vote as a block to Foster. Without the Finnish vote, Foster could not maintain his majority. In addition, the Law Group, which still was an important factor, opposed Bolshevization as nonsensical. Law knew even then that Zinovov was a nincompoop. Foster therefore ended lip service in support of the Bolshevization campaign and in practice put all kinds of obstacles in its path. Of course, the Rothenburg caucus also sought to make political capital out of the reorganization campaign. It became the champion of Bolshevization. In those districts where our group was entrusted with the work of reorganizing, we organized the shop nuclei in such a way that we could control them. Whatever shop nuclei I did organize in district number two were solid for the Rothenburg group in the next elections for delegates to the district convention, at which delegates to the national convention of the party were elected. But it was all much ado about nothing, and before long the Bolshevization issue died a natural death. Yet how much precious energy was wasted on it by our small group of zealots, how much misplaced idealism and enmity it generated, all because some fools in Moscow quite ignorant of American conditions wanted it. We might have concentrated all this earnest endeavor on something really of moment to America, the United States Supreme Court decision in the Gitlow case, for one dot but of course the crux of all factionalism at the time was the Labor Party issue. By the end of 1924 the Fosterites became the anti-Labor Party caucus and we Rothenburgians became the pro-Labor Party caucus. That naturally made the Fosterites appear as Simon Pure, orthodox, left of the left communists, and how they wallowed in that glory. As the first act of their recently acquired revolutionism, they merged the liberator, 
the party-controlled organ for left intellectuals and predecessor of the current new masses, the Labour Herald, organ of the Trade Union Educational League, and Soviet Russia Pictorial, organ of the Friends of Soviet Russia, all of which had previously paraded as independent of the Communist Party, into one official monthly magazine of the party, the Workers' Monthly. Immediately we of the Ruthenburg group charged the Fosterites with sectarianism, arguing that they were thereby isolating the party from the masses. Our emissary in Moscow, the redoubtable John Pepper, nay Joseph Bogany, raised a tremendous hullabaloo at the Comintern about Fosterian sectarianism and got all the Russian leaders in a dither. Thousands of dollars were wasted on cables between Moscow and Chicago, and New York and Moscow. Our caucus was hot and bothered about Fosterian sectarianism, and the Foster caucus fumed and raged about Ruthenbergian reformism. That fight went on for months, when subsequently Lovestone wrote me from Moscow it might interest you to know that in the special Bolshevization committee session this night Zinovov made the following significant remark, yesterday I had an American day and night. In the afternoon I saw one side. At night another side. The debate in the American party is now over the question, shall the party be only the party of the dictatorship of the proletariat or shall it also be the party of partial demand? The answer of course is, that it shall be the party of both. John laid great stress on this dot 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 John feels delighted at this being Zinn's view of the controversy after both sides saw him dot needless to say, partial demand is reform. John is Pepper and Zinn is affectionate New York City college style for Zinovov. And of course the letter speaks for itself. But how did Lovestone get to Moscow? Dot dot thereby hangs a tale intertwined inextricably in the fight between the rival factions. Properly it antedates the Foster seizure of the party, when Israel Amter was in Moscow as the accredited representative of the party at the Cummington. Such a rep is the highest in rank above all other representatives of the party, accredited to the various auxiliary organizations of the Cummington, and he has absolute authority over all of them, including American communists in the various schools, colleges, and institutes, in training at Moscow as organizers and propagandists. Moreover, the party rep is the liaison officer in all other respects, often consulted by the G.P you, and other important branches of the Soviet government on all matters pertaining to the government of the United States, conditions in the country, and American visitors to Russia. His expenses are paid by the Cummington, as are the expenses of all other party representatives in Moscow, whose number varies from time to time, but has been known to be around a hundred and even more, in the form of living quarters, special food privileges and a comfortable monthly salary. Incidentally, the Cummington spent millions of dollars a year supporting such official embassies of the various communist parties in Moscow, the largest official families being the Chinese, followed by the Germans, Hungarian and Italian and later the Austrian. In any event, when Foster came to power, he did not remove Amta. Since his policy was to proceed cautiously at first, he merely sent Earl Browder as the new emissary to the Profinton, to scout around and make contacts with the right Russian leaders. Amta and Browder fell into the thick of this factional war that had been gaining in intensity ever since the 1924 presidential elections. The Rothenburg group felt that the time was ripe to deal Foster a body blow from which he could never recover, because of the debacle of the party in the presidential campaign. Rothenburg was stationed at the national headquarters of the party in Chicago, and, with J. Lovestone, handled matters from there for our faction. I took care of matters from New York, John Pepper, from Moscow. Lovestone was our traveling salesman. He toured the country for our faction and was ingenious in putting through proposals that made it necessary for the Central Executive Committee to finance his factional trips around the country. When the Central Executive Committee did not authorize a trip, the money was supplied to him out of the special caucus treasury which our group maintained. The caucus members helped defray the expenses of the factional fight by contributing generously whenever asked to do so. The Communist International decision on the La Follette policy had given us a fighting advantage because, although it really accepted law's policy, 
it savagely castigated law. Foster, Bittleman and Cannon, following that decision against law, had to engage in two-faced politics. With law they had to be confidential, promising him that in the near future he would be freed from the blight of the communist international attack. They met with law, points and with the leaders of the needle trades who backed law, in a desperate effort to keep these lines together. At the same time, they had to give evidence to the leaders of the Communist International that they were fighting the law group and its alleged anti-communist heresy. We of the Rothenburg group hammered away at this duplicity at every opportunity, recognizing that in so doing we might cause a breach in the Foster group which would give us the majority of the party. Every group maintained an organized caucus with well-oiled caucus machinery. The party members attended secret caucus meetings into the wee hours of the morning, listening to confidential reports on what went on in the Communist International or in the Central Executive Committee and to all the factional gossip that flooded the party. Besides, each caucus maintained a mimeograph machine and a staff, to edit and issue confidential caucus bulletins, which were prohibited by the party. These bulletins hold a very special place in communist literature. They are almost literally sizzling with vitriolic attacks against factional opponents. The party was divided into two warring camps. The comrades, the leaders as well as the rank and file, were virtually at each other's throat. Under such circumstances it was only natural to expect that the SUs would reach Moscow and the be adjudicated. After all, we were all acting under orders from our Moscow connections and the storm we raised in America was to a very large extent traced for Moscow's consumption. The executive committee of the Cominton decided to hold a plenary meeting in the early part of 1925. A meeting of the Central Executive Committee was called to consider the sending of delegates. The Rothenburg group decided to send Lovestone and Rothenburg. The Foster group picked Foster and Cannon. As soon as the decision was made, J. Lovestone was off like lightning to Moscow. Every day in Moscow before Foster and Cannon arrived would be advantageous to his group. Foster and Cannon, though they tried, could not outrace Lovestone. Meantime, Foster had made up his mind about the Labour Party issue and took a stand on it. That occurred when he publicly hailed our disgracefully small presidential vote of 1924 as a victory for the party. Frankly, I was disappointed with the vote and disgusted with Foster's hypocrisy. It was clear to me even then that the pitiable vote of slightly over 30,000 for us out of 30 million, and the 5 million for Senator Robert M. La Follette, showed that, while politically we communists did not have much of a chance with American workers and farmers, the latter were strongly inclined to support a genuine third party, a farmer labor party free of communist influence. That, to me, was the lesson of the 1924 presidential election. It was sad but true, and our only chance was to tie ourselves to the farmer Labour Party movement, but do so more subtly than ever, without betraying our hand in it, until we had managed to wear down public prejudice against us, meantime however taking a public stand in favour of the idea and on the basis of that agitation recruit what adherents and sympathisers we could. This was substantially Charles E. Rothenburg's position. He wrote our party has made its greatest gains through its united front farmer labor policy. The slogan, for a class labor party is still the best road open for the building of the workers party and making it a mass communist party. Not so Foster. Tongue in cheek, brazenly defying facts, he proclaimed although five million ballots cast amount to a large vote. The outcome in reality constitutes a serious defeat for the La Follette movement in view of the previous overestimates of its strength. The Workers' Party is now entering upon the third stage of its policy regarding the Farmer Labour Party movement. This consists in going one step further than dropping the Farmer Labour Party as an organization and also dropping it as a slogan. Foster did not believe one word of that himself. He took that stand, only because, to maintain his power and his majority, he had to have the support of the Law Caucus, and Ludwig Law opposed our labor policy on principle. I thought Law was doctrinaire about it, yet he was honest and courageous, on this occasion, in my opinion, 
Foster was neither Dotty and Cannon had to spend a few days in New York, to fix up their fences with the law group, in order that their house should not collapse while they were away. Lovestone arrived in Moscow in January, 1925, as did Foster and Cannon. Rothenburg did not arrive until February. An American commission was constituted, to handle the American party question, consisting of Nicholas Bukharin, Clara Zetkin and the Finnish exile, Kusin, then secretary of the Communist International. The final decision, however, rested solely in the hands of the Russian leaders then in power, as Lovestone writing to me from Moscow then indicated tomorrow Zinovov gets in from the other big city and I will then know, definitely when I can see him. And at eleven the day after Pietnitsa, Joseph Pietnitsky, head of the organization department of the Communist International. These birds are hard to catch. And in another letter have not yet been able to get Bucker in. Wednesday he will have me see Stalin. In 1925 it was already important to get Stalin on your side. In still another letter, which Lovestone, with a humorous eye on his own historic importance, entitled pompously The Doors Plan and the American Workers, he wrote of a two hour talk he had with Zinovov in which Zinovov was ready to make a somersault on the La Follette issue and to instruct the American party to work inside the La Follette movement, even though less than a year ago the party was prevented by Zinovov and the Communist International from so doing. On law, he reported that Foster and Cannon had opposed the suggestion that Law come to Moscow to defend himself, and were instead stating that it is their proposal to have Law and his followers expelled from the party. Lovestone waxed indignant about that, not, of course, because he loved law or justice, but because he wanted to embarrass Foster and Cannon I am going to the Secretariat and will again raise hell about Ludwig, will demand the reopening of his question, that he be instructed to pack up and go at once. I will make the bastards, Foster and Cannon, show their true colors. But Ludwig Law did not pack up and did not go to Moscow. The fight in Moscow over the American party question went on for over three months. For a quarter of a year the outstanding leaders of the communist movement of the United States were in Moscow. One may wonder what happened in the United States during those long three months. The communist party members all had their eyes focused on Moscow. From Moscow the contending caucus headquarters received cables, letters, documents, instructions, advice on policy. As soon as cables or letters were received by the contending caucuses, the caucus machinery went into immediate operation. Secret caucus meetings were called. The mimeograph machines were flooded with ink, and caucus bulletins went out to every nook and corner of the party. Besides, the caucus spies were kept very busy during those exciting days. They shadowed their factional opponents penetrated their caucus meetings, rifled letterboxes to get their hands on caucus documents and at the same time, while covering their own tracks as best they could, collected evidence for a case on the illegal factional activities of their opponents. The Foster group did it in all seriousness against the Rothenburg caucus, and the Rothenburg caucus did it in the same serious vein against the Foster caucus. Yet notwithstanding this intense factional atmosphere and the turmoil it created, the party, with most of its leading figures in Moscow, continued to carry on its political and trade union activities, each side utilizing them to gain a factional advantage over its opponent, or to involve or catch the opponent in a serious deviation from what was considered the Moscow-ordained true path of communism. As the news began to come in of law's disfavor in Moscow, both the Foster and Rothenburg caucuses began their witch hunting against Law and his followers, for whom life inside of the party became a living hell. Far from ending the factional warfare, the Cummington decision provided for the holding of a national convention in the immediate future to thrash out the issue, and thus served merely to intensify further the struggle for the capture of the majority of the party. It was full of what in the Cummington was called flick and politique, indecisive politics. It was a labyrinthian maze. The more you tried to decipher it, the more difficult it became. Moscow was famous for such decisions, and anyone who had anything to do with the Cummington soon became well acquainted with them. There was, first of all, 
Flick and Politique in the decision on the estimate of the vote received by the La Follette movement. Foster had called the election results a victory for the Workers' Party and a defeat for the La Follette movement. Moscow declared it must be recognized that in the elections La Follette gained an important victory. Yet our party met with a defeat which was not to be avoided under the given circumstances. But to add to the confusion, it went on to state that does not mean that the tactics of the Workers' Party were not correct. That gave Foster the opportunity to go to the membership and declare that the Communist International approved his tactics in the 1924 elections. Though the Communist International did not positively state that those tactics were correct. Some months later, although nothing had changed since 1924, the Muscovite masterminds of Bolshevism in 1925 declared in reference to the La Follette movement the path of the proletariat can even lead through such false roads. The La Follette movement, in its first steps towards its constitution as a class. Every important Moscow decision has its scapegoat. In this decision, it was Ludwig Law, one of the most decent of the communist leaders in America. We implemented that aspect of the decision by calling it the struggle against Law's opportunism. But Law's opportunism was not separable from Foster's opportunism, because they mutually supported each other's policies. To law belongs the distinction of having early in 1924 formulated the very policy on La Follette which the Communist International itself subsequently adopted. But Moscow was not prepared to throw overboard so docile and submissive a tool as Foster, certainly not for a mere communist of principles like law. Therefore, when Foster came to Moscow, none other than law was picked for scapegoat, to ward off the fire from Foster. Law, Moscow declared, represented a non-communist tendency in the party and misrepresented the policy of the communist international on almost every question, spurring on the heresy hunt against him by the following declaration the executive proposes to the Workers' Party to come to a definite decision on the law question at its next Congress. In any case the executive is of the opinion that the central committee of the party is not the place for such an opportunist. The communist international executives of course had the power forthwith to expel law. But that would not have served their purpose. They wanted his expulsion to come at the end of a campaign in which the party would be bombarded on the heresies of law, while at the same time the pressure of the party would be used among law's followers, who held important posts in the trade unions to have them break away from law and throw themselves at the mercy of the party. Of additional importance was the fact that law, through his editorship, controlled an important and very influential daily paper, the oldest radical newspaper in the United States, the New Yorker Volksztung. Time was needed to organize the communist forces in the Volksztung publishing company for the drive to take over the paper and its valuable property for the party. And lastly, Moscow had hopes that Law would listen to the pleas Foster would take back to him, and go to Moscow to take up his case. If Law would accept, that would lead, for some time, to a voluntary separation of Law from the American party. In Moscow they had a much better chance than we had in New York to get Law to confess that his views were deviations from communism and to agree to spend some time in communist work under Comintern direction either in Moscow or some other place. Such was the disciplinary technique initiated by Zinoviev, presumably with the approval of Lenin and Trotsky, which, perfected by Stalin, ultimately led to the most obscene of political spectacles, the Moscow demonstration trials with their masochistic confessions. Yet, although law was picked as scapegoat, to protect Foster, provision was also made to keep Foster vulnerable. Thus, before the American party leaders left Moscow, with the well wishes of the communist international leaders to make a good fight, and thrash things out in their national convention, the Moscow leaders in secret meetings with Lovestone, Pepper and Rothenburg mapped out for them just how the fight against Foster should be conducted. Whether they did as much for the Foster side against us, I do not know. Meantime, Earl Browder had been chosen by the Foster majority to act as the secretary of the party during Rothenburg's sojourn in Moscow. He was fanatical in his zeal to promote Foster as the outstanding communist leader in the United States. At times when he defended Foster, in his deadly monotone, 
drawing his breath through his mustache, in the manner of the proverbial insidious Japanese spy of popular fiction, heaving sighs of compassion, as he rolled his eyes toward heaven and clasped his hands in the proverbial manner of sanctimonious missionaries. I feared that even his cornfed Kansas frame would collapse under the emotional burden of his utterances and we might lose a dearly beloved comrade. He never proclaimed an original idea and was satisfied to walk in the footsteps of his master. In sheer self-defense I would shut my eyes, sorry that I could not also shut my ears when he spoke, and seek some measure of solace in the vision of the dog on the old phonograph advertisement entitled, his master's voice a far handsomer vision than Browder's face contorted with his obnoxious style of oratory. Next to Foster, in those days, Browder worshipped Lozovsky and the Profinton. He accepted the communist international authority as a matter of course, but held the Profinton in higher esteem. He diligently read all the communist tracts and all the bulletins of the Profinton, and accepted them without question as the gospel truth. These he absorbed in his uncritical mind as the acme of intellectual achievement, with the consequence that he soon began to believe himself next to Foster, the greatest intellectual communist in America. Stalin had his Lenin, Browder had only his Foster. A greater zealot in a factional cause than Browder was hard to find. I remember one dramatic incident during the feverish days when the leaders of the factions were still in Moscow. Browder happened to be in New York at the district headquarters. Amta, who had his office on the third floor, had just completed typing a factional bulletin against the Finnish members of the party. In that document he had referred to the Finns as, the White Guard Finns no less. While he was holding the document in his hands and reading it to a number of his caucus comrades, Browder, who was on the floor below, was tipped off by one of the Foster Caucus spies of what was going on in Amter's office. Breathless, the acting secretary of the Communist Party of the United States rushed up the stairs, burst into Amter's room and seized one corner of the typewritten sheet which Amter was holding in his hand. I was in the room at the time and saw the whole drama. Panting and breathless, Browder gasped, as general secretary of the party and in the name of the Central Executive Committee. I order you to turn over the document you have in your hand to me. Amta flushed and answered calmly, this paper which you are holding is my own personal matter and does not concern you or the party. I will not let you have it. And he tore it away, leaving Browder holding a tiny corner of paper tightly between his fingers. Under pain of discipline, Browder sharply retorted, his red face turning white with rage, you will have to answer to the party for your flagrant defiance of party discipline. But Amta said nothing, as he slowly and deliberately folded the sheet and clenched his fist around it. Many comrades had gathered by this time. There were angry remarks from members of both factions. Browder shook with anger, his eyes became bloodshot. Turning to me, he said, as a member of the Central Executive Committee, I, the secretary of the party, order you to direct Comrade Amta to turn the paper he has in his hand over to me. It is a caucus document and hence a party document of the greatest importance to the party. Perfectly unperturbed, I smiled and said, if what Amta has in his hand is a caucus document and you want it, please turn over all of your caucus documents first. He thereupon left the room, growling. You will all answer for your factionalism and indiscipline to the Central Executive Committee. But that ended the incident, for his own factional record was far from clear. That was dramatically illustrated shortly after the Comintern had rendered its decision on the American question and some time prior to the return of our chief party leaders from Moscow. The decision had been cabled to each caucus secretly early in April, weeks before it was officially communicated to the party each caucus receiving from its own leaders in Moscow lengthy exegesis by cable as to its real meaning. As I have already stated, the decision castigated Law while adopting his policy. Now, the leaders of the Communist Needle Trades faction were strictly loyal to Law on the La Follette issue, and it was quite a job for the Fosterites to make them understand the Cummington decision, not as any normal human being would understand it but as the Fosterites wanted them to understand it. 
we Rothenburgians proposed to capitalize on that difficulty by simply proving to the Comintern that the needled trade leaders were lawrites, this was a pleasant and easy job for Lovestone, Rothenburg and Pepper, because it was obvious and true. Foster, moreover, made the task even easier for our side, for instead of defending the needle trades leaders, who had always supported his caucus loyally, he turned tail, repudiated them completely before the Cummington leaders as incorrigible lawrites and disclaimed all political responsibility for them. At the same time, he sent instructions to his one-man brain trust in Chicago, Alexander Bittleman on how to save the continued support of the needle trades leaders for the foster caucus. I did not read those instructions, but they told their own story in the nature of Bittleman's sudden activity. First, my spies reported to me that Bittleman had come to New York, next, on April 8, without previously consulting with me, a member of the Central Executive Committee. Bittleman introduced a resolution before the New York District Committee, which contained in part the following official statement made by the Central Executive Committee at its preceding meeting in Chicago We do not wish to imply, nor do we wish to create the impression, that our comrades in the needle trades are opportunistic, after sharply criticizing them for their lawyerist tendencies. Finally, again without consulting me, although I was a member of the Party Needle Trades Committee, Bittleman presented the same Central Executive Committee resolution, backed up by a concurring resolution of the New York District Committee, before a meeting he convoked of the Needle Trades membership of the party. This was how Foster proposed to whitewash himself before his Needle Trades supporters after stabbing them in the back. He could execute this maneuver because he had a majority on both the C. E. C. and the New York District Committee but not without violating the most elementary rules of informing the Rothenburgian members of both these party bodies. I caught up with Bittleman at the meeting of the Needle Trades membership. And there opened up on him. I charged him with all the crimes from malfeasance in office to outright reason. Bittleman countercharged that I had violated discipline by refusing to support a C. E. C. decision and even criticizing it in public an unpardonable crime in a member of the C. E. C., now being magnanimous, he wanted to see whether I was really a good Bolshevik, I could convince him of it, if I forthwith voted for that resolution, notwithstanding that I had just castigated it mercilessly, that would prove to Bittleman that I understood the highest discipline and was indeed a good Bolshevik. Whereupon, I told Bittleman to go chase himself and, after consulting then and though with Lifshitz and Weinstone, introduced a statement of censure against the C. E. C. Then, having meantime learned through my spies that the Fosterites were caucusing that day, I sent the following telegram to Earl Browder and Max Biddick in Chicago, the party headquarters I prefer charges against Bittleman, Manley, Johnston, Carlson for holding caucus with party members New York on Cummington decision laying plans for convention, thus opening convention period letter follows. And followed it with a letter to Browder, in which I enclosed the following Foster Caucus document stolen by one of my spies. Dear comrade, a very important meeting will be held this coming Saturday evening at 6 p.m. Sharp at Great Central Palace, 90 Clinton Street, Room 11. You must attend without fail. Comrade Bittleman will be present. M. Unjust. Then, accompanied by several members of the Rothenburg group, I went to the meeting. We were refused admission. But our spies were among the 75 party members at that foster caucus. To justify his holding that meeting secretly, Bittleman telegraphed Chicago that it was an official meeting of responsible party workers on confidential matters. As a member of the C. E. C., I was certainly as much entitled to be present at such a meeting as Bittleman, yet I had been refused admission. Therefore, just to rub it in, I wrote a letter to Browder, in which I not only denounced Bittleman for infractions of party rules but also gave him proof that I had the more efficient spy service and therefore knew what went on in their caucus.
by stating in part Comrade Bittleman opened the caucus meeting by giving a lengthy report on the decision of the Communist International on the American Party question. This he did in violation of party discipline. As political secretary of the party he knew that the Communist International decision must first be submitted to the Central Executive Committee for it to decide how the membership shall be officially informed of it. The significance of the breach of party discipline is still more apparent when one realized that this gathering was held a day after the executive committee had decided upon Comrade Browder's motion to elect a committee to liquidate the factional grouping in the party. This time we Rothenburgians had caught the Fosterites red-handed. But both factions were really equally guilty of scheming, conniving factionalism of the lowest order. However, the feathers really began to fly when Cannon, Foster, Lovestone and Rothenberg returned from Moscow early in May. Lovestone and Rothenberg were related that they had come back from Moscow with a decision that gave our group a more than fighting chance to win back the party. They immediately went into conference with the leading comrades in New York, and before they left for Chicago spoke before a large membership caucus of our group. Foster and Cannon did not look so happy. They had to mend their fences with Law's immediate group as well as with the Needle Trades leaders, or lose the majority and control of the party. Foster kept fuming about Pepper and that bastard Lovestone. It was clear from his attitude that he had no intention of attempting to make peace, as demanded by the Communist International. It was also apparent from the reports we had about the caucus meetings of the Foster group in New York that a rift was taking place between Foster and Cannon that Cannon, though he did not express it, was disappointed with the political leadership of Foster and held him accountable for the bad showing they had made in Moscow. As for Law and his followers, they were up in arms. The breach between them and Foster broke out rather violently, not to say openly, at the meeting of the Central Executive Committee, called to consider the Communist International decision, which took place in Chicago on May 12th and 13th. This proved to be one of the most dramatic meetings of the Central Executive Committee I had ever attended. It was a setting fit for Homeric heroes, not only for the National Convention which was to follow in a few months. Personal feelings ran high and were especially bitter in the speeches of Foster, Law and Juliet Stewart points. Cannon and Foster had their administration to save, Law and points their political lives in the party. At this meeting Cannon tried to keep his sails turned to meet the wind and, instead of backing up Foster, straddled, in order to be free to act in the future. Foster, speaking under a very great strain, recalled that although the year before he had opposed Zinovov's proposal that the Communist International send a representative to the American Party to assist in liquidating factionalism, he had been the first to propose it to the Cummington this year. He was quite certain, he said that neither the Rothenburg group nor Moscow really took a serious view of his alliance with the law group. He then attacked what he called our fake Labour Party policy, claiming that on this, the main political question before Moscow, he and his group had been vindicated and upheld. As for his relations with law, Foster declared when I was in New York I met Comrade Law. We talked of the trip to Moscow, whether it would be the best thing for him to go. I put it in this light. If you don't go to Moscow, it will be interpreted as a complete admission of all the charges against you and your group. If you go to Moscow and maintain your position you will be condemned 100%. If you see leaders and say you want to go along, they will whitewash you and you will escape completely. This statement by Foster gives a good insight into the workings of the Cummington. It was governed by its own rules, which were made by the Bolshevik leaders. These rules involved no ethical concepts. The question of honesty, intellectual or otherwise, did not count and personal integrity was dismissed as only a bourgeois virtue. What did matter, was that communists of all countries must without reservations accept the control which Moscow imposed upon them. Foster knew the rules, and was perfectly satisfied to play the game of his Moscow bosses. In this respect he acted like most of us who were leading communists in the United States. To foster it was perfectly proper for law to go to Moscow, in order to give his pledge to the Russian leaders that he would go along with them in everything they did or said. 
He advised Law to do so and resented the fact that Law considered his intellectual honesty and personal integrity above blind obedience to the Communist International. That Central Executive Committee meeting turned into a lynching bee, with Law as victim. The Comintern had given the signal to destroy Law by driving him out of the Communist movement and ruining his reputation in the Labour movement. Every member of the Central Executive Committee flew into a rage against Law. Every Central Executive Committee member present at the meeting and all the officials of the party who were invited to attend clamoured for the floor, in order to put themselves on record against law. Lovestone, who in 1923 together with Pepper tried to get law's support, took credit as the gallant knight who discovered the treacherous role that law was playing against communism and the working class. Rothenburg attacked him as an opportunist and a social democrat whose views and activity had nothing in common with communism. I attacked him as one who as far back as 1919, when the Communist Labour Party was formed, was an incorrigible opportunist and social democrat, and I took prideful credit for the fact that I had been instrumental in keeping him out of the leading committee of the newly formed Communist Labour Party. Law presented a pitiable figure when he took the floor. He appeared like a man thrown into a den of lions who were that moment going to pounce upon him and devour him. His voice sounded as if it came from one who had been painfully hurt. I expected him at any moment to break into tears. Under the circumstances, his speech was one of great restraint. He said in part we have a party of core causes. I left the minority, Rothenburg Group, on account of the La Follette struggle. After the last national convention we joined the Foster Group. After a while things changed. The alliance grew weaker. We felt that the majority was beginning to leave the sound sane way and was coming dangerously near to adopting the pepper policy of adventurism. As editor of the Volkszeitung, I cannot consult the Communist International or the Central Executive Committee on every important event that takes place. I am editor of a daily paper and must comment on such events immediately. I must therefore write on events as I understand and see them. All these articles were written by law and he alone stands responsible. All the enemies are now branded as Trotskyites. I never made bones of the fact that I am sympathetic to Trotsky. Why I should be, Rothenburg does not understand because he does not understand Trotskyism. Law then went on to explain how he was condemned for publishing chapters from Trotsky's book on Lenin. But, he charged correctly that William Weinstone, then Secretary of the Workers' International Relief, a branch of the Moscow Relief Organization, the more pro sold the same book to a publisher and turned the money he received over to the party. Law further stated on this matter that he knew a communist publisher, the international publishers, who refused to do so and warned others not to do so. Law continued the big mistake that I made was not to go to Moscow. The comrades of the majority know it was not done in defiance to Moscow. The first time when comrade Gitlow insisted that I should go, I would have liked to dot 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 the second time I would have liked to go but we did not have an associate editor. Dot 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 I stated that to comrades Browder, Bittleman and Foster. Dot 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 Foster advised me strongly to go. He also told me that it would be bad for me if I would not endorse Zinovov's program fully. He also told me it might be advisable to go alone because then only John Pepper would be there. I felt that after I had once been betrayed, when Olgin went to represent me, after he stated he stood for everything I had written and could prove it by the Communist International itself, I said that one betrayal was enough and that I would like to go alone. Law concluded his speech with these words I am not the social democrat you made me out to be. Thirty nine years ago I joined an illegal young socialist organization in Germany. Here I joined the communist movement from its inception, when many who were criticizing me were with Abe Cohen and the forward, Olgin. I was doing my bit for the communist movement. I am not going to quit the party. I don't think you will expel me. You can take all kinds of organizational measures. Whatever you decide I will try to enforce and carry out. I will try to help the movement as much as I understand. It was I who brought the Volkszeitung into the movement.
I have brought the revolutionary Germans into the movement. I have never been an enemy but always stood for the communist international and for Soviet Russia. Nothing you will do will make a reformer of me, less of a revolutionist than I am today. We were pretty mean and heartless about law. But at the time we did not even question the ethics of hounding an innocent scapegoat at the behest of the Cummington leaders. Indeed, we felt no more compunction in hounding out of the party and out of the revolutionary labor movement, if we could, a man who honestly and courageously, and far more ably than many of us, had served the cause for two score years than in swatting an annoying fly. It occurred to none of us, I am sure, that through no fault of his, but simply because it was his turn in the political game to be scapegoat, we were breaking his heart. All of us took our activity in the communist movement with deadly seriousness, law included. It was a matter of life or death to remain in the party. Yet not a voice was lifted in the Central Executive Committee in defense of this comrade, no one even bothered to recall his previous services in extenuation of his artificially concocted crime and all of us voted for the resolution that branded him as a pariah. Since. Moreover the Cominton had decreed that there was a political contagion known as Lawraism, we duly passed a resolution, pledging to wage a merciless campaign against it. Had the Cominton decreed that it was our duty to fight the Albigensian heresy in our midst, I wonder how many of us would have paused to inquire first into the nature of Albigensianism before passing by unanimous vote a resolution pledging to campaign against it. Solemnly we laid the ground for Law's expulsion from the Communist Party. He was as good as out already, since he had the temerity to speak favorably of Trotsky, which sealed his doom in Moscow, if not yet with us. We did not really understand the struggle for leadership that was then raging in Moscow, and, busy with our own squabbles, were primarily concerned with staying on the good side of that omnipotent source of our political prerogatives in the United States the Cummington. When Juliet Stewart Points took the floor the atmosphere became electric. She was of American stock, fair, about thirty years old, rather tall, rather fleshy, rather good-looking. Though her bearing was aristocratic, she was not snobbish, mixed well with the rank-and-file communists and was very popular among them. She was headstrong and ambitious. She was the outstanding woman in the party an excellent speaker and highly dramatic in her delivery. She craved the public platform, enjoyed the applause of the listening crowds. She delighted in taking part in inner party politics, aspired to prominent party leadership, and in the Foster Law Caucus was a powerful figure who had to be reckoned with. Though a good agitator, she was a poor organizer. Her knowledge of the movement and its underlying philosophy was very superficial. As a fighter for her faction and for her political beliefs she was hard to equal. Her venom and tenacity knew no limits. She was a spitfire when she took the floor at the Central Executive Committee meeting to defend herself against charges of Lauraism. Foster and his supporters squirmed and fumed at her sallies. William F. Dunn, the wild bull from Montana, shouted and yelled derisively at her. Cannon puffed and chewed away at his cigar muttering curses under his breath. Foster paced up and down the room, his face flushed with anger, and when her sting hurt most, he would interject, it's a damn lie. As she hurled one bombshell after another against the Foster group and its leaders, we of the Ruthenburg group listened with glee and often roared with laughter at the discomfort she caused Foster, Cannon, Bittleman, Browder and the others. Her speech laid bare the intrigues plots and counterplots of communist inner party politics and undressed the leaders of the Foster group, exposing them for what they were. Her very first remark was a bombshell to the Foster group which all the time was trying to create the impression that there was no link between it and law. She said after arriving here, I was quite astonished to hear my name brought up by Comrade Cannon as the leader of a supposed group. I was invited once to become a member of a hundred percent caucus. Perhaps that is why I am qualified to become a hundred percent member of the Cannon Caucus. Bittleman calls us right-wingers. In the interest of clarity, what is and what isn't a law group? That the majority should determine. There is no law group. 
I am a member and follower of the Foster Law Canon Group. Points continued at the National Convention of 1923 for we joined the Foster Caucus at once. Foster turned crimson at her next remarks and cursed as only Foster knows how, when she said with a good deal of passion during the convention Foster hesitated to take over the power in the party. He insisted that the only inducement that would lead him to take over the power in the party would be a pledge by all in his caucus that they would loyally support him until the next convention of the party. We gave him that pledge. I at last got my main name in life at the last national convention. I as a member of the Foster group was to defend and if necessary to die for comrade Foster. She then related how she went back to New York as Foster's missionary. The moment she mentioned New York, Charles Crumbain, interrupted her, by hurling insulting phrases, shouting and scowling at her fiercely. But she only smiled ironically, glared at him with contempt and continued there was no group in New York ready to live and die for Comrade Foster. The problem for us was to create a political group for the majority. If anyone organized the law group in New York, it was Comrade Foster. In New York, we gathered into our group Comrade Grek. Rebecca Grek was Foster's confidant in New York. He was always with her when he came in from Chicago. She was a short red haired girl of about 19, vivacious highly emotional and greatly attached to Foster we were the ones who demanded that the minority district organizer be dismissed. When Crumbane came we took him to our hearts and tried to make him feel at home. Comrade Crumbane did come to caucus meetings, but not to all of them. The reason he gave was that while he was in thorough agreement with us it would be advisable for him as the district organizer not to come regularly, in order to give the impression that he was in New York, not allied with a group and acting impartially. Whenever Foster, Cannon and Bittleman came to New York they caucused with us, and when we met, we met in no other place but the offices of the Volkszeitung, 15 Spruce Street, New York. She charged that Browder came to them and asked them to abandon their opposition to the endorsement of La Follette in the interest of group loyalty. When she spoke on the Bolshevization of the party she exclaimed sarcastically we have heard about fake farmer labor parties, about fake united fronts, and so forth, but we haven't heard about fake Bolshevization. The majority is carrying on a policy of fake Bolshevization. Their professional Bolshevizer is Comrade Bittleman. He came to New York to Bolshevize New York. The group that he has worked with, that has supported him continuously. He is now trying to assassinate. Nor did she relent when she turned her offensive against Foster and Cannon. If anything, we are left wing in the Foster group. We are the most communist wing of that group. We disagreed with their last thesis in abandoning the slogan for independent political action. We did not agree with its omnibus united front policy. We were dissatisfied with the administration of the party and particularly the New York district. Meanwhile, Foster decided to build up his own caucus and send us to the Boers. Everybody understands that law has been a factional football in this factional fight. At the present time, the law group is an ardent supporter of the majority Foster group. The charge that I have an alliance with the minority is sheer nonsense. I am not even on speaking terms with most members of the minority. I am a disillusioned Fosterite. Browder wants us to remain illegitimate children of the majority group, that we should continue to support Foster. Any group that does not publicly announce that I am a member of it will not have me as a part of it, furthermore, I will not under any circumstances be part of it. She brought her attack to a dramatic closing by loudly declaring I stand by the Cummington. I support it organizationally and ideologically. I support the old guard of the Russian Communist Party against Trotsky. She was greeted by derisive shouts and catcalls from the Foster ranks as she ended, and by silence from the Ruthenburg forces. This silence had been prearranged by the Ruthenburg caucus, which knew in advance that points would make revelations and attack the Foster group. In her break with Foster, Points however did not break with the Cummington, for she gave her pledge to the Moscow leaders and took a stand against Trotsky, 
which marked her separation from law. She thus saved herself from expulsion. As for her pride, she covered her capitulation to the Cummington and her cowardly desertion of law by her fighting attitude against Foster. Yet she it was who had been nicknamed the Joan of Arc of the Communist movement. She continued her fight against Foster and for her political life in the party. In this she was clandestinely supported by us of the Ruffenburg group. The man who carried on the secret negotiations with her was Jacques de Shell, known in the party as the medicine faker, because before he became a party official he had sold patent medicines. He was at the time the New York District Secretary of the Young Workers League, the Communist Party Youth Organization. We of the Ruffenburg group realized that the point's exposures on the law question were just the ammunition we needed with which to blast Foster out of control of the party. Through our caucus apparatus the party was flooded with mimeographed copies of the point's speech, with copies of her resolutions and whatever dirt she was ready to unload against Foster. However, that did not stop the Ruffenburg group in the Central Executive Committee from agreeing upon a joint resolution against points which was published in the Daily Worker of July 5, 1925, calling for the liquidation of Pointsism as well as Lawraism. This resolution declared that Comrade Points was the most energetic leader of the law group. But she was safe, because she had eaten the Cummington's humble pie and had made a deal with us. Thus was the game played by all factions concerned, hypocritically and dishonestly. Points subsequently confessed her sins again in a manner satisfactory to the powers that be and the Communist International. In later years she even became an agent of the G. P. U., the powerful secret police of the Soviet Union. This Joan of Arc, who for years was a stormy petrol in the Communist movement, whose speeches brought forth thunderous applause from her Communist listeners, finally fell into disgrace was denounced by Crumbane in the New York press, as an agent of the United States Department of Justice, and disappeared from her living quarters in New York City, becoming the center of a mystery that has not yet been solved. Chapter 8, The Moscow Cat and ITS American Mouse Have you ever watched a cat toy with a mouse? You may have in your boyhood or girlhood, when you were still somewhat of a savage, and rather relished the spectacle. Since I am confessing all, I admit that I found the cat and mouse game far more fascinating as an observer on the sidelines than as participant, especially on the mouse end of it. This holds both literally and metaphorically. Watching a sleek cat seize a mouse, toy with it, hold it lightly with one paw or with two, release it, flick it suddenly with a rear paw and bowl it over, allow it to escape for a moment only to pounce upon it once more rebuke it in a fatherly manner, with the feline whiskers like a forest of pikes around its frightened eyes as the mouse quivers between the cat's velvet jaws, it is a cruel game. We all played at this sort of game in the communist party, relishing the role of the cat when chastising a deviator for political heresy, real or invented for convenience. But we were tyros as cats by comparison with the Russian leaders, to whom the entire American Communist Party seemed to be no more than a nest of mice to toy with. And the favorite mouse in that nest was William Z. Foster. I suppose he was the favorite as a mouse because he was more playful than the other American leaders, he trembled, he maneuvered, he yielded, he tried again and again, never talked back to the cat and was always properly mousy with the feline masters of the Cummington. I don't know to what extent the Cummington leaders relished this cat and mouse game with the leaders of the American party, but it seems to me that the game began to gain in intensity around 1924-25, when Stalin, still apparently a member of the Zinovov came and F. Stalin triumvirate in the Russian political bureau, was beginning to emerge as top boss of the Russian party of which the Cummington was of course no more than an appendage. We puny rodents of the American party leadership took ourselves very seriously. We gnawed through a straw here and sliver there, flattering ourselves that we were seriously undermining the capitalist system of the United States, but most of the time we gnawed each other, chewing catch as catch can a tail or ear or making the fur fly. 
That was what happened at the Central Executive Committee meeting at which law and points were chewed to pieces and which from our close to the floor vantage point was the opening gun in huge strategic operations of the factional war. Foster, intent on maintaining his majority at the forthcoming national convention, reorganized entire districts, brought our followers up on charges, castigated, suspended, expelled, even resorted to outright gangsterism. We in turn protested, sending cables to the Cominton and arousing members of our own faction to savage frenzy at meetings, private, semi-private and public. We also plotted and schemed, finally seizing upon the Cominton decision for a parity commission to supervise the convention arrangements and to settle controversial matters between the factions as a possibility for our side. The Cominton appointed one and the same person as chairman of the Parity Commission and as its official observer and representative to the convention, investing him with the full authority and all the prerogatives of a top-ranking communist international representative. We felt that we could turn the Parity Commission into a mighty weapon for our group, and either check Foster's efforts to hold power under any and all circumstances or at least make life miserable for him by overruling many of his actions in the Parity Commission. We were therefore eager to have it constituted. Foster had the advantage over us in his control of the party machine. We planned to make the higher-ranking Cominton Parity Commission our means for wresting that power from him. But it was easier planned than done. Confronted with the accomplished fact that Foster had the power, surely the Communist International was sufficiently power conscious to respect and recognize his power regardless of the foul means employed in obtaining it. That was at least how Foster reckoned. But he was altogether wrong, because the Communist International could not respect a power that was merely the plaything of its own indulgence. In dealing with us, the Cominton respected only its own power. Within the Central Executive Committee, the uppermost question for weeks was when would the Cominton Rep. arrive? The question became an important one in the Central Executive Committee, because the National Convention date could not be definitely set without him. Foster tried to utilize the delay by getting the date for the convention set anyway. On June 11, 1925, the Foster Group of the Central Executive Committee voted that the following cable be sent to Moscow Parity Commission not constituted because absence of essential element. No definite information regarding arrival. In view of this Central Executive Committee requests permission to proceed with organization of convention to be subject to approval of Parity Commission when fully constituted. The Ruthenburg Group on the Central Executive Committee voted against the Foster Cable and sent its own cable party situation such that convention agreements by Parity Commission essential for future of party. Protest against action before full constitution of parity commission which will be possible in one week according to information received. But in this battle of the cables, about the parity commission chairman, we had the drop on Foster, because one of our men, J. Lovestone, was aiding the G. P. U. in making arrangements for the arrival in the United States of this very important Cominton rep, advising the G. P. U agents concerning the best methods to be used in circumventing American immigration authorities and getting the Communist International representative into the country. Hence, the Rothenburg caucus leaders knew more about that than Foster, who on June 26, 1925, learned that the Communist International representative was coming to America via Mexico. A meeting of the Secretariat was hurriedly called together and the matter taken up. The Secretariat of the Central Executive Committee was then composed of Foster, Bittleman and Ruthenberg. Foster made the following motion on the matter that we send a representative to Mexico, to be Gomez, to find out as to the whereabouts of the representative of the Communist International. But it was useless for Foster to send Gomez. While Gomez was searching Mexico for one lost Cominton rep, Lovestone had already met him upon his arrival in Chicago. We of the Ruthenburg group were the first to greet him. That gave us a head start on the Fosterites and enabled us to develop our Parity Commission strategy. We went to work on the Parity Commission chairman with a will. We, not the Fosterite leaders, arranged his living quarters, which had to be kept secret. We supplied the liaison officer between him, 
illegally in the country, and the party. We looked after all his personal comforts, arranged his entertainment, his social life and provided him with the companionship of women. The home of one of our faction comrades was used as the place for spending sociable evenings and for his relaxation. All persons surrounding the communist international representative, all present at these sociable evenings were exclusively members of the Rothenburg group. The communist international representative soon became an intimate of our circle of friends, who very cleverly impressed him with the qualities and excellence of our group. Every want, every slight caprice of the representative, we attended to. We studied his habits, his weaknesses, his tastes and his pleasures, carefully noting all, so that we might serve him most satisfactorily. Taking care of this communist international representative did not end even there. His life was delved into, his opinions were carefully analyzed, in order to determine his psychological reactions and mental attitudes. We attached great importance to knowing his role and standing in the Russian Communist Party, and in what phase of Russian political life he was most interested. Sure he was a Stalin man, we knew that we had to be very careful, when discussing the communist movement, to stress Stalin's importance. Since he was also a military man, we acquainted ourselves with the military problems in which he was interested and with his military record. The nursing of the Cummington Rep, as we called it, involved the use of the most delicate and intricate amenities of diplomatic conduct, with an air of such genuine friendship that its ulterior purpose would not be suspected. We did our job so well that we caused consternation in the foster camp. They lacked the finesse and technique for this kind of activity, with the result that they resented the friendship which came to exist between the communist international rep. And the leaders of our group. His Bolshevik name was Gusev, though he was born a Drabkin. He was a short, rotund, clean shaven man, who looked more like a prosperous middle class merchant than like a Bolshevik. Yet he was really both, born into a well to do family of Jewish merchants. He abandoned the privileges of a comfortable life for the tribulations of a professional revolutionist, and was one of the 22 original Bolsheviks who had rallied around Lenin in 1904 to found the Bolshevik movement. In 1925 he was in his middle forties. Sedate in manner, he spoke his German in a quiet tone and very slowly. He looked at you over his spectacles through eyes that scrutinized keenly. Studied though he was in his demeanor. He was quick in forming his judgment of persons he met and in grasping what they had to say. He had a way of smoking a cigarette, while engrossed in his thoughts, that invested him with an air of mystery. He was a good listener and used words sparingly. Though not a person of passion and dynamic power, the deliberate manner in which he presented his views or imparted his decisions left no doubt as to his strength of character and his ability to force matters through by sheer force of will. A typical old guard Bolshevik, he had been a high-ranking officer of the Red Army during the Civil War and was at the time of his sojourn among us a member of the powerful control committee of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. The control committee was made up of the most influential men in the Russian party who were not members of the Central Committee or of its political bureau. To the control committee was entrusted the hearing of all cases of misconduct on the part of the highest officials of the party. It was the supreme tribunal of the Russian Communist Party. A writer on military affairs and a prominent member of the Soviet Military Academy, Gusev despised Trotsky and worshipped Stalin, because, as he told us, during one of the Civil War campaigns Trotsky had threatened him and a number of other officers of the Red Army with death for insubordination and due to Stalin's intervention not only were their lives spared but they were rehabilitated as military commanders and as Bolsheviks. Since he was in this country illegally, having been smuggled in through Mexico, a suitable alias had to be found for him. We christened him, P. Green. We soon found out that P. Green was not only concerned with the American party. He did not neglect to find out all he could from us about the United States in general. He used to exhaust us with his questions. After he had squeezed us dry, he would become confidential. Then he would talk about Russian party affairs and about the Russian leaders. 
he never lost an opportunity to berate Trotsky. He would tell of his personal experiences with Trotsky in Paris. Look, he would say, Trotsky is not a Bolshevik. We Bolsheviks always despised him for his individualistic vanity and egotism. Then he would tell us, choosing his words carefully, that he would watch Trotsky for hours stand before a mirror and deliver a speech to himself so that he could watch his own expressions and motions and improve upon them. He told how Trotsky would practice and repractice certain parts of them, in order to get the impression he wanted, finally leaving the mirror, extremely satisfied. He would go at length into the history of all of Trotsky's differences with the Bolsheviks and would maintain that, as an individual, Trotsky was not made of the caliber from which Bolsheviks come and that intellectually he was never able to grasp the real basic foundations of Bolshevism. But when he spoke of Stalin it was different. He pictured Stalin in the most glowing terms. He confided to us that, as far as Stalin was concerned, not only was he the logical successor to Lenin as the leader of the great Russian party but that Stalin was prepared to carry out his methods of leadership in the communist international. From now on we could expect to see Stalin actively assume the leadership of the Comintern. That would mean, he told us, in the strictest confidence, that Stalin once and for all would end the Ficken politics of the Comintern characteristic of the Zinovov regime. It was the first inkling we got that Stalin did not think highly of Zinovov. Stalin, he said, was for a collective leadership. He gave us to understand that Stalin wanted a dependable leadership in the communist international coming from the affiliated parties whose strength and Bolshevik stamina would center around Stalin. We were sufficiently political to realize that a strong fight was on in the Russian party and that Stalin, who had not played a major role in Comintern affairs, was determined to play the main role in the future. If Green would support us against the Foster Group, we realized it was necessary for us to support Stalin 100%. The Foster Group, however, did not like Green and soon began openly to proclaim their hostility to him. A popular expression among them was, we got rid of Pepper, only to get a dose of Paris Green. Green was a very shrewd political trickster. He once told me that Lenin told him that politics is a very dirty business and if one is in politics, he must be prepared to wash dirty linen. Whenever he had private talks with the leaders of the Foster Group he would always report them to us. When he met Cannon for the first time he was duly impressed by him and reported to us that Cannon was more political than Foster. One can play with the young man, and if one is clever, it will not be difficult, by playing on his vanity and arousing his ambitions, to break him away from Foster. If you will permit me, I will try to do it, and I believe I will succeed. Bittleman he considered a Talmudic student, one completely divorced from life. He complained that he had difficulty listening to him because he was bored by his confounded abstractions. He could not understand how Browder became a communist. He looked and spoke more like a missionary or a minister. On the American Party controversy, he adopted a line which, in my opinion, was basically correct. He maintained that there were no major political differences which divided the two groups and that, therefore, there was every reason to expect the unification of the two groups and the end of factionalism. He said that, since the Comington decision on the American Party was accepted by both groups, and since all major political issues before the party were settled in that decision, there was no reason for a continuation of the factional warfare. He would say, whenever we Russians are confronted by a factional controversy, we are not interested in individuals. We ask ourselves, what are the political platforms of the opposing factions and wherein do they differ? He went further and said that the liquidation of Lawraism had given the party the task of the liquidation of that two and one half Trotskyist tendency in the party, a task which could be successfully carried out only if the two factions would unite. Whenever we insisted upon clarifying the difference between us and the Foster group, he would raise the question of the party split, by saying, if you comrades insist on your attitude towards Foster and his followers then there is no room in the party for both, and a split is inevitable. When I first met him I was closeted with him for about an hour and a half, talking about the party situation. I went into details on the crimes and fallacies of the Foster group.
But he concluded, if the comrades of the Rothenburg group will continue to insist on their contentions about Foster and his group, then I will have to tell the Communist International frankly that my mission as chairman of the Parity Commission is an impossible task, because the work of such a commission cannot be carried on in the factional atmosphere that now prevails. Either the Communist International will have to give me the power to act in a split situation or else I will have to return home. The more Green stressed the danger of a split, the more certain did we become that he sought to utilize as a smokescreen the threat of a split situation for putting through proposals he had brought with him from Moscow. We never lost sight of this important fact and were prepared if necessary to resist to the bitter end any attempt on Foster's part to deprive us of our legitimate gains in the party. Soon after the arrival of Green the Parity Commission was constituted, with him as its chairman. The Foster group was represented by Foster, Cannon and Bittleman, the Rothenburg group by Rothenburg, Lovestone and Bidicht, all of the national office in Chicago. The formation of the Parity Commission superseded all the other party committees. It became the actual boss of the party, and into its committee hopper were thrown all party problems, controversies, preparation of convention agenda and resolutions, disciplinary matters, in fact, every matter pertaining to the party. The Communist International representative, as chairman of the Parity Commission, plus his authority as a Cummington rep, which gave him the power to overrule every party decision, became the American party's virtual dictator. The question of issuing a call for the party national convention was really left in his hands. The national convention issue had a complicated history. In the autumn of 1924, Following the miserable showing made in the presidential election, the Foster group felt that it was beginning to lose its hold on the party, in consequence of the continuous criticism leveled against its administration by the Rothenburg group. On November 19 the membership meeting was to be held in Chicago on the eve of a full Central Executive Committee meeting. We worked like beavers, preparing to capture it. Since all our top leaders were in Chicago for the full Central Executive Committee conclave, we held numerous conferences with the heads of the language federations, especially the Greek, South Slavic and Lithuanian, we mapped out plans on how to mobilize their members for the momentous meeting, through sumptuous parties for influential Chicago party members and the discussed with them the party situation and plans for the general membership meeting. We were getting ready to railroad through a resolution that would put the Chicago membership on record as opposed to the policies of the Foster-dominated Central Executive Committee. Since Chicago was his stronghold, it would have been a calamity for him to have been thus repudiated and a significant victory for our group. We therefore decided to take no chances at the meeting, and came fully prepared, not only to defend our group politically but physically as well if necessary. And it was a good thing we did, for the meeting ended up in a free-for-all fight and a riot, when the Rothenburg supporters in the audience demanded that a vote be taken on the resolution we had introduced. Bill Dunn was not allowed to speak. Foster was booed and howled down, when he attempted to take the floor against the wishes of the rank and file in order to prevent a vote from being taken. The chairman arbitrarily declared the meeting ended because he realized that the vote would go against Foster. When the membership protested, the usual trade union tactics of turning the light off were resorted to. The air was thick with personal attacks and recriminations. The Fosterites were so stunned over the outcome of the Chicago membership meeting that they hurried the arrangements for calling the National Convention. Without definitely setting the date for it, they passed a resolution through the Central Executive Committee for starting a pre-convention discussion as a prelude to the holding of the convention, which, according to the party statutes had to be preceded by a two-months discussion period, which was duly opened on November 26, 1924, and was to be closed on January 9, 1925. But on December 19, 1924, the Central Executive Committee explained to the membership that it could not hold the party convention in January, as it had intended, for the following stated reasons colon 1. Under the statutes of the Communist International permission must be secured from the Executive Committee of the Communist International before a convention of any of its sections can be held. 2. 
the Central Executive Committee, in October transmitted a request for permission for a convention to be held during the month of January.3. The Secretariat of the Communist International answered the request suggesting that the advice of the Communist International on policy be sought in advance of the convention of the party and that for this reason the convention be postponed until after delegates of the party, representatives of both viewpoints could present the matter. After cancelling the January date, however, the convention was again postponed because the representative of the Communist International was late in arriving. Finally, after the Parity Committee had worked out all the convention matters and after P. Green had succeeded in forcing the Foster and Ruthenberg representative on the Parity Commission unanimously to endorse all political resolutions and decisions to be presented to the convention, the Central Executive Committee issued a new call for the convention, to take place in Chicago on August 21, 1925. Delegates were to be elected on the basis of proportional representation worked out by the Parity Commission in order to prevent the majority from excluding representatives of the minority. In all 54 delegates were to be elected. But the factional warfare did not stop with the publication of the call for the convention. The unanimous declaration of the Parity Commission calling for cessation of factionalism was completely ignored, for in the campaign to elect delegates the most bitter internal party warfare developed. The Parity Commission had to sit continuously as a court of final appeal, hearing the complaints and charges of illegality, fraud and high-handed methods, which were used by both sides in an effort to muster a majority of the delegates. Green soon discovered that while he could easily get unanimous agreement on questions of principle and on political thesis and resolutions, he could not get such agreement on matters concerning the question of delegates and power. At one of the meetings of the Parity Commission, when Foster stubbornly refused to set aside an allegedly illegal act on the part of his group and had launched into an attack on Green, the latter for the first time lost his calm and poise and shouted back angrily at Foster, charging him with driving the party to a split. After that meeting I saw Green. He had regained his calm, and he said, in politics one must never lose one's temper one must never show his feelings. One must always be calm, objective. The Fosterites used their control of the party machinery to make sure of a majority, manipulating the hierarchy of delegates all the way up to the national convention. The elections to that began really with the basic units of the party organization, the branches or nuclei electing delegates to the city convention, which elected delegates to the district convention, which elected the delegates to the National Convention. The call for this National Convention provided that the city conventions be held between August 10 and 15 and that all district conventions should be held on August 16. Since the apportionment of delegates was made on the basis of the number of dues stamps sold by the districts, wherever possible the records of dues stamp payments were padded to favor the Foster Group which also did its utmost to suspend opposition members and deprive them of their right to vote in the election of delegates. On top of all this finagling the Fosterites used every conceivable method to gerrymander, pad rolls and obtain more votes than they were entitled to, in order to win. The result was that the Parity Commission was flooded with appeals against the Foster machine. In sections of the party where we of the Ruthenberg group were able to muster a majority, the Foster group charged gross misconduct against us, and appealed as vociferously as we to the Parity Commission. Green became alarmed. He called in Ruthenberg, Lovestone and Biddock and went over with them in detail the critical situation created by the appeals that had swamped the Parity Commission. It was obvious, Green maintained, that, in the limited time left before the convention took place, it was impossible for the Parity Commission to review all the cases. He said two things were clear to him, one, that something had to be done before the convention to prevent a split, and two, that positive guarantees had to be received that under no circumstances would the Ruthenberg group be exterminated from the leadership and the important posts in the party. He pleaded with us as good communists to be prepared to take whatever steps were necessary, even if it involved great sacrifices on our part, to save the party. After much arguing, 
it was finally agreed that Green should propose in the Parity Commission that a 50-50 Central Executive Committee be elected at the National Convention, but, if the Foster Group would not agree, then to compromise on a 40-60 Central Executive Committee, 40% to the Rothenburg Group and 60% to the Foster Group, with the guarantees that had been agreed to. After many heated hours of bickering in the Parity Commission, Green finally succeeded in putting across his proposal of a 40-60 division plus guarantees. As soon as this decision was reached, all the Foster Caucus centers throughout the party received telegrams that the Communist International had decided to give Foster 60% of the party. I was in New York at the time. I heard of this decision at first indirectly. My wife was working on Freeheit. Olgin, who was a Foster supporter, stopped in front of her desk very jubilantly and informed her of the decision in the following words Miss Zetlin, the Communist International has spoken. It has decided that Foster should lead the party and should have 60% of the new Central Executive Committee to be elected by the National Convention. Now that the Communist International has spoken, every comrade must accept its decision. When my wife told me about that, I called the leading comrades of New York together and gave them the startling information. They were dumbfounded and for a time speechless. It seemed that the fight was all over. I spoke up and told them that, on the eve of the convention, we could under no circumstances accept such a decision. We were fighting and ready to take the consequence. I asked them if they would stand solid in repudiating the agreement and would fight against it. They gave me that pledge. I telephoned Lovestone in Chicago and gave him to understand that the Rothenburg comrades in New York had most emphatically repudiated the agreement and that we resented the capitulation of our members on the Parity Commission. Lovestone was overjoyed to hear of our reaction. He said that it was precisely what he wanted done. He further informed me that the only chance we had of winning the party was to contest the Foster Group all along the line even if it meant coming to Chicago with a contesting set of delegates from every district of the party. He told me that he was sure that Green would not permit Foster to get away with it. Needless to say, I was overjoyed with the conversation. I reported it back to our leading caucus of the New York district and we made plans for a fight to the finish. And that is exactly the sort of fight it turned out to be, not only in New York but in every district of the party. Every inch of ground was contested. In New York City, we had obtained a majority of the delegates to the district convention from those branches which were active in party work. What we did not know was how the Finnish branches would vote. The procedure in New York City was to have the branches elect delegates directly to the district convention. This was permissible because this had always been the procedure in New York. Even if all the Finnish delegates were Fosterites, we still would have had a majority. But Foster contested enough delegates to change the picture. He came personally to New York as the representative of the Central Executive Committee to the District Convention. He was not going to take any chances in losing the largest district in the party, the one that elected the most delegates to the National Convention, 11 out of a total of 54 for the entire country. Our group now controlled the New York District Committee, because law, points and the other law rights on it had decided to pursue an independent policy and did not support the Foster faction. The district committee had charge of district convention arrangements. It decided that I should open the convention as the temporary chairman. The convention took place in Manhattan Lyceum. I made sure that the Rothenburg delegates should be present at the hall long before the hour set for the convention to open. Our group also came heavily armed and well guarded and protected, should any rouse be started. The Foster delegates were also on hand at an early hour, all of them with the exception of the Finnish delegates. As soon as the hall was opened I took the platform and seated myself at the chairman's table. I saw at once that the situation in the hall was very tense. I sat on the platform, watching everyone, prepared for any outbreak. Five minutes before the convention was to be opened, the door in the rear of the hall opened and Foster marched in, leading the Finnish delegates, who marched in twos behind him. It was a real military display. It was clear to me that they had come prepared to fight as well as to vote. Who they were I did not know, 
because most of them had never been seen around party headquarters nor had ever before been active in the party's campaigns. I found out later that Foster had these Finnish delegates rounded up by their leaders the night before and that he had slept with them all night, to make sure that he could lead them into the convention the next morning. The hour for opening the district convention struck. I rose as temporary chairman to open it. No sooner did I do so, when Arenberg, member of the Chicago Amalgamated Clothing Workers, who had settled in New York to serve Foster's factional purposes, jumped on the platform to open the convention himself and usurp the legal power of the district committee. The Rothenburg strong arm guard formed an iron wall around the platform. To have stormed it would have resulted in terrible bloodshed. Bedlam broke loose. I could not make myself heard. Unless some agreement could be reached on how to run the convention, a free-for-all fight was bound to take place. And the weapons would not be only bare fists. Lives might be lost. The police would certainly interfere. The party could stand plenty, but it could not stand the owners of such a riot. All this flashed through my mind as I decided quickly that my voice, powerful though it is, was useless here. Without relinquishing the chair or the chairman's mallet, I held a conference with the members of our steering committee. We agreed to go into conference with Foster and his steering committee before attempting to open the convention. We decided that, if no other way out was found at the conference, both sides should constitute themselves into the district convention, elect the delegates to the national convention, and have the contest decided by either the parity commission or the national convention. I held the platform while the other members went to confer. In the face of all this bedlam we kept the utmost vigilance, to ward off any attempted charge by the Fosterites upon the platform. In about an hour's time the conferees reached an agreement. Then took place the most unusual convention that I had ever attended or had presided over. Practically two conventions went on simultaneously. The Rothenburg group organized the convention on the basis of its majority and its decisions on policies and proceeded forthwith to elect its slate of delegates to the national convention. The Foster group did the same identical things. There were two chairmen, one for the Foster group and one for the Rothenburg group, both occupying the platform at the same time. There were two secretaries, two credential committees and two sets of motions. This duality was continued until the very closing of the convention, when one motion for adjournment was made by the Rothenburg Convention and carried, and another motion for adjournment made by the Foster Convention and also carried. On the basis of the elections in the party units, including the votes of the Finnish branches, the Rothenburg Group in New York had won the district decisively. On the basis of the proportional representation rules governing the election of delegates to the National Convention, we elected seven delegates of the Rothenburg Group and four delegates of the Foster Group. I was elected as a delegate and chosen to head the delegation at the convention. When the reports came in from the other district conventions, it was almost the same story, contests in practically all the districts. The Rothenburg Group, however, did legitimately carry the majority of the largest and most important districts of the party, namely, New York, Boston, Philadelphia, Cleveland and Pittsburgh. In the other important districts, Detroit and Chicago particularly, the vote was very close and the Foster Group was able to register a majority only by means of the most flagrant and high-handed manipulations. It was clear to everyone in the party that the National Convention would be the most violent one ever held. And yet, the two contending factions in the Parity Commission had worked out a set of long and detailed resolutions on every important question before the party. These resolutions were unanimously adopted in the Parity Commission and were laid before the National Convention with the unanimous approval of the representatives of both factions. Though they were unanimously adopted, the resolution on law, with a supplementary motion appended to it, was introduced by Max Bedict of the Rothenburg Group and Bittelman of the Foster Group, calling upon the convention forthwith to expel law from the party as an enemy of the working class for two main reasons, because he had dared to write editorials in the Volkszeitung in defense of his conduct and because although still a member of the Central Executive Committee, 
he refused to attend the convention to defend himself. Had law attended the convention he would have been given no quarter, he would have had to listen to every delegate denounce him as a criminal and renegade, he would have been called upon to submit to the communist international and confess his crimes and, failing to do so, would have been given no more than a few minutes in which to ward off the swarm of gnats, wasps, flies and stampeding buffaloes. Law knew in advance the tactics that would be used and acted wisely in absenting himself. I went to Chicago with the New York delegation, intent on fighting against Foster to the last ditch. I felt that Foster was far from a communist, that he was primarily interested in his own personal aggrandizement and that if he continued in the leadership of the party, all those who had fought him would be exterminated and the party run by the strong arm methods prevalent in certain trade unions. I arrived in Chicago two days before the opening of the convention. The national office at 1113 West Washington Boulevard was already jammed with comrades from all over the country. The New York delegation received a hearty welcome. We New Yorkers had come to fight. We found that the comrades in Chicago were in very good shape but lacked our fighting spirit. As chairman of the New York delegation, I intended to utilize it for whipping all the Rothenburg delegates into a frenzy of opposition. Yet I was not deceiving myself about the outlook of the convention, for that morning I wrote looking over the field I see a very difficult and bitter fight ahead of us. How it will end I cannot now tell. We will probably see the parity man this afternoon. Tomorrow he will attend our caucus meeting. We New Yorkers took a suite of three rooms in the Bradley Hotel, which, besides being the sleeping quarters for our delegation, was also to serve as the caucus headquarters of the Rothenburg Group. Here we met continually, as the Rothenburg Board of Strategy. It was not unusual for us to meet all night. I was added to the Parity Commission as soon as I arrived in Chicago and was later also included on the Rothenburg Steering Committee for the convention. On August 20th I wrote the situation is not yet clarified. Perhaps at today's sitting of the Parity Commission I will know what the results will be. Contesting delegations are here from practically every district. The Parity man is of the opinion that we were defeated, that a split threatens to divide the party and that the situation calls for the surrender of the minority. He is very frank in his estimation of the majority. He fears their action. What he will actually do when he will be forced to make a decision I cannot foretell now. Green maintained a poker face. He spoke slowly, deliberately, without any expression of feeling, presented us with what he thought was the actual situation and let us decide what to do about it. We could not understand what he had in mind. On the 21st, the day of the opening of the convention, I wrote developments have not as yet come to a head. The parity man is cool and composed and not in a hurry. He sits unconcerned, either puffs away at a cigarette or chews gum, a habit which he has acquired and pursues like a real American. The situation in the party is serious. Last night the parity man spoke before the caucus of the majority. Then he came to us, told us what took place there and what he said. According to his report, Foster said there was the danger of a split. Cannon stated that in the split all the right-wing, opportunistic elements would go with them and the real communists would remain with the minority. In respect to Cannon he stated that Cannon was a good schoolboy who learned the speeches he, Green, made in the Parity Commission and then repeated them as his own in the caucus. The Parity man told the Foster caucus there were two kinds of victory a bad victory and a good one and that they had won a very bad victory. Green also reported to us that the Foster group refuses to concede to the Rothenburg group the five major districts which they won and that he proposed to them as a compromise new elections in those districts under the supervision of the Parity Commission after the convention, which compromise Foster rejected. P. Green, the Communist International Rep, addressed our caucus afterwards. The hall was jammed with every important comrade of our group then in Chicago. Several hundred were present. He opened up by declaring that he favors us as the real communist wing of the party and declared, I will do everything in my power to help you. 
but my hands are tied by the decision of the Communist International which directed that the Foster Group be given at least 60% of the Central Executive Committee, which is tantamount to saying that they be given the leadership of the party. I believe that the decision of the Comintern was a big mistake and must be changed in the future. Nevertheless we must recognize the basis of this decision by the fact that formerly the majority won the majority of the party. He closed by suggesting to us the same compromise that he had made to the Foster Group, that we recognize the Foster majority, accept 40% of the new Central Executive Committee to be elected at the convention and new elections in the contested districts after the convention, with this one concession that the elections, instead of taking place two months after the convention, shall take place three months after. I took the floor and spoke emphatically against the proposal. I declared that we would never submit to a majority that was secured by violence and fraud and that included the inactive, opportunistic and lawrite elements of the party. The lead which I gave was followed by the caucus. Green's compromise was emphatically rejected. It was true that formally and legally Foster had a very slight majority of the party. This majority was based mainly on the membership of the Finnish Federation, which played virtually no role in the affairs of the party and whose leaders, with few exceptions, were supporters of the law group. Other inactive sections of the Foster majority were made up of the comparatively numerous Scandinavian and Czechoslovak federations. But the Finnish Federation alone had a membership of 7,000, or virtually half of the total party membership. These 7,000 were members of the Finnish clubs who were enrolled in the party as units. They were not party members in the strict communist sense, because they did not engage in party activities. We brought figures with us to the convention which proved conclusively that in the election of delegates to the national convention not even 10% of the Finnish members actually participated. At some of the meetings that elected delegates to the district conventions more delegates were elected by the Finnish branches than members actually present to vote for these delegates. Had the Finnish representation been reduced to the actual Finnish communists? and not to those merely carried on the roles as communists, the Foster group would have been decisively defeated by the Ruthenburg group. That does not change the fact that the Ruthenburg group also received the votes of many members who should have been included in the same inactive category as the Finnish Federation members, but our proportion of that was far from being as large as in the Foster camp. The National Convention was opened and organized by the Fosterites on the basis of allotting us 23 delegates and taking 40 for themselves. It should be noted that the Foster group seated 11 more delegates than were provided in the convention call. In fact, Foster seated all the contested delegates he had brought to Chicago from all parts of the country. In the report of the minority of the Credentials Committee the Ruthenburg group claimed a majority of the delegates for its group. For two days, while the convention was in session, between the many conferences and caucuses that went on, the fight continued on the report of the Credentials Committee. The Rothenburg group decided as part of its strategy not to refer to itself as the minority but as the left wing of the party and to brand the Foster group as the right wing. The Rothenburg group represented then a solid block of determined fighting delegates. Every opportunity was taken for staging demonstrations and flaying the Foster right wing. When Martin Appen as chairman of the majority of the Credentials Committee reported in his dull sonorous voice, the words coming slowly through his nose, he cast a slur on the communist integrity of the Rothenburg group. We immediately staged a demonstration, demanding a retraction. One Rothenburg delegate after another rose and indignantly stated that the convention would not go on unless the statement was withdrawn. Aben was flabbergasted. He was purple with rage as he bit his lips. The chairman kept banging the table with his gavel. Had a fight broken out, it would have been a very bloody affair, because both sides came very well armed. The Rothenburg group was taking no chances. The Foster Group had barricaded the national office on Washington Boulevard, which housed the daily worker plant. Behind the barricades were Fosterites armed with automatic revolvers, to prevent any attempt on the part of the Ruthenburg Group to seize the national office. We knew also that the Foster Group had a heavily armed guard at the convention, 
with revolvers ready to go into action if given the order. The backbone of the Ruthenburg defense were members of the South Slavic Federation, each one a husky of six feet or over, who had been actively engaged in fighting in the old country and who had been hardened in the steel mills and coal mines of the United States. As for us, we brought to Chicago everyone who knew how to fight and wield weapons. The Fosterites knew that. There was therefore a lame semi-retraction by Aben and a bloody fight was averted. But the next day the Fosterites were as arrogant as ever. On the 25th Foster served notice that we would have to submit to the arbitrary rulings of his majority, that our leading comrades would have to go back to their districts on probation, since the Fosterites would henceforth be in control of all districts, including the ones in which we had a majority. This was his answer to all the painful negotiations and all the conferences we had held with him under the aegis of the Communist International Rep. We attempted to come to some understanding which would make some semblance of unity possible, but Foster made it plain that he was determined to annihilate any and all opponents that did not submit to his authority. Yet in his private talks with us P. Green kept pressing that we yield. He always confronted us with the threat of a split, and his famous phrase in German was, Capitulation oder Splittung. Capitulation or split. At that time it looked as if the convention would soon break up and mark the beginning of a new internecine war in the party. But in view of Foster's ultimatum, we did the only thing we honorably could do, we broke off all negotiations with the Fosterites. If they wanted blood, we would give it to them but only fighting, not by surrendering. I was not the only one of our group who felt that way, yet I was singled out for a bit of personal attack by James P. Cannon, Foster's chief lieutenant, who, holding me responsible for the adamant attitude of the Ruthenburg group, declared accusingly Gitlow is dot 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 the most intransigent of the minority, he is the leader of the extreme left wing of the minority caucus dot he argued, moreover, that if the extremists represented by Gitlow could be overcome there would be some basis for cooperation between the two groups. He then made a weak plea for some sort of cooperation between the two forces. When we heard that, we knew that the Foster Caucus was cracking. It became increasingly clear to us that Cannon was beginning to withdraw from Foster's leadership. Two factors were responsible for this situation. Cannon's feeling that he was the actual leader and organizer of the Foster Caucus but had failed to gain the recognition he deserved, and the clever intriguing of the Communist International Chairman of the Parity Commission, who was always availing himself of the opportunity to flatter Cannon, whispering innuendos into his ear and firing his ambition. The steering committee of our group was fully informed on the progress of Green's intrigues by Green himself. He filled Cannon with the idea that Foster had no political judgment, that he was nothing but a trade unionist, and that it was about time that such an able political thinker and tactician as Cannon should assert himself. He urged Cannon to prove himself a communist leader in his own right and follow his own political line, in keeping with his own judgment rather than continue to bear the brunt of responsibility for Foster's mistakes and deviations. He even promised Cannon recognition by the Communist International and an outstanding position of leadership if he would only assert his independence as a leader. All this was grist to our mill. On August 26, I debated Foster on the trade union question. Foster looked upon my efforts as sheer effrontery, for he considered himself the only man in the party qualified to speak on that subject. Yet I not only spoke on the policies of trade union work but went further and ridiculed Foster's activities and policies. Foster spoke for over two hours, while I was given only 45 minutes to make the minority report in answer to him. But these discussions on the convention floor served only to maintain the illusion that the convention was really proceeding, meantime affording us the opportunity to keep up an incessant barrage against the Foster group. The decisive developments were going on behind the scenes. On the morning of the 27th, a few hours after the debate on the trade union question, I learned that, in consequence of Cannon's impending break with Foster and our refusal to capitulate, which was what P. Green wanted all the time, although he did not say so, 
Green had cabled a draft of his decision on the American Party situation to Moscow, with the request that the Communist International cable it back to the convention with all its authority behind it. I was therefore able to record in a letter I wrote to New York yesterday as a climax to our bombardment of the majority we received news from across that definitely gave us the party. Great jubilation rose in our ranks. Everyone was smiling, laughing and joyful in the camp of the minority. The cable we received from the Communist International states the following, under no circumstances must majority suppress Ruffenburg Group because it has finally become clear that the Ruffenburg group is more loyal to the communist international and stands closer to its views, because it has received a majority in most important districts or an important minority, because Foster group employs excessively mechanical and ultra-factional methods. As minimum, Ruffenburg group must get not less than 40% of the Central Executive Committee. Ultimatum to majority that Ruffenburg must remain as secretary and Lovestone a member of the Central Executive Committee. Ultimatum to majority, to refrain making removals, replacements and dispersions against minority. Ruffenburg group must retain co-editorship daily worker. In contested districts Ruffenburg group gets 50-50 district committees and 50-50 on subcommittees of the Central Executive Committee. If majority does not accept these demands, then in view of circumstances that elections were unclear who has real majority and methods of majority raise danger of split, Communist International proposes then only a temporary central executive committee with equal representation for both groups and a neutral chairman be elected to call new convention after passions have died down. Those who refuse to submit to this decision will be expelled. Green called a conference of the Parity Commission for 5 o'clock of August 28. I shall never forget the scene. I can still see Cannon, Bittleman, and Foster seated beside each other on a couch, green, cool, and unconcerned. Sitting at a table, busily engaged in writing and seated on chairs around the room Ruffenberg, Lovestone, Biddeck, Ballam and myself. Foster had just come from a session of the convention, where he had been unmercifully pounded by the Ruffenbergians in the debates on his report. Perfect quiet reigns. Then Green nonchalantly gives the Moscow cable to Ruffenberg. As secretary of the party he reads it, calmly and very slowly. A more dramatic setting could not have been staged. Foster's eyes become liquid, his jaws set. Cannon squints out of his eyes, and his jaws lock with a nervous twitch. Bittleman collapses into dejection and hopelessness. Minutes go by. For some time they cannot talk. Then the parity man, cool and deliberate, no sentiment, no emotion, explains the cable and lays stress on the point that the Communist International has now corrected the very bad mistake it had made in its last decision on the American question. Foster asks for time to confer. The trio go into another room. When they return, Foster speaks. He is excited and bitter. He offers us the majority of the Central Executive Committee. He states with great emotion that he wants to be relieved from membership in the Central Executive Committee. He says that under such a decision it is impossible for him to shoulder responsibility and work. He is a bundle of quivering nerves as he speaks. It seems that any moment he will collapse. The parity man quiets him down, tells him he cannot accept such an attitude. Foster then agrees formally to accept the decision. He further agrees to hold an executive session of the convention at which the cable will be read. Flushed with anger, Foster curses and says he knows who is responsible. He departs, followed by Cannon. Bittleman, shoulders drooped, dejected, blue in the face, completely flabbergasted, remains seated on the couch. He looks around, is surprised when he realizes his associates have departed, so hurriedly picks up his hat and jacket and leaves. It is the tragedy of politics. The victors remain. The parity man smiles. Wolf's wife comes dancing into the room, and the parity man wittily remarks, Why are you dancing? Do you think this is a love affair? This is a lovestone affair, 
and so victory is snatched from the victors. With this decision, the convention was practically over. The Foster group was wrecked and divided. They had to caucus for 34 hours before they could reach an agreement on the decision. What Foster did not know in his caucus was that Cannon, who was leading the fight against him, was following the strategy suggested to him by Green, was Green's tool against him. Cannon fought to accept the Communist International decision, while Foster fought to withdraw and give the party to us outright. For hours Foster maintained the majority in his caucus. The change came when Cannon won over Bill Dunn to his side. Together they hammered Foster's position and finally won the majority of the caucus for accepting the decision. At half past ten in the evening of August 29th the Parity Commission held another session, to get the answer from the Foster caucus. Of that meeting I wrote I witnessed something I will long remember. If ever a group looked broken and beaten, it was they. Bittleman especially was a picture of misery, as he sat hidden away in a corner trying to obscure himself. His face was virtually black. His thin frame seemed to shrivel up. Cannon was a nervous mass of human flesh. Weary and exhausted, he stared out of his bleary, bloodshot eyes like a trapped fox. He pressed his thin hands against his forehead in a supreme effort to suppress his emotion. Foster was disheveled and unkempt, like one shipwrecked, hopeless and helpless. Politics is a cruel game. The last two days were jammed with drama and tragedy. The day before, Dunn's seven year old boy was buried. He was killed by an auto on Chicago's busy streets. The comrades gathered around the grave. A little in the distance stood the bulky wire chested Bill Dunn, the wild bull from Montana, tenderly holding his frail wife in his arms. As Norman Tallentire spoke, I saw Dunn. A picture of sorrow silhouetted against the background of trees, and heard the sobbing of his poor wife. The Internationale was sung. The earth thudded down on the coffin. We were for a moment caught by the mystery of life in the grim reality of death. But it was only a momentary respite. As our footsteps turned back to the city, we who had mourned together at the great sorrow that had befallen our comrades, split into our factions to resume the fight where we had left it off. The Foster group had decided to accept the decision of the Communist International on the basis suggested by Green. Cannon had fought for Green's proposal, which was that the new Central Executive Committee should be on a 50-50 basis, with the chairman of the Parity Commission as the neutral member. The Foster group finally decided upon this course because it refused to take responsibility for the leadership of the party after the Communist International had implied that it was not as loyal to the Communist International as was the Ruthenburg group. As for Cannon, in fighting for Green's proposals, he had reckoned without Green. At the first meeting of the newly elected Central Executive Committee following the conclusion of the convention, the Parity Man made a significant statement which completely baffled Cannon. It rose on the question of the organization of the Central Executive Committee in the elections of its subcommittees. Green stated of course, we now have a parity Central Executive Committee, but it is not exactly a parity Central Executive Committee. With the decision of the Communist International on the question of the groups in the American Party the GO parallel instructions to the Communist International representative to support the group which was the former minority. If the Communist International continues to support this policy, that will always be the case, that is, the Communist International representative will be supporting that group, and therefore, although we have nearly a parity Central Executive Committee, we have majority and minority in the Central Executive Committee. The result of this declaration was that Green, representative of the Communist International, member of the Bolshevik Party and of its Control Committee, voted as a member of the Central Executive Committee with the Ruthenburg Group, thus giving the Ruthenburg Group a majority of the Central Executive Committee. Thus did Moscow deliver the Communist Party of the United States to Ruthenburg. But this was not yet the end. The game of the cat and the mouse was to continue. Part 2, American Communism in Action Chapter 9, Communist Party Life November, 1925, I was ordered back to Sing Sing Prison, to finish my sentence. When I arrived there, 
I was greeted humorously by my fellow prisoners as the man who goes in and out of prison at will. The authorities, treating me as an old timer, transferred me immediately from the receiving flats of the old prison cell block to the new prison on the hill. The old cell block had everything to condemn it, the new prison everything to command it. I was assigned to the company that had to keep the place clean. I scrubbed two tiers of stairs with soap and water every day. They had to be scrubbed spotlessly clean in order to satisfy the inspection of the keeper in charge. It took me about three quarters of an hour maximum to do this job. Then I had to clean the bars of the cells on my tier with a rag dipped in oil and do a few odd cleaning jobs which the keeper assigned to me. If I worked more than an hour a day, I considered it a long day's work. The new prison was kept immaculate. A cleaner place was not to be found. Here the cells were larger than those in the old cell block. The walls were of steel and smoothly painted. Every prisoner had his own private cell, which included a wash basin with running hot and cold water, a window opening to the outside that let in plenty of fresh air in the hospital cot with a spring and comfortable mattress. The greatest convenience was the inclusion of a private toilet bowl with a modern flushometer. Had a bath been included, it would have been equivalent to a good small room in a modern hotel. Each prisoner had to keep his cell spotlessly clean. The basin and toilet bowl had to be polished and white. The bed made up neatly, the window cleaned. The slightest infraction on the part of the prisoner against the rules for cleanliness was called to the prisoner's attention and, if repeated, he was punished. Besides, each cell was heated and ventilated by a most modern hot air system, which was fed by ventilated air, to keep the dust out, and which could be regulated to suit the desires of the inmates of each cell. Many of the men in the new prison had never before lived so comfortably and so cleanly. The regime in the new prison was very liberal. Radios were permitted. The cell doors were left open until the men returned from the movies. One could stroll all over the cell block, visit fellow prisoners and engage in conversation or games. The place was prison nevertheless, and I was anxious to be free. I expected to be pardoned soon, because the Civil Liberties Union had assured me that they had a promise from Governor Smith. But he did not pardon me at once. The last word I received from my lawyers was to the effect that I could obtain my parole from Governor Smith after the meeting of the parole board. I sent back word that I was not interested in parole and would not accept it. I had already made plans for finishing out my term. On December 10th I wrote my wife about it our hopes did not materialize. In a few days I will be able to form a definite opinion on what will take place. This letter will probably reach you Friday morning. I very strongly desired to be out by that time in order to be with you. You know why and what a memorable day it is for us. Perhaps, Badana, you will be able to come here Friday. Friday, December 11th, was the first anniversary of our wedding. On that memorable Friday my wife paid me a visit. She showed me a letter from Forrest Bailey of the American Civil Liberties Union stating that if I would consent to go out on parole it might be arranged, but that a pardon was now out of the question. The letter was very discouraging. I did not want to go out on parole. I wanted to be free to carry on my communist activities without any restraint. When I explained the matter to my wife, she agreed with me that it would be better to finish the term so that I could leave Sing Sing feeling that I was a free man, free from the supervision and restrictions of the parole board. While we were talking about the not too happy turn of events, the keeper in charge of the visiting room approached my wife, ma'am, you are wanted on the telephone. As my wife went to answer, she half jokingly remarked, wouldn't it be funny if the call is on the matter of your pardon? I replied, it would be like believing in miracles. My wife returned from the warden's office greatly excited. She stopped at the keeper's desk and happily said, well, don't be surprised if you will lose one of your steady guests soon. I just got word that the governor has pardoned my husband. When I got the news I was more than surprised. It was a very pleasant and unexpected shock. I could not get myself to believe it. My wife told me that she had received the call from the editorial offices of Frihiite 
which had been informed that the Convention of the International Ladies' Garment Workers' Union in Philadelphia had received a wire from Governor Smith to that effect. She had asked them to recheck, in order to make sure. A little later my wife was again called to the phone. The news of my pardon was confirmed. I then asked my wife to wait, in the event the warden received the pardon from Albany, because as soon as a pardon is received the prisoner is released. But the pardon did not come that day. My wife had to leave for New York. It was like a moving picture climax to a prison scene, liberation coming at the darkest moment and on the very day of the first wedding anniversary. The following morning Warden Laws received official notification of my pardon. I was immediately notified by him and went once more to the state shop, where I again got into an ill-fitting prison suit, put on a heavy ugly prison overcoat and left the prison a free man. On the train I was informed of the circumstances that led to my pardon. The National Convention of the International Ladies' Garment Workers' Union was in session in Philadelphia. The sessions were torn by a bit of factional dispute between the left-wing forces led by the communists and the so-called right-wing forces led by the president of the international, Morris Sigmund. A split in the organization was threatened. Sigmund was trying to prevent the split. The party's three representatives in Philadelphia, Biddock, Weinstone and Dunn, likewise opposed a split. Those in the left wing who advocated a split did so as a tactical maneuver, believing that, if a split should take place, Sigmund would enter into negotiations with the left wing, which controlled the majority of the membership, and would come to such terms with them as would result in the left wing virtually taking over the organization. Dr. Henry Moskowitz was present as the representative of Governor Smith. He, in consultation with Sigmund, engineered the plan to prevent a split in the organization by having Sigmund present the convention with a resolution calling upon Governor Smith to release me from prison. It was arranged that, when Governor Smith received the telegram, he would wire back the convention that upon their request he had pardoned Gitlow. In fact, the convention was informed by Governor Smith that he had released me hours before the official papers had been signed and the authorities at Sing Sing notified. The introduction of the resolution asking for my release resulted in a spontaneous demonstration in which both the left and the right wing participated. When the news of my release was received, a wild demonstration took place at the convention, which wired me at once to come to Philadelphia to address the delegates. When I arrived at Grand Central Station in New York City the place was jammed with communists who cheered wildly, giving me a rousing welcome. I had just time to greet my parents, for as soon as I was out of the station, my wife and I were pushed into a taxi and rushed to the Pennsylvania station, to make a train for Philadelphia. The left wing and the Communist Party of Philadelphia had planned to stage a demonstration on my arrival there and gathered at the station long before my train was due. But the police precipitated riot, and the demonstrators were dispersed. Upon my arrival in Philadelphia the large headlines in the local papers informed me that I had caused a riot in Philadelphia, the news being so written as to give the impression that I had purposely come to Philadelphia to stage the riot, which took place in my absence. Dr. Henry Moskowitz came to see me at my hotel. He was very nervous and very much disturbed. He wanted to make sure that the kind of speech I would deliver would not lead to disorder and a split. I assured him that I appreciated his efforts on my behalf and that I had come to Philadelphia in order to thank the Union and its membership for what they had done. The convention hall was packed when I arrived. I received a very impressive welcome. I spoke very carefully and guardedly. I thanked the Union and its membership for their efforts in my behalf, stressed the need for unity, and without engaging in personal attacks. I criticized what I believed to be disruptive trade union tactics. My speech, punctuated by repeated applause, took about an hour and a half to deliver. I was of the opinion that it was the best speech I had delivered during my many years in the labor movement. But evidently what I said did not please the administration, because more than half of it was expunged from the printed record of the convention. It also did not please the left wing, which felt that it was my duty as a communist, to ignore the reason for my invitation to attend the convention, 
by availing myself of the opportunity to attack Sigmund and his administration, implementing my popularity into a call for the ousting of Sigmund and his reactionary lieutenants. I disagreed with their position, since such action would have been tantamount to creating a situation from which a split might result, with the blame resting squarely upon my shoulders and the communists whom I represented. Foster and his group, who opposed a split, nevertheless did not hesitate to attack me for my speech, spreading versions of it that were distorted and altogether false. More than once I challenged Foster himself to come out in the open and prefer charges against me, for the kind of a speech he alleged I had made left the party no other alternative but to censure me or expel me from the party. The years 1925 and 1926 witnessed a development of the communist movement in all directions. The membership, in spite of the factional warfare, was devoted to the party and fanatical in its belief in communism. The greatest ambition of a party member was to serve the cause and become a professional revolutionist, a paid party official or organizer. The members were highly disciplined. They functioned like privates in a military organization. Orders given were carried out. Personal or family considerations were never taken into account, to take them into account was to be considered a petty bourgeois, the greatest insult to a communist. The party was dynamic, intensely active in whatever it did. This was possible because our members gave every moment of their spare time to the party. This is difficult for one who has not been active in the Communist Party to understand. It can best be described by a typical party member's daily routine, a rank and file comrade, a union member, who works during the day. In the morning he buys his communist newspaper and reads it going to work. He may arrive a little earlier than his shopmates in order to spread communist leaflets around without being noticed. At noon he will be engaged in some noonday activity of the party or of his communist trade union faction. After work, instead of going home, he will rush to party headquarters, to attend committee meetings of the party or of the trade union educational league, of his trade union faction, and the like. Later, after eight o'clock, he may have to attend a union meeting or a meeting of his party branch. After the meeting he probably will go back to party headquarters to get instructions for the next day's activities. A party member is always meeting, for he belongs as a rule to the following organizations, the Communist Party, the Trade Union Educational League, the union of his trade, the Communist Fraction 3, in that union, the International Labor Defense, the International Workers' Aid, and a fraternal organization. In all the organizations to which he belongs there are left-wing organizations organized by the communists into fractions of communist party members. All of them hold meetings. The communist party member must attend them all. Besides, he must attend the party school, help circulate the party papers, attend the caucus meetings of his faction and be present at all their general important meetings called by the party. In addition, all the organizations, and the organizations within the organizations to which he belongs, have special committees, with the result that the Communist Party member is always hurrying from one committee meeting to another. Sometimes an active rank and filer attends half a dozen meetings in the evening, until late into the night. Saturday afternoons are particularly crowded with numerous meetings, with perhaps an occasional demonstration thrown in. At night either his attendance is required at a communist lecture or forum, or else he must be present at a communist ball or entertainment. On Sunday, too, meetings and conferences take place, followed by communist lectures and other affairs in the evening. In the summertime, if the Communist Party member finds it possible to take a few weekends off or to take a vacation for a few weeks, he will invariably go to a communist summer camp, where as part of his vacation enjoyment he will engage in innumerable communist camp activities for the party, the daily worker and the multitudinous campaigns in which the communists are active raising money. A communist's life is in and of the movement. He is like a squirrel in a cage always running around in circles. He is so busy, so feverishly active, that it is impossible for him to see what is going on around him. His world is the party and its incessant round of meetings.
his personal associations are almost completely confined to communists. He reads the communist press and the numerous party tracts and magazines. A party member even speaks a language peculiar to the communists and foreign to others. The communist party members talk and think almost alike, because they keep absorbing the phrases, arguments and expressions which the party lavishly feeds them through its press, propaganda and cultural departments. The fanatical zeal of the communist party member is founded on his belief in the power of the Soviet Union and in its ultimate victory over the capitalist world. To the communist party member the Soviet Union is a worker's paradise the most desirable place in the world to live in. Not only does the communist party member give every moment of his time to the cause but every dollar he can spare as well, often giving much more than he can afford. In fact, the contributions communist party members are called upon to make are out of all proportion to their earning power. There are the dues to the party, to the union, to the trade union educational league, to the international labor defense to the workers' international relief, to the left wing in their union, to the communist fraternal organization, to the workers' club, besides contributions to the party branch, the daily worker, the special appeals of the national office for funds, and the numerous financial drives constantly carried on by the party. In some of these drives, like support of the daily worker, members are assessed from time to time as much as a day's pay. In addition, there are always tickets to buy and sell, dozens of them every week, for every kind of affair. The party member gives freely, happy to be able to do so. The individual communist is a generous contributor, the party bureaucrat, an extravagant spender. We would not hesitate to spend $25,000 for a single demonstration, if we deemed it politically necessary. I doubt if Chinese bandit generals ever taxed the Chinese peasantry more heavily than communist officials tax the party membership. Courageous and disciplined, the rank and filers of my days were ready to give up their lives for the party. They carried out unflinchingly the party's order to go out on dangerous demonstrations, to do picket duty in strikes, to defy injunctions, to resist the police. The party member would not hesitate at any time to give up his job, to leave his home and family, to engage in party activities in some remote part of the country or anywhere in the world. Yet in most cases all this was done not only as a free sacrifice, but also in large measure as an investment in a future career. All rank and file party members considered themselves potential political leaders of the working class. We developed this leadership psychology by impressing the members with the idea that they represented the vanguard of the working class. Hence, imitating us, their leaders, they became adept in political intrigue and trickery. The result was that party members did not trust one another. Whenever party members met they generally talked deprecatingly about other members. The party was a regular gossip factory in which the most intimate personal relations of the members and leaders were discussed and all kinds of rumors about them circulated. And of course, being embryo politicians, party members magnified their own importance and exaggerated the extent of their activities and achievements. If they were unable to make headway, they would exaggerate the difficulties confronting them out of all proportions to the actual facts because a party member who did not succeed in carrying out an activity assigned to him was subjected to the harshest kind of criticism. They were afraid of this criticism and did everything to avoid it. Many party members were given over to fads. In Russia the men and women wore leather coats and caps. The communists in America followed suit by wearing caps and leather coats. A communist girl could be recognized in a crowd by her swaggering walk, her bobbed hair, her low-heeled shoes, her leather coat and boyish cap. Communists were a boisterous and jolly lot. After midnight, the meetings over, they would swarm into their favorite cafeterias, to discuss and wrangle in a more carefree vein over the problems they had been discussing, or to digest over the coffee cups the latest factional developments in the party. This was especially true of the New York communists, who had a nightlife all of their own never getting to bed before two or three o'clock in the morning. One who joined the party was soon caught in the communist whirlpool. 
family ties had to be broken almost immediately, the non-communist friends dropped and one's social life completely changed. If a man was married to a non-communist, in many instances, he would be separated from his wife and family before very long and would be found living with a girl party member. From 1919 to 1925 the membership of our party was almost static, around 13,000, in spite of the fact that thousands of new members were recruited. Too many newcomers stayed in the party for a short period of time and then dropped out. Only a handful remained. The turnover in membership was about 85%. The real growth began during the first two years of the Rothenberg administration, 1925 to 1927, when we made the first serious effort to gain a foothold in the United States. It was during this period that American communist methods and tactics were developed. The Purcell Tour in 1925 the Communist International decided to make an energetic campaign on behalf of international trade union unity. Through it Moscow sought to gain a foothold in the trade unions of the important capitalist countries for the purpose of furthering the interests of the Soviet Union, by having the trade unions exert pressure on public opinion for more favorable trade relations with the Soviet Union and for de jure recognition of the Soviet government. Albert A. Purcell, a member of the General Council of the British Trade Union Congress, was enlisted by the Communist International in this campaign and sent on a tour of the United States, to see what he could do to enlist trade union support for American recognition of the Soviet Union. 4. Purcell's expenses in the United States were paid by Moscow. The money which the party paid out to organize the Purcell tour as well as the minimum of $200 per week plus railroad fares paid out to Purcell, came out of a special fund which was supplied by the Profinton and which was in William Z. Foster's custody. In New York the so-called Trade Union Committee to organize the Purcell meeting was headed by M. Rosen, a member of the Communist Party and the Carpenters Union, as president, and Elias Marx, a member of the Communist Party and of the International Ladies' Garment Workers' Union, as Secretary Treasurer. Out of the thirteen who made up the Provisional Advisory Committee, ten were party members. We tried to give the impression that the Communist Party had nothing to do with personal meetings. Whenever we were charged with running the meetings, we denied it most emphatically, by declaring that Purcell was not a member of the Communist Party of Great Britain that his routing manager in the United States was personally appointed by Purcell and that we supported his meetings because he supported World Trade Union Unity and the Soviet Union. But the Purcell tour turned out to be a failure. We found it practically impossible to inveigle the trade unionists who were not under our influence to support the campaign. The Purcell tour shows some of the means resorted to by our party to camouflage its activities. It employed these methods in defense activities, strike activities, relief activities, and wherever it was necessary to give the impression that the Communist Party was not directly involved. But in all these camouflaged activities we always took the greatest care in so organizing the machinery to conduct them that our control was secure, in order that the policies dictated by the party would not be countermanded. Many of those who were put in charge were either secret party members who paid their dues directly to the national office of the party, or sympathizers, who were, if not organizationally affiliated, actually party agents, because every move they made was in consultation with party agents, whose orders they followed as explicitly as did disciplined party members. Only we who were in the inner circle knew who these individuals were. Their actual connections with the party were kept secret even from the regular party members. The American trade union delegation to Soviet Russia, the Soviet government, through its Commissariat of Foreign Affairs and the Communist International, had worked out elaborate plans for publicizing the Soviet Union abroad. Among them was the ingenious scheme of trade union delegations from important capitalist countries journeying to the Soviet Union to investigate for themselves presumably at first hand the actual conditions, as they found them, in Russia. The Soviet government hoped through the reports which these delegations published after their trip, 
not only to refute the anti-Soviet publicity appearing in the press of the capitalist countries but also to win over the support of a large section of the trade union movement. The communist parties of the countries sending trade union delegations were instructed by the Comintern to use the reports of the delegations as the findings of fair-minded, impartial investigators, who, though they were not communists, had to admit that conditions in Russia were excellent and that the workers received many advantages they did not enjoy in the capitalist countries. The greatest emphasis in the reports issued was put on the lucrative trade which could be established with the Soviets, a trade which would be profitable for the capitalist countries and would offer increased employment to their workers. After the success of the British trade union delegation in 1924, our party was given instructions to survey the field and to lay plans for the sending of a trade union delegation from the United States. The idea of sending a delegation of prominent trade unionists from the United States to Soviet Russia, to investigate for themselves the conditions prevailing in Russia, was first raised in the Central Executive Committee of the party while the Persil tour was under consideration. The C. E. C decided first to arouse the interest of American trade unionists in the idea through the Persil tour itself. When that came to an end, we began to translate the idea into action. The Communist International informed us that all the expenses involved, including the trip to and from Soviet Russia, as well as the cost for preparing and printing the report of the delegation, would be paid by Moscow. But organizing the delegation was not an easy task. Of the six members who constituted it only four were active trade unionists and trade union officials. Of these four, one, L. E. Shepard, the honorary chairman of the delegation, did not even go to the Soviet Union. The three other unionists were, James H. Moura, president of the Pennsylvania State Federation of Labor, John Brophy, president of District 2 of the United Mine Workers of America, and James William Fitzpatrick, president of the Actors and Artists of America. The two non-union members were Frank L. Palmer and Albert F. Coyle both party sympathizers. This small delegation was accompanied by technical, advisory, research and secretarial staffs numbering 19 persons, including, besides such prominent persons as Professor George S. Counts, Professor Arthur Fisher, Professor R. G. Tugwell and others, disguised party members. Although Coyle was officially secretary of the delegation, his duties were really performed by Robert W. Dunn a secret member of the party. We thus had a disciplined party member in actual control, with the concurrence of a close sympathizer, and were in position to have our orders carried out explicitly. First to go to the Soviet Union were members of the technical staff of the delegation, the party contingent, which left in June, 1926, to prepare the ground for the genuine trade union members, who left for Moscow on July 27, 1926. In the Soviet Union the trade union delegation of three actual trade unionists divided itself into five separate parties, which toured the vast areas of that country, covering in one month's time thousands of miles and visiting over 35 cities, doing a lot more listening to speeches, speech making, attending of receptions and sheer traveling than even beginning to investigate conditions. So cleverly was the whole trip of the delegation planned that its non-initiated members never suspected that they were just pawns in the hands of the communists who were directing their tour. They were kept busy seeing what the Soviets wanted them to see, getting the reactions that the communists wanted them to get, and were so lavishly entertained, so subtly flattered and so deftly impregnated with the Soviet and communist viewpoint that they had very little or no time for independent investigation and the gathering of free and uninspired opinions. They were on a tour, the details of which were known in advance, and wherever they went the scenes were dressed up for them in glamorous colors. In 1927 I had a talk with the head of the Cummington department for this work. He jokingly remarked on how cleverly the work was done and how easy it was to put the naive visitors in the right frame of mind. He told me an interesting story about the visit of some British trade unionists. On the way from the border to Moscow, the train was suddenly stopped because of some engine trouble. 
When the passengers got out of the train and walked up and down the small station they were suddenly surprised to hear the strains of a band of music. As they looked around, they saw a group of workers carrying banners marching merrily behind a Red Army band. When the procession reached the station they stopped, one of the workers stepped forward and made a little speech, in which he said the workers in the factory had heard of the coming of the delegation to visit their country, and, when they heard that the train had stopped at the station, they had rushed to give their comrades and brothers a welcome as is befitting such visitors to the land of socialism. He called the head of the delegation by name, flattered him with praise for his good work and working class solidarity, and thanked him for the greetings he brought with him from the British workers. The Russian workers cheered wildly, surrounded the delegation and made them feel that they were the recipients of a most hearty spontaneous welcome in some small insignificant little village in the vast Soviet territory. The effect upon the British trade unionists was startling. That little unexpected welcome melted away whatever misgivings they may have had. But my informant said laughingly in German, Nicht war. They did not know that that welcome was well planned weeks in advance and was most carefully executed. Even the unexpected stopping of the train at that spot on account of assumed engine trouble was also planned. But the tutelage of such delegations went further. They were so loaded with affairs, functions, wind, dined and what not, that they had no time or desire to take upon themselves the responsibility for writing up an objective report on the investigations of the delegation. The trade union delegation gladly entrusted that work to Robert W. Dunn, who, in collaboration with Communist International and American Communist Party representatives, drafted the report and put it into final form. Every word of it was then edited by the party. Incidentally, out of the money allotted by Moscow for organizing the delegation and printing its report, the party saved several thousand dollars, which it put in the party treasury for general party expenditures. The report was signed by only two of the three actual trade unionists who went to Russia, James H. Moyura and John Brophy. The latter could not be considered unbiased because he had for years worked together with our party in the campaign to oust Lewis from the leadership of the United Mine Workers of America. The report, which was nothing but a rehash of what we of the Communist Party had been saying in defense of the Soviet Union, tried to hide the fact that most of the money involved in financing the trip and the work of the delegation was paid by the Soviet government, by inferring that the money came from contributions of workers and liberal friends who supplemented a nucleus from the Purcell Fund. But we had no Purcell Fund. Purcell's tour did not pay for itself. His meetings were far from profitable and the campaign we organized around his meetings to raise funds cost much more in administration than what was raised. The contributions from workers and liberals were less than negligible. The cost of the whole publicity stunt, which was what the delegation tour really was, a rather expensive proposition, was met by the Soviet government. The publicity was bought and paid for. Dot friendship and politics The Communist Party is an impersonal organization in which nothing is left to chance. All human relations are mangled, in keeping with the Procrustean standards of political schemes and plans. Long before it could hope to attain the expropriation of capitalist property, the party had expropriated our very souls controlling not only our behavior in public but our private actions and our thoughts. If we had friends prominent in public life, the party was bound to know about it and to determine our relations with them. That placed me very often in a very embarrassing position among friends who were not communists. As a blanket apology to all friends I lost through the party's control over my personal affairs, I cite one illustration. The case of Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, who is herself now under party control. On February 14, 1926, the League for Mutual Aid, of which I was a member, tendered a banquet to Elizabeth Gurley Flynn in honor of her 20 years of activity in the labor movement. I was a member of the dinner committee, which included the names of such opposites of political opinion as Harry Kelly, anarchist, Victor Berger, the first socialist congressman. Abraham Cohen, editor of the Jewish Daily Forward, Mrs. J. Sergeant Cram, Eugene V. Debs, 
Waldo Frank, Emma Goldman, Sidney Hillman, Isaac Don Levine, Morris Sigmund, President of the International Ladies Garment Workers Union, Norman Thomas, B. Charney Vladeek and Art Young. The committee in charge of arrangements was eager that I attend the banquet, because Elizabeth Gurley Flynn had inquired whether I would be present. It also informed me that if I would attend, I would be called upon to speak. I took the matter up with the party, as was the custom. I explained that, even though I did not agree with Gurley Flynn politically, I nevertheless had the greatest regard for her as a friend. I explained that the party must not forget that Gurley Flynn was among the first to rally to my defense and that of the party and its leaders when we were under Fiora in 1919. I further stated that her efforts on behalf of the I. W. W. Prisoners, her work in the National Defense Committee on behalf of myself and the other comrades who were sent to prison, put her in a special position and imposed upon us the obligation to treat her as a friend, not as an enemy. I made it clear that such an attitude did not imply that we were to be uncritical of her actions. My comrades, however, stressed that we could not honor Elizabeth Gurley Flynn for her past activities without holding her responsible for her support of the movement on behalf of political prisoners in Soviet Russia. Her anarchist and syndicalist leanings, all of which put her in the camp of the enemies of the communist movement and made her a part of the counter-revolutionary forces fighting Soviet Russia. I then pointed out to them that Flynn was now traveling in our direction and that we would make a serious mistake in snobbing her by having me fail to attend the banquet. I added that I could make my speech political, approving her activities as a militant I. W. W. Strike leader and criticizing her for her present inactivity, at the same time utilizing the occasion to castigate the critics of the communist movement and of the Soviet government in such a way as to cause a rift between Flynn and her anti communist friends. That argument appealed to my comrades, and I was allowed to attend the banquet, the party decision being that I should speak politically and critically. Whereupon a committee of the party worked out my speech in all details along the lines of my proposal. This was the speech I delivered at the Gurley Flynn dinner. Those who heard me were greatly shocked, because I criticized the one honored by the banquet and injected into an otherwise non political occasion a controversial political tone. The fact remains that these communist methods do bring home the bacon when properly applied, that is, my speech was not in vain. When Gurley Flynn rose she took special note of my speech, and from her answer I knew that it had had the proper effect. Some years later when I spoke about the banquet to her she told me that my speech had greatly impressed her, that at the time she had no doubt that I had made the speech in a spirit of genuine friendship and in all sincerity, but that, after having worked with the party, she now had doubts. She said, Tell me, Ben, was not that speech planned by the party? If the party did, it was very cleverly done. But I only shrugged my shoulders and remained non-committal, even as comrade to comrade, as a very close friend, I could not be frank with her. Representing the Soviet government in addition to being a branch or section of the Communist International, the Communist Party also acted as an agent of the Soviet government. Indeed, it is the link between the American Communist Party and the Soviet government that accounts for the tight grip of the party upon its membership. The typical American communist regards himself by virtue of his membership in the party as an important cog in the worldwide communist machine that serves the Soviet government. He is compensated for his opposition to the United States government by being impressed with his importance to the government of the Soviet Union. It is this tie-up with a mighty government that holds the party and the leadership together more than any other single factor. Of course, the Soviet government has repeatedly argued that it and the Communist International are two separate entities. But their separation is as real as, say, the separation of the President of the United States from the, the United States State Department. Soviet spokesmen have always insisted that the Soviet government and the Russian Communist Party are two entirely different organizations, like, let us say, the United States government and the Republican Party during a Republican administration. Yet in Russia the Communist Party is the state even more so than the Nazi Party in Germany and the Fascist Party in Italy. 
Stalin, the head of the Russian Communist Party, is the recognized ruler of the Soviet government, and has been for years, even though the nominal head of the government is that political non-entity, Mikhail Kalinin. The Communist Party of the Soviet Union directly considers all the policies of the Soviet Union and its decisions then become the laws of the state. In its turn the American Communist Party has always argued that it had no connections whatsoever with the Soviet government, but the fact of the matter is that the American Communist Party is in the same relation to the Soviet government as the paid agents of Nazi Germany and the United States are to the government of the Third Reich. Before the Soviet government was recognized by the United States, visas were issued in this country for the Soviet government by the Society for Technical Aid to Soviet Russia. This was a Russian organization which was run by the members of the Russian Federation of the Communist Party. Its affairs were subject to the control and decisions of the party. Individuals who desired to visit the Soviet Union would get approval for their visas either from this organization or from the party. If the party O. K. D. them, the procurement of visas was facilitated. Very often the party would directly notify the Soviet government that it was opposed to certain persons obtaining visas. In one case, that of Abraham Cohen, editor of the Jewish Daily Forward, the party held up the granting of a visa to him for a long time, and when a visa was granted to him, the Soviet government made sure that his trip in Russia should be supervised and carefully watched by the G. P. U. At the same time, the party has always served as an agency of information on American visitors to the Soviet Union. The Soviet government was supplied with a detailed report on particular visitors. When party members traveled to the Soviet Union they received special credentials from the party which were recognized by the customs officials and the G. P. U. agents on the border. Presentation of such a party credential, which was typed on a small strip of white silk, stamped with the party seal and sewed into the lining of one's coat, immediately gave the bearer special consideration. Furthermore, party members who went to the Soviet Union to settle permanently or for a period of years obtained transfers to the Communist Party of the Soviet Union only after the American Party received the membership request of the Russian Party and approved of the transfer. The opening of the IMTIG Trading Corporation, the Soviet's trading corporation in the United States gave the party many advantages. In staffing the AMTIG with technical help, bookkeepers, stenographers, translators, salesmen, advertising personnel and publicity agents, the party was consulted, the important, confidential and well-paying positions being filled by party members. Several hundred party members were employed by the AMTIG. These workers became in fact part of the party bureaucracy their jobs depending definitely upon the goodwill of the party. The party members working in the AMTIG were organized into an AMTIG nucleus, but this nucleus was kept a strict secret. The head of the nucleus was the confidential liaison officer between it and the party. Party members in the AMTIG had to pay whatever assessments or taxes were levied upon them by the party. Failure to do so would have meant loss of their job. But the influence of the party in the AMTIG did not apply only to party members. Others who sought jobs in the AMTIG did not hesitate to court the favor of party leaders, and many who were job conscious rather than class conscious joined the Communist Party in order to obtain jobs. When Soviet trade or technical missions came to the United States, it was a rule that the IMTIG sought to obtain from the party not only advice and other help for these missions but that party members were also given posts on the missions as translators, interpreters, guides and the like. Party members who obtained these jobs consulted with the party on what they could do to be of service to it and from time to time gave special reports to the party on matters of importance. Moreover, the heads of the AMTIG very often conferred with the members of the party secretariat on political matters pertinent to their activities. J. Lovestone and I had a number of conferences with Saul Brun, head of the AMTIG, on how a movement could be started in the United States Congress for the recognition of the Soviet Union. At another time, when the AMTIG arranged an exhibition in New York City, 
employing party members almost exclusively in taking care of the various phases of the exhibition, we were requested by the head of the IMTAG to discourage party members from attending the exhibition, because they wanted to create the impression that it was a bourgeois affair. But the party was tied to the Soviet government by stronger strings as well. Most important of these was the G. P. U. Directly upon the request of the G. P. U. The party supplied it with party members who could be added to its espionage staff. These party members became full fledged G. P. U. agents, employed and paid by the Soviet government. These agents were the link between the party and the G. P. U. Contacts were made for them by the party secretariat, who from time to time advised them how to proceed. A party member who became a G. P. U. Agent dropped out of party activity the moment he was selected. He became subject to the severe discipline which the G. P. U. Imposes upon its agents. Only very few of the party leaders knew when a party member became a G. P. U. Agent, and they kept this information strictly confidential. Every time the party was called upon by the G. P. U. To help, it was paid for any expenses involved far above what was actually spent, the surplus going into the party treasury. But we, the party leaders, who greatly cherished every opportunity to be of service to the G. P. U. Aid in its work and be in its confidence, knew that the G. P. U. Kept a close watch on us, too. It was an open secret among us, the party leaders, that the G. P. U. was supplying Moscow with a complete record of all the leaders of the American Communist Party along with reports on the activities of the party as a whole. But it was impossible really to find out whether the G. P. U. agents who came to the United States, many of whom were unknown to the party leadership, favored or disapproved of the party leaders and their activities. However, we all knew that the Soviet government did not consider our party merely a section of the Communist International, which the leaders of the Soviet government dominated, but that they looked upon the American Communist Party as one of its agencies. Nor were the party's services to the Soviet government confined to the borders of the United States. The Soviet government utilized members of the American Communist Party over a far flung area that included China, Japan, Germany. Mexico and the countries of Central and South America. Charles Crumb Bain, a leader of the American Party, was sent to England, presumably to work for the Profinton. Jack Johnston went to India, from where he was deported by the British government. H. M. Wicks went on special missions to Germany and Central America. Earl Browder headed a bureau, known as the Pan Pacific Trade Union Secretariat, with headquarters in Hankow, China. Party members traveled as representatives of the Communist International and the Profinton to the four corners of the earth, not only to carry out the particular policies of the Comintern and Profinton, which were adopted as part of the intricate policies of the Soviet government in the spheres controlled by these two organizations, but the representatives of these two organizations also served directly as G. P. U and all sorts of other agents of the Soviet government as well. This was strikingly brought out by the activities of the Soviet government in China during the rise to power of the Kuomintang in 1924-1927. Not only were Russian communists poured into China, but also communists from other countries. They made up the trusted core of confidential representatives who watched out for Soviet interests and helped guide Soviet policy through the difficult maze of Chinese politics. At times, taking advantage of its connection with the Soviet government, the party would even play the picaroon. Thus, on February 8, 1927, I wrote Rothenburg enclosed is a copy of a letter I mailed to Comrade Amter. I saw Mrs. Falk when I was in Ohio. Her property if sold now could realize five to ten thousand dollars. However, the property, if held, 
provided it cannot be sold immediately, will increase in value tremendously in a year's time. I believe you should grant Comrade Mrs. Falk's request that she be transferred permanently to the R. C. P. Russian Communist Party, provided she transfers the property. Amta was foolish enough to create the impression that the party needed workers like her and would oppose her permanent transfer. You should advise Amta accordingly and instruct him to proceed immediately to have Mrs. Falk turn her property over to us. The letter to Amta was as follows enclosed is a Russian letter and a Poltinik, a half ruble silver coin, for Mrs. Falk from her son. This was sent to me by Bob Miner, then the party representative in Moscow, through Comrade Wyshnyak, who just arrived. It is necessary that you forward the letter and the coin to her at once. When you see her, and you should see her personally, you ought to make definite arrangements about the turning over of her property to the daily concern, daily worker. I think we ought to get the Central Executive Committee to promise her that she can obtain, if she transfers the property, a permanent transfer to the Russian Communist Party. The sending of the Russian letter and the coin was arranged through Bob Miner in Moscow, as was the matter of Mrs. Falk's transfer to the Russian Communist Party. Mrs. Falk got her transfer and we received from her valuable Canton, Ohio, real estate. Anything for the cause. The propaganda machine during this period the international publishers was organized for the purpose of publishing communist books and pamphlets for sale in the United States.